Virgil, the Aeneid. Translation by Fitzgerald, Robert. Book 1. A Fateful Haven. I sing of warfare and a man at war. From the seacoast of Troy in early days he came to Italy by destiny, to our Lavinian western shore, a fugitive, this captain, buffeted cruelly on land as on the sea by blows from powers of the air, behind them baleful Juno in her sleepless rage. And cruel losses were his lot in war, till he could found a city and bring home his gods to Latium, land of the Latin race, the Alban lords, and the high walls of Rome. Tell me the causes now, O muse, how galled in her divine pride, and how sore at heart from her old wound, the queen of gods compelled him, a man apart, devoted to his mission, to undergo so many perilous days and enter on so many trials. Can anger black as this prey on the minds of heaven? Tyrian settlers in that ancient time held Carthage, on the far shore of the sea, set against Italy and Tiber's mouth, a rich new town, warlike and trained for war. And Juno, we are told, cared more for Carthage than for any walled city of the earth, more than for Samos, even. There her armor and chariot were kept, and, fate permitting, Carthage would be the ruler of the world. So she intended, and so nursed that power. But she had heard long since that generations born of Trojan blood would one day overthrow her Tyrian walls, and from that blood a race would come in time with ample kingdoms, arrogant in war, for Libya's ruin, so the Parsi spun. In fear of this, and holding in memory the old war she had carried on at Troy for Argos' sake, the origins of that anger, that suffering, still rankled, deep within her, hidden away, the judgment Paris gave, snubbing her loveliness, the race she hated, the honors given ravished Ganymede, Saturnian Juno, burning for it all, buffeted on the waste of sea those Trojans left by the Greeks and pitiless Achilles, keeping them far from Latium. For years they wandered as their destiny drove them on from one sea to the next, so hard and huge a task it was to found the Roman people. They were all under sail in open water with Sicily just out of sight astern, light-hearted as they ploughed the white-capped sea with stems of cutting bronze. But never free of her eternal inward wound, the goddess said to herself, Give up what I began? Am I defeated? Am I impotent to keep the king of Teucrians from Italy? The fates forbid me, am I to suppose? Could Pallas then consume the Argive fleet with fire, and drown the crews, because of one man's one mad act, the crime of Ajax, son of Oileus? She, yes, she, hurled out of cloudland lancing fire of Jove, scattered the ships, roughed up the sea with gales, then caught the man, bolt struck, exhaling flames, in a whirlwind and impaled him on a rock. But I who walk as queen of all the gods, sister and wife of Jove, I must contend for years against one people. Who adores the power of Juno after this, or lays an offering with prayer upon her altar? Smoldering, putting these questions to herself, the goddess made her way to storm-cloud country, Aeolia, the weather-breeding isle. Here in a vast cavern King Aeolus rules the contending winds and moaning gales as warden of their prison. Round the walls they chafe and bluster underground. The din makes a great mountain murmur overhead. High on a citadel enthroned, scepter in hand, he mollifies their fury, else they might flay the sea and sweep away land masses and deep sky through empty air. In fear of this, Jupiter hid them away in caverns of black night. He set above them granite of high mountains, and a king empowered at command to rein them in or let them go. To this king Juno now made her petition, Aeolus, the father of gods and men decreed and fixed your power to calm the waves or make them rise in wind. The race I hate is crossing the Tuscan Sea, transporting Ilium with her household gods, beaten as they are, to Italy. Put new fury into your winds, and make the long ships founder. Drive them off course. Throw bodies in the sea. I have fourteen exquisite nymphs, of whom the loveliest by far, Dea Pia, shall be your own. I'll join you two in marriage, so she will spend all future years with you, as you so well deserve, and make you father of her lovely children, said Aeolus, to settle on what you wish is all you need to do, your majesty. I must perform it. You have given me what realm I have. By your good offices I rule with Jove's consent, and I recline among the gods at feasts, for you appoint me lord of wind and cloud. Spear half reversed, he gave the hollow mountainside a stroke, and, where a portal opened, winds in ranks, as though drawn up for battle, hurtled through, to blow across the earth in hurricane. Over the sea, tossed up from the seafloor, east wind and south wind, then the wild southwest with squall on squall came scudding down, rolling high combers shoreward. Now one heard the cries of men and screech of ropes and rigging suddenly, as the storm cloud whipped away clear sky and daylight from the Teucrian's eyes, and gloom of night leaned on the open sea. It thundered from all quarters, as it lightened flash on flash through heaven. Every sign portended a quick death for mariners. Aeneas on the instant felt his knees go numb and slack, and stretched both hands to heaven, groaning out, 
triply lucky, all you men to whom death came before your father's eyes below the wall at Troy. Bravest Danon, Diomedes, why could I not go down when you had wounded me, and lose my life on Ilium's battlefield? Our Hector lies there, torn by Achilles' weapon, their Sarpedon, our giant fighter, lies, and there the river Simois washes down so many shields and helmets, with strong bodies taken under. As he flung out these words, a howling gust from due north took the sail aback and lifted wave tops to heaven. Oars were snapped in two, the prow sheared round and left them broadside on to breaking seas, over her flank and deck a mountain of grey water crashed in tons. Men hung on crests, to some a yawning trough uncovered bottom, boiling waves and sand. The south wind caught three ships and whirled them down on reefs, hidden mid-sea, called by Italians the altars, razorbacks just under water. The east wind drove three others from deep water into great shoals and banks, embedding them and wringing them with sand, a desperate sight. Before Aeneas' eyes a toppling billow struck the Lycian ship, Arantes' ship, across the stern, pitching the steersman down and overboard. Three times the eddying sea carried the ship around in the same place until the rapid whirlpool gulped it down. A few men swimming surfaced in the welter. So did shields, planks, precious things of Troy. Ilioneus' good ship, brave Achates' ship, the ship that carried Abbas, and the one Alatus sailed in, hail in his great age, were all undone by the wild gale, their seams parted and let the enemy pour in. During all this, Neptune became aware of hurly-burly and tempest overhead, bringing commotion to the still sea depth and rousing him. He lifted his calm brow above the surface, viewing the great sea, and saw Aeneas' squadron far and wide dispersed over the water, saw the Trojans overwhelmed, the ruining clouds of heaven, and saw his angry sister's hand in all. He called to him east wind and south and said, Are you so sure your line is privileged? How could you dare to throw heaven and earth into confusion, by no will of mine, and make such trouble? You will get from me, but first to calm the rough sea, after this, you'll pay a stricter penalty for your sins. Off with you. Give this message to your king, power over the sea and the cruel trident were never his by destiny, but mine. He owns the monstrous rocks, your home, east wind. Let Aeolus ruffle in that hall alone and lord it over winds shut in their prison. Before the words were out, he quieted the surging water, drove the clouds away, and brought the sunlight back. Samothoe and Triton, side by side, worked to dislodge the grounded ships, then Neptune with his trident heaved them away, opened the miles of shoals, tempered the sea, and in his car departed gliding over the wave tops on light wheels. When rioting breaks out in a great city, and the rampaging rabble goes so far that stones fly, and incendiary brands, for anger can supply that kind of weapon, if it so happens they look round and see some dedicated public man, a veteran whose record gives him weight, they quiet down, willing to stop and listen. Then he prevails in speech over their fury by his authority, and placates them. Just so, the whole uproar of the great sea fell silent, as the father of it all, scanning horizons under the open sky, swung his team around and gave free rein in flight to his eager chariot. Tired out, Aeneas' people made for the nearest land, turning their prows toward Libya. There's a spot where at the mouth of a long bay an island makes a harbour, forming a breakwater where every swell divides as it comes in and runs far into curving recesses. There are high cliffs on this side and on that, and twin peaks towering heavenward impend on reaches of still water. Over these, against a forest backdrop shimmering, a dark and shaggy grove casts a deep shade, while in the cliffside opposite, below the overhanging peaks, there is a cave with fresh water and seats in the living rock, the home of nymphs. Here never an anchor chain, never an anchor's biting fluke need hold a tired ship. Aeneas put in here, with only seven ships from his full number, and longing for the firm earth underfoot the Trojans disembarked, to take possession of the desired sand beach. Down they lay, to rest their brine-soaked bodies on the shore. Achates promptly struck a spark from flint and caught it in dry leaves, he added tinder roundabout and waved it for a flame burst. Then they brought out the grain of Ceres, tainted by sea water, and Ceres implements, and, weary of their troubles, made all ready to dry and grind with millstones what they had. Meanwhile, Aeneas climbed one of the peaks for a long seaward view, hoping to sight gale-worn Antheus and the Phrygian Byremes, Capus, or high poops bearing Caicus arms. He found no ship in sight, but on the shore three wandering stags. Behind them whole herds followed, grazing in a long line down the valleys. Planting his feet, he took in hand the bow and arrows carried by his aid, Achates, then, aiming for the leaders with heads high and branching antlers, brought them first to earth. Next he routed the whole herd, driving them with his shafts through leafy places, shooting and shooting till he won the hunt by laying seven carcasses on the ground, a number equal to his ships. Then back to port he went, and parceled out the game to his ship's companies. There he divided the wine courtly Acestes had poured out and given them on the Sicilian shore, 
full jugs of it, when they were about to sail. By this and by a simple speech Aeneas comforted his people, friends and companions, have we not known hard hours before this? My men, who have endured still greater dangers, God will grant us an end to these as well. You sailed by Scylla's rage, her booming crags, you saw the Cyclops boulders. Now call back your courage, and have done with fear and sorrow. Some day, perhaps, remembering even this will be a pleasure. Through diversities of luck, and through so many challenges, we hold our course for Latium, where the fates hold out a settlement and rest for us. Troy's kingdom there shall rise again. Be patient, save yourselves for more auspicious days. So ran the speech. Burdened and sick at heart, he feigned hope in his look, and inwardly contained his anguish. Now the Trojan crews made ready for their windfall and their feast. They skinned the deer, bared ribs and viscera, then one lot sliced the flesh and skewered it on spits, all quivering, while others filled bronze cooking pots and tended the beach fires. All got their strength back from the meal, reclining on the wild grass, gorging on venison and mellowed wine. When hunger had been banished, and tables put away, they talked at length in hope and fear about their missing friends, could one believe they might be still alive, or had they suffered their last hour, never again to hear a voice that called them. Aeneas, more than any, secretly mourned for them all, for that fierce man, Orontes, then for Amicus, then for the bitter fate of Lycus, for brave Gius, brave Clonthus. It was the day's end when from highest air Jupiter looked down on the broad sea flecked with wings of sails, and the land masses, coasts, and nations of the earth. He stood on heaven's height and turned his gaze toward Libya, and, as he took the troubles there to heart, Venus appealed to him, all pale and wan, with tears in her shining eyes, my lord who rule the lives of men and gods now and forever, and bring them all to heal with your bright bolt, what in the world could my Aeneas do, what could the Trojans do, so to offend you that after suffering all those deaths they find the whole world close to them, because of Italy. Surely from these the Romans are to come in the course of years, renewing Teucer's line, to rule the sea and all the lands about it, according to your promise. What new thought has turned you from them, father? I consoled myself for Troy's fall, that grim ruin, weighing out one fate against another in the scales, but now, when they have borne so many blows, the same misfortune follows them. Great king, what finish to their troubles will you give? After Antenor slipped through the Achaeans he could explore Illyrian coves and reach in safety the Liburnians inland kingdoms and source of the time of us. Through nine openings with a great rumble in the mountain wall it bursts from the ground there and floods the fields in a rushing sea. And yet he chose that place for Padua and new homes for Teucrians, gave them a name, set up the arms of Troy, and now rests in his peace. As for ourselves, your own children, whom you make heirs of heaven, our ships being lost, this is unspeakable, we are forsaken through one enemy's rage and kept remote from Italy. Is this the palm for loyalty? This our power restored? He smiled at her, the father of gods and men, with that serenity that calms the weather, and lightly kissed his daughter. Then he said, no need to be afraid, Cytherea. Your children's destiny has not been changed. As promised, you shall see Lavinium's walls and take up, then, amid the stars of heaven great souled Aeneas. No new thought has turned me. No, he, your son, now let me speak of him, in view of your consuming care, at length, unfolding secret fated things to come, in Italy he will fight a massive war, beat down fierce armies, then for the people there establish city walls and a way of life. When the Rutulians are subdued he'll pass three summers of command in Latium, three years of winter quarters. But the boy, Ascanius, to whom the name of Iulus now is added, Illus while Ilium stood, will hold the power for all of thirty years, great rings of wheeling months. He will transfer his capital from Lavinium and make a fortress, Alba Longa. Three full centuries that kingdom will be ruled by Hector's race, until the queen and priestess, Ilia, pregnant by Mars, will bear twin sons to him. Afterward, happy in the tawny pelt his nurse, the she-wolf, wears, young Romulus will take the leadership, build walls of Mars, and call by his own name his people Romans. For these I set no limits, world or time, but make the gift of empire without end. Juno, indeed, whose bitterness now fills with fear and torment sea and earth and sky, will mend her ways, and favor them as I do, lords of the world, the toga-bearing Romans. Such is our pleasure. As the years fall away, an age comes when Asericus' royal house will bring to servitude Thessaly and Thyia, renowned Mycenae, too, and subjugate defeated Argos. From that comely line the Trojan Caesar comes, to circumscribe empire with ocean, fame with heaven's stars. Julius's name, from Iulus handed down, all tranquil shall you take him heavenward in time, laden with plunder of the east, and he with you shall be invoked in prayer. Wars at an end, 
harsh centuries then will soften, ancient Fides and Vesta, Quirinus with brother Remus, will be lawgivers, and grim with iron frames, the gates of war will then be shut, inside, unholy furor, squatting on cruel weapons, hands and chained behind him by a hundred links of bronze, will grind his teeth and howl with bloodied mouth, that said, he sent the son of Maya down from his high place to make the land of Carthage, the new-built town, receptive to the Trojans, not to allow Queen Dido, all unknowing as to the fated future, to exclude them. Through the vast air with stroking wings he flew and came down quickly on the Libyan coast, performing Jove's command, so that at once Phoenicians put aside belligerence as the god willed. Especially the queen took on a peaceful mood, an open mind toward Teucrians. But the dedicated man, Aeneas, thoughtful through the restless night, made up his mind, as kindly daylight came, to go out and explore the strange new places, to learn what coast the wind had brought him to and who were living there, men or wild creatures, for wilderness was all he saw, and bring report back to his company. The ships he hid beneath a hollowed rocky cliff and groves that made a vault, trees all around and deep shade quivering. He took his way with only one man at his side, Achates, hefting two hunting spears with broad steel points. Then suddenly, in front of him, his mother crossed his path in mid-forest, wearing a girl's shape and a girl's gear, a Spartan girl, or like that one of Thrace, her palacy, who tires horses out, outrunning the swift Hebrus. She had hung about her shoulders the light, handy bow a huntress carries, and had given her hair to the dishevelling wind, her knees were bare, her flowing gown knotted and curdled up. She spoke first ho, young fellows, have you seen, can you say where, one of my sisters here, in a spotted lynx hide, belted with a quiver, scouting the wood, or shouting on the track behind a foam-flecked boar. To Venus then the son of Venus answered, No, I've heard or seen none of your sisters, only, how shall I address you, girl? Your look's not mortal, neither has your accent a mortal ring. O oh, goddess, beyond doubt. Apollo's sister? One of the family of nymphs? Be kind, whoever you may be, relieve our trouble, tell us under what heaven we've come at last, on what shore of the world are we cast up, wanderers that we are, strange to this country, driven here by wind and heavy sea. By my right hand many an offering will be cut down for you before your altars. Venus replied, Be sure I am not fit for any such devotion. Tyrian girls are given to wearing quivers and hunting boots of crimson, laced on the leg up to the knee. This is the Punic kingdom that you see, the folk are Tyrian, the town of Genors. But neighboring lands belong to Libya, a nation hard to fight against in war. The ruler here is Dido, of Tyre city, in flight here from her brother, a long tale of wrong endured, mysterious and long. But let me tell the main events in order. Her husband was Sicaeus, of all Phoenicians richest in land, and greatly loved by her, ill-fated woman. Her father had given her, a virgin still, in marriage, her first right. Her brother, though, held power in Tyre, Pygmalion, a monster of wickedness beyond all others. Between the two men furious hate arose, and sacrilegiously before the altars, driven by a blind lust for gold, Pygmalion took Sicaeus by surprise and killed him with a dagger blow in secret, undeterred by any thought of Dido's love. He hid what he had done for a long time, cousining her, deluding the sick woman with false hope. But the true form of her unburied husband came in a dream, lifting his pallid face before her strangely, he made visible the cruel altars and his body pierced, uncovering all the dark crime of the house. He urged her then to make haste and take flight, leaving her fatherland, and to assist the journey revealed a buried treasure of old time, unknown to any, a weight of gold and silver. Impelled by this, Dido laid her plans to get away and to equip her company. All who hated the tyrant, all in fear as bitter as her own, now came together, and ships in port, already fitted out, they commandeered, to fill with gold, the riches Pygmalion had itched for went to sea, and captaining the venture was a woman. They sailed to this place where today you'll see stone walls going higher and the citadel of Carthage, the new town. They bought the land, called Drumskin from the bargain made, a track they could enclose with one bull's hide. But now, what of yourselves? From what coast do you come? Where are you bound? Then to the questioner he answered sighing, bringing out the words from deep within him, Goddess, if I should tell our story from the start, if you had leisure to hear our annals of adversity, before I finished, the fair evening star would come to close Olympus in the day. From old Troy, if the name of Troy has fallen perhaps upon your ears, we sailed the seas, and yesterday were driven by a storm, of its own whim, upon this Libyan coast. I am Aeneas, duty-bound, and known above high air of heaven by my fame, carrying with me and my ships our gods of hearth and home, saved from the enemy. I look for Italy to be my fatherland, and my descent is from all highest Jove. With twenty ships I mounted the Phrygian sea, as my immortal mother showed the way. 
I followed the given fates. Now barely seven ships are left, battered by wind and sea, and I myself, unknown and unprovisioned, cross the Libyan wilderness, an exile driven from Europe and from Asia, but Venus chose to hear no more complaints and broke in, midway through his bitterness, whoever you are, I doubt heaven is unfriendly to you, as you still breathe life-giving air on your approach to the Tyrian town. Go on, betake yourself this way to the Queen's Gate. Your friends are back. This is my news for you, your ships were saved and brought to shore again by wind shifting north, or else my parents taught me augury to no purpose. Look, see the twelve swans in line rejoicing there. Jove's eagle, like a bolt out of the blue, had flurried them in open heaven, but now they seem to be alighting one by one or looking down on those already grounded. As they disport themselves, with flapping wings, after their chanting flight about the sky, just so your ships and your ship's companies are either in port or entering under sail. Go on then, where the path leads, go ahead. On this she turned away. Rose pink and fair her nape shone, her ambrosial hair exhaled divine perfume, her gown rippled full length, and by her stride she showed herself a goddess. Knowing her for his mother, he called out to the figure fleeting away, you. Cruel, too. Why tease your son so often with disguises? Why may we not join hands and speak and hear the simple truth? So he called after her, and went on toward the town. But Venus muffled the two wayfarers in grey mist, a cloak of dense cloud poured around them, so that no one had the power to see or to accost them, make them halt, or ask them what they came for. Away to Paphos through high air she went in joy to see her home again, her shrine and hundred altars where Sabian incense fumed and garlands freshened the air. Meanwhile the two men pressed on where the pathway led, soon climbing a long ridge that gave a view down over the city and facing towers. Aeneas found, where lately huts had been, marvelous buildings, gateways, cobbled ways, and din of wagons. There the Tyrians were hard at work, laying courses for walls, rolling up stones to build the citadel, while others picked out building sites and plowed a boundary furrow. Laws were being enacted, magistrates and a sacred senate chosen. Here men were dredging harbors, there they laid the deep foundation of a theater, and quarried massive pillars to enhance the future stage, as bees in early summer and sunlight in the flowering fields hum at their work, and bring along the young full-grown to beehood, as they cram their combs with honey, brimming all the cells with nectar, or take newcomers plunder, or like troops alerted, drive away the lazy drones, and labor thrives in sweet time sense the honey. Aeneas said, how fortunate these are whose city walls are rising here and now. He looked up at the roofs, for he had entered, swathed in cloud, strange to relate, among them, mingling with men, yet visible to none. In midtown stood a grove that cast sweet shade where the Phoenicians, shaken by wind and sea, had first dug up that symbol Juno showed them, a proud warhorse's head, this meant for Carthage prowess in war and ease of life through ages. Here being built by the Sidonian queen was a great temple planned in Juno's honor, rich in offerings and the godhead there. Steps led up to a sill of bronze, with brazen lintel, and bronze doors on groaning pins. Here in this grove new things that met his eyes calmed Aeneas' fear for the first time. Here for the first time he took heart to hope for safety, and to trust his destiny more even in affliction. It was while he walked from one to another wall of the great temple and waited for the queen, staring amazed at Carthaginian promise, at the handiwork of artificers and the toil they spent upon it, he found before his eyes the Trojan battles in the old war, now known throughout the world, the great Atridae, Priam, and Achilles, fierce in his rage at both sides. Here Aeneas halted, and tears came. What spot on earth, he said, what region of the earth, Achates, is not full of the story of our sorrow? Look, here is Priam. Even so far away great valor has due honor, they weep here for how the world goes, and our life that passes touches their hearts. Throw off your fear. This fame ensures some kind of refuge. He broke off to feast his eyes and mind on a mere image, sighing often, cheeks grown wet with tears, to see again how, fighting around Troy, the Greeks broke here, and ran before the Trojans, and there the Phrygians ran, as plumed Achilles harried them in his war car. Nearby, then, he recognized the snowy canvas tents of Rhesus, and more tears came, these, betrayed in first sleep, Diomedes devastated, sorting many, till he reeked with blood, then turned the meddlesome horses toward the beachhead before they tasted Trojan grass or drank at Xanthus' fort. And on another panel Troilus, without his armor, luckless boy, no match for his antagonist, Achilles, appeared pulled onward by his team, he clung to his war car, though fallen backward, hanging on to the rein still, head dragged on the ground, his javelin scribbling s's in the dust. Meanwhile to hostile palace shrine the Trojan women walked with hair unbound, bearing the robe of offering, in sorrow, entreating her, beating their breasts. But she, her face averted, 
would not raise her eyes. And there was Hector, dragged around Troy walls three times, and there for gold Achilles sold him, bloodless and lifeless. Now indeed Aeneas heaved a mighty sigh from deep within him, seeing the spoils, the chariot, and the corpse of his great friend, and Priam, all unarmed, stretching his hands out. He himself he saw in combat with the first of the Achaeans, and saw the ranks of Dawn, black Memnon's arms, then, leading the battalion of Amazons with half-moon shields, he saw Penicillia fiery amid her host, buckling a golden girdle beneath her bare and arrogant breast, a girl who dared fight men, a warrior queen. Now, while these wonders were being surveyed by Aeneas of Dardania, while he stood enthralled, devouring all in one long gaze, the queen paced toward the temple in her beauty, Dido, with a throng of men behind. As on Eurotus bank or Synthus ridge Diana trains her dancers, and behind her on every hand the mountain nymphs appear, a myriad converging, with her quiver slung on her shoulders, in her stride she seems the tallest, taller by a head than any, and joy pervades Latona's quiet heart, so Dido seemed, in such delight she moved amid her people, cheering on the toil of a kingdom in the making. At the door of the goddess shrine, under the temple dome, all hedged about with guards on her high throne, she took her seat. Then she began to give them judgments and rulings, to apportion work with fairness, or assign some tasks by lot, when suddenly Aeneas saw approaching, accompanied by a crowd, Antheus and Sergestus and brave Clonthus, with a few companions, whom the black hurricane had driven far over the sea and brought to other coasts. He was astounded, and Achates too felt thrilled by joy and fear, both of them longed to take their friends' hands, but uncertainty hampered them. So, in their cloudy mantle, they hid their eagerness, waiting to learn what luck these men had had, where on the coast they left their ships, and why they came. It seemed spokesmen for all the ships were now arriving, entering the hall, calling for leave to speak. When all were in, and full permission given to make their plea before the queen, their eldest, Ilioneus, with composure said, Your Majesty, granted by great Jupiter freedom to found your new town here and govern fighting tribes with justice, we poor Trojans, warned by winds on every sea, entreat you, keep away calamity of fire from our ships. Let a God-fearing people live, and look more closely at our troubles. Not to ravage Libyan hearths or turn with plunder seaward have we come, that force and that audacity are not for beaten men. There is a country called by the Greeks Hesperia, very old, potent in warfare and in wealth of earth, Enetrians farmed it, younger settlers now, the tale goes, call it by their chief's name, Italy. We laid our course for this. But stormy Orion and a high sea rising deflected us on shoals and drove us far, with winds against us, into whelming waters, unchanneled reefs. We kept afloat, we few, to reach your coast. What race of men is this? What primitive state could sanction this behavior? Even on beaches we are denied a landing, harried by outcry and attack, forbidden to set foot on the outskirts of your country. If you care nothing for humanity and merely mortal arms, respect the gods who are mindful of good actions and of evil. We had a king, Aeneas, none more just, more zealous, greater in warfare and in arms. If fate preserves him, if he does not yet lie spent amid the insensible shades but still takes nourishment of air, we need fear nothing, neither need you reap in of being first in courtesy, to outdo us. Sicily too has towns and ploughlands and a famous king of Trojan blood, Acestes. May we be permitted here to beach our damaged ships, hew timbers in your forest, cut new oars, and either sail again for Latium, happily, if we recover shipmates and our king, or else, if that security is lost, if Libyan waters hold you, Lord Aeneas, best of Trojans, hope of Iulus gone, we may at least cross over to Sicily from which we came, to homesteads ready there, and take Acestes for our king. Ilioneus finished, and all the sons of Dardanus murmured assent. Dido with eyes downcast replied in a brief speech, Cast off your fear, you Teucrians, put anxiety aside. Severe conditions and the kingdom's youth constrain me to these measures, to protect our long frontiers with guards. Who has not heard of the people of Aeneas, of Troy City, her valors and her heroes, and the fires of the great war? We are not so oblivious, we Phoenicians. The sun yokes his team within our range at Carthage. Whether you choose Hesperia Magna and the land of Saturn or Eryx in the west and King Acestes, I shall dispatch you safely with an escort, provision for my stores. Or would you care to join us in this realm on equal terms? The city I build is yours, haul up your ships, Trojan and Tyrian will be all one to me. If only he were here, your king himself, caught by the same easterly, Aeneas. Indeed, let me send out trustworthy men along the coast, with orders to comb it all from one end of Libya to the other in case the sea cast the man up and now he wanders lost, in town or wilderness. Elated at Dido's words, both staunch Achates and father Aeneas had by this time longed to break out of the cloud. Achates spoke with urgency, My lord, 
born to the goddess, what do you feel, what is your judgment now? You see all safe, our ships and friends recovered. One is lost, we saw that one go down ourselves, amid the waves. Everything else bears out your mother's own account of it. He barely finished when the cloud around them parted suddenly and thinned away into transparent air. Prince Aeneas stood and shone in the bright light, head and shoulders noble as a god's. For she who bore him breathed upon him beauty of hair and bloom of youth and kindled brilliance in his eyes, as an artist's hand gives style to ivory, or sets pure silver, or white stone of peros, in framing yellow gold. Then to the queen he spoke as suddenly as, to them all, he had just appeared, before your eyes I stand, Aeneas the Trojan, that same one you look for, saved from the sea off Libya. You alone, moved by the untold ordeals of old Troy, seeing as few whom the Greeks left alive, worn out by faring ill on land and sea, needy of everything, you'd give these few a home and city, allied with yourselves. Fit, thanks for this are not within our power, not to be had from Trojans anywhere dispersed in the great world. May the gods, and surely there are powers that care for goodness, surely somewhere justice counts, may they and your own consciousness of acting well reward you as they should. What age so happy brought you to birth? How splendid were your parents to have conceived a being like yourself? So long as brooks flow seaward, and the shadows play over mountain slopes, and highest heaven feeds the stars, your name and your distinction go with me, whatever lands may call me. With this he gave his right hand to his friend Ilioneus, greeting Serestus with his left, then took the hands of those brave men, Clonthus, Gius, and the rest. Sidonian Dido stood in astonishment, first at the sight of such a captain, then at his misfortune, presently saying, born of an immortal mother though you are, what adverse destiny dogs you through these many kinds of danger. What rough power brings you from sea to land in savage places? Are you truly he, Aeneas, whom kind Venus bore to the Dardanian, the young Anchises near to the stream of Phrygian Simois? I remember the Greek, Teucer, came to Sidon, exiled, and in search of a new kingdom. Belus, my father, helped him. In those days Belus campaigned with fire and sword on Cyprus and won that island's wealth. Since then, the fall of Troy, your name, and the Pelasgian kings have been familiar to me. Teucer, your enemy, spoke often with admiration of the Teucrians and traced his own descent from Teucrian stock. Come, then, soldiers, be our guests. My life was one of hardship and forced wandering like your own, till in this land at length fortune would have me rest. Through pain I've learned to comfort suffering men. She led Aeneas into the royal house, but not before declaring a festal day in the gods' temples. As for the ship's companies, she sent twenty bulls to the shore, a hundred swine, huge ones, with bristling backs, and fatted lambs, a hundred of them, and their mother ewes, all gifts for happy feasting on that day. Now the queen's household made her great hall glow as they prepared a banquet in the kitchens. Embroidered tablecloths, proud crimson dyed, were spread, and set with massive silver plate, or gold, engraved with brave deeds of her fathers, a sequence carried down through many captains in a long line from the founding of the race. Meanwhile paternal love would not allow Aeneas' mind to rest. He sent Achates on a quick mission to the ships, to tell Ascanius and bring him to the city, fond father, as always thoughtful of his son, and told Achates to fetch gifts as well, relics of Ilium, a robe stiff with figures worked in gold, and a veil woven round with yellow acanthus flowers, both adornments worn by Argive Helen when she sailed for Pergamum and her forbidden marriage, marvelous keepsakes of her mother, Leda. Along with these, a scepter Ilione, eldest of Priam's daughters, once had used, a collar hung with pearls, and a coronet doubled in gems and gold, given these orders, Achates lost no time seeking the ships. Our Lady of Cathera, however, pondered new interventions, a new strategy, that her young godling son, Desire, should take the face and figure of Ascanius, then come and use his gifts to make the queen infatuated, inflaming her with lust to the marrow of her bones. Venus no doubt lacked faith in the ambiguous royal house and Tyrion's double dealing, then, the spite of Juno vexed her. Her anxieties recurred as night came on. So she addressed him, Amor, god of caressing wings, my son, my strength, my greatest power, my one and only, making light of our high father's bolt, his giant killer. I must turn to you and beg the force of your divinity. You know how brother Aeneas has been tossed from one coast to another on the high seas by bitter Juno's hatred, you know this and in my grieving for him grieve as well. Now the Phoenician woman, Dido, has him, making him linger with her blandishments, and what may come of this Junonian welcome worries me seriously. Juno will act at such a crisis of affairs. Accordingly, what I propose is to ensnare the queen by guile beforehand, pin her down in passion, so she cannot be changed by any power but will be kept on my side by profound love of Aeneas. 
Take heed of our thought how you may do this. The boy prince, my greatest care in the world, must go now to the city, summoned by his father, taking gifts saved from the great sea and the fires of Troy. I'll drug him in his sleep, then hide him well high up in Kathira, or on Cyprus, over Idolium in my shrine. There is no way for him to learn this trick or interfere. You counterfeit his figure for one night, no more, and make the boy's known face your mask, so that when Dido takes you on her lap amid the banqueting and wine, enjoy, when she embraces you and kisses you, you'll breathe invisible fire into her and dupe her with your sorcery, Amor agreed with his fond mother's plan of action, put off his wings and gaily walked as Iulus. Venus in turn sent through Ascanius' body rills of slumber, caught him to her breast, and bore him to Adalia's aerial groves where beds of marjoram embraced him in soft bloom and breathing shade. Soon then the godling, doing as she wished, happily following where Achet led, carried the royal gifts to the Tyrians. He found the queen amid magnificence of tapestries, where she had placed herself in the very center, on a golden couch. Then Father Aeneas and the Trojan company came in to take their ease on crimson cloth. Houseboys filled their finger bowls and brought them bread in baskets, napkins nubbled smooth. In the great kitchen there were fifty maids to set the dishes out in a long line and tend the fires that shone for the hearth gods. A hundred others, and as many boys of the same age, loaded the boards with meat and placed the wine cups. Tyrians as well came crowding through the radiant doors, all bidden to take their ease on figured cushioning. There they admired Aeneas' gifts, admired Iulus with his godling's face aglow and simulated speech, then the great robe, the veil that yellow acanthus flowers edged. And more than anyone, the Phoenician queen, luckless, already given over to ruin, marveled and could not have enough, she burned with pleasure in the boy and in the gifts. After hugging Aeneas round the neck and clinging to him, answering the love of the deluded father, he sought the queen, and she with all her eyes and heart embraced him, fondling him at times upon her breast, oblivious of how great a god sat there to her undoing. Mindful of his mother, he had begun to make Sicaeus fade from Dido's memory bit by bit, and tried to waken with new love, a living love, her long-settled mind and dormant heart. After the first pause in the feast, and after trenchers were taken off, they put out wine bowls, grand and garlanded. A festive din now rose and echoed through the palace halls. Lighted lamps hung from the coffered ceiling rich with gold leaf, and torches with high flames prevailed over the night. And now the queen called for a vessel heavy with gems and gold that Belus and his line had always used. She filled it, dipping wine, and her long hall fell silent. Jupiter, she prayed, you make the laws for host and guest, they say. Grant that this day be one of joy for Tyrians and men of Troy, grant that it be remembered by our descendants. Now be with us, Bacchus, giver of happiness, and kindly Juno, and all you Tyrians attend in friendliness this meeting that unites us. At this she tilted a libation out and put the vessel lightly to her lips, then, with a jest, gave it to Bishes, who nearly immersed himself in brimming gold as he drank down the foaming wine. The bowl passed then to other lords. And Lord Iopus, with flowing hair, whom giant Atlas taught, made the room echo to his golden lyre. He sang the straying moon and toiling sun, the origin of mankind and the beasts, of rain and fire, the rainy hyad, Arcturus, the great bear and little bear, the reason winter suns are in such haste to dip in ocean, or what holds the nights endless in winter. Tyrians at this redoubled their applause, the Trojans followed. And Dido, fated queen, drew out the night with talk of various matters, while she drank long draughts of love. Often she asked of Priam, often of Hector, now of the armor Memnon, the son of Dawn, had worn, now of the team Diomedes drove, now of the huge Achilles. Come, rather, then she said, dear guest, and tell us from the beginning the Greek stratagems, the ruin of your town and your seafaring, as now the seventh summer brings you here from wandering all the lands and all the seas. Book 2. How they took the city. The room fell silent, and all eyes were on him, as Father Aeneas from his high couch began, sorrow too deep to tell, your majesty, you order me to feel and tell once more, how the Danaeans leveled in the dust the splendor of our mourned forever kingdom, heartbreaking things I saw with my own eyes and was myself a part of. Who could tell them, even a Myrmidon or Dolopian or Ruffian of Ulysses, without tears. Now, too, the night is well along, with dewfall out of heaven, and setting stars weigh down our heads toward sleep. But if so great desire moves you to hear the tale of our disasters, briefly recalled, the final throes of Troy, however I may shudder at the memory and shrink again in grief, let me begin. Knowing their strength broken in warfare, turned back by the fates, and years, so many years, already slipped away, the Danan captains by the divine handicraft of Pallas built a horse of timber, tall as a hill, and sheathed its ribs with planking of cut pine. This they gave out to be an offering for a safe return by sea, and the word went round. 
but on the sly they shut inside a company chosen from their pick soldiery by lot, crowding the vaulted caverns in the dark, the horse's belly, with men fully armed. Offshore there's a long island, Tenedos, famous and rich while Priam's kingdom lasted, a treacherous anchorage now, and nothing more. They crossed to this and hid their ships behind it on the bare shore beyond. We thought they'd gone, sailing home to Mycenae before the wind, so Teucer's town is freed of her long anguish, gates thrown wide. And out we go in joy to see the Dorian campsites, all deserted, the beach they left behind. Here the Dolopians pitched their tents, here cruel Achilles lodged, there lay the ships, and there, formed up in ranks, they came inland to fight us. Of our men one group stood marvelling, gaping up to see the dire gift of the cold unbedded goddess, the sheer mass of the horse. Thymides shouts it should be hauled inside the walls and moored high on the citadel, whether by treason or just because Troy's fate went that way now. Capus opposed him, so did the wiser heads, into the sea with it, they said, or burn it, build up a bonfire under it, this trick of the Greeks, a gift no one can trust, or cut it open, search the hollow belly. Contrary notions pulled the crowd apart. Next thing we knew, in front of everyone, Laocoon with a great company came furiously running from the height, and still far off cried out, Oh my poor people, men of Troy, what madness has come over you? Can you believe the enemy truly gone? A gift from the Danaeans, and no ruse? Is that Ulysses' way, as you have known him? Achaeans must be hiding in this timber, or it was built to butt against our walls, peer over them into our houses, pelt the city from the sky. Some crookedness is in this thing. Have no faith in the horse. Whatever it is, even when Greeks bring gifts I fear them, gifts and all. He broke off then and rifled his big spear with all his might against the horse's flank, the curve of belly. It stuck there trembling, and the rounded hull reverberated groaning at the blow. If the gods will had not been sinister, if our own minds had not been crazed, he would have made us foul that Argive den with bloody steel, and Troy would stand today, O citadel of Priam, towering still. But now look, Hillmen, shepherds of Dardania, raising a shout, dragged in before the king an unknown fellow with hands tied behind, this all as he himself had planned, volunteering, letting them come across him, so he could open Troy to the Achaeans. Sure of himself this man was, braced for it either way, to work his trick or die. From every quarter Trojans run to see him, ring the prisoner round, and make a game of jeering at him. Be instructed now in Greek deceptive arts, one barefaced deed can tell you of them all. As the man stood there, shaken and defenseless, looking around at ranks of Phrygians, O oh God, he said, what land on earth, what seas can take me in? What's left me in the end, outcast that I am from the Danaeans, now the Dardanians will have my blood. The whimpering speech brought us up short, we felt a twinge for him. Let him speak up, we said, tell us where he was born, what news he brought, what he could hope for as a prisoner. Taking his time, slow to discard his fright, he said, I'll tell you the whole truth, my lord, no matter what may come of it. Argive I am by birth, and will not say I'm not. That first of all, fortune has made a derelict of Sinon, but the bitch won't make an empty liar of him, too. Report of Polymedes may have reached you, scion of Belus Line, a famous man who gave commands against the war. For this, on a trumped-up charge, on perjured testimony, the Greeks put him to death, but now they mourn him, now he has lost the light. Being kin to him, in my first years I joined him as companion, sent by my poor old father on this campaign, and while he held high rank and influence in royal councils, we did well, with honor. Then by the guile and envy of Ulysses, nothing unheard of there, he left this world, and I lived on, but under a cloud, in sorrow, raging for my blameless friend's downfall. Demented, too, I could not hold my peace but said if I had luck, if I won through again to Argos, I'd avenge him there. And I roused hatred with my talk, I fell afoul now of that man. From that time on, day in, day out, Ulysses found new ways to bait and terrify me, putting out shady rumors among the troops, looking for weapons he could use against me. He could not rest till Kalkos served his turn, but why go on? The tale's unwelcome, useless, if Achaeans are all one, and it's enough I'm called Achaean, then exact the punishment, long overdue, the Ithacan desires it, the Atridae would pay well for it. Burning with curiosity, we questioned him, called on him to explain, unable to conceive such a performance, the art of the Pelasgian. He went on, a tremble, as though he feared us, many times the Danaeans wished to organize retreat, to leave Troy in the long war, tired out. If only they had done it. Heavy weather at sea closed down on them, or a fresh gale from the southwest would keep them from embarking, most of all after this figure here, this horse they put together with maple beams, reached its full height. Then wind and thunderstorms rumbled in heaven. 
So in our quandary we sent Eurypolis to Phoebus' oracle, and he brought back this grim reply, blood and a virgin slain you gave to appease the winds, for your first voyage Troyward, O Danians. Blood again and Argive blood, one life, wins your return. When this got round among the soldiers, gloom came over them, and a cold chill that ran to the very marrow. Who had death in store? Whom did Apollo call for? Now the man of Ithaca hailed Kalkas out among us in tumult, calling on the seer to tell the true will of the gods. Ah, there were many able to divine the crookedness and cruelty afoot for me, but they looked on in silence. For ten days the seer kept still, kept under cover, would not speak of anyone, or name a man for death, till driven to it at last by Ulysses' cries, by prearrangement, he broke silence, barely enough to designate me for the altar. Every last man agreed. The torments each had feared for himself, now shifted to another, all could endure. And the infamous day came, the ritual, the salted meal, the fillets. I broke free, I confess it, broke my chains, hid myself all night in a muddy marsh, concealed by reeds, waiting for them to sail if they were going to. Now no hope is left me of seeing my home country ever again, my sweet children, my father, missed for years. Perhaps the army will demand they pay for my escape, my crime here, and their death, poor things, will be my punishment. Ah, sir, I beg you by the gods above, the powers in whom truth lives, and by what faith remains uncontaminated to men, take pity on pain so great and so unmerited. For tears we gave him life, and pity, too. Priam himself ordered the jibs removed and the tight chain between. In kindness then he said to him, Whoever you may be, the Greeks are gone, forget them from now on, you shall be ours. And answer me these questions, who put this huge thing up, this horse? Who designed it? What do they want with it? Is it religious or a means of war? These were his questions. Then the captive, trained in trickery, in the stagecraft of Achaia, lifted his hands unfettered to the stars. Eternal fires of heaven, he began, powers inviolable, I swear by thee, as by the altars and blaspheming swords I got away from, and the gods' white bands I wore as one chosen for sacrifice, this is justice, I am justified in dropping all allegiance to the Greeks, as I had cause to hate them, I may bring into the open what they would keep dark. No laws of my own country bind me now. Only be sure you keep your promises and keep faith, Troy, as you are kept from harm if what I say proves true, if what I give is great and valuable. The whole hope of the Danaeans, and their confidence in the war they started, rested all along in help from Pallas. Then the night came when Diomedes and that criminal, Ulysses, dared to raid her holy shrine. They killed the guards on the high citadel and ripped away the statue, the palladium, desecrating with bloody hands the virginal chaplets of the goddess. After that, Danon hopes waned and were undermined, ebbing away, their strength in battle broken, the goddess now against them. This she made evident to them all with signs and portents. Just as they set her statue up in camp, the eyes, cast upward, glowed with crackling flames, and salty sweat ran down the body. Then, I say it in awe, three times, up from the ground, the apparition of the goddess rose in a lightning flash, with shield and spear tremble. Kalkos divined at once that the sea crossing must be attempted in retreat, that Pergamum cannot be torn apart by Argive swords unless at Argos first they beg new omens, carrying homeward the divine power brought overseas in ships. Now they are gone before the wind to the fatherland, Mycenae, gone to enlist new troops and gods. They'll cross the water again and be here, unforeseen. So Kalkos read the portents. Warned by him, they set this figure up in reparation for the palladium stolen, to appease the offended power and expiate the crime. Enormous, though, he made them build the thing with timber braces, towering to the sky, too big for the gates, not to be hauled inside and give the people back their ancient guardian. If any hand here violates this gift to great Minerva, then extinction waits, not for one only, would God it were so, but for the realm of Priam and all Phrygians. If this proud offering, drawn by your hands, should mount into your city, then so far as the walls of Pelops town the tide of Asia surges in war, that doom awaits our children. This fraud of Sinon, his accomplished lying, won us over, a tall tale and fake tears had captured us, whom neither Diomedes nor Laracy and Achilles overpowered, nor ten long years, nor all their thousand ships. And now another sign, more fearful still, broke on our blind miserable people, filling us all with dread. Laocoon, acting as Neptune's priest that day by lot, was on the point of putting to the knife a massive bull before the appointed altar, when ah, look there. From Tenedos, on the calm sea, twin snakes, I shiver to recall it, endlessly coiling, uncoiling, swam abreast for shore, their underbellies showing as their crests reared red as blood above the swell, behind they glided with great undulating backs. 
Now came the sound of thrashed seawater foaming. Now they were on dry land, and we could see their burning eyes, fiery and suffused with blood, their tongues a flicker out of hissing maws. We scattered, pale with fright. But straight ahead they slid until they reached Laocoon. Each snake enveloped one of his two boys, twining about and feeding on the body. Next they ensnared the man as he ran up with weapons, coils like cables looped and bound him twice round the middle, twice about his throat they whipped their back scales, and their heads towered, while with both hands he fought to break the knots, drenched in slime, his headbands black with venom, sending to heaven his appalling cries like a slashed bull escaping from an altar, the fumbled axe shrugged off. The pair of snakes now flowed away and made for the highest shrines, the citadel of pitiless Minerva, where coiling they took cover at her feet under the rondure of her shield. New terrors ran in the shaken crowd, the word went round Laocoon had paid, and rightfully, for profanation of the sacred hulk with his offending spear hurled at its flank. The offering must be hauled to its true home, they clamored. Votive prayers to the goddess must be said there. So we breached the walls and laid the city open. Everyone pitched in to get the figure underpinned with rollers, hemp and lines around the neck. Deadly, pregnant with enemies, the horse crawled upward to the breach. And boys and girls sang hymns around the tow rope as for joy they touched it. Rolling on, it cast a shadow over the city's heart. O oh fatherland, O oh Ilium, home of gods. Defensive wall renowned in war for Dardanus's people. There on the very threshold of the breach it jarred to a halt four times, four times the arms and the belly thrown together made a sound, yet on we strove unmindful, deaf and blind, to place the monster on our blessed height. Then, even then, Cassandra's lips unsealed the doom to come, lips by a god's command never believed or heeded by the Trojans. So pitiably we, for whom that day would be the last, made all our temples green with leafy festal boughs throughout the city. As heaven turned, night from the ocean stream came on, profound in gloom on earth and sky and myrmidons in hiding. In their homes the Teucrians lay silent, wearied out, and sleep enfolded them. The Argive fleet, drawn up in line abreast, left Tenedos through the aloof moon's friendly stillnesses and made for the familiar shore. Flame signals shone from the command ship. Sinon, favored by what the gods unjustly had decreed, stole out to tap the pine walls and set free the Danians in the belly. Opened wide, the horse emitted men, gladly they dropped out of the cavern, captains first, Thesandrus, Sthenelus and the man of iron, Ulysses, hand over hand upon the rope, Acamas, Toas, Neoptolemus, and Prince Machaean, Menelaus and then the master builder, Ipios, who designed the horse decoy. Into the darkened city, buried deep in sleep and wine, they made their way, cut the few sentries down, let in their fellow soldiers at the gate, and joined their combat companies as planned. That time of night it was when the first sleep, gift of the gods, begins for ill mankind, arriving gradually, delicious rest. In sleep, in dream, Hector appeared to me, gaunt with sorrow, streaming tears, all torn, as by the violent car on his death day, and black with bloody dust, his puffed out feet cut by the rawhide thongs. Ah God, the look of him! How changed from that proud Hector who returned to Troy wearing Achilles' armor, or that one who pitched the torches on Danon ships, his beard all filth, his hair matted with blood, showing the wounds, the many wounds, received outside his father's city walls. I seemed myself to weep and call upon the man in grieving speech, brought from the depth of me, light of Dardania, best hope of Troy, what kept you from us for so long, and where? From what far place, O oh Hector, have you come, long, long awaited? After so many deaths of friends and brothers, after a world of pain for all our folk and all our town, at last, bone-weary, we behold you. What has happened to ravage your serene face? Why these wounds? He wasted no reply on my poor questions but heaved a great sigh from his chest and said, I. Give up and go, child of the goddess, save yourself, out of these flames. The enemy holds the city walls, and from her height Troy falls in ruin. Fatherland and Priam have their due, if by one hand our towers could be defended, by this hand, my own, they would have been. Her holy things, her gods of hearth and household Troy commends to you. Accept them as companions of your days, go find for them the great walls that one day you'll dedicate, when you have roamed the sea. As he said this, he brought out from the sanctuary chaplets and Vesta, lady of the hearth, with her eternal fire. While I dreamed, the turmoil rose, with anguish, in the city. More and more, although Anchises' house lay in seclusion, muffled among trees, the din at the grim onset grew, and now I shook off sleep, I climbed to the rooftop to cup my ears and listen. And the sound was like the sound a grass fire makes in grain, whipped by a south wind, or a torrent foaming out of a mountainside to strew in ruined fields, happy crops, the yield of ploughing teams, or woodlands borne off in the flood, 
In wonder the shepherd listens on a rocky peak. I knew then what our trust had won for us, knew the Danon fraud, Deiphobus' great house in flames, already caving in under the overpowering god of fire, Ucalagon's already caught nearby, the glare lighting the straits beyond Siam, the cries of men, the wild calls of the trumpets. To arm was my first maddened impulse, not that anyone had a fighting chance in arms, only I burned to gather up some force for combat, and to man some high redoubt. So fury drove me, and it came to me that meeting death was beautiful in arms. Then here, eluding the Achaean spears, came Panthus, Othrus' son, priest of Apollo, carrying holy things, our conquered gods, and pulling a small grandchild along, he ran despairing to my doorway. Where's the crux, Panthus, I said. What strong point shall we hold? Before I could say more, he groaned and answered, the last day for Dardania has come, the hour not to be fought off any longer. Trojans we have been, Ilium has been, the glory of the Teucrians is no more, black Jupiter has passed it on to Argos. Greeks are the masters in our burning city. Tall as a cliff, set in the heart of town, their horse pours out armed men. The conqueror, gloating Sinon, brews new conflagrations. Troops hold the gates, as many thousand men as ever came from great Mycenae, others block the lanes with cross spears, glittering in a combat line, sword blades are drawn for slaughter. Even the first guards at the gates can barely offer battle, or blindly make a stand. Impelled by these words, by the powers of heaven, into the flames I go, into the fight, where the harsh fury, and the din and shouting, skyward rising, calls. Crossing my path in moonlight, five fell in with me, companions, Riphius, and Eptus, a great soldier, Hyponis, Demas, cleaving to my side with young Caribus, Migdon's son. It happened that in those very days this man had come to Troy, aflame with passion for Cassandra, bringing to Priam and the Phrygians a son-in-law's right hand. Unlucky one, to have been deaf to what his bride foretold. Now when I saw them grouped, on edge for battle, I took it all in and said briefly, Soldiers, brave as you are to no end, if you crave to face the last fight with me, and no doubt of it, how matters stand for us each one can see. The gods by whom this kingdom stood are gone, gone from the shrines and altars. You defend a city lost in flames. Come, let us die, we'll make a rush into the thick of it. The conquered have won safety, hope for none. The desperate odds doubled their fighting spirit, from that time on, like predatory wolves in fog and darkness, when a savage hunger drives them blindly on, and cubs in lairs lie waiting with dry famished jaws, just so through arrow flights and enemies we ran toward our sure death, straight for the city's heart, cavernous black night over and around us. Who can describe the havoc of that night or tell the deaths, or tally wounds with tears? The ancient city falls, after dominion many long years. In wind drows on the streets, in homes, on solemn porches of the gods, dead bodies lie. And not alone the Trojans pay the price with their heart's blood, at times manhood returns to fire even the conquered and non-conquerors fall. Grief everywhere, everywhere terror, and all shapes of death. Andragios was the first to cross our path leading a crowd of Greeks, he took for granted that we were friends, and hailed us cheerfully, men, get a move on. Are you made of lead to be so late and slow? The rest are busy carrying plunder from the fires and towers. Are you just landed from the ships? His words were barely out, and no reply forthcoming credible to him, when he knew himself fallen among enemies. Thunderstruck, he halted, foot and voice, and then recoiled like one who steps down on a lurking snake in a briar patch and jerks back, terrified, as the angry thing rears up, all puffed and blue. So backward went Androgios in panic. We were all over them in a moment, cut and thrust, and as they fought on unknown ground, startled, unnerved, we killed them everywhere. So fortune filled our sails at first. Caribus, elated at our feet in his own courage, said, Friends, come follow fortune. She has shown the way to safety, shown she's on our side. We'll take their shields and put on their insignia. Trickery, bravery, who asks, in war. The enemy will arm us. He put on the plumed helm of Andragios, took the shield with blazon and the Greek sword to his side. Riphius, Demas, all were pleased to do it, making the still fresh trophies our equipment. Then we went on, passing among the Greeks, protected by our own gods now no longer, many a combat, hand to hand, we fought in the black night, and many a Greek we sent to Orcus. There were some who turned and ran back to the ships and shore, some shamefully clambered again into the horse, to hide in the familiar paunch. When gods are contrary they stand by no one. Here before us came Cassandra, Priam's virgin daughter, dragged by her long hair out of Minerva's shrine, lifting her brilliant eyes in vain to heaven, her eyes alone, as her white hands were bound. Caribus, infuriated, could not bear it, but plunged into the midst to find his death. 
we all went after him, our swords at play, but here, here first, from the temple gable's height, we met a hail of missiles from our friends, pitiful execution, by their error, who thought us Greek from our Greek plumes and shields. Then with a groan of anger, seeing the virgin rested from them, Danaeans from all sides rallied and attacked us, fiery Ajax, Atreus' sons, Dolopians in a mass, as, when a cyclone breaks, conflicting winds will come together, west wind, south wind, east wind riding high out of the dawnland, forests bend and roar, and raging all in spume near use with his trident churns the deep. Then some whom we had taken by surprise under cover of night throughout the city and driven off, came back again, they knew our shields and arms for liars now, our speech alien to their own. They overwhelmed us. Caribus fell at the warrior goddess altar, killed by Penelius, and Riphius fell, a man uniquely just among the Trojans, the soul of equity, but the gods would have it differently. Hyponis, Demas died, shot down by friends, nor did your piety, Panthus, nor Apollo's fillet shield you as you went down. Ashes of Ilium. Flames that consumed my people. Here I swear that in your downfall I did not avoid one weapon, one exchange with the Danaeans, and if it had been fated, my own hand had earned my death. But we were torn away from that place, Iphitus and Pelas too, one slow with age, one wounded by Ulysses, called by a clamor at the hall of Priam. Truly we found here a prodigious fight, as though there were none elsewhere, not a death in the whole city, Mars gone berserk, Danaeans in a rush to scale the roof, the gate besieged by a tortoise shell of overlapping shields. Ladders clung to the wall, and men strove upward before the very doorposts, on the rungs, left hand putting the shield up, and the right reaching for the cornice. The defenders wrenched out upper works and rooftals, these for missiles, as they saw the end, preparing to fight back even on the edge of death. And gilded beams, ancestral ornaments, they rolled down on the heads below. In hall others with swords drawn held the entranceway, packed there, waiting. Now we plucked up heart to help the royal house, to give our men a respite, and to add our strength to theirs, though all were beaten. And we had for entrance a rear door, secret, giving on a passage between the palace halls, in other days Andromache, poor lady, often used it, going alone to see her husband's parents or taking a styanox to his grandfather. I climbed high on the roof, where hopeless men were picking up and throwing feudal missiles. Here was a tower like a promontory rising toward the stars above the roof, all Troy, the Danon ships, the Achean camp, were visible from this. Now close beside it with crowbars, where the flooring made loose joints, we pried it from its bed and pushed it over. Down with a rending crash in sudden ruin wide over the Danon lines it fell, but fresh troops moved up, and the rain of stones with every kind of missile never ceased. Just at the outer doors of the vestibule sprang Pyrrhus, all in bronze and glittering, as a serpent, hidden swollen underground by a cold winter, writhes into the light, on vile grass fed, his old skin cast away, renewed and glossy, rolling slippery coils, with lifted underbelly rearing sunward and triple tongue a flicker. Close beside him giant Periphus and Automedon, his armor-bearer, once Achilles' driver, besieged the place with all the young of Skiros, hurling their torches at the palace roof. Pyrrhus shouldering forward with an axe broke down the stony threshold, forced apart hinges and brazen door jams, and chopped through one panel of the door, splitting the oak, to make a window, a great breach. And there before their eyes the inner halls lay open, the courts of Priam and the ancient kings, with men-at-arms ranked in the vestibule. From the interior came sounds of weeping, pitiful commotion, wails of women high-pitched, rising in the formal chambers to ring against the silent golden stars, and, through the palace, mothers wild with fright ran to and fro or clung to doors and kissed them. Pyrrhus with his father's bronze stormed on, no bolts or bars or men availed to stop him, under his battering the double doors were torn out of their sockets and fell inward. Sheer force cleared the way, the Greeks broke through into the vestibule, cut down the guards, and made the wide hall seethe with men-at-arms, a tumult greater than when dikes are burst in a foaming river, swirling out in flood, whelms every parapet and races on through fields and over all the lowland plains, bearing off pens and cattle. I myself saw Neoptolemus furious with blood in the entranceway, and saw the two Atridae, Hecuba I saw, and her hundred daughters, Priam before the altars, with his blood drenching the fires that he himself had blessed. Those fifty bridal chambers, hope of a line so flourishing, those doorways high and proud, adorned with takings of barbaric gold, were all brought low, fire had them, or the Greeks. What was the fate of Priam, you may ask? Seeing his city captive, seeing his own royal portals rent apart, his enemies in the inner rooms, the old man uselessly put on his shoulders, shaking with old age, armor unused for years, belted a sword on, and made for the masked enemy to die. Under the open sky in a central court stood a big altar, near it, a laurel tree of great age, leaning over, 
In deep shade embowered the Penates. At this altar Hecuba and her daughters, like white doves blown down in a black storm, clung together, enfolding holy images in their arms. Now, seeing Priam in a young man's gear, she called out, My poor husband, what mad thought drove you to buckle on these weapons? Where are you trying to go? The time is past for help like this, for this kind of defending, even if my own Hector could be here. Come to me now, the altar will protect us, or else you'll die with us. She drew him close, heavy with years, and made a place for him to rest on the consecrated stone. Now see Polites, one of Priam's sons, escaped from purest butchery and on the run through enemies and spears, down colonnades, through empty courtyards, wounded. Close behind comes Pyrrhus burning for the death stroke, has him, catches him now, and lunges with the spear. The boy has reached his parents, and before them goes down, pouring out his life with blood. Now Priam, in the very midst of death, would neither hold his peace nor spare his anger. For what you've done, for what you've dared, he said, if there is care in heaven for atrocity, may the gods render fitting, thanks, reward you as you deserve. You forced me to look on at the destruction of my son, defiled a father's eyes with death. That great Achilles you claim to be the son of, and you lie, was not like you to Priam, his enemy, to me who threw myself upon his mercy he showed compunction, gave me back for burial the bloodless corpse of Hector, and returned me to my own realm. The old man threw his spear with feeble impact, blocked by the ringing bronze, it hung there harmless from the jutting boss. Then Pyrrhus answered, You'll report the news to Pelides, my father, don't forget my sad behavior, the degeneracy of Neoptolemus. Now die. With this, to the altar step itself he dragged him trembling, slipping in the pooled blood of his son, and took him by the hair with his left hand. The sword flashed in his right, up to the hilt he thrust it in his body. That was the end of Priam's age, the doom that took him off, with Troy in flames before his eyes, his towers headlong fallen, he that in other days had ruled and pride so many lands and peoples, the power of Asia. On the distant shore the vast trunk headless lies without a name. For the first time that night, inhuman shuddering took me, head to foot. I stood unmanned, and my dear father's image came to mind as our king, just his age, mortally wounded, gasped his life away before my eyes. Creusa came to mind, too, left alone, the house plundered, danger to little Iulus. I looked around to take stock of my men, but all had left me, utterly played out, giving their beaten bodies to the fire or plunging from the roof. It came to this, that I stood there alone. And then I saw lurking beyond the doorsill of the Vesta, in hiding, silent, in that place reserved, the daughter of Tyndarius. Glare of fires lighted my steps this way and that, my eyes glancing over the whole scene, everywhere. That woman, terrified of the Trojans' hate for the city overthrown, terrified too of Danon vengeance, her abandoned husband's anger after years, Helen, that fury both to her own homeland and Troy, had gone to earth, a hated thing, before the altars. Now fires blazed up in my own spirit, a passion to avenge my fallen town and punish Helen's whorishness. Shall this one look untouched on Sparta and Mycenae after her triumph, going like a queen, and see her home and husband, kin and children, with Trojan girls for escort, Phrygian slaves? Must Priam perish by the sword for this? Troy burn, for this? Dardania's literal be soaked in blood, so many times, for this? Not by my leave. I know no glory comes of punishing a woman, the feet can bring no honor. Still, I'll be approved for snuffing out a monstrous life, for a just sentence carried out. My heart will teem with joy in this avenging fire, and the ashes of my kin will be appeased. So ran my thoughts. I turned wildly upon her, but at that moment, clear, before my eyes, never before so clear, in a pure light stepping before me, radiant through the night, my loving mother came, immortal, tall, and lovely as the lords of heaven know her. Catching me by the hand, she held me back, then with her rose-red mouth reproved me, Son, why let such suffering goad you on to fury past control? Where is your thoughtfulness for me, for us? Will you not first revisit the place you left your father, worn and old, or find out if your wife, Creusa, lives, and the young boy, Ascanius, all these cut off by Greek troops foraging everywhere. Had I not cared for them, fire would by now have taken them, their blood glutted the sword. You must not hold the woman of Laconia, that hated face, the cause of this, nor Paris. The harsh will of the gods it is, the gods, that overthrows the splendor of this place and brings Troy from her height into the dust. Look over there, I'll tear away the cloud that curtains you, and films your mortal sight, the fog around you, have no fear of doing your mother's will, or balk at obeying her, look, where you see high masonry thrown down, stone torn from stone, with billowing smoke and dust, Neptune is shaking from their beds the walls that his great trident pried up, 
undermining, toppling the whole city down. And look, Juno in all her savagery holds the sea and gates, and raging in steel armor calls her allied army from the ships. Up on the citadel, turn, look, Pallas Tritonia couched in a storm cloud, lightning, with her gorgon. The father himself empowers the Danaeans, urges assaulting gods on the defenders. Away, child, put an end to toiling so. I shall be near, to see you safely home. She hid herself in the deep gloom of night, and now the dire forms appeared to me of great immortals, enemies of Troy. I knew the end then, Ilium was going down in fire, the Troy of Neptune going down, as in high mountains when the countrymen have notched an ancient ash, then make their axes ring with might and main, chopping away to fell the tree, ever on the point of falling, shaken through all its foliage, and the treetop nodding, bit by bit the strokes prevail until it gives a final groan at last and crashes down in ruin from the height. Now I descended where the goddess guided, clear of the flames, and clear of enemies, for both retired, so gained my father's door, my ancient home. I looked for him at once, my first wish being to help him to the mountains, but with Troy gone he set his face against it, not to prolong his life, or suffer exile. The rest of you, all in your prime, he said make your escape, you are still hale and strong. If heaven's lords had wished me a longer span they would have saved this home for me. I call it more than enough that once before I saw my city taken and wrecked, and went on living. Here is my death bed, here. Take leave of me. Depart now. I'll find death with my sword arm. The enemy will oblige, they'll come for spoils. Burial can be dispensed with. All these years I've lingered in my impotence, at odds with heaven, since the father of gods and men breathed high winds of thunderbolt upon me and touched me with his fire. He spoke on in the same vein, inflexible. The rest of us, Creusa and Ascanius and the servants, begged him in tears not to pull down with him our lives as well, adding his own dead weight to the fate's pressure. But he would not budge, he held to his resolve and to his chair. I felt swept off again to fight, in misery longing for death. What choices now were open, what chance had I? Did you suppose, my father, that I could tear myself away and leave you? Unthinkable, how could a father say it? Now if it please the powers above that nothing stand of this great city, if your heart is set on adding your own death and ours to that of Troy, the door's wide open for it, Pyrrhus will be here, splashed with Priam's blood, he kills the son before his father's eyes, the father at the altars. My dear mother, was it for this, through spears and fire, you brought me, to see the enemy deep in my house, to see my son, Ascanius, my father, and near them both, Creusa, butchered in one another's blood? My gear, men, bring my gear. The last light calls the conquered. Give me back to the Greeks. Let me take up the combat once again. We shall not all die this day unavenged. I buckled on sword belt and blade and slid my left forearm into the shield strap, turning to go out, but at the door Creusa hugged my knees, then held up little Iulus to his father. If you are going out to die, take us to face the whole thing with you. If experience leads you to put some hope in weaponry such as you now take, guard your own house here. When you have gone, to whom is Iulus left? Your father? Wife? One called that long ago. She went on, and her wailing filled the house, but then a sudden portent came, a marvel, amid his parents' hands and their sad faces a point on Iulus' head seemed to cast light, a tongue of flame that touched but did not burn him, licking his fine hair, playing round his temples. We, in panic, beat at the flaming hair and put the sacred fire out with water, Father Anchises lifted his eyes to heaven and lifted up his hands, his voice, in joy, omnipotent Jupiter, if prayers affect you, look down upon us, that is all I ask, if by devotion to the gods we earn it, grant us a new sign, and confirm this portent. The old man barely finished when it thundered a loud crack on the left. Out of the sky through depths of night a star fell trailing flame and glided on, turning the night to day. We watched it pass above the roof and go to hide its glare, its trace, in Ida's wood, but still, behind, the luminous furrow shone and wide zones fumed with sulphur. Now indeed my father, overcome, addressed the gods, and rose in worship of the blessed star. Now, now, no more delay. I'll follow you. Where you conduct me, there I'll be. Gods of my fathers, preserve this house, preserve my grandson. Yours this portent was. Troy's life is in your power. I yield. I go as your companion, son. Then he was still. We heard the blazing town crackle more loudly, felt the scorching heat. Then come, dear father. Arms around my neck, I'll take you on my shoulders, no great weight. Whatever happens, both will face one danger, find one safety. Iulus will come with me, my wife at a good interval behind. Servants, 
Give your attention to what I say. At the gate inland there's a funeral mound and an old shrine of Ceres the bereft, near it an ancient cypress, kept alive for many years by our father's piety. By various routes we'll come to that one place. Father, carry our hearth gods, our Penates. It would be wrong for me to handle them, just come from such hard fighting, bloody work, until I wash myself in running water. When I had said this, over my breadth of shoulder and bent neck, I spread out a lion skin for tawny cloak and stooped to take his weight. Then little Iulus put his hand in mine and came with shorter steps beside his father. My wife fell in behind. Through shadowed places on we went, and I, lately unmoved by any spears thrown, any squads of Greeks, felt terror now at every eddy of wind, alarm at every sound, alert and worried alike for my companion and my burden. I had got near the gate, and now I thought we had made it all the way, when suddenly a noise of running feet came near at hand, and peering through the gloom ahead, my father cried out, Run, boy, here they come. I see flame light on shields, bronze shining. I took fright, and some unfriendly power, I know not what, stole all my addled wits, for as I turned aside from the known way, entering a maze of pathless places on the run, alas, Creusa, taken from us by grim fate, did she linger, or stray, or sink in weariness. There is no telling. Never would she be restored to us. Never did I look back or think to look for her, lost as she was, until we reached the funeral mound and shrine of venerable Ceres. Here at last all came together, but she was not there, she alone failed her friends, her child, her husband. Out of my mind, whom did I not accuse, what man or god? What crueler loss had I beheld, that night the city fell. Ascanius, my father, and the Teucrian Penates, I left in my friend's charge, and hid them well in a hollow valley. I turned back alone into the city, cinching my bright harness. Nothing for it but to run the risks again, go back again, comb all of Troy, and put my life in danger as before, first by the town wall, then the gate, all gloom, through which I had come out, and so on backward, tracing my own footsteps through the night, and everywhere my heart misgave me, even stillness had its terror. Then to our house, thinking she might, just might, have wandered there. Danaeans had got in and filled the place, and at that instant fire they had set, consuming it, went roofward in a blast, flames leapt and seethed in heat to the night sky. I pressed on, to see Priam's hall and tower. In the bare colonnades of Juno's shrine two chosen guards, Phoenix and hard Ulysses, kept watch over the plunder. Piled up here were treasures of old Troy from every quarter, torn out of burning temples, altar tables, robes, and golden bowls. Drawn up around them, boys and frightened mothers stood in line. I even dared to call out in the night, I filled the streets with calling, in my grief time after time I groaned and called Creusa, frantic, in endless quest from door to door. Then to my vision her sad wraith appeared, Creusa's ghost, larger than life, before me. Chill to the marrow, I could feel the hair on my head rise, the voice clot in my throat, but she spoke out to ease me of my fear, what's to be gained by giving way to grief so madly, my sweet husband? Nothing here has come to pass except as heaven willed. You may not take Creusa with you now, it was not so ordained, nor does the lord of high Olympus give you leave. For you long exile waits, and long sea miles to plough. You shall make landfall on Hesperia where Lydian Tiber flows, with gentle pace, between rich farmlands, and the years will bear glad peace, a kingdom, and a queen for you. Dismiss these tears for your beloved Creusa. I shall not see the proud homelands of Myrmidons or of Dolopians, or go to serve Greek ladies, Dardan lady that I am and daughter-in-law of Venus the Divine. No, the great mother of the gods detains me here on these shores. Farewell now, cherish still your son and mine. With this she left me weeping wishing that I could say so many things, and faded on the tenuous air. Three times I tried to put my arms around her neck, three times enfolded nothing, as the wraith slipped through my fingers, bodiless as wind, or like a flitting dream. So in the end as night waned I rejoined my company. And there to my astonishment I found new refugees in a great crowd, men and women gathered for exile, young, pitiful people coming from every quarter, minds made up, with their belongings, for whatever lands I'd lead them to by sea. The morning star now rose on Ida's ridges, bringing day. Greeks had secured the city gates. No help or hope of help existed. So I resigned myself, picked up my father, and turned my face toward the mountain range. Book 3. Sea Wanderings and Strange Meetings. Now our high masters had seen fit to visit upon the Asian power of Priam's house unmerited ruin, and the sea god's town, proud Ilium, lay smoking on the earth, our minds were turned by auguries of heaven to exile in far quarters of the world. By Antander, below Ida's hills, we toiled to build a fleet, though none could say where fate would take or settle us. 
Then we held muster of all our able-bodied men. When summer had just begun, Anchises gave the word to hoist sail to the winds of destiny. Weeping, I drew away from our old country, our quiet harbors, and the coastal plain where Troy had been, I took to the open sea, borne outward into exile with my people, my son, my hearth gods, and the greater gods. Beyond that water lies the land of Mars, great plains ploughed by the men of Thrace, and ruled in ancient days by cruel Lycurgus. Guesthood and common household gods had bound this realm to Troy while fortune held. Now making landfall under the south wind there, I plotted out on that curved shore the walls of a colony, though fate opposed it, and I devised the name Aeneity for the people, for my own. As I made offering to Dione's daughter, my divine mother, and to other gods who give protection to a work begun, I readied for the knife, there by the sea, a sleek bull to the overlord of heaven. Now as it happened the ground rose nearby in a low hummock, overgrown with cornel and myrtle saplings flickering in a thicket. I stepped over, trying to tear away green stuff out of the mound to make a roof of boughs and leaves over the altar. There I had sight of a gruesome prodigy beyond description, when the first stalk came torn out of the earth, and the root network burst, dark blood dripped down to soak and foul the soil. Shuddering took me, my heart's blood ran slow and chill with fear. But once more I went forward and fought to pull another stubborn shoot, to find what cause lay hid there, and again dark crimson blood ran out of the ripped bark. My spirit strove hard, I paid reverence to nymphs of the wild woods and Father Mars, guardian of Thrace, that they might make this vision turn to good, and lift away the omen. Then I doubled my effort, a third time wrenched at a green shoot, grappling on my knees against the sandy ground. Should I tell this or hold my peace? A groan came from the mound, a sobbing muffled in the depth of earth, and words were carried upward, Must you rend me, derelict that I am, Aeneas? Spare me, now I am in the grave, spare your clean hands defilement. I am no foreigner, old Troy gave birth to me, this blood drips from no tree. Ah, put the savage land behind you. Leave this shore of greed. For I am Polydorus. An iron hedge of spears covered my body, pinned down here, and the pointed shafts took root. At this be sure that in a maze of dread I stopped appalled, my hair stood up, my voice choked in my throat. This man, this Polydorus, ill-starred Priam had sent some years before in secret, with great weight of gold, to be maintained by the Thracian king. That was a time when Priam's trust in Dardan arms had faltered as he saw Ilium ringed in siege. The Thracian, after the shattering of Trojan power, after fortune had left us, threw in his lot with Agamemnon's cause and winning arms, broke every pact and oath, killed Polydorus, and took the gold by force. To what extremes will you not drive the hearts of men, a cursed hunger for gold? When faintness of dread left me, I brought before the leaders of the people, my father first, these portents of the gods and asked their judgment. All were of one mind, we should withdraw from that earth stained with blood, with guesthood so profaned, and give our ships the winds and sea again. For Polydorus therefore we held a funeral, on his grave we heaped up earth, and altars to the dead were decked with night blue bands and cypress gloom, round which our women mourned with hair unbound. We brought up foaming bowls of milk, with shallow cups of consecrated blood to pour, and put to rest the spirit in the tomb, giving the last loud cry. When seas offshore looked promising and smiled back at the wind, a halyard snapping land breeze calling seaward, our men crowded the beaches, launched the ships, and out we sailed as shorelines fell behind. Midsea a holy island lies, most dear to Aegean Neptune and the Nereid's mother. Once in its course afloat from coast to coast the filial archer god had tied it up to Mykonos, the sea mark, and to Gyrus, enabling it at rest to scorn the winds. Here we put in, and the serene island haven welcomed our tired men. We went ashore in pilgrimage to Apollo's town. King Aeneas, both king of Delians and priest of Phoebus, garlanded in snowy wool and laurel, came to meet us, greeting his old friend, Anchises. We joined hands, then at his side entered the temple of the god. I paid my homage to that shrine of ancient stone, praying, O god of Thymbra, grant a home and walls to weary men, grant us posterity and an abiding city, guard our second tower of Troy, this remnant left alive by Danon's swords and pitiless Achilles. Whom should we follow? Or by what sea way dost thou direct us? Where may we settle now? Father, grant us a sign, enter our hearts. These words were barely uttered, when it seemed of a sudden everything shook, dorsals and laurel, the whole ridge round us quaking, and the cauldron sang low from the sanctum, now thrown open. We pitched down prone, and a voice rang in our ears, tough sons of Dardanus, the selfsame land that bore you from your primal parent stock will take you to her fertile breast again. Look for your mother of old. Aeneas' house and her will rule the world's shores down the years, through generations of his children's children. So rang the god's voice. 
Then our voices rose in tumult, jubilant, but everyone inquired what and where that place could be to which the gods summon us wanderers and called it a return. Soon then my father, calling up memories of ancient men, spoke out, Sirs, listen to me and be clear as to your hopes. Midsea great Jove's great island, Crete, lies southward. There's Mount Ida, there the cradle of our people. Cretans hold one hundred cities, fertile and wide domains. From there, if I recall it well, our first forefather, Teucris, sailed to the coast around Point Retium and chose it for his kingdom. As yet no Ilium stood, no citadel, the settlers lived in lowlands, river valleys. There was the origin of Mount Cybele's mother goddess, with her Corybont's brazen ringing cups, her grove on Ida, there were her mysteries, devoutly kept, and the yoked lions of Our Lady's car. Come then, we'll follow where the gods command, court favor of the winds, and lay our course for Nasa's country, no long sail, let Jupiter fill our canvas and we beach on Crete at sunrise the third day. His counsel given, he slaughtered ritual beasts upon the altars, a bull to Neptune and a bull to thee, comely Apollo, to the god of storm a black ram, and a white one to the zephyrs. Rumor now flew about that Crete's great captain, Idomeneus, had left his father's kingdom, driven away, so there were lands abandoned, free of our enemies, and homes on Crete awaiting settlers. Up from Ortigia's cove we spread our wings to fly over the sea, past Naxos and the Menad heights, then past Donus's greenery, Oleros, and snow-white rifts of Paros, all the Cyclades that stud that reach of sea. We sailed along through channels between shore on foaming shore, as men vied at ship handling, shouting out and cheering one another, on to Crete. On to our ancestors. And from astern the wind blew, freshening, to chase us on. At last we ran into the ancient land of the Curetes. I could barely wait to build our hope for city walls, to be called Pergamum, I said. I urged the people, who loved the name, to love their newfound hearths and raise a citadel above the town. Our ships were not long cradled on dry land, our men not long engaged in marriages or sowing the new fields, while I gave out homesteads and laws, when, without warning, plague, out of infected air to sap our bodies came on us pitiable to see, and came to blight our trees and crops, a year of death. People relinquished their sweet lives or dragged their wasted bodies on, the dog star burned our green plantations barren, and our grassland withered, sickly stalks denied us food. Again to Delos Oracle and Phoebus' father pressed me, back on our sea track, to beg again the favor of the god, what end would he afford our weariness? Where might we turn for help, where set our course? Night deepened, sleep on earth held living things, but now the sacred images of the gods, the Phrygian hearth gods I had brought with me from Troy, out of the fire, seemed to stand before me where I lay in sleep. I saw them plain in the pure light cast by the full moon edging its way into unshuttered windows. Then it seemed they spoke to comfort me with these words, all Apollo would have told you, Delos regained, he will deliver here. See how he sends us here of his own will into your room. We are the gods who came along with you, and joined your cause, when Troy went down in flames, we are the gods who crossed the deep sea swell in ships at your command, and we are those who will exalt your sons to starry heaven and give your town dominion. You must prepare great walls for a great race. Keep up the long toil of your flight. Your settlement must be changed. This coast is not the one Apollo of Delos urged you toward, nor did he bid you stay on Crete. There is a country, Hesperia, as the Greeks have named it, ancient, full of manpower in war and fruitful earth, Enetrians lived there once, then by report new generations called it Italy after their leader. Our true home is there, Dardanus came from there, and Iasia's forefathers of our people. Up with you, be glad, and tell your father full of years what has been said here, with no room for doubt. Look for Carethus and Ausonian country, lands under dicta Jupiter denies you. Breathless with awe at these appearances, at the divine voice, and all this no dream, no, for I saw them, large as life, before me, the veiled heads and the faces near at hand, so cold sweat soaked me head to foot, I tore myself from bed, I lifted up my hands and voice to heaven, then I poured pure offerings at the fire. These rites performed to my satisfaction, I recounted all that strange event in sequence to Anchises. He saw the ambiguity of the two ancestral lines, the double parentage, his late-born error about ancient places. Then he said, Son, pitted as you were against the fates of Ilium, Cassandra alone made such a prophecy to me. I call it back now, how she would foretell this future for our people, saying often Hesperia, and the realm of Italy. But who could think the Trojans would migrate to evening lands? Or whom then could Cassandra move by foresight? We should yield to Phoebus, taking a better course, as we are shown. With this we were all happy to comply. We soon abandoned the new colony, leaving few souls behind, and making sail in the deck ships we took to the waste sea. When we had gained the offing to the west, 
no land in sight now, but sky everywhere and everywhere the sea, a thunderhead rose high above us, bringing gloom and storm with crisping dark grey water. Soon the winds made the sea rise and big waves came against us. This way and that we tossed in the great welter, low scud muffled daylight, night and rain wiped out the sky, flash after flash of lightning ripped from the burst clouds. We were blown off course and veered in darkness over the waves. My pilot, Palinurus himself, could barely tell day from night, he said, and sighting nothing but sea about us, could not keep direction. Three days on the deep sea muffled in fog, three starless nights we wandered blind. At dawn on the fourth day we raised land far away in clearing weather, hilltops and then smoke a spiral in calm air. Our sails came down, we took to the oars. No dallying, the seamen heaved up whirls of foam on the dark blue sea, pulling across it. Safe now from the storm wave, I took shelter first on the strophades, for so the Greek name goes, islands that lie in the broad Ionian Sea. There nests the vile Selino and her harpy sisterhood, shut out, now, from the house of Phineas, as they were frightened from old banquets there. No gloomier monster, no more savage pest and scourge sent by the gods' wrath ever mounted from the black Stygian water, flying things with young girls' faces, but foul ooze below, talons for hands, pale famished nightmare mouths. When we pulled into port, what met our eyes but sleek herds in the meadows everywhere and flocks of goats, no one attending them. Setting upon them with our swords, we sent up shouts to the gods, to Jove himself, to share the windfall with us, then on the curving beach we set out couches for a savory feast. But instantly, grotesquely whirring down, the harpies were upon us from the hills with deafening beat of wings. They trounced our meat, defiling everything they touched with filth, and gave an obscene squawk amid the stench. We tried again. In a secluded gorge under a cliffside, in thick shade of trees, we set our tables up, relit our altars. But the loud horde again, from another quarter, came out of hiding, swooped down on the prey with hooked feet, hunched to feed, and spoiled our feast. I then gave orders to resort to arms and make war on the vicious flock. My men did as commanded, laid their swords nearby, hidden in grass, and kept shields out of sight. Now when the birds flew down along the cove once more with their infernal din, my Cenus from a high lookout sounded the alarm on his brass horn. Into their midst my men attacked and tried a strange new form of battle, to cut the indecent seabirds down in blood. But they received no impact on their feathers, took on their backs no wounding cut, too quick, they soared away into the upper air, leaving the prey half-eaten and befouled. Only Selino, perched on a high crag, a ghastly witch, brought words out, croaking down, so war is all you give in recompense for slaughter of bulls and bullocks, can it be, heirs of Laomedon? You'd arm for war to drive the innocent harpies from their country? Then put your mind on what I prophesy, a thing foretold to Phoebus by the Almighty Father and by Apollo then to me, now I, first of the Furies, will disclose it to you. Italy is the land you look for, well, the winds will blow, you'll find your Italy, you'll be allowed to enter port, but you may never wall your destined city till deathly famine, for the bloodshed here, has made you grind your tables with your teeth. On this she took wing back into the forest. But our men of a sudden felt their blood run cold, and lost all heart. Not with arms now but prayers and vows they begged me to make peace, whether these foes were goddesses or birds, obscene and dire. My father, facing seaward, hands held out, invoked the heavenly powers and pledged the rituals do them. Gods, he said, turn back this thing foreboded. Gods, avert disaster of that kind. Cherish your faithful. Hawsers were cast off at his word, and sheets paid out to tugging canvas, as the south wind filled the sails. Over the white-capped waves we fled while wind and pilot called our course. And soon out of the sea we raised Zasynthos leafy bulk, Dulichium and Same, Craggy Neritos, past the rocks of Ithaca, Laertes' realm, we ran, and cursed that island nurse of cruel Ulysses. Before long the cloudy peaks of the Lucatan mountain came in view, Apollo's promontory, seamen are wary of. Here we put in and hauled up, tired, near the little town, our anchors out, our sterns high on the shingle. Then, Having gained this land beyond our reckoning, we purified ourselves in the sight of Jove and lit with offerings our altar fires, then on the action shore held games of Ilium. The men, all naked, slippery with oil, fought bouts in our traditional wrestling style, glad to have run past all those Argive towns and carried out our flight amid our foes. The sun went slanting round the mighty year, and freezing winter came, roughing the sea with northern gales. Against the temple columns I nailed a shield great Abbas carried once, all rounded bronze, and cut this legend on it, Aeneas from victorious Greeks these arms. Then I ordered the rowing benches manned, the harbour left behind. They made a race of it, my men, digging their oars into the swell and surging on. 
Faisha's airy towers hove in sight and dropped away behind. We passed along the coastline of Epirus to Port Kayanya, where we put in, below Buthrotum on the height. And here an unbelievable story reached our ears, that Hellenus, the son of Priam, now ruled over cities of the Greeks, as heir to Pyrrhus' wife and power, Andromache had found again a husband of her nation. It made me stare, and in my heart I burned with measureless desire to speak to him, to learn of that strange turn of life. So upward inland I went, leaving the port in ships. And, as it happened, at that hour she, Andromache, in a grove outside the city beside a brook, thin replica of Simois, was making from a ceremonial meal her offerings and libation to the dust, calling the great shade at a tomb called Hector's made by her, an empty mound of turf where she had blessed twin altars for her tears. But when she saw me coming, saw the men around me in Trojan arms, her mind misgave, and, gazing at this ghostliness in terror, she stood there pale and rigid, till the warmth ebbed from her and she swooned. And it was long before she spoke, or barely spoke, your face, can it be real? And you real, messenger, coming before me? Goddess born? Alive? Or if sweet daylight left your eyes forever, where is my Hector? Then she wept and filled the grove with wailing. I had difficulty forcing a few words out amid her passion, so overcome I felt, but murmured to her, alive, oh yes, through every mortal danger this world holds, I carry on my life. Be sure that what you see is real. Ah, tell me, since you were so bereft of such a husband, what change has come to your relief? What fortune worthy of the wife of Hector, Andromache? Then Pyrrhus wife and slave? She bent her head, with eyes downcast, and whispered, happiest of us all was Priam's daughter, the virgin picked to die at the great tomb, below Troy wall, of our dead enemy. She never had to bear the slave's allotment, never laid hands on a lord and master's bed. But when our native city burned, we others were shipped out through far seas. I bore the pride and insolence of Achilles' warrior son, being brought to bed, in slavery, of his child. He turned then to a bride in Lacedaemon, Leta's daughter, Hermione. He made me over to Helenus, to another slave. But now Pyrrhus is dead. Orestes, hot with lust for her whom he thought stolen from him, and maddened by the furies for spilt blood, caught Pyrrhus unprepared and cut him down before his father's altar. By that death part of the kingdom passed to Helenus. He called the plains Chaonian, the realm itself Caonia, from the Trojan Shan, and built a Pergamum, a citadel, called Iliums, on this ridge. As to yourself, what winds of destiny gave you this voyage? Which of the gods impelled you, all unknowing, here to our coast? What of your child, Ascanius? Alive still, nourished still by the world's air? Even at Troy, one thought. But does the boy remember her, the mother who was lost? And do his father and his uncle Hector stir him to old-time valor and manliness? So she poured out her questions, all in tears, her long and vain lament, when the great soldier and son of Priam, Helenus, approached from the townside, with many in his train. In his great joy at knowing us for kindred he led us then to the city gate, by turns weeping and speaking. Walking along with him I saw before me Troy in miniature, a slender copy of our massive tower, a dry brooklet named Xanthus, and I pressed my body against a sea and gate. Those with me feasted their eyes on this, our kinsman's town. In spacious colonnades the king received them, and offering midcourt their cups of wine they made libation, while on plates of gold a feast was brought before them. That day passed, and other days. Then sailing weather came when canvas bellied out, filled by a south wind. Now I put questions to the seer. I said, Trojan interpreter of the god's will, you know the mind of Phoebus, know his tripod, know the Apolline laurel, know the stars, the tongues of birds, and all the signs of bird flight. Prophesy for me. As you know, the powers favored me with directions for my sailing, all the divine speech from the shrines agreed I must find Italy, must pioneer in those far lands. The harpy called Selino riddled the only strange and evil sign, of pallid famine, and the wrath of heaven. What dangers must I steer away from first? How set my course to conquer that distress? Helenus cut down bullocks at his altar with ceremony, begged the gods for peace, unbound the sacred ribbons from his head, and took me by the hand, leading me in a tingle at the overshadowing power, O Phoebus! In thy shrine, then with oracular voice the priest addressed me, born of the goddess, highest auspices are clearly to be seen for your seafaring, the Lord God deals out destiny so and turns the wheel of change, so turns the world. A few things, out of many, shall I tell you, so you may cross the welcoming seas more safely, to find harbour in Ausonia, other details of time to come the Parsi keep from Hellenus, and Saturn's daughter, Juno, will not allow him speech of these. That Italy you think so near, with ports you think to enter, ignorant as you are, lies far, 
past far lands, by untraveled ways. You are to make thee or bend off Trinacria, to pass Ausonian water, lakes of the underworld, the island home of Circe the Eean, before your walls can rise in a safe country. Here are signs for you to keep in mind, when in anxiety by a stream apart beneath shore oaks you find a giant so, snow white, reclining there, suckling a litter of thirty snow white young, that place will be your haven after toil, sight of your town. And have no fear of table biting times, the fates will find a way for you, Apollo will be at hand when called. But now avoid the shoreline to the west, a part of Italy lapped by the tide of our own sea, the towns are all inhabited by evil Greeks. Here the Locrians founded a colony and Lycianae Dominius with soldiers took the Salentine plain, here is that town of Philoctetes, captain of Melibea, little Petelia, buttressed by her wall. Another thing, when you have crossed and moored your ships ashore, there to put up your altars for offerings, veil your head in a red robe against intrusions on your holy fires, omen unsettling sights amid your prayers. You and your company retain this ritual veiling in the future, let your progeny hold to religious purity thereby. Now then, at sea again, as the wind takes you toward the Sicilian shore, and headlands northward dwindle up the narrows of Polaris, steer for the coast to port, the seas to port, a long sail round, away from shores to starboard. These landmasses in the past, they say, the one unbroken mainland long ago, in cataclysm leapt apart, a change that the long ages of the past could bring, the sea rushed in between, to cut away Hesperia's flank from Sicily, and washed with narrow tide the sundered shores and towns. Now Scylla haunts the starboard side, Charybdis, never appeased, the side to port, and deep in her whirlpool gulps down the great sea waves three times a day and spews them up again, sending the whiplash of her spray to heaven. Scylla lies immured in a rocky cave in clefts of inky darkness, darting out her faces, pulling ships onto the reef. First she looks human, a fair-breasted girl down to the groin, but then, below, a monster creature of the sea, a wolvish belly merging in dolphins' tails. Better to round the sea mark of Pachinus, and stand out to sea, taking the long route west, then sight weird Scylla and her overhanging gloom and froth of rocks where sea green hounds give tongue. Further, if Helenus can look ahead, if you can trust a seer, and if Apollo fills his mind with truth, I have one thing to tell you, over and over again, one thing to warn you of, son of the goddess, make your prayer first of all to Juno's godhead, chant with a will your vows to her, secure with humble gifts the power of that lady, so in the end in triumph, with Trinacria left behind, you will be sent to Italy. Ashore there, when you reach the town of Cumi, Avernus murmuring forests, haunted lakes, you'll see a spellbound prophetess, who sings in her deep cave of destinies, confiding symbols and words to leaves. Whatever verse she writes, the virgin puts each leaf in order back in the cave, unshuffled they remain, but when a faint breeze through a door ajar comes in to stir and scatter the light leaves, she never cares to catch them as they flutter or to restore them, or to join the verses, visitors, unenlightened, turn away and hate the Sibyl shrine. But here no thought of time spent in delay should count with you, though crews reproach you, though the course you set call seaward now, and you can fill your sails with wind in the right quarter, even so pray to the prophetess that she herself consent to utter and chant her oracles. She will inform you of the Italian tribes, the wars to come, the way you should avoid each difficulty, or face it. Do her reverence and she will bring you through, by sea and land. These are the matters I may warn you of. Go, and exalt the might of Troy in action. When he had said all this in friendliness, the seer commanded gifts of heavy gold and carven ivory brought to the ships. He stowed masses of silver between decks with cauldrons of Dodona, then a cuirass woven of chain mail triply laced with gold, and a magnificent helm plumed at the peak, the arms of Neoptolemus. Special gifts went to my father. Then he added horses, pilots, two, and oarsmen as required, and fitted out my fighting men with arms. Meanwhile Anchises ordered sails on house to catch a favoring wind without delay. Now the diviner of Apollo, bowing in august deference, said to him, Anchises, chosen by Venus for the pride of marriage, cared for by heaven, brought to safety twice from ruined Pergamum, look toward your land, Ausonia, make sail for it and take it. And yet this shoreline you must skirt by sea, the sector of Ausonia meant by Apollo lies far away. Embark now, fortunate in the devotion of your son. Should I detain you by more talk while the winds rise? Andromache, too, sat at this last farewell, brought out embroidered robes, and cloth of gold, and for Ascanius a Phrygian mantle. Not to be outdone in courtesy, she gave armfuls of woven gifts, and said, Take these things, too, and may they be remembrances of my hands, child, and token of my love, the long love of Andromache, Hector's dearest. Final gifts of your own people, take them, you that alone remind me of Astyanox. His eyes, his hands, his look, 
all were like yours. He would be your age, growing up like you. I said farewell, and tears came as I spoke, be happy, friends, your fortune is achieved, while one fate beckons us and then another. Here is your quiet rest, no sea to plow, no quest for dim lands of Osonia receding ever. Here before your eyes are replicas of Xanthus and of Troy your own hands built, with better auspices, I pray, and less a challenge to the Greeks. If one day I shall enter Tiber stream and Tiber fields and see the walls my people have in store for them, then of these kindred cities, neighboring nations, in Epirus and in Hesperia, both looking back to Dardanus as founder, both to one sad history, we shall make a single Troy in spirit, may this task await our heirs. We set sail for Sirania nearby to cross from there, the short sea route to Italy. The sun went west, the hills grew dark. Then down we threw ourselves upon the welcome land, assigned the oars for next day, scattered all along the dry beach to take food and rest, and sleep came soft as dew on tired men. Now night drawn by the hours had not yet reached the midpoint of her course when Palinurus turned out briskly. Studying the winds, he cupped his ears to catch movements of air, observed the slowly wheeling constellations in the still heaven, bright Arcturus, rainy Hyades, Great Bear, and Little Bear, Orion in his belt of gold. All clear and cloudless air he made them out to be, then gave a trumpet signal from the stern. So we broke camp, put out to sea, unfurled our wings of sails. The stars had vanished, dawn was reddening the sky, when far ahead we saw the blue hills and low-lying plain of Italy. And Caesar shouted Italy. And all the men cried Italy. Enjoy. My father garlanded a great wine bowl, filled it with wine, stood on the stern aloft, and called to the gods, lords of the land and sea, storm powers, ease our way with a stern wind, steadily blow for us. Then as desired the light airs freshened and an opening bay appeared as we drew in, backed by a temple upon an acropolis of Minerva. The sailors took in sail and rowed for shore. The harbour there, bent like a bow, recoils from seas out of the east, long rocky spits make foaming surf, the port lies hid behind. Two crags like towers put out arms like walls, the temple stands back inland. Here I saw our first portent, in grassland, horses, four, as white as snow, at graze in an open field. You bring us war, host land, murmured my father, it is for war that horses are caparisoned. These herds mean war for us. Yet the same beasts are sometimes trained to take the chariot pole in harmony, to bear the yoke and bit. There is, then, hope of peace. And there we prayed to the tall palace, goddess of clanging arms, first to receive us on that festal beach, then veiled our heads in Phrygian drapery before the altars, where by Helena's particular command we made burnt offerings in proper form to Juno of the Argives. That ritual once complete, we would not stay, but swung our yard arms and our sails to take us out to sea again, leaving behind Greek territory, treacherous in our eyes. Soon then we saw Tarentum's gulf, or Hercules if the old tale be true. There, dead ahead, rose the Lacinian goddess on her height. Then Colon's towers and Cilicium, the coast of shipwreck. On the distant sky Trinocri and Etna could be seen, and soon we heard big seas groaning on beaten rocks and voices of the breakers. Shoals leapt up before our eyes, with sand in the sea swell at which my father and Chises cried, no doubt of it. Here is Charybdis, that abyss, and those perilous points of rock that Helenus foretold, with deadly ledges under sea. Sheer off, men, put your backs into the stroke. They bent hard to the rowing as commanded, and Palinurus and the leading ship swung his creaking prow over to port. The whole flotilla followed him in turn with oars and wind. On every rolling sea we rose to heaven, and in the abysmal trough sank down into the world of shades. Three times the rock cliffs between caverns boomed, three times we saw the wave shock and the flung spume drenching the very stars. The wind at last and sun went down together, leaving us spent, and in the dark as to our course, we glided quietly onward to the Cyclops' shore. Here was a mighty harbour, in itself landlocked and calm, out of the wind's way, but Etna, just beyond, rumbled and flashed, formidable in eruption. Up the sky she sent a somber cloud of billowing smoke, a pitch-black turbine full of glowing ash and balls of fire to lick the stars. Below, she vomited rocks and brought up lava streams, entrails of Etna, boiling in the deep. The tale goes that the body of Enceladus, half consumed by thunderbolt, lies prone under that weight, prodigious Etna piled above him, jetting flame from broken furnaces, and when the worn-out giant turns, all Sicily rumbles and quakes and weaves a pall of smoke against the sky. Under the forest roof that night we suffered monstrous fears, we could not see what made the din there were no stars or starlight overhead, only the cloud obscuring heaven, and the depth of night withheld the moon, and wrapped in stormy mist. At long last rose the morning star, we felt day's onset as aurora thinned away the vapour of the night. Then suddenly out of the forest, 
at the last extremity of hunger, came the strange shape of a man, in pitiful condition, his arms wide to beg for mercy. We took in the sight, his filth, his uncut beard, his ragged shirt pinned up by thorns, but even so, a Greek, and one sent on an earlier day to Troy with Greek equipment. Seeing at a distance to don clothing, Trojan arms, he cringed and stopped a while in fear of what he saw, then stumbled onward to the shore headlong with tears and prayers. In heaven's name, he said, by all the powers, I beg you, oh, by the light and air we breathe. Take me with you, Trojans. Anywhere at all will be good enough for me. I am, I know it, one of the Danians, one from the fleet, I won't deny I fought to take Troy's gods. For that, if so much harm came of our devilry, cut me to bits, scatter me on the water, drop me in the sea. If I must die, death at the hands of men will be a favor. With this he took our knees and groveled, kneeling, clinging there. We told him to speak out, say who he was, born of what blood, what fortune put him in such a panic, and my father after a moment gave the man his hand to calm him by that touch and sign of mercy. In the end he put aside his fear and said, I am an Ithacan, of Ulysses' company, that man beset by trouble. Achaemenides I'm called. My father, Automastus, lived in poverty, so I shipped out for Troy. Would God our life of poverty had lasted. My shipmates left me here, they all forgot me, scrambling to get away from the cave mouth and frightfulness in the cavern of the Cyclops. That is a blood-soaked hall of brutal feasts, all gloom inside, and huge. The giant rears his head against the stars. O oh heaven, spare earth a scourge like this, unbearable to see, unreachable by anything you say. The innards and the dark blood of poor fellows are what he feeds on, I myself looked on when he scooped up two crewmen in his hand mid-cave, and as he lay back smashed them down against the rock face, making the whole floor swim with spattered blood, I saw him crunch those dead men running blood and excrement, the warm flesh still a quiver in his teeth. Not that he did not suffer for the act. Not that Ulysses put up with that outrage or lost his self-possession in the pinch. Gorged with feasting and dead drunk with wine, the giant put down his lolling head, laid down enormous on the cave floor. In his sleep he dribbled bile and bits of flesh, mixed up with blood and wine. We prayed to the great gods, drew lots for duties, and surrounded him, then with a pointed beam bored his great eye, his single eye, under his shaggy brow, big as a Greek shield or the lamp of Phoebus. So we got back at him, some cause for pride, avenging our friend's shades. As for yourselves, put out to sea, put out to sea, poor fellows, break your hawsers. Tall and dangerous as Polyphemus, panning and milking sheep in his rock cave, there are a hundred more unspeakable huge cyclops everywhere at large along these bays and mountainsides. And now three times the long-horned moon has filled with a new glow since I've dragged out my days in woods, among the wild things lonely dens, and from a peak spied on the cyclops there, my heart a tremble at their great footfalls, their shouts. Thin fare I've had, such as the boughs would yield me, berries, cornel fruit, all stones, with roots and grasses. As I looked out seaward these were the first ships that I saw put in. Whatever ships they might turn out to be, I handed myself over. Boon enough just to escape these unholy savages. Better you take this life, by any form of death you choose. He had no sooner spoken than we all saw, high on the mountainside, the shepherd Polyphemus giant mass in motion with his flocks, advancing shoreward. Vast, mind-sickening, lumpish, heaven's light blacked out for him. He held a pine tree staff to feel his way with, and the woolly sheep were all his company and all the ease or comfort that he had. On reaching the seashore and the deep water he washed the fluid from his gouged eye pit and gnashed his teeth and groaned, then waded out to the middle depth where still the swell came short of dampening his haunches. We made haste to get away, and far, taking aboard the suppliant for his pains, in dead silence we cut our hawsers, launched, and put our backs into a racing stroke. He heard the splash and turned back toward it, but he never got the range of us to reach us, could not breast the full Ionian sea, waiting behind. At this he sent up an unearthly roar at which the waves on the deep sea were shaken, Italy was affrighted far inland, and Etna's caverns rumbled. Out of the forest, out of the mountains, poured the Cyclops tribe to crowd the bay and shoreline, we could see them standing there, each with his awful eye in impotent rage, the brotherhood of Etna, towering heavenward, terrifying peers, erect with heads as high as oaks in air or evergreen cypresses, great trees of Jove or those in sacred parklands of Diana. Stung to impetuous action by our fear, we hoisted sail to a fair wind, paid out sheets to get sea room, no matter on what course. But Helena's commands, his warning stood, no steering between Scylla and Charybdis, that channel so near death on either side. Resolved to go about, to take in sail, we felt, lo and behold, the wind veer northward blowing down from the narrows of Polaris. We sailed then past Pantages river mouth, 
Megara Bay, and Thapsus, that low islet, coastal places Achaemenides, hard-pressed Ulysses' shipmate, pointed out as he retraced his wanderings. There's an island lying this side of a Sicilian bay, facing Plemirium Point where the waves beat. Early people called this Alortigia. The tale runs that the Aelian stream, Alpheus, took hidden channels there, under the sea, and through your fountain, Arethusa, now infuses the salt waves. There, as directed, we worship the pure powers of the place, then sailed on past Taloris rich plowlands and ponds. We coasted high crags of Pacanus with rocky tongues of land, and far away shone Camarina, never to be disturbed, then the Gelone plain, Gela itself, named for a torrent, then beetling Akragas, breeder of meddlesome horses in the past, displayed her distant massive walls, and helped by winds I put Salinas of the palms behind us, to sail close to the shoal water of Lilybeum with her hidden reefs. And in the end the port of Drepanum took me in, a landing without joy. For after storms at sea had buffeted me so often, here, alas, I lost my father, solace in all affliction and mischance, O oh best of fathers, in my weariness, though you had been delivered from so many perils in vain, alas, here you forsook me. Never had Helenus the seer, who warned of many things to make me quail, foretold this grief to me, nor had the vile Salino. Here was my final sorrow, here the goal of all my seafaring. When after this I put to sea, God drove me to your shores. So in his tale before the attentive crowd Aeneas single voice recalled the fates decreed by heaven, and his wanderings. He fell silent at last and made an end. Book 4. The Passion of the Queen. The Queen, for her part, all that evening ached with longing that her heart's blood fed, a wound or inward fire eating her away. The manhood of the man, his pride of birth, came home to her time and again, his looks, his words remained with her to haunt her mind, and desire for him gave her no rest. When dawn swept earth with Phoebus' torch and burned away night gloom and damp, this queen, far gone and ill, confided to the sister of her heart, my sister Anna, quandaries and dreams have come to frighten me, such dreams. Think what a stranger yesterday found lodging in our house, how princely, how courageous, what a soldier. I can believe him in the line of gods, and this is no delusion. Telltale fear betrays inferior souls. What scenes of war fought to the bitter end he pictured for us. What bufferings awaited him at sea. Had I not set my face against remarriage after my first love died and failed me, left me barren and bereaved, and sick to death at the mere thought of torch and bridal bed, I could perhaps give way in this one case to frailty. I shall say it, since that time Sicaeus, my poor husband, met his fate, and blood my brother shed stained our hearth gods, this man alone has wrought upon me so and moved my soul to yield. I recognize the signs of the old flame, of old desire. But O oh chaste life, before I break your laws, I pray that earth may open, gape for me down to its depth, or the omnipotent with one stroke blast me to the shades, pale shades of Erebus and the deep world of night. That man who took me to himself in youth has taken all my love, may that man keep it, hold it forever with him in the tomb. At this she wept and wet her breast with tears. But Anna answered, Dearer to your sister than daylight is, will you wear out your life, young as you are, in solitary mourning, never to know sweet children, or the crown of joy that Venus brings? Do you believe this matters to the dust, to ghosts in tombs? granted no suitors up to now have moved you, neither in Libya nor before, in Tyre, Yarbas you rejected, and the others, chieftains bred by the land of Africa their triumphs have enriched, will you contend even against a welcome love? Have you considered in whose lands you settled here? On one frontier the Gachelans, their cities, people invincible in war, with wild Numidian horsemen, and the offshore banks, the Sirts, on the other, desert sands, bone dry, where fierce Barki and nomads range. Or need I speak of future wars brought on from Tyre, and the menace of your brother? Surely by dispensation of the gods and backed by Juno's will, the ships from Ilium held their course this way on the wind. Sister, what a great city you'll see rising here, and what a kingdom, from this royal match. With Trojan soldiers as companions in arms by what exploits will Punic glory grow? Only ask the indulgence of the gods, win them with offerings, give your guests ease, and contrive reasons for delay, while winter gales rage, drenched Orion storms at sea, and their ships, damaged still, face iron skies. This council fan the flame, already kindled, giving her hesitant sister hope, and set her free of scruple. Visiting the shrines they begged for grace at every altar first, then put choice rams and used to ritual death for Ceres giver of laws, Father Laeus, Phoebus, and for Juno most of all who has the bonds of marriage in her keeping. Dido herself, splendidly beautiful, holding a shallow cup, tips out the wine on a white shining heifer, between the horns, or gravely in the shadow of the gods' approaches opulent altars. 
through the day she brings new gifts, and when the breasts are open pours over organs, living still, for signs. Alas, what darkened minds have soothsayers? What good are shrines and vows to madden lovers? The inward fire eats the soft marrow away, and the internal wound bleeds on in silence. Unlucky Dido, burning, in her madness roamed through all the city, like a doe hit by an arrow shot from far away by a shepherd hunting in the Cretan woods, hit by surprise, nor could the hunter see as flying steel had fixed itself in her, but though she runs for life through cops and glade the fatal shaft clings to her side. Now Dido took Aeneas with her among her buildings, showed her Sidonian wealth, her walls prepared, and tried to speak, but in mid-speech grew still. When the day waned she wanted to repeat the banquet as before, to hear once more in her wild need the throes of Ilium, and once more hung on the narrator's words. Afterward, when all the guests were gone, and the dim moon in turn had quenched her light, and setting stars weighed weariness to sleep, alone she mourned in the great empty hall and pressed her body on the couch he left, she heard him still, though absent, heard and saw him. Or she would hold Ascanius in her lap, enthralled by him, the image of his father, as though by this ruse to appease a love beyond all telling. Towers, half-built, rose no farther, men no longer trained in arms or toiled to make harbours and battlements impregnable. Projects were broken off, laid over, and the menacing huge walls with cranes unmoving stood against the sky. As soon as Jove's dear consort saw the lady prey to such illness, and her reputation standing no longer in the way of passion, Saturn's daughter said to Venus, Wondrous! Covered yourself with glory, have you not, you and your boy, and won such prizes, too? Divine power is something to remember if by collusion of two gods one mortal woman is brought low. I am not blind. Your fear of our new walls has not escaped me, fear and mistrust of Carthage at her height. But how far will it go? What do you hope for, being so contentious? Why do we not arrange eternal peace and formal marriage? You have your heart's desire, Dido in love, Dido consumed with passion to her core. Why not, then, rule this people side by side with equal authority? And let the queen wait on her Phrygian lord, let her consign into your hand her Tyrians as a dowry. Now Venus knew this talk was all pretense, all to divert the future power from Italy to Libya, and she answered, Who would be so mad? so foolish as to shun that prospect or prefer war with you. That is, provided fortune is on the side of your proposal. The fates here are perplexing, would one city satisfy Jupiter's will for Tyrians and Trojan exiles? Does he approve a union and a mingling of these races? You are his consort, you have every right to sound him out. Go on, and I'll come, too. But Regal Juno pointedly replied, that task will rest with me. Just now, as to the need of the moment and the way to meet it, listen, and I'll explain in a few words. Aeneas and Dido in her misery plan hunting in the forest, when the titan sun comes up with rays to light the world. While beaters in excitement ring the glens my gift will be a black rain cloud, and hail, a downpour, and I'll shake heaven with thunder. The company will scatter, lost in gloom, as Dido and the Trojan captain come to one same cavern. I shall be on hand, and if I can be certain you are willing, there I shall marry them and call her his. A wedding, this will be. Then Cytherea, not disinclined, nodded to Juno's plea, and smiled at the stratagem now given away. Dawn came up meanwhile from the ocean stream, and in the early sunshine from the gates picked huntsmen issued, wide mesh nets and snares, broad spearheads for big game, Massilian horsemen trooping with hounds and packs keen on the scent. But Dido lingered in her hall, as Punic nobles waited, and her meddlesome hunter stood nearby, cavorting in gold and scarlet, champing his foam-flecked bridle. At long last the queen appeared with courtiers in a crowd, a short Sidonian cloak edged in embroidery caught about her, at her back a quiver sheathed in gold, her hair tied up in gold, and a brooch of gold pinning her scarlet dress. Phrygians came in her company as well, and Iulus, joyous at the scene. Resplendent above the rest, Aeneas walked to meet her, to join his retinue with hers. He seemed, think of the Lord Apollo in the spring when he leaves wintering in Lycia by Xanthus torrent, for his mother's Isle of Delos, to renew the festival, around his altars Cretans, Dryopes, and painted Agathersons raise a shout, but the god walks the Scythian ridge alone and smooths his hair, binds it in fronded laurel, braids it in gold, and shafts ring on his shoulders. So elated and swift, Aeneas walked with sunlit grace upon him. Soon the hunters, riding in company to high pathless hills, saw mountain goats shoot down from a rocky peak and scamper on the ridges, toward the plain deer left the slopes, herding in clouds of dust in flight across the open lands. Alone, the boy Ascanius, delightedly riding his eager horse amid the lowland vales, outran both goats and deer. Could he only meet amid the harmless game some foaming boar, or a tawny lion down from the mountainside? Meanwhile in heaven began a rolling thunder, and soon the storm broke, 
pouring rain and hail. Then Tyrians and Trojans in alarm, with Venus to Don grandson, ran for cover here and there in the wilderness, as freshets coursed from the high hills. Now to the selfsame cave came Dido and the captain of the Trojans. Primal earth herself and nuptial Juno opened the ritual, torches of lightning blazed, high heaven became witness to the marriage, and nymphs cried out wild hymns from a mountain top. That day was the first cause of death, and first of sorrow. Dido had no further qualms as to impressions given and set abroad, she thought no longer of a secret love but called it marriage. Thus, under that name, she hid her fault. Now in no time at all through all the African cities rumor goes, nimble as quicksilver among evils. Rumor thrives on motion, stronger for the running, lowly at first through fear, then rearing high, she treads the land and hides her head in cloud. As people fable it, the earth, her mother, furious against the gods, bore a late sister to the giants Coeus and Enceladus, giving her speed on foot and on the wing, monstrous, deformed, titanic. Pinioned, with an eye beneath for every body feather, and, strange to say, as many tongues and buzzing mouths as eyes, as many pricked up ears, by night she flies between the earth and heaven shrieking through darkness, and she never turns her eyelids down to sleep. By day she broods, on the alert, on rooftops or on towers, bringing great cities fear, harping on lies and slander evenhandedly with truth. In those days rumor took an evil joy at filling countrysides with whispers, whispers, gossip of what was done, and never done, how this Aeneas landed, Trojan-born, how Dido in her beauty graced his company, then how they reveled all the winter long unmindful of the realm, prisoners of lust. These tales the scabrous goddess put about on men's lips everywhere. Her twisting course took her to King Yarbas, whom she set ablaze with anger piled on top of anger. Son of Jupiter Hammond by a nymph, a ravished Garamantian, this prince had built the god a hundred giant shrines, a hundred altars, each with holy fires alight by night and day, sentries on watch, the ground enriched by victims' blood, the doors festooned with flowering wreaths. Before his altars King Yarbas, crazed by the raw story, stood, they say, amid the presences, with supplicating hands, pouring out prayer, all-powerful Jove, to whom the feasting moors at ease on coloured couches tip their wine, do you see this? Are we then fools to fear you throwing down your bolts? Those dazzling fires of lightning, are they aimless in the clouds and rumbling thunder meaningless? This woman who turned up in our country and laid down a tiny city at a price, to whom I gave a beach to plough, and on my terms, after refusing to marry me has taken Aeneas to be master in her realm. And now Sir Paris with his men, half-men, his chin and perfumed hair tied up in a Meonian bonnet, takes possession. As for ourselves, here we are bringing gifts into these shrines, supposedly your shrines, hugging that empty fable. Please like this from the man clinging to his altars reached the ears of the Almighty. Now he turned his eyes upon the queen's town and the lovers careless of their good name, then spoke to Mercury, assigning him a mission, son, bestir yourself, call up the zephyrs, take to your wings and glide. Approach the Dardan captain where he tarries wrapped in Tyrian Carthage, losing sight of future towns the fates ordain. Correct him, carry my speech to him on the running winds, no son like this did his enchanting mother promise to us, nor such did she deliver twice from peril at the hands of Greeks. He was to be the ruler of Italy, potential empire, armorer of war, to father men from Teucer's noble blood and bring the whole world under law's dominion. If glories to be won by deeds like these cannot arouse him, if he will not strive for his own honor, does he begrudge his son, Ascanius, the high strongholds of Rome? What has he in mind? What hope, to make him stay amid a hostile race, and lose from view Ausonian progeny, Lavinian lands? The man should sail, that is the whole point. Let this be what you tell him, as for me. He finished and fell silent. Mercury made ready to obey the great command of his great father, and he first tied on the golden sandals, winged, that high in air transport him over seas or over land abreast of gale winds, then he took the wand with which he summons pale souls out of Orcus and ushers others to the undergloom, lulls men to slumber or awakens them, and opens dead men's eyes. This wand in hand, he can drive winds before him, swimming down along the storm cloud. Now aloft, he saw the craggy flanks and crown of patient Atlas, giant Atlas, balancing the sky upon his peak, his pine-forested head in vapor cowled, beaten by wind and rain. Snow lay upon his shoulders, rills cascaded down his ancient chin and beard a bristle, caked with ice. Here Mercury of Selene hovered first on even wings, then down he plummeted to sea level and flew on like a low-flying gull that skims the shallows and rocky coasts where fish ply close in shore. So, like a gull between the earth and sky, the progeny of Selene, on the wing from his maternal grandsire, split the winds to the sand bars of Libya. Alighting tiptoe on the first hutments, there he found Aeneas laying foundations for new towers and homes. 
he noted well the sword the man wore, adorned with yellow jasper, and the cloak aglow with Tyrian dye upon his shoulders, gifts of the wealthy queen, who had inwoven gold thread in the fabric. Mercury took him to task at once, is it for you to lay the stones for Carthage's high walls, tame husband that you are, and build their city? Oblivious of your own world, your own kingdom. From bright Olympus he that rules the gods and turns the earth and heaven by his power, he and no other sent me to you, told me to bring this message on the running winds, what have you in mind? What hope, wasting your days in Libya? If future history's glories do not affect you, if you will not strive for your own honor, think of Ascanius, think of the expectations of your heir, Iulus, to whom the Italian realm, the land of Rome, are due. And Mercury, as he spoke, departed from the visual field of mortals to a great distance, ebbed in subtle air. Amazed, and shocked to the bottom of his soul by what his eyes had seen, Aeneas felt his hackles rise, his voice choke in his throat. As the sharp admonition and command from heaven had shaken him awake, he how burned only to be gone, to leave that land of the sweet life behind. What can he do? How tell the impassioned queen and hope to win her over? What opening shall he choose? This way and that he let his mind dart, testing alternatives, running through every one. And as he pondered this seemed the better tactic, he called in Mnistheus, Sergestus and stalwart Serestus, telling them, get the fleet ready for sea, but quietly, and collect the men on shore. Lay in ship stores and gear. As to the cause for a change of plan, they were to keep it secret, seeing the excellent Dido had no notion, no warning that such love could be cut short, he would himself look for the right occasion, the easiest time to speak, the way to do it. The Trojans to a man gladly obeyed. The queen, for her part, felt some plot afoot quite soon, for who deceives a woman in love? She caught wind of a change, being in fear of what had seemed her safety. Evil rumor, shameless as before, brought word to her in her distracted state of ships being rigged and trim for sailing. Furious, at her wit's end, she traversed the whole city, all aflame with rage, like a bacchante driven wild by emblem shaken, when the mountain revels of the odd year possess her, when the cry of Bacchus rises and Cathiron calls all through the shouting night. Thus it turned out she was the first to speak and charge Aeneas, you even hoped to keep me in the dark as to this outrage, did you, two-faced man, and slip away in silence? Can our love not hold you, can the pledge we gave not hold you, can die or not, now sure to die in pain? Even in winter weather must you toil with ships, and fret to launch against high winds for the open sea? Oh, heartless! Tell me now, if you were not in search of alien lands and new strange homes, if ancient Troy remained, would ships put out for Troy on these big seas? Do you go to get away from me? I beg you, by these tears, by your own right hand, since I have left my wretched self nothing but that, yes, by the marriage that we entered on, if ever I did well and you were grateful or found some sweetness in a gift from me, have pity now on a declining house. Put this plan by, I beg you, if a prayer is not yet out of place. Because of you, Libyans and nomad kings detest me, my own Tyrians are hostile, because of you, I lost my integrity in that admired name by which alone I made my way once toward the stars. To whom do you abandon me, a dying woman, guess that you are, the only name now left from that of husband? Why do I live on? Shall I, until my brother Pygmalion comes to pull my walls down? Or the Gachelini Arbus leads me captive? If at least there were a child by you for me to care for, a little one to play in my courtyard and give me back Aeneas, in spite of all, I should not feel so utterly defeated, utterly bereft. She ended there. The man by Jove's command held fast his eyes and fought down the emotion in his heart. At length he answered, As for myself, be sure I never shall deny all you can say, your majesty, of what you meant to me. Never will the memory of Elissa stale for me, while I can still remember my own life, and the spirit rules my body. As to the event, a few words. Do not think I meant to be deceitful and slip away. I never held the torches of a bridegroom, never entered upon the pact of marriage. If fate permitted me to spend my days by my own lights, and make the best of things according to my wishes, first of all I should look after Troy and the loved relics left me of my people. Priam's great hall should stand again, I should have restored the tower of Pergamum for Trojans in defeat. But now it is the rich Italian land Apollo tells me I must make for, Italy, named by his oracles. There is my love, there is my country. If, as a Phoenician, you are so given to the charms of Carthage, Libyan city that it is, then tell me, why begrudge the Teucrians new lands for homesteads in Ausonia? Are we not entitled, too, to look for realms abroad? Night never veils the earth in damp and darkness, fiery stars never ascend the east, but in my dreams my father's troubled ghost admonishes and frightens me. Then, too, each night thoughts come of young Ascanius, my dear boy wronged, 
defrauded of his kingdom, Hesperian lands of destiny. And now the God's interpreter, sent by Jove himself, I swear it by your head and mine, has brought commands down through the racing winds. I say with my own eyes in full daylight I saw him entering the building. With my very ears I drank his message in. So please, no more of these appeals that set us both afire. I sail for Italy not of my own free will. During all this she had been watching him with face averted, looking him up and down in silence, and she burst out raging now, no goddess was your mother. Dardanus was not the founder of your family. Liar and cheat. Some rough Caucasian cliff begot you on flint. Hyrcanian tigresses tendered their teats to you. Why should I palter? Why still hold back for more indignity? Sigh, did he, while I wept? Or look at me? Or yield a tear, or pity her who loved him? What shall I say first, with so much to say? The time is past when either Supreme Juno or the Saturnian father viewed these things with justice. Faith can never be secure. I took the man in, thrown up on this coast in dire need, and in my madness then contrived a place for him in my domain, rescued his lost fleet, saved his shipmates' lives. Oh, I am swept away burning by furies. Now the prophet Apollo, now his oracles, now the gods' interpreter, if you please, sent down by Jove himself, brings through the air his formidable commands. What fit employment for heaven's high powers? What anxieties to plague serene immortals? I shall not detain you or dispute your story. Go, go after Italy on the sailing winds, look for your kingdom, cross the deep sea swell. If divine justice counts for anything, I hope and pray that on some grinding reef midway at sea you'll drink your punishment and call and call on Dido's name. From far away I shall come after you with my black fires, and when cold death has parted body from soul I shall be everywhere a shade to haunt you. You will pay for this, unconscionable. I shall hear. The news will reach me even among the lowest of the dead. At this abruptly she broke off and ran in sickness from his sight in the light of day leaving him at a loss, alarmed, and mute with all he meant to say. The maids in waiting caught her as she swooned and carried her to bed in her marble chamber. Duty bound, Aeneas, though he struggled with desire to calm and comfort her in all her pain, to speak to her and turn her mind from grief, and though he sighed his heart out, shaken still with love of her, yet took the course heaven gave him and went back to the fleet. Then with a will the Teucrians fell to work and launched the ships along the whole shore, slick with tar each hull took to the water. Eager to get away, the sailors brought or bows out of the woods with leaves still on, and oaken logs unhewn. Now you could see them issuing from the town to the water's edge in streams, as when, aware of winter, ants will pillage a mound of spelt to store it in their granary, over fields the black battalion moves, and through the grass on a narrow trail they carry off the spoil, some put their shoulders to the enormous weight of a trundled grain, while some pull stragglers in and castigate delay, there to and fro of labor makes the whole track come alive. At that sight, what were your emotions, Dido? Sighing how deeply, looking out and down from your high tower on the seething shore where all the harbour filled before your eyes with bustle and shouts. Unconscionable love, to what extremes will you not drive our hearts? She now felt driven to weep again, again to move him, if she could, by supplication, humbling her pride before her love, to leave nothing untried, not to die needlessly. Anna, you see the ark of waterfront all in commotion, they come crowding in from everywhere. Spread canvas calls for wind, the happy crews have garlanded the sterns. If I could brace myself for this great sorrow, sister, I can endure it, too. One favor, even so, you may perform for me. Since that deserter chose you for his friend and trusted you, even with private thoughts, since you alone know when he may be reached, go, intercede with our proud enemy. Remind him that I took no oath at Aulus with Danians to destroy the Trojan race, I sent no ship to Pergamum. Never did I profane his father in Chysis' dust and shade. Why will he not allow my prayers to fall on his unpitying ears? Where is he racing? Let him bestow one last gift on his mistress, this, to await fair winds and easier flight. Now I no longer plead the bond he broke of our old marriage, nor do I ask that he should live without his dear love, Lot Yum, or yield his kingdom. Time is all I beg, mere time, a respite and a breathing space for madness to subside in, while my fortune teaches me how to take defeat and grieve pity your sister. This is the end, this favor, to be repaid with interest when I die. She pleaded in such terms, and such, in tears, her sorrowing sister brought him, time and again. But no tears moved him, no one's voice would he attend attractively. The fates opposed it, gods will block the man's once kindly ears. And just as when the north winds from the Alps this way and that contend among themselves to tear away an oak tree hail with age, the wind and tree cry, and the buffeted trunk showers high foliage to earth, but holds on bedrock, 
for the roots go down as far into the underworld as cresting boughs go up in heaven's air, just so this captain, buffeted by a gale of pleas this way and that way, dinned all the day long, felt their moving power in his great heart, and yet his will stood fast, tears fell in vain. On Dido in her desolation now terror grew at her fate. She prayed for death, being heartsick at the mere sight of heaven. That she more surely would perform the act and leave the daylight, now she saw before her a thing one shudders to recall, on altars fuming with incense where she placed her gifts, the holy water blackened, the spilt wine turned into blood and mire. Of this she spoke to no one, not to her sister even. Then, too, within the palace was a marble shrine devoted to her one-time lord, a place she held in wondrous honour, all festooned with snowy fleeces and green festive boughs. From this she now thought voices could be heard and words could be made out, her husband's words, calling her, when midnight hushed the earth, and lonely on the rooftops the night owl seemed to lament, in melancholy notes, prolonged to a doleful cry. And then, besides, the riddling words of seers in ancient days, foreboding sayings, made her thrill with fear. In nightmare, fevered, she was hunted down by pitiless Aeneas, and she seemed deserted always, uncompanioned always, on a long journey, looking for her Tyrians in desolate landscapes, as Pentheus gone mad sees the oncoming Eumenides and sees a double sun and double Thebes appear, or as when, hounded on the stage, Orestes runs from a mother armed with burning brands, with serpents hellish black, and in the doorway squat the avenging ones. So broken in mind by suffering, Dido caught her fatal madness and resolved to die. She pondered time and means, then visiting her mournful sister, covered up her plan with a calm look, a clear and hopeful brow. Sister, be glad for me. I've found a way to bring him back or free me of desire. Near to the ocean boundary, near sundown, the Ethiop's farthest territory lies, where giant Atlas turns the sphere of heaven studded with burning stars. From there a priestess of Massilian stock has come, she had been pointed out to me, custodian of that shrine named for daughters of the west, Hesperides, and it is she who fed the dragon, guarding well the holy boughs with honey dripping slow and drowsy poppy. Chanting her spell she undertakes to free what heart she wills, but to inflict on others duress of sad desires, to arrest the flow of rivers, make the stars move backward, call up the spirits of deep night you'll see earth shift and rumble underfoot and ash trees walk down mountainsides. Dearest, I swear before the gods and by your own sweet self, it is against my will that I resort for weaponry to magic powers. In secret build up a pyre in the inner court under the open sky, and place upon it the arms that faithless man left in my chamber, all his clothing, and the marriage bed on which I came to grief, solace for me to annihilate all vestige of the man, vile as he is, my priestess shows me this. While she was speaking, cheek and brow grew pale but Anna could not think her sister cloaked a suicide in these unheard-of rites, she failed to see how great her madness was and feared no consequence more grave than at Sicaeus' death. So, as commanded, she made the preparations. For her part, the queen, seeing the pyre in her inmost court erected huge with pitch pine and sawn ilex, hung all the place under the sky with wreaths and crowned it with funereal cypress boughs. On the pyre's top she put a sword he left with clothing, and an effigy on a couch, her mind fixed now ahead on what would come. Around the pyre stood altars, and the priestess, hair unbound, called in a voice of thunder upon three hundred gods, on Erebus, on Chaos, and on triple Hecate, three-faced Diana. Then she sprinkled drops purportedly from the fountain of Avernus. Rare herbs were brought out, reaped at the new moon by scythes of bronze, and juicy with a milk of dusky venom, then the rare love charm or call torn from the brow of a birthing foal and snatched away before the mother found it. Dido herself with consecrated grain in her pure hands, as she went near the altars, freed one foot from sandal straps, let fall her dress ungirdled, and, now sworn to death, called on the gods and stars that knew her fate. She prayed then to whatever power may care in comprehending justice for the grief of lovers bound unequally by love. The night had come, and weary in every land men's bodies took the boon of peaceful sleep. The woods and the wild seas had quieted at that hour when the stars are in mid-course and every field is still. Cattle and birds with vivid wings that haunt the limpid lakes or nest in thickets in the country places all were asleep under the silent night. Not, though, the agonized Phoenician queen, she never slackened into sleep and never allowed the tranquil night to rest upon her eyelids or within her heart. Her pain redoubled, love came on again, devouring her, and on her bed she tossed in a great surge of anger. So awake, she pressed these questions, musing to herself, look now, what can I do? Turn once again to the old suitors, only to be laughed at, begging a marriage with Numidians whom I disdain so often? Then what? Trail the Ilian ships and follow like a slave commands of Trojans? Seeing them so agreeable, in view of past assistance and relief, so thoughtful their unshaken gratitude? 
suppose I wished it, who permits or takes aboard their proud ships one they so dislike. Poor lost soul, do you not yet grasp or feel the treachery of the line of Laomedon? What then? Am I to go alone, companion of the exultant sailors in their flight? Or shall I set out in their wake, with Tyrians, with all my crew close at my side, and send the men I barely tore away from Tyre to sea again, making them hoist their sails to more sea winds? No, die as you deserve, give pain quietus with a steel blade. Sister, you are the one who gave way to my tears in the beginning, burdened a mad queen with sufferings, and thrust me on my enemy. It was not given me to lead my life without new passion, innocently, the way wild creatures live, and not to touch these depths. The vow I took to the ashes of Sicaeus was not kept. So she broke out afresh in bitter mourning. On his high stern deck Aeneas, now quite certain of departure, everything ready, took the boon of sleep. In dream the figure of the god returned with looks reproachful as before, he seemed again to warn him, being like Mercury in every way, in voice, in golden hair, and in the bloom of youth. Son of the goddess, sleep away this crisis, can you still? Do you not see the dangers growing round you, madman, from now on? Can you not hear the offshore west wind blow? The woman hatches plots and drastic actions in her heart, resolved on death now, whipping herself onto heights of anger. Will you not be gone in flight, while flight is still within your power? Soon you will see the offing boil with ships and glare with torches, soon again the waterfront will be alive with fires, if dawn comes while you linger in this country. Ha! Come, break the spell. Woman's a thing forever fitful and forever changing. At this he merged into the darkness. Then as the abrupt phantom filled him with fear, Aeneas broke from sleep and roused his crewmen. Up, turn out now. Oarsmen, take your thwarts. Shake out sail. Look here, for the second time a god from heaven's high air is goading me to hasten our break away, to cut the cables. Holy one, whatever god you are, we go with you, we act on your command most happily. Be near, graciously help us, make the stars in heaven propitious ones. He pulled his sword a flash out of its sheath and struck at the stern hawser. All the men were gripped by his excitement to be gone, and hauled and hustled. Ships cast off their moorings, and an array of hulls hid inshore water as oarsmen churned up foam and swept to sea. Soon early dawn, quitting the saffron bed of old Tithonus, cast new light on earth, and as air grew transparent, from her tower the queen caught sight of ships on the seaward reach with sails full and the wind astern. She knew the waterfront now empty, bare of oarsmen. Beating her lovely breast three times, four times, and tearing her golden hair, O oh Jupiter, she said, will this man go, will he have mocked my kingdom, stranger that he was and is? Will they not snatch up arms and follow him from every quarter of the town? And dock hands tear our ships from moorings? On. Be quick with torches. Give out arms. Unship the oars. What am I saying? Where am I? What madness takes me out of myself? Dido, poor soul, your evil doing has come home to you. Then was the right time when you offered him a royal scepter. See the good faith and honour of one they say bears with him everywhere the hearth gods of his country. One who bore his father, spent with age, upon his shoulders. Could I not then have torn him limb from limb and flung the pieces on the sea? His company, even Ascanius could I not have minced and served up to his father at a feast? The luck of battle might have been in doubt, so let it have been. Whom had I to fear, being sure to die? I could have carried torches into his camp, filled passageways with flame, annihilated father and son and followers and given my own life on top of all. O son, scanning with flame all works of earth, and thou, O Juno, witness and go-between of my long miseries, and Hecate, screeched for at night at crossroads in the cities, and thou, avenging furies, and all gods on whom Elissa dying may call, take notice, overshadow this hell with your high power, as I deserve, and hear my prayer. If by necessity that impious wretch must find his haven and come safe to land, if so Jove's destinies require, and this, his end in view, must stand, yet all the same when hard beset in war by a brave people, forced to go outside his boundaries and torn from Iulus, let him beg assistance, let him see the unmerited deaths of those around and with him, and accepting peace on unjust terms, let him not, even so, enjoy his kingdom or the life he longs for, but fall in battle before his time and lie unburied on the sand. This I implore, this is my last cry, as my last blood flows. Then, O oh my Tyrians, besiege with hate his progeny and all his race to come, make this your offering to my dust. No love, no pact must be between our peoples, no, but rise up from my bones, avenging spirit. Harry with fire and sore the Dardan countrymen now, or hereafter, at whatever time the strength will be afforded. Coast with coast in conflict, I implore, 
and sea with sea, and arms with arms, may they contend in war, themselves and all the children of their children. Now she took thought of one way or another, at the first chance, to end her hated life, and briefly spoke to Barche, who had been Sicaeus' nurse, her own an urn of ash long held in her ancient fatherland. Dear nurse, tell sister Anna to come here, and have her quickly bedew herself with running water before she brings our victims for atonement. Let her come that way. And you, too, put on pure wool around your brows. I have a mind to carry out that right to Stygian Jove that I have readied here, and put an end to my distress, committing to the flames the pyre of that miserable Dardan. At this with an old woman's eagerness Barche hurried away. And Dido's heart beat wildly at the enormous thing afoot. She rolled her bloodshot eyes, her quivering cheeks were flecked with red as her sick pallor grew before her coming death. Into the court she burst her way, then at her passion's height she climbed the pyre and bare the Dardan sword, a gift desired once, for no such need. Her eyes now on the Trojan clothing there and the familiar bed, she paused a little, weeping a little, mindful, then lay down and spoke her last words, remnants dear to me while God and fate allowed it, take this breath and give me respite from these agonies. I lived my life out to the very end and passed the stages fortune had appointed. Now my tall shade goes to the underworld. I built a famous town, saw my great walls, avenged my husband, made my hostile brother pay for his crime. Happy, alas, too happy, if only the Dardanian keels had never beached on our coast. And here she kissed the bed. I die unavenged, she said, but let me die. This way, this way, a blessed relief to go into the undergloom. Let the cold Trojan, far at sea, drink in this conflagration and take with him the omen of my death. Amid these words her household people saw her crumpled over the steel blade, and the blade aflush with red blood, drenched her hands. A scream pierced the high chambers. Now through the shock city rumor went rioting, as wails and sobs with women's outcry echoed in the palace and heaven's high air gave back the beating din, as though all Carthage or old Tyre fell to storming enemies, and, out of hand, flames billowed on the roofs of men and gods. Her sister heard and trembling, faint with terror, lacerating her face, beating her breast, ran through the crowd to call the dying queen. It came to this, then, sister? You deceived me? The pyre meant this, altars and fires meant this? What shall I mourn first, being abandoned? Did you scorn your sister's company and death? You should have called me out to the same fate. The same blade's edge and hurt, at the same hour, should have taken us off. With my own hands had I to build this pyre, and had I to call upon our country's gods, that in the end with you placed on it there, O oh heartless one, I should be absent? You have put to death yourself and me, the people and the fathers bred in Sidon, and your own new city. Give me fresh water, let me bathe her wound and catch upon my lips any last breath hovering over hers. Now she had climbed the topmost steps and took her dying sister into her arms to cherish, with a sob, using her dress to staunch the dark blood flow. But Dido trying to lift her heavy eyes fainted again. Her chest wound whistled air. Three times she struggled up on one elbow and each time fell back on the bed. Her gaze went wavering as she looked for heaven's light and groaned at finding it. Almighty Juno, filled with pity for this long ordeal and difficult passage, now sent Iris down out of Olympus to set free the wrestling spirit from the body's hold. For since she died, not at her fated span nor as she merited, but before her time inflamed and driven mad, Proserpina had not yet plucked from her the golden hair, delivering her to Orcus of the Styx. So humid Iris through bright heaven flew on saffron yellow wings, and in her train a thousand hues shimmered before the sun. At Dido's head she came to rest. This token sacred to dis I bear away is bidden and free you from your body. Saying this, she cut a lock of hair. Along with it her body's warmth fell into dissolution, and out into the winds her life withdrew. Book 5. Games and a Conflagration. Cutting through waves blown dark by a chill wind Aeneas held his ships firmly on course for a midsy crossing. But he kept his eyes upon the city far astern, now bright with poor Ulysses' pyre. What caused that blaze remained unknown to watchers out at sea, but what they knew of a great love profaned in anguish, and a desperate woman's nerve, led every Trojan heart into foreboding. When they had gained the offing east and north, no land in sight now, but sky everywhere and everywhere the sea, a thunderhead towered above them, bringing gloom and storm with shuddering dusky water. Aeneas helmsman, Palinurus, called from his high stem deck, why have these clouds massed on the height of heaven? Father Neptune, what are you brewing for us? On this he made the seamen shorten sail and bend to the oars. He trimmed his fluttering canvas more to catch the wind and said, Aeneas, Lord Commander, even if Jupiter should pledge his word for it, I could not hope to make landfall on Italy in this weather. It's thickening up, and now the wind blows hard out of the murky west abeam of us. No bucking it. 
We cannot make our northing. Seeing that fortune has the upper hand, I say give in, and follow where she calls. No long reach eastward there's a loyal coast, I think, the land named for your brother, Eryx, and the Sicilian ports, if I remember rightly my star heights and my miles at sea. The good commander said, for some time now I've noticed what the veering wind demands and how you fought it uselessly. Change course, haul yards and sails around. Could any soil be more agreeable to me, or anywhere I would rather moor these tired ships, than Sicily, home of my Dardan friend, Acestes, and the ashes of my father? With this exchange they headed east for port, the west wind in their sails. On a following swell the fleet ran free, and happily at last they turned in toward the shoreline that they knew. Far off, now, on a high hill top, Acestes wondered to see his guest's fleet coming in, then hurried down, spiny with javelins, wearing a Libyan she bears hide, Acestes, born of a Trojan mother to the river god Crinesis. As he knew and prized his parentage, he welcomed their return, treated them to the riches of the fields, and comforted with friendship weary men. When the next day at dawn the brightening sky made the stars fade, Aeneas called his crews together from all quarters of the shore and spoke out from a built-up rostrum, sons of Dardanus, in the high line of gods, the months are spent, the rounding year fulfilled since we interred my godlike father's bones and mourned and blessed his altars. And if I am not mistaken, now that day has come which I shall hold in bitterness and honour all my life, gods, you would have it so. Were I today exiled in Libyan sands or caught at sea off Argos, or detained in walled Mycenae, still I should carry out my anniversary vows and ceremonies, heaping the altars, as I should, with offerings. But now, beyond all expectation, here we stand beside his ashes and his bones, and surely not, I think, without the great God's will and contrivance, carried here off course to enter kindly havens. Come then, everyone, we'll celebrate this holiday in joy. Let us ask for propitious winds, and when our city is laid out, our temples blessed in Father's honour, may he grant each year that I perform this ritual. Trojan-born Acestes gives each ship two head of oxen. Welcome the hearth gods to the feast, our own and those our host Acestes cherishes. Then, too, if as we trust nine days from now dawn lifts for mortals her dear light and bears the world with sunrays, I shall plan and hold contests for Trojans, first a ship race, then we'll see who wins at running, who stands out in pride of strength at javelin and archery, or dares to fight with rawhide on his hands. May all compete for prizes and the palm. Now silence, all. Garland your brows with leaves. At this he shaded his own brows with myrtle, loved by his mother. Helimus did the same, Acestes ripe with age, the boy Ascanius, and ail the young men followed suit. Aeneas left the assembly now and made his way with many thousands to the funeral mound, walking amid the crowd. Once there, he poured the ritual libations, two of wine, two of fresh milk, and two of victims' blood, then cast down purple morning flowers and said, I greet and bless you, sacred father, bless you, ashes and shade and soul, paternal soul I vainly rescued once. It was not given me with you beside me to explore the coasts and plains of Italy, nor to discover, whatever it may be, Ausonian Tiber, so far he had proceeded in his speech when from the depths of mound and shrine a snake came huge and undulant with seven coils, enveloping the barrow peaceably and gliding on amid the altars. Azure flex mottled his back, a dappled sheen of gold set all his scales ablaze, as when a rainbow on the clouds facing the sun throws out a thousand colors. Aeneas paused, amazed and silent, while deliberately the snake's long column wound among the bowls and polished cups, browsing the festal dishes, and, from the altars where he fed, again slid harmlessly to earth below the tomb. Now all the more intent, the celebrant took up again his father's ritual, uncertain whether he should think the snake the local god, the genius of the place, or the attendant spirit of his father. He sacrificed a pair of sheep, a pair of swine, a pair of heifers with black hides, then poured out shallow bowls of wine and called the ghost of great Anchises, the death shade released from Acheron. Then his companions, each to his capacity, brought in their own glad offerings. They piled the altars, knifed the beasts, placed cauldrons on the fires, and at their ease upon the grass raked up live coals under the spits to broil the flesh. In due course came the awaited day, the shining sun's team brought a ninth and cloudless dawn. Acestes' influence roused the neighboring folk, and now in happy groups they thronged the shore to see Aeneas men, or to compete. But first the prizes were set out on view midfield, blessed tripods, fresh green crowns, and palms, rewards for winners, armor, too, and robes infused with crimson dye, gold bars and silver. Next from a central eminence a trumpet sang out for the opening of the games. The well-matched entrants in the first event were heavy oared ships, four from the whole fleet, Mnistheus eager oarsman drove the sea beast, Mnistheus of Italy he soon would be, from whose name came the clan of Memmius. 
Then Giz captained the Chimera, huge in length and weight, big as a town afloat, which Dardan oarsmen in three tiers drove onward, surging together at three banks of oars. Then he for whom the Sergian house was named, Sergestus, rode the great centaur. Clonthus, from whom your family came, Roman Cluentius, rode in the sea blue Scylla. Out at sea, well off the foaming beach, there is a rock submerged and beaten by high seas at times when northwest winds in winter hide the stars, but in calm weather it stands quietly above the unmoving water, a level perch and happy sunning place for gulls. Aeneas made a green goal here with an ilex bow, wishing well marked for sailors in his charge the point where they should turn and double back on the long course. Now they drew lots for places, captains erect upon the sterns, their gold and splendid crimson gleaming far around. The crews, for their part, garlanded with poplar, bare to the waist, glistened with rubbing oil, while settled on their planks, reaching ahead to or halves, listening hard for the starting call. Throbbing excitement seemed to void their hearts all beating high in appetite for glory. Then as the brilliant trumpet gave its note they all surged forward from the starting line, no lagging, heaven echoed shouts, and channels under the crewmen's pulling turned to foam. Abreast they cleft their furrows, all the sea torn up by oar strokes and the biting prows. The racing cars in a two-horse chariot race are not so headlong to consume the field once they have left the barriers, not though the charioteers shake out the rippling reins to give head to the teams, and hang above them, bent to the whip. Then with applause and cheers and partisan shouts the wooded landscape rang, the shores, embayed, rolled the sound back and forth, and the reverberant hills gave back the din. Amid the turbulence, the leader now, racing ahead at the very start, was Giz. Close on him came Clonthus, better served by oarsmen, but his ship's weight slowed him up. Behind them at an equal interval the sea beast and the centaur vied for third, and now the sea beast had it, now the mighty centaur took the lead, now both together, prows on a line, with their long keels ploughed up the salt sea water. As they all came near the offshore rock, the halfway mark, the leader, Giz, hailed May Neats at the tiller, why keep so far to starboard, man? This way. Hug shore, making the turn. What if the oar blades graze the rock to port? Let others shear off wide to seaward. Heedless, in his fear of a hidden ledge, Maynit swung the prow toward the open sea. Giz again cried out, Now why bear off? Stick to the rocks, Maynit's. And at that instant looking back he saw Clonthus just behind on the inner track. Between the ship of Giz and the rocks he shaved his way to port, then suddenly shot past him at the turn and got away into safe water, leaving the mark behind. Young Giz flared up now, ablaze to the bottom of his soul with indignation, and tears wetted his cheeks. Without a thought for dignity or the safety of his crew he tossed cautious Maynitz overboard into the sea. Then he himself as steersman took the tiller, and as captain cheered his oarsmen as he swung the rudder over, heading for shore. When heavy old Maynitz slowly at last emerged from the sea bottom drenched and streaming, up he climbed and sat atop the dry ledge. Trojans had laughed to see his plunge, his swimming, and now laughed again as he coughed up sea water from his chest. To the two behind, Timnistheus and Sergestus, the happy thought had come of passing Giz, now he had lost speed, and Sergestus led, nearing the rock, though not by a full boat length, for sea beast by her prow came up alongside. Mnistheus on his catwalk fore and aft between the oarsmen urged them on, now pull, pull for it. Great Hector's companions in arms, chosen in Troy's last hour for my crew, now bring to bear the strength and nerve you showed in Gachelin Seertz, in the Ionian Sea, in the assaulting waves off Malia. Not for the first place, not for the victory now am I, Mnistheus, contending, though I wish, but let the winners be your choices, Neptune, only, to come in last, that's shameful. Fellows, win just this, keep us from that disgrace. They stretched ahead for strokes and pulled their hearts out, making the beaked hull shake at every stroke, and sheets of sea were yanked, it seemed, from under them. Panting racked them, dry-mouthed, and the sweat ran down in streams. But actually, Chance brought them the wished for glory. As Sergestus in his wild zeal entered the danger zone and turned his prow and toward the rock, his luck failed and he struck on an outlying reef, a grinding blow, or shivered, hitting rock, and the hull hung tipped up where it went aground. With a loud shout the sailors heaved together, backing water, then brought boat hooks out and pikes, retrieving cracked oars from the sea. Mnistheus meanwhile, more ardent for his luck, with his fast oars in line, the wind behind him, took the shoreward leg through open water. As a wild dove when startled into flight beats her affrighted way over the fields, a dove whose coat and tender nestlings lie in a rock cranny, with fast clapping wings, but soon in quiet air goes floating on with wings extended motionless, just so Mnistheus, just so the sea beast cleft the sea, running for the home stretch, and just so she glided, borne by her own impetus. Sergestus was the first she left behind, 
pitted against the ledge in shallow water with pointless cries for help, learning the trick of boat racing with broken oars, a head then sea beast closed with Gis huge chimera that soon, for lack of helmsman, fell away. Now in the home stretch only one was left, Clonthus. In his track, with might and main, Mnistheus pressed on. And now the shouts from shore grew twice as loud, as all the watching crowd cheered from Mnistheus, filling the air with din. One crew fought off the shame of losing honor theirs already, glory won, they'd give their lives for fame, but luck empowered the others, who felt that they could do it, and so could. The prows now even, they were close indeed to winning, had Clonthus not stretched out his hands to seaward and in bursts of prayer called on the gods to hear his vows, O gods whose power is on the deep sea and whose waves I'm racing over, I shall place with joy a snow-white bull before your altars, here upon the shore, in payment of my vow, and fling the parts into the sea and pour a stream of wine. Under the depth of water all the Nereids, Forcus company, and virgin Penopia heard his prayer, and Father Portunus, the harbour god, with his great hand impelled the Scylla onward. Swifter than a gust out of the east or arrow on the wing she ran for land and took her place in the deep harbour. Then when all were called together, and Chyses' son proclaimed by the loud crier Clonthus winner and veiled his temples with Green Bay. Moreover, to each contending ship he gave a choice of bullocks, three to each, with wine and one great bar of silver to be borne away. Additional rewards went to the captains, a cloak, woven with gold thread, for the winner, bordered with a meander's double line of Melaby and crimson, pictured there the royal boy amid the boughs of Ida running with javelin, tiring out swift deer, so lifelike in the chase he seemed to pant. Then Jove's big bird, his weapon carrier, whisked him aloft from Ida in his talons, while aged guardians held out their hands to heaven in vain and wild hounds barked at air. To him whose valour won him second place a triple shirt of mail close wrought with links of polished gold, a trophy of Aeneas' victory over Demolios, near the river Simois under Troy's high wall. This shirt Aeneas gave to Mnistheus, as an honour, and as protection in the wars to come. Phygeus and Sagoras, his body servants, could barely carry all its folds on shoulders braced for it, though in other days Demolios in this shirt and on the run had harried straggling Trojans. The third prize Aeneas gave was a pair of brazen cauldrons and silver cups embossed in high relief. All now rewarded, proud of their rich things, beribboned, garlanded, they were going off, when back from the rude rock, barely dislodged by every skill, limping, with missing oars on one or bank, comedian Sergestus brought his long craft ingloriously in. Often you'll see a snake on a high road a followed will has run obliquely over or a pedestrian with a heavy stone has torn and left half dead, to get away it sets in motion its long coils, in part still dangerous with blazing eyes and rearing hissing head, in part immobilized by the crippling wound, writhing upon itself. So sluggish under oars the ship moved on, but then she hoisted sail and entered harbour under full sail. Glad for the rescued ship and crew, Aeneas gave the promised gift, a slave woman who knew Minerva's craft, the Cretan Philoe, with nursing twins. Now that the ship race had been run, Aeneas walked to a grassy field that wooded hills curved all around, a vale and an arena. There with a crowd of thousands the great captain betook himself and took a central place, a seat on a platform. Now he called on those whom hope for gain led to compete in running, and set out prizes for them. From all sides they came up, Teucrians with Sicilians mixed, Nisus and Euryalus in the lead, Euryalus exceptional for beauty and bloom of youth, whom Nisus dearly loved. Next came Diorus of the royal line of Priam, then, together, Salius and Patron, this one an Achaemenian, the other from Arcadia, a Tegean. Then two Sicilians, Helimus, and Panopes, men of the woods, henchmen of old Acestes, and many more whose names are in the dark. Aeneas spoke among them, be aware of this, now, bear it happily in mind, not one goes off without a gift from me. Two Cretan arrows shot in polished steel and a double-bladed axe, inlaid in silver, await each one of you, the same reward. Then prizes go to the first three finishers with pale green olive garlands, he who wins will get a horse, fully caparisoned, the runner-up, an Amazonian quiver full of Thracian arrows, and a strap of broad gold, buckled with a well-cut gem. As for the third-place winner, let him go contented with this Argive helm. At this they towed the line, and when they heard the signal, suddenly given, broke from the starting post and made off on the track like an outriding rack of storm cloud. As they marked the finish, Nisus flashed out, sprinting into the lead, faster than gale wind or a bolt of thunder. After him, but far behind, came Salius, and after Salius by a space Eurylus, Helimus next. But close upon him, look, Diorus in his flight matched stride with stride, nearing his shoulder, if more track remained he would have passed him or come up abreast in a dead heat. But in the home stretch now the tired men were making for the finish when Nisus stumbled by bad luck, in gore, 
a slippery place where beasts had been cut down and blood gushed on the turf soaking the grass. Elated, with the race as good as won, he staggered there and could not hold his feet on the trodden ground, but pitched on it headlong in the mire and blood of offerings. Though beaten, this man did not forget Eurylus, his beloved, but surging from the spot of slipperiness he tripped up Salius, and he in turn went tumbling head over heels to lie flat, as Eurylus flashed past by his friend's help running to win first place amid applause and cheers. Then Helimus came in and then Diorus, third place now. At this point the whole banked assemblage rang with Salius' clamour, facing the front row elders, for the honour stolen from him by a foul. The crowd's support and his own quiet tears were in Eurylus's favour, prowess ever more winning for a handsome form. Diorus backed him with loud protestations, having won third place all in vain if the first prize went back to Salius. Then fatherly Aeneas said, Your prizes stand as they are, young fellows. There will be no change by anyone in the winning order. Let me console a blameless friend's bad luck. With this he gave a gachelin lion's hide with shaggy mane and gilded claws to Salius. Nisus now said, If losers get rewards as great as that, and you console a fall, what proper gift will you give Nisus, then? First prize, the crown, is what I earned by rights had fortune not opposed me, taken me out as it did Salius. While he spoke he showed his face and body all befouled with mire. Smiling at Nisus, fatherly Aeneas ordered a shield brought out, Didymane's work, removed once by Danaeans from a portal sacred to Neptune, this exceptional prize he gave to the conspicuous runner. After the races had been held and prizes given, now, said Aeneas, anyone who is a fighting heart and fortitude, step forward, put up your hands for the encasing hide. He set a double prize then for the boxing, a bullock for the winner, dressed with gold and snowy wool, a sword and a choice helm as comfort for the beaten man. Straightway, without an instant's pause, in his huge power, Dares got up amid the murmurous crowd, the one man who had held his ground with Paris, the man, too, who knocked out the champion, beauties, beside the burial mound where Hector lies, beauties, a giant boxer, bragged of coming from the Bibrytian tribe of Amicus, but Dares stretched him half dead on the sand. So powerful, the man reared up his head for combat, showed his shoulders breadth, his reach with left and right, threw punches at the air. Who would fight him? Among all those men not one dared put the leather on his hands. Thinking all had withdrawn, yielding the prize, he took his stance before Aeneas' feet and made no bones of grasping the bull's horn in his left hand, and saying, Son of the goddess, if no one dares commit himself to boxing, how long must I stand here? How long may I properly be kept waiting? Say the word, and I lead off the prize. Then all the Dardans murmured, Let the man have what was promised. Acestes, though, had hard words for Antellus sitting beside him on a couch of turf, Antellus, what price now that in the old days you were our strongest fighting man? Will you sit here so meek and let a prize like that be carried off without a fight? Where now is our god, Eryx, whom you call your teacher but let down in the end? What of your fame through all Trinacria, and the booty hung about your hall? And Tellus softly answered, Not that love of honour or appetite for glory have given way, beaten by fear, I'm slowed by age, my blood runs feebly now without heat, and my strength is spent, my body muscle-bound. Had I that youth again that I had once, and that this arrogant fellow counts on, I would need no setting on, no prize, no pretty steer, to make me meet him, gifts don't concern me. After saying this, he tossed into the ring a pair of gauntlets monstrously heavy, which the fighter Eryx used to bind on his forearms and hands, hard rawhide. And the crowd looked on amazed, so huge they were, of seven ox hides, barred with lead and iron sewn to stiffen them. Dares himself stared more than anyone and moved away, reluctant for a bout. Meanwhile Anchises' great-souled son picked up and tried the gauntlets, turning their rolled-up weight this way and that. The veteran Antellus now spoke up in his deep voice, what then if anyone had seen Hercules' gloves and the grim fight, here on this very shore? These were the armor worn by your own brother Eryx, even now you see them stained with blood and spattered brains. In these at last he faced the great Alcides, and in these I used to fight, while hotter blood sustained me and age had not won out as yet or scattered snow on my brows. But if this Trojan, dares, refuses our equipment, if Aeneas in fairness so decides, and my proponent, Acestes, nods, will equalize the fight. Here, I give up the oxhide gloves of Eryx. Breathe easier, pull off your Trojan gloves. He threw the double mantle from his shoulders, bared his great arms and legs, all thew and bone, and took his stand, gigantic, in the arena. Now with paternal care Anchises' son brought gauntlets of the same weight out to tie on both men's hands. Then instantly each in his stance moved on his toes and put his fists up high in air, holding his head well back out of the range of blows. They sparred with rights and lefts, each trying to sting the other into unguarded fighting. 
one had speed of footwork and elan of youth, the other giant mass and brawn, but his slow knees quivered and buckled, painful gasping shook him, huge as he was. Often they punched and missed, often they hit, thudding on flanks and ribs or making chests resound. Then flurrying punches pummeled ears and temples, and their jaws would crunch at every solid blow. And Tellus gravely stood in the same unshifting stance, watchful to roll with punches or to slip them. Dares, like one assaulting a tall city or laying siege to a stronghold on a height, tried this approach, then that, explored the ground on all sides cleverly, came on, came in from various angles, all to no avail. Then surging up, and Tellus poised his right and threw it, but the other in his quickness saw the blow descending and just in time slipped out from under. All in Tellus' force being spent on air, by his own impetus the mighty man fell mightily to earth, as ponderously as, from time to time, a hollow and uprooted pine will fall on Arimanthus or the range of Idaho Teucrians and Sicilians and their rivalry rose together, as a shout went up, and, running out, Acestes was the first to help the old man, his contemporary, up from the ground. Now neither hurt and slowed or shaken by the fall, the fighting man returned to combat hotter than before, his power excited by his anger. Shame aroused him, too, and his own sense of manhood, so that he went for dares, driving him headlong over the ring, redoubling cuffs with right and left alike, no pause, no rest. As thick and fast as hail, drumming on roofs in a big storm, were the old hero's blows with both hands battering and spinning dares. Fatherly Aeneas would not sit by while this fury went further, so Berserk and Tellus was in the rancor of his soul. He stopped the fight, and saved bone-weary dares, saying to comfort him, Poor fellow, how could rashness take you this way? Don't you feel a force now more than mortal is against you and heaven's will is changed? We'll bow to that. So, speaking loudly, he broke off the battle, and loyal shipmates took dares in hand, weak need, his head wobbling from side to side spitting out teeth mixed in with gobs of blood. They led him to the ships, and then, recalled, received the helm and sword, leaving the palm and bullock for Antellus. The old champion, glorying in his courage and his prize, spoke out, Son of the goddess, Teucrians all, now see what power was in me in my prime, and see the death from which you rescued dares. He set himself to face the bull that stood there, prize of the battle, then drew back his right and from his full height lashed his hard glove out between the horns. The impact smashed the skull and fragmented the brains. Down went the ox a quiver to sprawl dying on the ground. The man stood over it and in deep tones proclaimed, Here is a better life in place of dares, Eryx, here I lay down my gauntlets and my art. Immediately after this, Aeneas invited all so minded to contend with speeding arrows, and he set the prizes. A mast out of Seresta's ship he raised with his own giant hand, and at the top tethered a dove upon a cord as target for them to shoot at. When they gathered round a bronze helm took their lots. First shaken out, and greeted by his partisans with cheers, was Hippocoon, son of Herticus, then Mnistheus, second place winner in the ship race, wearing his olive garland, and the third was Eurytion, brother to you, illustrious Pandarus, who in another day, when given command to break the truce, led off with a bow-bent arrow shot amid the Achaeans. The last one out, deep in the helm, Acestes, he, too, ventured to try the young men's feet. Now with stout arms they flexed their bows, each man hefting his own before him, and then drew their shafts from quivers. Right across the sky, as the bowstring twanged, the first winged arrow, shot by the son of Herticus, whipped through the air to strike and then stay fixed in the mass timber. The long pole trembled and the terrified bird fluttered, as all the place rang with applause. Now Menistheus took his eager stand, bow bent, and aimed his gaze and full-drawn arrow high, but by hard luck he missed the bird herself, his steel point cut the flaxen cord, by which, tied to her foot, the bird hung from the mast. Away she soared, into the south wind, white against dark clouds. In a flash, Eurytion, long ready with his bow bent, arrow drawn, and whispering to his archer brother's shade as he tracked the dove delighting in open sky with clapping wings, now put his arrow through her under a black cloud. Down she plummeted and left her life in the upper air of stars, but brought down with her the transfixing shaft. Only Acestes now remained, although the prize escaped him, still he bent his bow and shot into the air, showing them all his old-time archer's power and bow that sang. But here before their startled eyes appeared an omen of great import, afterward mighty events made it all clear and poets far in the future fabled it in awe. The arrow flying in thin cloud caught fire and left a track of flame until, burnt out, it vanished in the wind, as shooting stars will often slip away across the sky trailing their blown hair. Everyone stood still and thunderstruck, with prayer to heaven's powers, Trinocrians and Teucrians alike. Aeneas' great soul soon embraced the sign, embraced joyous Acestes, loaded him with handsome gifts, and said, Here, take them, 
Father, you are the one the great king of Olympus wished by these auspices to be distinguished apart from others. You shall have this gift that in his age had been Anchises' own, a mixing bowl, engraved, that Sisius of Thrace once gave my father, a princely thing, to keep as a reminder and pledge of love. With this he bound Acestes' brows with laurel, proclaiming him the winner before all, preferm it never grudged by that good fellow, Eurytion, though he alone had brought the dove down from the sky. The third place winner, he who had cut the cord, came forward next for his reward, and last came he who fixed his arrow in the timber of the mast. But even before the finish of this contest Aeneas called aside Epitides, bodyguard and companion of young Iulus, and spoke into his ear, go out and tell Ascanius, if he has the boy's troop ready here along with him, and has maneuvers planned for the horses, tell him to lead them on for grandfather, these squadrons, and to let himself be seen in arms. Aeneas now commanded the whole crowd to withdraw from the long track and open up the playing field. Then came the riders, boys in even ranks, all shining before their parents' eyes, all mounts in hand, and, as they passed, admiring murmurs rose from men of Sicily and men of Troy. The troopers had their hair smartly pressed down by well-trimmed wreaths, each had a pair of lances made of cornel, tipped with steel. Some shoulders bore glossy quivers. All wore twisted gold and a pliant necklace on the upper chest. There were three squadrons, three commanders, weaving right and left, behind each one there came two files of six boy riders in open column bright in the sun, and a trainer to each column. Number one squadron gloried in its leader, little Priam, who bore his grandsire's name, your noble son, Polites, and a destined sire of Italians, riding a Thracian mount with dappling of white, white pasterns and upon his haughty brow a snow-white blaze. Atis had command of the second squadron, from whom the Latin Atai have their name, small Atis, cherished boy to boy by Iulus. Third and last, and handsomest of all, came Iulus, riding a Sidonian mount given him by the glowing beauty, Dido, to be a keepsake and a pledge of love. The other troopers rode Sicilian horses of old Acestes. Dardans with applause now greeted the shy boys and loved their show, marking in each the features of his forebears. After the troop had circled the assembly before their family's eyes, Epitides from the wings shouted an order pre-arranged and cracked his whip. The column split apart as files and the three squadrons all in line turned away, cantering left and right, recalled, they wheeled and dipped their lances for a charge. They entered then on parades and counter-parades, the two detachments, matched in the arena, winding in and out of one another, and whipped into sham cavalry skirmishes by bearing backs in flight, then whirling round with leveled points, then patching up a truce and riding side by side. So intricate in ancient times on mountainous Crete they say the labyrinth, between walls in the dark, ran crisscross a bewildering thousand ways devised by guile, a maze insoluble, breaking down every clue to the way out. So intricate the drill of Trojan boys who wove the patterns of their pacing horses, figured, in sport, retreats and skirmishes, like dolphins in the drenching sea, Carpathian or Libyan, that shear through waves in play. This mode of drill, this mimicry of war, Ascanius brought back in our first years when he walled Alba Longa, and he taught the ancient Latins to perform the drill as he had done with other Trojan boys. The Albans taught their children, and in turn Great Rome took up this glory of the founders. The boys are called Troy now, the whole troop Trojan. Rites for Aeneas' father had reached this point, when fortune now first altered and betrayed them. While they were honoring the tomb with games Saturnian Juno sent her iris down from heaven, exhaling winds to waft her far to the Trojan fleet. Juno had plans afoot, her ancient rancor not yet satisfied. So Iris glided on the colored rainbow, seen by none, swift goddess, on her way. She sighted the great crowd, then scanned the shore, saw ports deserted and ships unattended, but on a desolate beach apart, the women wept for Anchises lost as they gazed out in tears at the unfathomable sea. How many waves remain for us to cross, how broad a sea, though we are weary, weary? All had one thing to say, a town and home were what they dreamed of, sick of toil at sea. Taking her cue, darting into their midst, adept at doing ill, Iris put off her aspect as a goddess, and her gown, to take the form of aged Barreau, wife of the Tmerian, Doriclus, blessed with noble birth, a name at Troy, and children. In this guise she advanced among the mothers. Miserable women that we are, she said, whom Noah Chi in hand dragged out to death under the walls of our old fatherland. Unlucky nation, for what final blow is fortune keeping you alive? We've seen the seventh summer since the fall of Troy, and all these years we have been driven on by land and sea, by hostile rocks and stars, to measure the great water in our quest for Italy, an Italy that recedes while we endure the roll of the sea swell. Here is the land of Eryx, our old brother, here is our host, Acestes. Who prevents our building here a town for town dwellers? Country of our fathers, dear hearth gods rescued from the enemy to no end, 
will never a wall be called the wall of Troy? Shall I not see on earth Simois and Xanthus, Hector's rivers? Come now, all of you, set fire to those infernal ships with me. I dreamed the clairvoyant Cassandra came with burning torches, offering them, saying, here you may look for Troy. Your home is here. Why wait? High time we acted on such portents. See there, Neptune's four altar flames, the god has fire for us, the god will give us courage. Urging them on, she picked a dangerous brand, lifted it high and swept it into flame and threw it. Taken by surprise, the women stood bewildered. Then one from the crowd, the eldest, Pyrgo, royal governess to Priam's many sons, cried, Do not take her for Barreau, this is not she, the Redian, wife of Doriclus, mothers. Just observe what traits she has of more than mortal beauty, her blazing eyes, her audacity, her face, her voice, her stride. I tell you, I myself left Barreau just now, and she is ill, vexed, too, that she alone missed our observance and paid no tribute to Anchises. Thus Pyrgo reported to them. Women of Troy, they looked now toward the ships, uncertainly, with animosity, half in unhappy love of landscapes there before them, half still bound to fated realms calling them onward, and the goddess on strong wings went up the sky traversing a great rainbow under clouds. Now truly wrought upon by signs and wonders, wrought to a frenzy, all cried out together, snatching up fire from hearths, despoiling altars, taking dry foliage, brush, and brands to throw. And Vulcan, god of fire, unbridled rage through rowing thwarts and oars and piney hulls. Courier Eumelus brought to Anchises' tomb and the bank theatre news of ships on fire, and looking round they saw the dark smoke cloud with soaring embers. First to act, Ascanius, as he had led his troop rejoicing, now whipped on his horse to reach the mutinous camp, and winded trainers could not hold him back. What unheard of madness! The boy shouted. Where now, where do you intend to go? Poor miserable women of our city, not the enemy, not the Argive camp, but your own hopes are what you burn. Look here, I am your own Ascanius. And he hurled before their feet his hollow helm, put on for the sham battles. Meanwhile in all hasty Aeneas came, and the Trojan companies. But the women scattered here and there in fear along the beaches, in the woods, wherever they could take cover in rock caves, ashamed to face the daylight, face what they had done, for now they knew their own, and their shocked hearts were free of Juno. Not on that account did fires lit by them lose power or yield to counteraction. Under wetted oak the caulking smouldered and exuded smoke as the great sluggish heat ate into hulls and the contagion seeped all through the body, neither men's force nor streams of water poured prevailed on it. Now God-fearing Aeneas rent the shirt upon his shoulders. Throwing wide his hands, he begged high heaven for help, Almighty Jupiter, unless by now you loathe all Trojans to the last man, if divine kindness shown in ancient days can still pay heed to mortal suffering, grant that our fleet survive this fire, Father, even now, at the last moment save the frail affairs of Trojans from destruction. Otherwise, do what now remains to do, with your consuming bolt, with your right hand, if I deserve it, blast me and overwhelm us. Scarce had he spoken when a black storm broke in wild fury with spouting rain, while peals of thunder shook the low lands and high places. Down from the whole sky the torrents came in dense murk, black as pitch, out of the south. And ships were filled up, half-burnt timbers drenched, till all the fires were out, and all the hulls, except for four, delivered from the burning. Aeneas had been stunned by the mischance and could not rest, turning this way and that within him, coping with momentous questions, should he forget the destiny foretold and make his home in Sicily, or try again for Italy. Knots, an older man, and one whom Pallas Tritonia had taught his famous thoughtfulness, she gave him answers, as to the meaning of the gods' great wrath or what the pattern of the fates required, Knots addressed Aeneas to give him heart, Sir, born of an immortal, let us follow where our fates may lead, or lead us back. Whatever comes, all fortune can be mastered by endurance. You have Acestes, a Dardanian divine in lineage, make him your counsellor, congenial as he is, in all your plans. And now these ships are burnt, hand over to him the number of those they might have carried, those too weary of your great quest, your seafaring, men who have had long lives, women worn out on shipboard, feeble men, afraid of danger, set them apart, and let them have their city here in this land, the tired ones, and they may with permission call their town Acesta. His old friend's plan attracted him, but still Aeneas wondered, all the more torn between anxieties of all kinds. As now black night borne upward in her car possessed the sky, out of the dark, from heaven, his father's image seemed to float suddenly and speak, My son, dearer to me than life while life remained, and pitted now against the fates of Troy, I come by Jove's command who drove away the fire from your ships, being moved to pity in heaven's height at last. Obey the counsel, beautiful as it is, now given by knots, embark for Italy chosen men, 
the bravest. In Latium you must battle down and war a hard race, hard by nurture and by training. First, however, visit the underworld the halls of Dis, and through profound Avernus come to meet me, son. Black Tartarus with its grim realm of shades is not my home, but radiant gatherings of godly souls I have about me in Elysium. To that place the pure Sibyl, after blood of many black sheep flows out, will conduct you. Then you will hear of your whole race to come and what walled town is given you. Farewell, night passes midway on her wheeling course, and cruel sunrise fan me with a breath her laboring team exhaled. And after speaking he faded like thin smoke into the air. Aeneas cried, So soon? Where to, then? Must you vanish? Are you taking flight from someone? Who can forbid you to be held by me? So he called out, then turned to poke the embers, the drowsing fire on his hearth, and paid his humble duty to the Lar of Troy and Vesta's shrine, the goddess of the hearth, with ground meal, as in ritual sacrifice, and a full incense casket. Then at once he called his captains, told Acestes first of Jove's command as taught by his dear father, and what now stood decided in his mind. No long exchange, no dissent from Acestes. They listed, for the town, the older women and set aside men so inclined, who felt no need of winning honour. The remainder built new thwarts, replaced burnt timbers, fitted oars and rigging, a slim band of men but brave hearts, keen for war. Meanwhile Aeneas marked with a plough the limits of the town and gave home sites by lot. One place should be called Ilium, he decreed, one quarter Troy. Acestes, Trojan that he was, took pleasure in his new realm, proclaiming an assembly and giving laws to the senate now convoked. Then on Mount Eryx height a shrine was built, hard by the stars, to Venus of Adalia, and round about Anchises' tomb they left a hallowed grove, with an attendant priest. Nine days the people feasted, and the altars fumed with offerings, light airs lulled the sea and blowing often from the south renewed their call to cross the main. A sound of weeping rose on the curving shore, as by a night, and then a day, embracing, they postponed it. Even those women, even those men, to whom the sea's face had seemed harsh, its very name intolerable, now desired to go and bear all exile's toil. Aeneas spoke to them with kindness and commended them in tears to their blood brother Acestes. He decreed three calves be slain to Eryx and a lamb to the storm winds. Cables were then cast off, as he himself, wearing an olive garland, standing upon the prow apart, held out the shallow cup and flung the vitals down into the salt surf, then poured out the wine. Wind coming up astern blew in their wake as crewmen struck their oars into the swell and swept a path over the sea. But now, beset with worries, Venus turned to Neptune, unfolding from her heart complaints and pleas, Juno's anger, and her implacable heart, drive me to prayers beneath my dignity. No length of time, no piety affects her, unbroken in will by Jove's commands or fate, she never holds her peace. To have devoured a city from the heart of Phrygia's people in her vile hatred, this was not enough, nor to have dragged the remnant left from Troy through all harassment. Now she harries still Troy's bones and ashes. She alone may know the causes of such madness. You yourself are witness to the giant storm she roused not long ago in the sea off Libya, mixing sea and sky, with hurricane winds of Elis her standby, though in vain, and all this dared in your domain. But look at her new crime, how she egged on the Trojan women to their foul ship burning, making the Trojans, for that loss of ships, forsake their own folk in a strange country. But as to what comes next, I beg you, let them safely entrust their sailing ships to you across the water, let them reach that stream, Laurentine Tiber, if one may concede these favours, if the Parsi grant their city. The son of Saturn, tamer of the deep, replied, Cytherea, you have every right to trust my kingdom, you were born from it. Then, too, I've merited your trust, so often have I repressed those mad fits and that fury of heavens and the sea. On land as well, as Xanthus and Simois can testify, I cared for your Aeneas. That day Achilles, hot in pursuit, pinned Trojan troops half dead with fright against their walls and killed a myriad, making the rivers, choked with corpses, groan, so Xanthus could not find his bed or send his current seaward. Then, as Aeneas fought, against the odds, against the frown of heaven, the mighty son of Peleus, it was I who caught and saved him in a sack of cloud, lust though I did to cast down walls I built with my own hands, walls of oath-breaking Troy. To this day my regard for him is the same. Dispel your fear. He shall, as you desire, enter Avernus port. One shall be lost, but only one to look for, lost at sea, one life given for many. He assured and cheered the goddess in this way, then yoked his team with gold, fitted the foaming bits in their wild mouths, and let the reins run free, flying light on the crests in his blue car. Waves calmed and quieted, the long sea swell smoothed out under his thundering axle tree, and storm clouds thinned away in heaven's vast air. 
Now came the diverse shapes of his companions, enormous whales and Glaucus hoary troop, Polemon, son of Eno, arrowy tritons, Forcus whole host, Thetis and Melidi and virgin Panopia on the left, Nessie, Spio, Talia, Simodice. The joys of the fair weather filled in turn Aeneas' attentive heart. Up with the masts, he ordered. Sails unfurled from the yard arms. The seamen as one man hauled on the sheets now port, now starboard, set the bellying canvas evenly to the wind, and took the braces, veering, this way and that, yard arms aloft until the freshening stern wind filled the sails and bore them onward. On the leading ship Palinurus guided the close formation, all under orders to set course by him. Now dewy night had touched her midway mark or nearly, and the crews, relaxed in peace on their hard rowing benches, took their rest, when Somnus, gliding softly from the stars put the night air aside, parted the darkness, Palinurus, in quest of you. He brought bad dreams to you, in all your guiltlessness. Upon the high poop deck the gods sat down in Forbus guise, and said, Son of Iasius, Palinurus, the very sea itself moves the ships onward. There's a steady breeze. The hour for rest has come. Put down your head and steal a respite for your tired eyes. I'll man your tiller for a while. But Palinurus barely looked around. He said, Forget my good sense for this peaceful face the sea puts on, the calm swell? Put my trust in that capricious monster? Or hand over Aeneas to the tricky winds, when I have been deceived so often by clear weather? With this response he held fast to the helm and would not give it up, but kept his eyes upon the stars. Now see the god, his bow a drip with Lethe's dew, and slumberous with Stygian power, giving it a shake over the pilot's temples, to unfix, although he fought it, both his swimming eyes. His unexpected drowse barely begun, Somnus leaned over him and flung him down in the clear water, breaking off with him a segment of the stern and steering oar. Head first he went down, calling in vain on friends. The god himself took flight into thin air, but still the fleet ran safely on its course, serene in Father Neptune's promises. Born onward, now it neared the siren's reef, that old-time peril, white with many bones, now loud far off with trample of surf on rock. Here the commander felt a loss of way as his ship's head swung off, lacking a helmsman, and he himself took over, holding course in the night waves. Hard hit by his friend's fate and sighing bitterly, he said, for counting over much on a calm world, Palinurus, you must lie naked on some unknown shore. Book 6. The World Below. So grieving, and in tears, he gave the ship her head before the wind, drawing toward land at the Euboean settlement of Cumi. Ships came about, prows pointing seaward, anchors biting to hold them fast, and rounded stems indented all the water's edge. The men debarked in groups, eager to go ashore upon Hesperia. Some struck seeds of fire out of the veins of flint, and some explored the virgin woods, lairs of wild things, for fuel, pointing out, too, what streams they found. Aeneas, in duty bound, went inland to the heights where overshadowing Apollo dwells and nearby, in a place apart, a dark enormous cave, the Sibyl feared by men. In her the Delian god of prophecy inspires uncanny powers of mind and soul, disclosing things to come. Here Trojan captains walked to Diana of the crossroads wood and entered under roofs of gold. They say that Daedalus, when he fled the realm of Minas, dared to entrust himself to stroking wings and to the air of heaven, unheard of path, on which he swam away to the cold north at length to touch down on that very height of the Chalcidians. Here, on earth again he dedicated to you, Phoebus Apollo, the twin sweeps of his wings, here he laid out a spacious temple. In the entrance way Andragio's death appeared, then Cecrop's children ordered to pay in recompense each year the living flesh of seven sons. The urn from which the lots were drawn stood modeled there. And facing it, upon the opposite door, the land of Crete, emergent from the sea, here the brutish act appeared, Pasiphae being covered by the bull in the cow's place, then her mixed breed, her child of double form, the Minotaur, get of unholy lust. Here, too, that puzzle of the house of Minos, the maze none could untangle, until, touched by a great love shown by a royal girl, he, Daedalus himself, unraveled all the baffling turns and dead ends in the dark, guiding the blind way back by a skein unwound. In that high sculpture you, too, would have had your great part, Icarus, had grief allowed. Twice your father had tried to shape your fallen gold, but twice his hands dropped. Here the Trojans would have passed on and gazed and read it all, had not Achates, whom they had sent ahead, returned now with the priestess of Apollo and of Diana, goddess of the crossroads, Dephobe, the Sibyl, Glaucus' daughter. Thus she addressed the king, the hour demands no lagging over sights like these. Instead, you should make offering of seven young bulls from an ungelded herd, and seven again well-chosen ewes. With these words for Aeneas, orders his men were quick to act upon, 
the priestess called them to her lofty shrine. The cliff's huge flank is honeycombed, cut out in a cavern perforated a hundred times, having a hundred mouths, with rushing voices carrying the responses of the sibyl. Here, as the men approached the entrance way, the sibyl cried out, Now is the time to ask your destinies. And then, the god. Look there. The god. And as she spoke neither her face nor hue went untransformed, nor did her hair stay neatly bound, her breast heaved, her wild heart grew large with passion. Taller to their eyes and sounding now no longer like a mortal since she had felt the god's power breathing near, she cried, Slow, are you, in your vows and prayers? Trojan Aeneas, are you slow? Be quick, the great mouths of the god's house, thunderstruck, will never open till you pray. Her lips closed tight on this. A chill ran through the bones of the tough Teucrians, but their king poured out entreaties from his deepest heart, O Phoebus, God who took pity on the pain of Troy, who guided Paris' hand, his Jordan shaft, against the body of Aeseed, as you led on I entered all those seas washing great lands, and then the distant tribe of the Messilians at the Seert's edge. Now we take hold at last of Italy that slipped away so long. Grant that the fortune of Troy shall have pursued us this far only. And all you gods and goddesses as well who took offence at Ilium and our pride, at last, and rightly, you may spare Pergamum's children. Most holy prophetess, for knowing things to come, I ask no kingdom other than fate allows me, let our people make their settlement in Latium with all Troy's wandering gods and shaken powers. Then I shall dedicate a temple here to Phoebus and Diana of the crossroads, ordering festal days in Phoebus' name. A holy place awaits you in my kingdom where I shall store your prophecies, your dark revelations to my people, and appoint a chosen priesthood for you, gracious one but now commit no verses to the leaves or they may be confused, shuffled and whirled by playing winds, chant them aloud, I pray. Then he fell silent. But the prophetess whom the bestriding god had not yet broken stormed about the cavern, trying to shake his influence from her breast, while all the more he tired her mad jaws, quelled her savage heart, and tamed her by his pressure. In the end the cavern's hundred mouths all of themselves unclosed to let the sibyl's answers through, you, sir, now quit at last of the sea's dangers, for whom still greater are in store on land, the Dardan race will reach Lavinian country, put that anxiety away, but there will wish they had not come. Wars, vicious wars I see ahead, and Tiber foaming blood. Simois, Xanthus, Dorians encamped, you'll have them all again, with an Achilles, child of Latium, he, too, goddess born. And nowhere from pursuit of Teucrians will Juno stray, while you go destitute, begging so many tribes and towns for aid. The cause of suffering here again will be a bride foreign to Teucrians, a marriage made with a stranger. Never shrink from blows. Boldly, more boldly where your luck allows, go forward, face them. A first way to safety will open where you reckon on at least, from a Greek city. These were the sentences in which the Sibyl of Cumi from her shrine sang out her riddles, echoing in the cave, dark sayings muffling truths, the way Apollo pulled her up raging, or else whipped her on, digging the spurs beneath her breast. As soon as her fit ceased, her wild voice quieted, the great soldier, Aeneas, began to speak, no novel kinds of hardship, no surprises, loom ahead, sister. I foresaw them all, went through them in my mind. One thing I pray for, since it is here they say one finds the gate of the king of underworld, the shadowy marsh that wells from Acheron, may I have leave to go to my dear father's side and see him. Teach me the path, show me the entrance way. Through fires, and with a thousand spears behind, I brought him on these shoulders, rescued him amid our enemies. He shared my voyage, bore all the seas with me, hard nights and days of menace from the sea and sky, beyond the strength and lot of age, frail though he was. Indeed, he prayed this very prayer, he told me that I should come to you and beg it humbly. Pity a son and father, gracious lady, all this is in your power. Hecate gave you authority to have and hold a Vernus wood. If Orpheus could call his wife's shade up, relying on the strings that sang loud on his Thracian lyre, if Pollux redeemed his brother, taking his turn at death, so often passing back and forth, why name the heroes, Theseus and Hercules? By birth I too descend from Jove on high, while in these terms he prayed and pressed the altar, breaking in, the Sibyl said, offspring of gods by blood, Trojan and Chysis son, the way downward is easy from Avernus. Black Dis's door stands open night and day. But to retrace your steps to heaven's air, there is the trouble, there is the toil. A few whom a benign Jupiter has loved or whom fiery heroism has borne to heaven, sons of gods, could do it. All midway are forests, then Cocytus, thick and black, winds through the gloom. But if you feel such love, and such desire to cross the Stygian water twice, to view the night of Tartarus twice, if this mad efforts to your liking, then consider what you must accomplish first. 
A tree's deep shade conceals a bough whose leaves and pliant twigs are all of gold, a thing sacred to Juno of the lower world. The whole grove shelters it, and thickest shade in dusky valleys shuts it in. And yet no one may enter hidden depths below the earth unless he picks this bough, the tree's fruit, with its foliage of gold. For Serpina decreed this bough, as do her, should be given into her own fair hands when torn away. In place of it a second grows up without fail, all gold as well, flowering with metallic leaves again. So lift your eyes and search, and once you find it pull away the bough. It will come willingly, easily, if you are called by fate. If not, with all your strength you cannot conquer it, cannot lop it off with a sword's edge. A further thing is this, your friend's dead body, ah, but you don't know, lies out there unburied, polluting all your fleet with death while you are lingering, waiting on my counsel here at my door. First give the man his rest, entomb him, lead black beasts to sacrifice, begin with these amends. Then in due course you'll see the Stygian forest rise before you, regions not for the living. She fell silent, closing her lips. With downcast face and eyes Aeneas turned from the cavern to the shore, dark matters on his mind. Steadfast Achates walked beside him with deliberate pace and equal anxieties. The two exchanged in shifting conversation many guesses as to that friend, now dead, now to be buried, so the prophetess had said, then suddenly as they came down to the dry beach they saw Mycenaeus, robbed of life by early death, their own Mycenaeus, a son of Aeolus, never surpassed at rousing fighting men with brazen trumpet, setting Mars afire. Once he had been great Hector's adjutant, going forward at Hector's side in battle, brilliant with trumpet and with spear as well. After Achilles took the life of Hector, this gallant soldier joined Erdan Aeneas in allegiance to no lesser cause. That day by chance, as he blew notes on a hollow shell, making the sea sing back, in his wild folly he dared the gods to rival him. Then Triton, envious, if this can be believed, caught him and put him under in the surf amid the rocks offshore. All who were there clamored around the body and lament, Aeneas, the good captain, most of all. In haste then, even as they wept, they turned to carry out the orders of the Sibyl, racing to pile up logs for the altar pyre and build it sky high. Into the virgin forest, thicket of wild things, went the men, and down the pitch pines came, the bitten ilex rang with axe blows, ash and oak were split with wedges, mighty rowans were trundled down the slopes. Aeneas himself went first in all this labor, cheering his fellows on, with implements like theirs in hand, but grimly in his heart he wondered, studying the unmeasured forest, and fell to prayer, if only the golden bough might shine for us in such a wilderness. As all the prophetess foretold was true, Mycenaeus, in your case only too true. The words were barely uttered when two doves in casual flight out of the upper air came down before the man's eyes to alight on the green grass, and the great hero knew these birds to be his mother's. Joyously he prayed, O oh be my guides, if there's a way. Wing on, into that woodland where the bough, the priceless bough, shadows the fertile ground. My divine mother, do not fail your son in a baffling time. Then he stood still to see what signs the doves might give, or where their flight might lead him. And they fed, and then flew on, each time as far as one who came behind could keep in view. Then when they reached the gorge of Sulphurus Avernus, first borne upward through the loosened air, they glided down to their desired rest, the two-hued tree where glitter of gold filtered between green boughs. Like mistletoe that in the woods in winter thrives with yellowish berries and new leaves, a parasite on the trunk it twines around, so bright amid the dark green ilex shone the golden leafage, rustling in light wind. Aeneas at once briskly took hold of it and, though it clung, greedily broke it off, then carried it to the Sibyl's cave. Meanwhile the Teucrians on the shore wept for Mycenaeus, doing for thankless dust the final honors. First they built up a giant pyre, enriched with pitch pine and split oak, with somber boughs alongside and dark cypresses in front. On top they made a blazon of bright arms. One group set water boiling over flames, then washed the cold corpse and anointed it, groaning loud, and laid it out when mourned on a low couch, with purple robes thrown over it, a hero's shrouding. Bearers then took up as their sad duty the great beer. With eyes averted in their father's ancient way they held the torch below. Heaped offerings blazed up and burned, food, incense, oil in bowls. And when the flame died and the coals fell in, they gave a bath of wine to the pyre's remnant, thirsty ash, then picking out the bones Coroneus and closed them in an urn. The same priest with pure water went three times around the company, aspurging them with cleansing drops from a ripe olive sprig, and spoke the final words. Faithfully then Aeneas heaped a great tomb over the dead, placing his arms, his oar, his trumpet there beneath a promontory, named for him, missing him now and always, age to age. All this accomplished, with no more ado he carried out the orders of the Sibyl. The cavern was profound, wide-mouthed, and huge, rough underfoot, 
defended by dark pool and gloomy forest. Overhead, flying things could never safely take their way, such deathly exhalations rose from the black gorge into the dome of heaven. The priestess here placed four black bullocks, wet their brows with wine, plucked bristles from between the horns and laid them as her first offerings on the holy fire, calling aloud to Hecate, supreme in heaven and Erebus. Others drew knives across beneath and caught warm blood in bowls. Aeneas by the sword's edge offered up to night, the mother of the Eumenides, and her great sister, Earth, a black fleece lamb, a sterile cow to thee, Proserpina. Then for the Stygian king he lit at night new altars where he placed over the flames entire carcasses of bulls, and poured rich oil on blazing viscera. Only see, just at the light's edge, just before sunrise, earth rumbled underfoot, forested ridges broke into movement, and far howls of dogs were heard across the twilight as the goddess nearer and nearer came. Away, away, the sibyl cried, all those unblessed, away. Depart from all the grove. But you, Aeneas, enter the path here, and unsheath your sword. There's need of gall and resolution now. She flung herself wildly into the cave mouth, leading, and he strode boldly at her heels. Gods who rule the ghosts, all silent shades, and chaos and infernal fiery stream, and regions of wide night without a sound, may it be right to tell what I have heard, may it be right, and fitting, by your will, that I describe the deep world sunk in darkness under the earth. Now dim to one another in desolate night they walked on through the gloom, through Dis's homes all void, and empty realms, as one goes through a wood by a faint moon's treacherous light, when Jupiter veils the sky and black night blots the colors of the world. Before the entrance, in the jaws of Orcus, grief and avenging cares have made their beds, and pale diseases and sad age are there, and dread, and hunger that sways men to crime, and sordid want, in shapes to affright the eyes, and death and toil and death's own brother, sleep, and the mind's evil joys, on the door sill death bringing war, and iron cubicles of the humanities, and raving discord, viperish hair bound up in gory bands. In the courtyard a shadowy giant elm spreads ancient boughs, her ancient arms where dreams, false dreams, the old tale goes, beneath each leaf cling and are numberless. There, too, about the doorway forms of monsters crowd, centaurs, twiformed scyllas, hundred-armed Briarius, and the Lerny and Hydra hissing horribly, and the Chimera breathing dangerous flames, and Gorgons, Harpies, huge Gyrian, triple-bodied ghost. Here, swept by sudden fear, drawing his sword, Aeneas stood on guard with naked edge against them as they came. If his companion, knowing the truth, had not admonished him how faint these lives were, empty images hovering bodiless, he had attacked and cut his way through phantoms, empty air. The path goes on from that place to the waves of Tartarus's Acheron. Thick with mud, a whirlpool out of a vast abyss boils up and belches all the silt it carries into Cocytus. Here the ferryman, a figure of fright, keeper of waters and streams, is Charon, foul and terrible, his beard grown wild and hoar, his staring eyes all flame, his sordid cloak hung from a shoulder knot. Alone he pulls his craft and trims the sails and in his rusty hull ferries the dead, old now, but old age and the gods is green. Here a whole crowd came streaming to the banks, mothers and men, the forms with all life spent of heroes great in valor, boys and girls unmarried, and young sons laid on the pyre before their parents' eyes, as many souls as leaves that yield their hold on boughs and fall through forests in the early frost of autumn, or as migrating birds from the open sea that darken heaven when the cold season comes and drives them overseas to sunlit lands. There all stood begging to be first across and reached out longing hands to the far shore. But the grim boatmen now took these aboard, now those, waving the rest back from the strand. In wonder at this and touched by the commotion, Aeneas said, Tell me, sister, what this means, the crowd at the stream. Where are the souls bound? How are they tested, so that these turn back, while those take oars to cross the dead black water? Briefly the ancient priestess answered him, Cocytus is the deep pool that you see, the swamp of sticks beyond, infernal power by which the gods take oath and fear to break it. All in the nearby crowd you notice here are pauper souls, the souls of the unburied. Karen's the boatman. Those the water bears are souls of buried men. He may not take them shore to dread shore on the horse currents there until their bones rest in the grave, or till they flutter and roam this side a hundred years, they may have passage then, and may return to cross the deeps they long for. And Kaisi's son had halted, pondering on so much, and stood in pity for the soul's hard lot. Among them he saw two sad ones of unhonored death, Lucaspis and the Lycian fleet's commander, Orontes, who had sailed the windy sea from Troy together, till the southern gale had swamped and whirled them down, both ship and men. Of a sudden he saw his helmsman, Palinurus, going by, who but a few nights before on course from Libya, as he watched the stars, had been pitched overboard astern. 
as soon as he made sure of the disconsolate one and all the gloom, Aeneas called, which God took you away from us and put you under, Palinurus? Tell me. In this one prophecy Apollo, who had never played me false, falsely foretold you'd be unharmed at sea and would arrive at the Ausonian coast. Is the promise kept? But the shade said, Phoebus Cauldron told you no lie, my captain, and no god drowned me at sea. The helm that I hung on to, duty bound to keep our ship on course, by some great shock chanced to be torn away, and I went with it overboard. I swear by the rough sea, I feared less for myself than for your ship, with rudder gone and steersman knocked overboard, it might well come to grief in big seas running. Three nights, heavy weather out of the south on the vast water tossed me. On the fourth dawn, I sighted Italy dimly ahead, as a wave crest lifted me. By turns I swam and rested, swam again and got my footing on the beach, but savages attacked me as I clutched at a cliff top, weighted down by my wet clothes. Poor fools, they took me for a prize and ran me through. Surf has me now, and sea winds, washing me close in shore. By heaven's happy light and the sweet air, I beg you, by your father, and by your hopes of Iulus rising star, deliver me from this captivity, unconquered friend. Throw earth on me, you can, put into Valia port. Or if there be some way to do it, if your goddess mother shows a way, and I feel sure you pass these streams and Stygian marsh by heaven's will, give this poor soul your hand, take me across, let me at least in death find quiet haven. When he had made his plea, the sibyl said, From what source comes this craving, Palinurus? Would you though still unburied see the Styx and the grim river of the Eumenides, or even the river bank, without a summons? Abandon hope by prayer to make the gods change their decrees. Hold fast to what I say to comfort your hard lot, neighboring folk in cities up and down the coast will be induced by portents to appease your bones, building a tomb and making offerings there on a cape forever named for Palinurus. The sibyl's words relieved him, and the pain was for a while dispelled from his sad heart, pleased at the place name. So the two walked on down to the stream. Now from the Stygian water the boatman, seeing them in the silent wood and headed for the bank, cried out to them a rough uncalled for challenge, who are you in armour, visiting our rivers? Speak from where you are, stop there, say why you come. This is the region of the shades, and sleep, and drowsy night. It breaks eternal law for the Stygian craft to carry living bodies. Never did I rejoice, I tell you, letting Alcides cross, or Theseus and Pirithus, demigods by paternity though they were, invincible in power. One forced in chains from the king's own seat the watchdog of the dead and dragged him away trembling. The other two were bent on carrying Our Lady off from Dis's chamber. This the prophetess and servant of Amphrasi and Apollo briefly answered, Here are no such plots, so fret no more. These weapons threaten nothing. Let the great watchdog at the door howl on forever terrifying the bloodless shades. Let Chase Proserpina remain at home in her uncle's house. The man of Troy, Aeneas, remarkable for loyalty, great in arms, goes through the deepest shades of Erebus to see his father. If the very image of so much goodness moves you not at all, here is a bow, at this she showed the bow that had been hidden, held beneath her dress, you'll recognize it. Then his heart, puffed up with rage, subsided. They had no more words. His eyes fixed on the ancient gift, the bow, the destined gift, so long unseen, now seen, he turned his dusky craft and made for shore. There from the long thwarts where they sat he cleared the other souls and made the gangway wide, letting the massive man step in the bilge. The leaky coracle groaned at the weight and took a flood of swampy water in. At length, on the other side, he put ashore the prophetess and hero in the mire, a formless ooze amid the grey-green sedge. Great Cerberus barking with his triple throat makes all that shoreline ring, as he lies huge in a facing cave. Seeing his neck begin to come alive with snakes, the prophetess tossed him a lump of honey and drugged meal to make him drowse. Three ravenous gullets gaped and he snapped up the sop. Then his great bulk subsided and lay down through all the cave. Now seeing the watchdog deep in sleep, Aeneas took the opening, swiftly he turned away from the river over which no soul returns. Now voices crying loud were heard at once, the souls of infants wailing. At the door of the sweet life they were to have no part in, torn from the breast, a black day took them off and drowned them all in bitter death. Near these were souls falsely accused, condemned to die. But not without a judge, or juryman, had these souls got their places. Minus reigned as the presiding judge, moving the urn, and called a jury of the silent ones to learn of lives and accusations. Next were those sad souls, benighted, who contrived their own destruction, and as they hated daylight, cast their lives away. How they would wish in the upper air now to endure the pain of poverty and toil. But iron law stands in the way, since the drear hateful swamp has pinned them down here, and the sticks that winds nine times around exerts imprisoning power. Not far away, 
spreading on every side, the fields of morning came in view, so called since here are those whom pitiless love consumed with cruel wasting, hidden on paths apart by myrtle woodland growing overhead. In death itself, pain will not let them be. He saw here Phaedra, Procris, Eriphyle sadly showing the wounds her hard son gave, Evadne and Pasiphae, at whose side Laodamia walked, and Kynaeus, a young man once, a woman now, and turned again by fate into the older form. Among them, with her fatal wound still fresh, Phoenician Dido wandered the deep wood. The Trojan captain paused nearby and knew her dim form in the dark, as one who sees, early in the month, or thinks to have seen, the moon rising through cloud, all dim. He wept and spoke tenderly to her, Dido, so forlorn, the story then that came to me was true, that you were out of life, had met your end by your own hand. Was I, was I the cause? I swear by heaven's stars, by the high gods, by any certainty below the earth, I left your land against my will, my queen. The gods' commands drove me to do their will, as now they drive me through this world of shades, these moldy waste lands and these depths of night. And I could not believe that I would hurt you so terribly by going. Wait a little. Do not leave my sight. Am I someone to flee from? The last word destiny lets me say to you is this. Aeneas with such pleas tried to placate the burning soul, savagely glaring back, and tears came to his eyes. But she had turned with gaze fixed on the ground as he spoke on, her face no more affected than if she were a mobile granite or marpesian stone. At length she flung away from him and fled, his enemy still, into the shadowy grove where he whose bride she once had been, Sicaeus, joined in her sorrows and returned her love. Aeneas still gazed after her in tears, shaken by her ill fate and pitying her. With effort then he took the given way, and they went on, reaching the farthest lands where men famous in war gather apart. Here Tydeus came to meet him, and then came Parthenopeus, glorious in arms, Adrastus then, a pallid shade. Here too were Dardans long bewept in the upper air, men who died in the great war. And he groaned to pick these figures out, in a long file, Glaucus, Medon, Thersilochus, besides Antinor's three sons, then the priest of Ceres Polybetes, then Edeus, holding still to his war car, holding his old gear. To right and left they crowd the path and stay and will not have enough of seeing him, but love to hold him back, to walk beside him, and hear the story of why he came. Not so Agamemnon's phalanx, chiefs of the Damons, seeing the living man in bronze that glowed through the dark air, they shrank in fear. Some turned and ran, as once, when routed, to the ships, while others raised a battle shout, or tried to, mouths agape, mocked by the whispering cry. Here next he saw Deiphobus, Priam's son, mutilated from head to foot, his face and both hands cruelly torn, ears shorn away, nose to the nose holes lopped by a shameful stroke. Barely knowing the shade who quailed before him covering up his tortured face, Aeneas spoke out to him in his known voice, Deiphobus, gallant officer in high Teucer's line, who chose this brutal punishment, who had so much the upper hand of you. I heard on that last night that you had fallen, spent after a slaughter of Pelusgians, fallen on piled-up carnage. It was I who built on Retium Point an empty tomb and sent a high call to your soul three times. Your name, your armor, marks the place. I could not find you, friend, to put your bones in earth in the old country as I came away. And Priam's son replied, You left undone nothing, my friend, but gave all ritual due Deiphobus, do a dead man's shade. My lot and the Laconian woman's ghastly doing sank me in this hell. These are the marks she left me as her memorial. You know how between one false gladness and another we spent that last night, no need to remind you. When the tall deadly horse came at one bound, with troops crammed in its paunch, above our towers, she made a show of choral dance and led our Phrygian women crying out on Bacchus here and there, but held a torch amid them, signaling to Danaeans from the height. Worn by the long day, heavily asleep, I lay in my unlucky bridal chamber, and rest, profound and sweet, most like the rest of death, weighed on me as I lay. Meanwhile she, my distinguished wife, moved all my arms out of the house, as she had slipped my sword, my faithful sword, out from beneath my pillow, opened the door and called in Menelaus, hoping no doubt by this great gift to him, her lover, to blot old infamy out. Why hold back from telling it? The two burst in the bedroom, joined by that ringleader of atrocity, Ulysses, of the Wind King's line. O oh gods, if with pure lips I pray, requite the Greeks with equal suffering. But you, now tell me what in the world has brought you here alive, have you come from your sea wandering, and did heaven direct you? How could harrying fortune send you to these sad sunless homes, disordered places? At this point in their talk Aurora, borne through high air on her glowing rosy car had crossed the meridian, should they linger now with stories they might spend the allotted time. But at Aeneas' side the Sibyl spoke, warning him briefly, night comes on, 
Aeneas, we use up hours grieving. Here is the place where the road forks, on the right hand it goes past mighty Dis's walls, Elysium way, our way, but the leftward road will punish malefactors, taking them to Tartarus. Deiphobus answered her, No need for anger, reverend lady. I'll depart and make the tally in the darkness full again. Go on, sir, glory of us all. Go on, enjoy a better destiny. He spoke, and even as he spoke he turned away. Now of a sudden Aeneas looked and saw to the left, under a cliff, wide buildings girt by a triple wall round which a torrent rushed with scorching flames and boulders tossed in thunder, the abyss's fiery river. A massive gate with adamantine pillars faced the stream, so strong no force of men or gods in war may ever avail to crack and bring it down, and high in air an iron tower stands on which Tisiphone, her bloody robe pulled up about her, has her seat and keeps unsleeping watch over the entrance way by day and night. From the interior, groans are heard, and thud of lashes, clanking iron, dragging chains. Arrested in his tracks, appalled by what he heard, Aeneas stood. What are the forms of evil here? Oh sister, tell me. And the punishments dealt out, why such a lamentation? Said the Sibyl, light of the Teucrians, it is decreed that no pure soul may cross the sill of evil. When, however, Hecate appointed me caretaker of Avernus wood, she led me through heaven's punishments and taught me all. This realm is under Cretan Radamanthus iron rule. He sentences. He listens and makes the souls confess their crooked ways, how they put off atonements in the world with foolish satisfaction, thieves of time, until too late, until the hour of death. At once the avenger girdled with her whip, Tisiphone, leaps down to lash the guilty, vile writhing snakes held out on her left hand, and calls her savage sisterhood. The awaited time has come, hell gates will shut her wide on shrieking hinges. Can you see her now, her shape, as doorkeeper, upon the sill? More bestial, just inside, the giant hydra lurks with fifty black and yawning throats. Then Tartarus itself goes plunging down in darkness twice as deep as heaven is high for eyes fixed on ethereal Olympus. Here is earth's ancient race, the brood of titans, hurled by the lightning down to roll forever in the abyss. Here, too, I saw those giant twins of Aloeus who laid their hands upon great heaven to rend it and to topple Jove from his high seat, and I saw, too, Salmonius paying dearly for the jape of mimicking Jove's fire, Olympus thunder, shaking a bright torch from a four-horse car he rode through Greece and his hometown in Elis, glorying, claiming honor as a god, out of his mind, to feign with horses' hoofs on bronze the blast and inimitable bolt. The Father Almighty amid heavy cloud let fly his missile, no firebrand for him nor smoky pitch pine light, and spun the man headlong in a huge whirlwind. One had sight of Titius, too, child of all mothering earth, his body stretched out over nine whole acres while an enormous vulture with hooked beak forages forever in his liver, his vitals rife with agonies. The bird, lodged in the chest cavity, tears at his feast, and tissues growing again get no relief. As for the lapiths, need I tell, Exion, Pirithus, and the black crag overhead so sure to fall it seems already falling. Golden legs gleam on the feasters' couches, dishes and royal luxury prepared are laid before them, but the oldest fury crouches near and springs out with her torch, her outcry, if they try to touch the meal. Here come those who as long as life remained held brothers hateful, beat their parents, cheated poor men dependent on them, also those who hug their newfound riches to themselves and put nothing aside for relatives, a great crowd, this, then men killed for adultery, men who took arms in war against the right, not scrupling to betray their lords. All these are hemmed in here, awaiting punishment. Best not inquire what punishment, what form of suffering at their last end overwhelms them. Some heave at a great boulder, or revolve, spread-eagled, hung on will spokes. Theseus cleaves to his chair and cleaves to it forever. Phlegius in his misery teaches all souls his lesson, thundering out amid the gloom, be warned and study justice, not to scorn the immortal gods. Here's one who sold his country, foisted a tyrant on her, set up laws or nullified them for a price, another entered his daughter's room to take a bride forbidden him. All these dared monstrous wrong and took what they dared try for. If I had a hundred tongues, a hundred mouths, a voice of iron, I could not tell of all the shapes their crimes had taken, or their punishments. All this he heard from her who for long years had served Apollo. Then she said, Come now, be on your way and carry out your mission. Let us go faster. I can see the walls the Cyclops forges built and, facing us, the portico and gate where they command us to leave the gifts required. On this the two in haste strode on abreast down the dark paths over the space between, and near the doors. Aeneas gained the entrance, halted there, asperged his body with fresh water drops, and on the sill before him fixed the bow. Now that at last this ritual was performed, his duty to the goddess done, they came to places of delight, 
to green park land, where souls take ease amid the blessed groves. Wider expanses of high air endow each vista with a wealth of light. Souls here possess their own familiar sun and stars. Some train on grassy rings, others compete in field games, others grapple on the sand. Feet moving to a rhythmic beat, the dancers group in a choral pattern as they sing. Orpheus, the priest of Thrace, in his long robe accompanies, plucking his seven notes now with his fingers, now with his ivory quill. Here is the ancient dynasty of Teucer, heroes high of heart, beautiful scions, born in greater days, Illus, Asericus, and Dardanus, who founded Troy. Aeneas marvels to see their chariots and gear far off, all phantom, lances fixed in earth, and teams unyoked, at graze on the wide plain. All joy they took, alive, in cars and weapons, as in the care and pasturing of horses, remained with them when they were laid in earth. He saw, how vividly, along the grass to right and left, others who feasted there and chorused out of him praising Apollo, within a fragrant laurel grove, where Po sprang up and took his course to the world above, the broad stream flowing on amid the forest. This was the company of those who suffered wounds in battle for their country, those who in their lives were holy men and chaste or worthy of Phoebus in prophetic song, or those who bettered life, by finding out new truths and skills, or those who to some folk by benefactions made themselves remembered. They all wore snowy chaplets on their brows. To these souls, mingling on all sides, the Sibyl spoke now, and especially to Messias, the central figure, toward whose towering shoulders all the crowd gazed, tell us, happy souls, and you, great seer, what region holds Anchises, where is his resting place? For him we came by ferry across the rivers of Erebus. And the great soul answered briefly, none of us has one fixed home. We walk in shady groves and bed on river banks and occupy green meadows fresh with streams. But if your hearts are set on it, first cross this ridge, and soon I shall point out an easy path. So saying, he walked ahead and showed them from the height the sweep of shining plain. Then down they went and left the hilltops. Now Aeneas' father Anchises, deep in the lush green of a valley, had given all his mind to a survey of souls, till then confined there, who were bound for daylight in the upper world. By chance his own were those he scanned now, all his own descendants, with their futures and their fates, their characters and acts. But when he saw Aeneas advancing toward him on the grass, he stretched out both his hands in eagerness as tears wetted his cheeks. He said in welcome, Have you at last come, has that loyalty your father counted on conquered the journey? Am I to see your face, my son, and hear our voices in communion as before? I thought so, surely, counting the months I thought the time would come. My longing has not tricked me. I greet you now, how many lands behind you, how many seas, what blows and dangers, son? How much I feared the land of Libya might do you harm. Aeneas said, Your ghost, your sad ghost, father, often before my mind, impelled me to the threshold of this place. My ships ride anchored in the Tuscan Sea. But let me have your hand, let me embrace you, do not draw back. At this his tears brimmed over and down his cheeks. And there he tried three times to throw his arms around his father's neck, three times the shade untouched slipped through his hands, weightless as wind and fugitive as dream. Aeneas now saw at the valley's end a grove standing apart, with stems and boughs of woodland rustling, and the stream of Lethe running past those peaceful glades. Around it souls of a thousand nations filled the air, as bees in meadows at the height of summer hover and home on flowers and thickly swarm on snow-white lilies, and the countryside is loud with humming. At the sudden vision shivering, at a loss, Aeneas asked what river flowed there and what men were those in such a throng along the riverside. His father Anchises told him, souls for whom a second body is in store, their drink is water of Lethe, and it frees from care and long forgetfulness. For all this time I have so much desired to show you these and tell you of them face to face, to take the roster of my children's children here, so you may feel with me more happiness at finding Italy. Must we imagine, Father, there are souls that go from here aloft to upper heaven, and once more return to bodies dead weight? The poor souls, how can they crave our daylight so? My son, I'll tell you, not to leave you mystified, Anchises said, and took each point in order, first, then, the sky and lands and sheets of water, the bright moon's globe, the titan sun and stars, are fed within by spirit, and a mind infused through all the members of the world makes one great living body of the mass. From spirit come the races of man and beast, the life of birds, odd creatures the deep sea contains beneath her sparkling surfaces, and fiery energy from a heavenly source belongs to the generative seeds of these, so far as they are not poisoned or clogged by mortal bodies, their free essence dimmed by earthiness and deathliness of flesh. This makes them fear and crave, rejoice and grieve. Imprisoned in the darkness of the body they cannot clearly see heaven's air, 
In fact even when life departs on the last day not all the scourges of the body pass from the poor souls, not all distress of life. Inevitably, many malformations, growing together in mysterious ways, become inveterate. Therefore they undergo the discipline of punishments and pay in penance for old sins, some hang full length to the empty winds, for some the stain of wrong is washed by floods or burned away by fire. We suffer each his own shade. We are sent through wide Elysium, where a few abide in happy lands, till the long day, the round of time fulfilled, has worn our stains away, leaving the soul's heaven sent perception clear, the fire from heaven pure. These other souls, when they have turned time's will a thousand years, the God calls in a crowd to Lethe stream, that their unmemory they may see again the heavens and wish re-entry into bodies. And Chises paused. He drew both Sun and Sibyl into the middle of the murmuring throng, then picked out a green mound from which to view the souls as they came forward, one by one, and to take note of faces. Come, he said, what glories followed her don generations in after years, and from Italian blood what famous children in your line will come, souls of the future, living in our name, I shall tell clearly now, and in the telling teach you your destiny. That one you see, the young man leaning on a spear unarmed, has his allotted place nearest the light. He will be first to take the upper air, Silvius, a child with half Italian blood and an Alban name, your last born, whom your wife, Lavinia, late in your great age will rear in force to be king and father of kings. Through whom our race will rule in Alba Longa. Next him is Procas, pride of the Trojan line, and Capus, too, then Numitor, then one whose name restores you, Silvius Aeneas, both in arms and piety your peer, if ever he shall come to reign in Alba. What men they are! And see their rugged forms with oak leaf crowns shadowing their brows. I tell you, these are to found Nomentum, Gabii, fit any town, Calatius hilltop towers, Pomidii, Fort Inuus, Bola, Cora, names to be heard for places nameless now. Then Romulus, fathered by Mars, will come to make himself his grandfather's companion, Romulus, reared by his mother, Ilia, in the bloodline of Asaracus. Do you see the double plume of Mars fixed on his crest, see how the father of the gods himself now marks him out with his own sign of honor? Look now, my son, under his auspices illustrious Rome will bound her power with earth, her spirit with Olympus. She'll enclose her seven hills with one great city wall, fortunate in the men she breeds. Just so Sibel mother, honored on Berecynthus, wearing her crown of towers, onward rides by chariot through the towns of Phrygia, in joy at having given birth to gods, and cherishing a hundred grandsons, heaven dwellers with homes on high. Turn your two eyes this way and see this people, your own Romans. Here is Caesar, and all the line of Iulus, all who shall one day pass under the dome of the great sky, this is the man, this one, of whom so often you have heard the promise, Caesar Augustus, son of the deified, who shall bring once again an age of gold to Latium, to the land where Saturn reigned in early times. He will extend his power beyond the Garamans and Indians, over far territories north and south of the zodiacal stars, the solar way, where Atlas, heaven-bearing, on his shoulder turns the night sphere, studded with burning stars. At that man's coming even now the realms of Caspia and Meotia tremble, warned by oracles, and the seven mouths of Nile go dark with fear. The truth is, even all Cides never traverse so much of earth, I grant that he could shoot the hind with brazen hoofs or bring peace to the groves of Arimanthus, or leave Lerna affrighted by his bow. Neither did he who guides his triumphal car with reins of vine shoots twisted, Bacchus, driving down from Nyssa's height his tiger team. Do we lag still at carrying our valor into action? Can our fear prevent our settling in Ausonia? Who is he so set apart there, olive-crowned, who holds the sacred vessels in his hands? I know that snowy mane and beard, Numa, the king, who will build early Rome on a base of laws, a man sent from the small-town poverty of cures to high sovereignty. After him comes Tullus, breaker of his country's peace, arousing men who have lost victorious ways, malingering men, to war. Near him is Ancus, given to boasting, even now too pleased with veering popularity's heady air. Do you care to see now, too, the Tarquin kings and the proud soul of the Avenger, Brutus, by whom the bundled fasces are regained? Consular power will first be his, and is the pitiless axis. When his own two sons plot war against the city, he will call for the death penalty in freedom's name, unhappy man, no matter how posterity may see these matters. Love of the fatherland will sway him, and unmeasured lust for fame. Now see the Desai and the Drusi there, and stern Torquatus, with his axe, and see Camillus bringing the lost standards home. That pair, however, matched in brilliant armor, matched in their heart's desire now, while night still holds them fast, once they attain life's light what war, what grief, will they provoke between them, battle lines and bloodshed, as the father marches from the alpine ramparts, 
down from Monaco's walled height, and the son-in-law, drawn up with armies of the east, awaits him. Sons, refrain. You must not blind your hearts to that enormity of civil war, turning against your country's very heart her own vigor of manhood. You above all who trace your line from the immortals, you be first to spare us. Child of my own blood, throw away your sword. Mummy is there, when Corinth is brought low, will drive his car as victor and as killer of Achaeans to our high capital. Paulus will conquer Argos and Agamemnon's old Mycenae, defeating Perseus, the Eacid, heir to the master of war, Achilles, thus avenging his own Trojan ancestors and the defilement of Minerva's shrine. Great Cato. Who would leave you unremarked, or, Cossus, you, or the family of Gracchi, or the twin Scipios, bright bolts of war, the bane of Libya, or you, Fabricius, in poverty yet powerful, or you, Serenus, at the furrow, casting seed. Where, though I weary, do you hurry me, you Fabii? Fabius Maximus, you are the only soul who shall restore our wounded state by waiting out the enemy. Others will cast more tenderly in bronze their breathing figures, I can well believe, and bring more lifelike portraits out of marble, argue more eloquently, use the pointer to trace the paths of heaven accurately and accurately foretell the rising stars. Roman, remember by your strength to rule earth's peoples, for your arts are to be these, to pacify, to impose the rule of law, to spare the conquered, battle down the proud. And Chises paused here as they gazed in awe, then added, see there, how Marcellus comes with spoils of the commander that he killed, how the man towers over everyone. Cavalry leader, he'll sustain the realm of Rome in hours of tumult, bringing to heal the Carthaginians and rebellious Gaul, and for the third time in our history he'll dedicate an enemy general's arms to Father Romulus. But here Aeneas broke in, seeing at Marcellus' side a young man beautifully formed and tall in shining armor, but with clouded brow and downcast eyes, and who is that one, father, walking beside the captain as he comes, a son, or grandchild from the same great stock? The others murmur, all astir. How strong his presence is. But night like a black cloud about his head whirls down an awful gloom. His father Anchises answered, and the tears welled up as he began, Oh, do not ask about this huge grief of your people, son. Fate will give earth only a glimpse of him, not let the boy live on. Lords of the sky, you thought the majesty of Rome too great if it had kept these gifts. How many groans will be sent up from that great field of Mars to Mars' proud city, and what sad rites you'll see, Tiber, as you flow past the new built tomb. Never will any boy of Ilian race exalt his Latin forefathers with promise equal to his, never will Romulus' land take pride like this in any of her sons. Weep for his faithful heart, his old world honor, his sword arm never beaten down. No enemy could have come through a clash with him unhurt, whether this soldier went on foot or road digging his spurs into a lathered mount. Child of our morning, if only in some way you could break through your bitter fate. For you will be Marcellus. Let me scatter lilies, all I can hold, and scarlet flowers as well, to heap these for my grandson's shade at least, frail gifts and ritual of no avail. So raptly, everywhere, father and son wandered the airy plain and viewed it all. After Anchises had conducted him to every region and had fired his love of glory in the years to come, he spoke of wars that he must fight, of Laurentines, and of Latina City, then of how he might avoid or bear each toil to come. There are two gates of sleep, one said to be of horn, whereby the true shades pass with ease, the other all white ivory agleam without a flaw, and yet false dreams are sent through this one by the ghosts to the upper world. And Chises now, his last instructions given, took Sun and Sibyl there and let them go by the ivory gate. Aeneas made his way straight to the ships to see his crews again, then sailed directly to Caeta's port. Bow anchors out, the sterns rest on the beach. Book 7. Juno served by a fury. Nurse Caeta of Aeneas, in death you too conferred your fame through ages on our coast, still honored in your last bed, as you are, and if this glory matters in the end your name tells of your grave in great Hesperia. When he had seen Caeta's funeral performed, her mound of tomb heaped up, Aeneas waited until the sea went down, then cleared her harbor under sail. Into the night the soft south wind blew on, the white full moon left no sea reach or path unbrightened for them, shimmering on the open sea. They passed the Isle of Circe close in shore, that I'll wear, in the grove men shun, the sun's rich daughter sings the hours away. She lights her hall by night with fires of fragrant cedar wood, making her shuttle hum across the warp. Out of this island now they could hear lions growling low in anger at their chains, then roaring in the deep night, bristling boars and fenced in bears, foaming in rage, and shapes of huge wolves howling. Men they once had been, but with her magic herbs the cruel goddess dressed them in the form and pelt of brutes. That night, to spare good Trojans' foul enchantment, should they put in, or near the dangerous beach, Neptune puffed out their sails with wind astern, 
giving clear passage, carrying them onward past the boiling surf. Then soon to eastward sea began to redden with dawn rays, and saffron robed aurora and high heaven shone on her rosy car. Now suddenly the wind dropped, every breath of wind sank down, and or blades dipped and toiled in the sparkling calm. Still far offshore, Aeneas on the lookout sighted a mighty forest, a fair river, Tiber, cutting through and at its mouth expelling eddies of clay yellow water into the sea. Above it, all around, birds of myriad colors, birds at home on river bank and channel, charmed the air with jargoning and flitting through the trees. Aeneas called right rudder. To the steersman, turned the prows to land, and smiling pulled for shade on the great river. Be with me, muse of all desire, Arado, while I call up the kings, the early times, how matters stood in the old land of Latium that day when the foreign soldiers beached upon Ausonia's shore, and the events that led to the first fight. Immortal one, bring all in memory to the singer's mind, for I must tell of wars to chill the blood, ranked men in battle, kings by their own valor driven to death, Etruria's cavalry, and all Hesperia mobilized in arms. A greater history opens before my eyes, a greater task awaits me. King Latinus, now grown old, had ruled his settled towns and countryside through years of peace. Tradition makes him a son of Faunus by a nymph, Marika of the Laurentines. The father of Faunus had been Picus, who in turn claimed you for sire, old Saturn, making you the founder of the dynasty. By fate Latinus had no son or male descendant, death having taken one in early youth. A single daughter held that house's hopes, a girl now ripe for marriage, for a man. And many in broad Latium, in Ausonia, courted her, but the handsomest by far was Turnus, powerful heir of a great line. Latinus' queen pressed for their union, desiring him with passion for a son, but heavenly portents, odd things full of dread stood in the way. There was a laurel tree deep in an inner courtyard of the palace, venerated for leafage, prized for years, having been found and dedicated there, so the tale went, to Phoebus by Latinus when he first built a strong point on the site, and from this laurel tree he gave his folk the name Laurentines. Here, for a wonder, bees in a thick swarm, borne through the limpid air with humming thunder, clustered high on top and, locking all their feet together, hung in a sudden mass that weighted leaves and bough. A soothsayer declared, in this we see a stranger's advent, and a body of men moving to the same spot from the same zone to take our fortress. Then came another sign, while the old king lit fires at the altars with a pure torch, the girl Lavinia with him, it seemed her long hair caught, her headdress caught in crackling flame, her queenly tresses blazed, her jeweled crown blazed. Mantled then in smoke and russet light, she scattered divine fire through all the house. No one could hold that sight anything but hair-raising, marvelous, and it was read by seers to mean the girl would have renown and glorious days to come, but that she brought a great war on her people. Troubled by these strange happenings, the king sought out the oracle of his father, Faunus, teller of destinies, to listen there in woodland by Albunia's high cascade and plashing holy spring, that noblest would that in cool dusk exhaled a brimstone vapor. All Italians, all the Enetrian land, resorted to this place in baffling times, asking direction. Here a priest brought gifts, here in the stillness of the night he lay on skins taken from sheep of sacrifice and courted slumber. Many visions came before his eyes and strangely on the air, he heard their different voices, and took part in colloquies of gods, in undergloom addressing the grim powers of Acheron. Now here in turn Father Latinus came for counsel. Ritually putting to the sword a hundred sheep, he lay on their piled fleeces. Then came a sudden voice from the inmost grove, propose no Latin alliance for your daughter, son of mine distrust the bridal chamber now prepared. Men from abroad will come and be your sons by marriage. Blood so mingled lifts our name starward. Children of that stock will see all earth turned Latin at their feet, governed by them, as far as on his rounds the sun looks down on ocean, east or west. So ran the oracle of Father Faunus in the still night, a warning that Latinus could not keep to himself, but far and wide report of it had reached Ausonian towns before the sons of Laomedon moored ship at the grassy riverside. There with his officers and princely son, Aeneas took repose beneath a tall tree's boughs. They made a feast, putting out on the grass hard wheaten cakes as platters for their meal, moved to do this by Jupiter himself. These banquet boards of Ceres they heaped up with country fruits. Now, as it happened, when all else was eaten, their neediness drove them to try their teeth on Ceres' platters. Boldly with hand and jaw they broke the crusted discs of prophecy, making short work of all the quartered loaves. Look, how we've devoured our tables even. Iulus playfully said, and said no more, for that remark as soon as heard had meant the end of wandering. Even as it fell from the speaker's lips, his father caught it, stopped the jesting there, struck by the work of heaven, and said at once, a blessing on the land the fates have held in store for me, a blessing on our true gods of Troy. Here is our home, 
here is our fatherland. You know, my father Anchises once foretold this secret token, now I remember, of our destiny. He told me then, my son, when the time comes that hunger on a strange coast urges you, when food has failed, to eat your very tables, then you may look for home, be mindful of it, weary as you are, and turn your hand to your first building there with Moton Mound. Here we have felt that hunger, here a last adversity awaited us, a limit set to our misfortunes. One and all, at sunrise with high hearts let us find out about this region and the people here, and where their homes are. We'll fan out in squads from our ship moorings. Tip your cups to Jove, invoke my father and Chises in your prayers, put out the wine bowls of our feast again. He twined a leafy sprig into a garland round his head, then made his formal prayer to the glade spirit there and to the earth, first of immortals, to the nymphs, the streams as yet unknown, to night and the rising stars of night, to Jove of Ida, to the mother goddess of Phrygia, Sibel, all ceremoniously, and then invoked his parents, one in heaven and one in Erebus. At this the Father Almighty in high air thundered three times out of a brilliant sky and shook before their eyes with his own hand a cloud ablaze with gold and rays of light. Now through the Trojan company's quicksilver rumor went around, the day had come for laying down the walls owed them by fate, and each outdid the other as they fell to feasting and rejoicing in the omen, setting the bowls and garlanding the wine. Next morning when the light of risen day shone on the earth, exploring parties sought the Latin city, boundaries, and coasts. Here was Numicius Fountain, and its pond, here Tiber River, here brave Latins lived. Aeneas ordered to the king's high city a hundred legates, chosen from all ranks, their heads shaded by olive shoots of Pallas, to bear the king gifts and to entreat a state of peace for Teucrians. No lingering, at the command they all moved smartly out in a quick march. Aeneas marked his line of walls with a low trench, then toiled away to deepen it, to throw an earthwork up with palisades, camp style, around that post, their first, on the riverside. Now presently his emissaries reached their journey's end, seeing steep roofs and Latin towers ahead as they approached the wall. In fields outside were boys and striplings practicing horsemanship, breaking in chariot teams in clouds of dust, pulling taut bows and throwing javelins, challenging one another to race or box. Meanwhile a messenger, riding ahead, reported to the old king the arrival of tall men in strange costume, and the king ordered them brought inside. He took his seat amid the court, on his ancestral throne. The royal building, massive and majestic, raised on a hundred columns, occupied the city's height. It had been Pica's palace, shadowed by trees and history, held in awe. Here kings by happy omen took the scepter, lifted the rods of office up, and here they had their senate house, a holy place, a hall for ritual feasts, for a slain ram the city fathers took accustomed seats on benches at long tables. Here as well were sculptures of their old forefathers, ranked by generations, carved in ancient cedar, Italus, and Sabinus, planter of vines, holding as such a pruning hook, and Saturn, whore with age, and the two-faced figure, Janus, all in the entrance way, and other kings from earliest times, with men wounded in war while fighting for their country. There besides were many arms, hung on the sacred doorposts, captured war cars, battle axes, plumes of helmets, massive gate bars, javelins and shields, and beaks torn from the prows of ships. The seated figure of Picus, tamer of horses, in a striped mantle, held a quirinal staff and on his left forearm a shield of heaven. Circe his bride, taken with strong desire, had struck him with her golden wand, then drugged him into a woodpecker and pied his wings. In this interior hall of the holy place, at ease upon the ancestral throne, Latinus called the Teucrians before him, saying tranquilly as they entered, Sons of Dardanus, you see, we know your city and your nation, as all had heard you laid a westward course, tell me your purpose. What design or need has brought you through the dark blue sea so far to our Ausonian coast? Either astray or driven by rough weather, such as sailors often endure at sea, you've broached the river, moored ship there. Now do not turn away from hospitality here. Know that our Latins come of Saturn's race, that we are just, not by constraint or laws, but by our choice and habit of our ancient god. Indeed, though years have dimmed the tale, I can remember old Oruncan's telling of Dardanus, how from this country of his birth he went on his long journey to the Edan towns of Phrygia and to Thracian Samos, now called Samothrace. From this land he set out, from his old Tuscan home at Carethus. And now great halls of starry sky enthrone him, to the gods' altars adding one for him. Latinus then fell silent, and in turn Ilianius began, Your Majesty, most noble son of Faunus, no rough seas or black gale swept us to your coast, no star or clouded sea mark put us off our course. We journey to your city by design and general consent, driven as we are from realms in other days greatest by far the sun looked down on, passing on his way from heaven's far eastern height. 
Our lines from Jove, in his paternity the sons of Dardanus exult, and highest progeny of Jove include our king himself, Trojan Aeneas, who sent us to your threshold. What a storm from cruel Mycenae swept across the plain of Ida, and what destiny made the worlds of Europe and of Asia clash in war, has now been heard in the most distant lands beside the tidal ocean, and by men divided from us by the inclement zone of sun that burns between the cooler four. By that storm overwhelmed, and then at sea so long on the vast waters, now we ask a modest settlement of the gods of home, a strip of coast that will bring harm to no one, air and water, open and free to all. We will not shame your kingdom. You shall win no light and passing fame, nor from ourselves a passing gratitude for your kind act. Ausonians who take Troy to their hearts will not regret it. By Aeneas' destiny I swear, and by his powerful right hand, whether tested in covenants or battle, many a people, many a race, and here do not disdain us for this overture and offering pleas and garlands, many, I say, have come to us and wished alliance with us. But by the will of heaven and heaven's commands our quest was for your country. Dardanus had birth here, and Apollo calls us back, directing us by solemn oracles to Tuscan Tiber, to the sacred waters of the Numitian fountain. Here besides Aeneas gives you from his richer years these modest gifts, relics caught up and saved from burning Troy. This golden cup Anchises used for libations at the altars, Priam bore this accoutrement when giving laws to peoples in due form called to assembly, scepter, and holy diadem, and robes woven by Trojan women. Latinus heard Ilioneus out, his countenance averted, sitting immobile, all attention, eyes downcast but turning here and there. The embroidered purple and the scepter of King Priam moved him less in his own kingliness than long thoughts on the marriage of his daughter, as he turned over in his inmost mind old Faunus prophecy. This is the man, he thought, foretold as coming from abroad to be my son-in-law, by fate appointed, called to reign here with equal authority, the man whose heirs will be brilliant in valour and win the mastery of the world. At length he spoke in his elation, may the gods assist our enterprises as their own. What you desire will be granted, Trojan, and I accept your gifts. While I am king you shall not want for bounty of rich land or miss the wealth of Troy. Aeneas himself should come, though, if he has such need of us and bids for guesthood, for an ally's name. He should not shrink from friendly faces here. For me a requisite of the peace will be to join hands with your captain. Now return to your ship moorings, bring the king my messages. I have a daughter, whom the oracles of father's shrine and warning signs from heaven keep me from pledging to a native here. Sons from abroad will come, the prophets say, for this is Lot Yum's destiny, new blood to immortalize our name. Your king's the man called for by fate, so I conclude, and so I wish, if there is truth in what I presage. After this vigorous speech, Father Latinus picked out horses for them from his string, three hundred who stood glossy in high stalls, and ordered them led out for all the Trojans, one by one, fast horses, ornamented with purple saddle cloths, with golden chains hung on their breasts, and golden snoods, and yellow golden bits they champed between their teeth. Then for Aeneas, absent though he was, he picked a chariot and a team, a pair grown from immortal stock and snorting fire. Their sire was that stallion crafty Circe stole from the sun, her father, and put to stud with a mortal mare, getting a bastard breed. Bearing these gifts and offers from Latinus, Aeneas legates, mounted now, returned, and they brought peace. Only look upward, though, at Jove's unpitying queen. She at that hour made her way back from Inicus's Argos, holding her course in air. From her great height over Pachynus in Sicily to the south, she could discern Aeneas taking heart, ships companies already building shelters, leaving the ships, trusting the land they found. She stayed her flight as pain went through her, then she tossed her head and cried out from her heart, O hateful race, and fate of the Phrygians pitted against my own. Could they be killed on the Sigean battlefield? When beaten, could they be beaten? Troy on fire, did Troy consume her men? Amid the spears, amid the flames, they found a way. I must, for my part, think my powers by this time tired out, supine, or sleeping, surfeited on hate? Well, when they were ejected from their country I had the temerity as their enemy to dog them, fight them, over the whole sea, these refugees. The strength of sea and sky has been poured out against these Teucrians. What were the Seerts worth to me, or Scylla, what was huge Charybdis worth? By Tiber's long for bed they now lay out their town, unworried by deep water or by me. Mars had the power to kill the giant race of Lapiths, and the father of gods himself gave up old Caledon to Diana's wrath, and what great sin brought Caledon or Lapith's justice so rough? How differently with me, the great consort of Jove, who nerved myself to leave no risk unventured, let myself to every indignity. I am defeated and by Aeneas. Well, if my powers fall short, I need not falter over asking help wherever help may lie. 
If I can sway no heavenly hearts I'll rouse the world below. It will not be permitted me, so be it, to keep the man from rule in Italy, by changeless fate Lavinia waits, his bride. And yet to drag it out, to pile delay upon delay in these great matters, that I can do, to destroy both countries' people, that I can do. Let father and son-in-law unite at that cost of their own. In blood, Trojan and Latin, comes your dowry, girl, bridesmaid Bologna waits now to attend you. Hecuba is not the only one who carried a burning brand within her and bore a son whose marriage fired a city. So it is with Venus' child, a Paris once again, a funeral torch again for Troy reborn. When she had said all this, she dropped to earth in a shuddering wind. From the dark underworld home of the Furies, she aroused Electo, grief's drear mistress, with her lust for war, for angers, ambushes, and crippling crimes. Even her father Pluto hates this figure, even her hellish sisters, for her myriad faces, for her savage looks, her head alive and black with snakes. Now Juno spoke to excite her, here is a service all your own that you can do for me, daughter of night, here is a way to help me, to make sure my status and renown will not give way or be impaired, and that Aeneas people cannot by marriage win Latinus over, laying siege to Italy. You can arm for combat brothers of one soul between them, twist homes with hatred, bring your whips inside, or firebrands of death. A thousand names belong to you, a thousand ways of wounding. Shake out the folded stratagems within you, break up this peace pact, scatter acts of war, all in a flash let men desire, demand, and take up arms. Without delay Electo, dripping venom deadly as the Gorgons, passed into Latium first in the high hall of the Laurentine king. She took her place on the still threshold of the queen, Amata. Burning already at the Trojans' coming, the plans for Turnus' marriage broken off, Amata tossed and turned with womanly anxiety and anger. Now the goddess plucked one of the snakes, her gloomy tresses, and, tossed it at the woman, sent it down her bosom to her midriff and her heart, so that by this black reptile-driven wild she might disrupt her whole house. And the serpent slipping between her gown and her smooth breasts went writhing on, though imperceptible to the fevered woman's touch or sight, and breathed viper's breath into her. The sinuous mass became her collar of twisted gold, became the ribbon of her headdress. In her hair it twined itself, and slid around her body. While the infection first, like dew of poison fallen on her, pervaded all her senses, netting her bones in fire, though still her soul had not responded fully to the flame, she spoke out softly, quite like any mother, shedding hot tears at the marriage of her child to a Phrygian, these Trojan refugees, father, are they to take away Lavinia and marriage? Have you no pity for your daughter, none for yourself? No pity for her mother, who will be left alone by the faithless man, the rover, going to sea at the first north wind with a girl for booty. Was that not the way the Phrygian shepherd entered Lacedaemon and carried Helen off to Troy's far city? What of your solemn word, your years of love for your own people, your right hand so often given to Turnus, our bloodkin? Suppose a son of foreign stock is to be found for Latins, and this holds, and the command your father, Faunus, gave ways hard upon you, then I maintain that every separate country free from all rule of ours, is foreign land, and this is what the gods mean. Turnus, too, if we seek origins, had Inachus and Acrisius as forbears at Mycenae. Finding Latinus proof against this plea and holding firm, while in her viscera the serpent's evil madness circulated, suffusing her, the poor queen, now inflamed by prodigies of hell, went wild indeed and with insane abandon roamed the city. One sees at times a top that a wound-up thong snapped into a spin, when, all eyes for the sport, boys drive it round a court in a great circle, sweeping curves on the ground, flicked by the whip, while the small boys in fascination bend above the rounded boxwood as it whirls, given new life at each stroke of the lash. So restless, wheeling like a spinning top, Amata sped on, driven through the town amid her hardy townsmen. Worse, she feigned back at possession, daring a greater sin and greater madness. Off to the woods she ran, into the leafy hills, and hid her child to snatch a marriage from the Teucrians or to postpone the wedding. Evoe, Bacchus, she shrilled out, and then cried again that you alone, the god, deserve the girl, who held an ivy thyrsus in your honor and danced for you, and let her hair grow long, sacred to you, as word of this went round. Laurentine mothers fired by sudden madness felt the same passion to acquire new homes. They left the old ones, bearing to the wind their necks and hair, while some in fawnskin dress filled heaven with long quavering cries and bore vine-covered wand spears. In their midst, the queen held up a blazing firebrand of pine and in her fever sang a marriage hymn for Turnus and her daughter, glancing round with bloodshot eyes. She called out suddenly and savagely, Mothers of Latium, listen, wherever you may be, if your good hearts feel any kindness still for poor Amata, any concern for justice to a mother, shake your headbands loose, take up the revel along with me. 
To this extreme she went in the wild wood, the wilderness of beasts, driven by Electo with a bacchic goat. When to the Furies' mind the first mad fit had been whipped up enough, seeing Latina's counsel subverted and his home undone, Electo rose up on her somber wings and flew straight to the bold Rutulian's walls, the city which, they say, Danae founded with her Acrisian colonists, blown there by gale winds from the south. Ardea once our early fathers called the place, and still the great name stands, though Ardea's fortune waned. In his high dwelling there, in darkest night, Turnus peacefully slept. Electo stripped her savage mask off and her fury's shape, to take on an old woman's face, she lined her forehead with deep seams, put on white hair and headband, twining there a shoot of olive, so she became Calibi, thrall in age to Juno and a priestess of her temple. Moving near, before the young man's eyes, she wheedled, Turnus, can you bear to see so many efforts wasted, spilt like water, and your own rule made over to the Dardan colonists? The king withholds your bride, withholds the dowry that you fought and bled for. Go into danger and be laughed at for it. Mow down the Tuscan ranks, shelter the Latins under your peace pact. So? These messages, while you lay in the stillness of the night, Saturn's almighty daughter ordered me herself to bring before you. Come then, put your young troops under arms, glory in arms, prepare a sortie and a fight. These Phrygian captains in their camp on our fine river, give them a burning, burn their painted ships. Great force in heaven demands it. Let the king Latinus, too, unless he undertake to yield your bride and keep his word, let him feel this, and feel at last the fear of meeting Turnus in arms. Now, making light of her, the young man gave his answer to the seer, news of the squadron making port on Tiber has not failed, as you think, to reach my ears. Do not imagine me afraid. Queen Juno has not forgotten me. But old age, mother, sunk in decay and too far gone for truth, is giving you this useless agitation, mocking your prophet's mind with dreams of fear and battles between kings. Your mind should be on the gods' images and on their shrines. Men will make war and peace, as men should do. Being so dismissed, Electo blazed in wrath, and sudden trembling ran through the man's body even as he spoke, his eyes in a rigid stare, for now the fury hissed with all her serpents, all her hideous faces. Glancing round with eyes of flame, as the man's faltering tongue tried to say more, she threw him back and raised a pair of snakes out of her writhing hair, then cracked and cracked her whip and railed at him. Look at me now, sunk in decay, see how old age in me is too far gone for truth, deluding me with battles between kings and dreams of fear. Look at these dreams of mine. I come to you from the Black Sister's home and bring war and extinction in my hand. With this she hurled a torch and planted it below the man's chest, smoking with hellish light. Enormous terror woke him, a cold sweat broke out all over him and soaked his body. Then driven wild, shouting for arms, for arms he ransacked house and chamber. Lust of steel raged in him, brute insanity of war, and wrath above all, as when fiery sticks are piled with a loud crackling by the side of a cauldron boiling, and the water heaves and seethes inside the vessel, steaming up with foam, and bubbling higher, till the surface holds no more, and vapor mounts to heaven. So, then, in violation of the peace, he told the captains of his troops to march on King Latinus, ordering arms prepared, the land defended, and the enemy pushed back from the frontiers, he, too, would come, a match for Teucrians and Latins both. His orders given, vows made to the gods, his countrymen cheered one another on, and vied with one another, to make war, this one admiring Turnus' princeliness, his figure and his youth, this one the kings, his ancestors, this one his feats afield. While Turnus filled these men with recklessness, Electo beat her way on Stygian wings coastward to Trojans, with a fresh design. Surveying that wild region on the shore where shining Iulus trapped or hunted, here the virgin of the wailing underworld brought sudden frenzy on the hounds. She touched their nostrils with a long familiar scent so they would run a stag, hot on the track, this the first cause of turmoil, kindling hearts of country folk to war. There was a stag, a beauty, with a giant spread of antlers, taken before weaning from a doe and brought up tame by boys, as by their father, Tyrus, the chief herdsman to the king and warden of his wide estates. Their sister, Sylvia, had trained the beast with love to do her bidding. She would wreathe his horns with garlands, groom him, bathe him in a spring of limpid water. Placid under her hand, accustomed to the table of his mistress, the stag would roam the forest, then return, however late at night, to the gate he knew. Now as he wandered far from home, the hounds of Iulus on the hunt, furiously barking, started the stag. He had been floating down a river, keeping cool by the green bank. Ascanius himself, now on the chase and passionate for the honour of the kill, let fly a shaft from his bent bow, Electo's guidance did not fail his hand or let him shoot amiss, and the arrow whizzing loud whipped on to pierce the belly and the flank. Mortally hurt, 
the swift deer made for home in the farm buildings. Groaning, he found his stall, and coated with dark blood he filled the house with piteous cries, as though imploring mercy. Hugging her shoulders, beating with her hands, the sister, Sylvia, raised a cry for help, calling her tough countryman, who came soon, unexpectedly, for the pitiless fiend in the silent would lay hidden. One was armed with a burnt-out brand, one with a knotted cudgel, each with whatever weapon anger first put in his groping hand. Herdsmen for war were rounded up by Tyrus, breathing fury, armed with an axe, for he had chanced to be splitting an oak four ways with driven wedges. Now the fierce goddess from her lookout post judging the time for further harm had come, flapped to the stable roof and from the peak sounded the herdsman's call. On her curved horn she sent into the air a blast from hell at which all groves were set at once a tremble and the deep forest rang and rang again. The lake of Trivia heard it, far away, so did the river Nar, whose current pales with sulphur, and Valinus of the springs, and frightened mothers held their children close. Then truly at the sound, the signal given by that dire trumpet, weaponed and on the run from every quarter, farmers and foresters came together. Trojan troops as well poured from the camp through open gates to bring Ascanius aid, and both sides formed for battle. No longer now a shindy of country boys with fire-hardened stakes and oaken clubs, but darkening on a wide field they contended with two-edged steel, like standing crops in ranks a bristle with drawn swords and armor shining, struck by the sun and flashing to the clouds, as when under a squall the waves begin to whiten in the sea, minute by minute, heaves and increases, as the swells go higher, till from its depths it surges to the sky. Ahead of the front rank a whizzing arrow brought down a young man, Almo, eldest son of Tyrus, as the point lodged in his throat, choking the moist channel of his voice and the frail breath of life with blood. Around him many dead soon lay, one old Galesus, killed as he interposed and pled for peace, the fairest minded of them all, and richest in those days in Ausonian lands, he owned five flocks of bleeding sheep, five herds of kine, a hundred ploughs that turned as many acres. Now while they fought on the wide field, with Mars impartial still, Electo's promise kept when she had stained the field with blood and caused first combat losses, now the feral goddess left Hesperia and veered away through airy sky, proud of her feet, to brag to Juno, see your quarrel brought to the point of grievous war. Now tell them to be friends, tell them to make a pact, now that I've splashed the Trojans with Ausonian blood. There's more if I am sure you want it, I can send out rumors to stir the border towns to war, fire them with lust for the madness of war, so they'll be joining in from everywhere. I'll scatter weapons up and down the land. But Juno said, terrors and treacheries we have in plenty. All that may prolong a war is there, they fight now hand to hand and arms luck gave are running with fresh blood. There is the marriage, there is the ceremony Venus distinguished son and that great King Latinus may take joy in. As for you, this roving rather freely in high air as hardly as the father wishes, he who rules highest Olympus. Down with you. If any further need to act arises I myself will manage. At these words from Saturn's daughter, Electo spread those wings that hiss with snakes and left the towering air for underworld again. There is a spot in central Italy where the mountains are, a noted place, heard of in many lands, the valley of Amsanctus. Flanks of forest, dark with leaves, close in on either side, and in the midst a torrent rumbles down a twisted channel, swirling through the rocks. Here people show a shuddersome cold cave, an outlet for the breath of cruel dis, and an abyss that opens jaws of death where Acheron bursts through, between these jaws the fury settled in her hateful power, giving relief to earth and sky. But still the queenly daughter of Saturn, undeterred, gave her last touches to the war. The crowd of shepherds as one man rushed from the field into the city, carrying the dead, young Almo, and Galesus all disfigured. There they implored the vengeance of the gods and called upon Latinus to bear witness. Turnus, at hand now, among men on fire with rage over the slaughter, made their fears redouble, saying rule fell to the Trojans, Italians were to mix with Phrygian stock, he had been turned away from the king's door. The kin, then, of those mothers in ecstasy who danced for Bacchus in the wilderness, Amata's name no light encouragement, came in from everywhere with cries for Mars. Nothing would do but that, against the omens, against the oracles, by a power malign they pled for frightful war. And they all thronged, out shouting one another, round the palace. Latinus, though, like a sea cliff stood fast, like a sea cliff that when the great sea comes to shatter on it, and the waves like hounds give tongue on every side, holds grandly on, though reefs and foaming rocks thunder offshore and seaweed flung against it streams away. But when no power was given him to defeat their blinded council, and things took their course at cruel Juno's nod, Father Latinus calling upon all the gods, on heaven's empty air, cried, I am breached by fate, wrecked, swept away by storm. You'll pay the price, poor people, with your sacrilegious blood. This wickedness will haunt you, and the grim punishment, Turnus, 
will come home to you, but it will be too late to pray the gods. For me, I've earned my rest, though entering haven I am deprived of happiness and death, he said no more, but shut himself away and dropped the reins of rule over the state. There was a custom then in Latium, held sacred later in Alban towns, as now in the world power of Rome when citizens first urged the war got on, to bring the sorrow of war upon the Gidi, or upon Arabs or Hyrcanians, or marching downward toward the Indians to take the Parthian captured standards back. There are two gates, twin gates of war, as they are called, by long observance looked on in awe, for fear of savage Mars. One hundred brazen bolts keep these gates closed in the unending strength of steel, then to their guardian, Janus, never leaves the portal. Now when the father's judgment holds for war, the consul in quirinal robe and gabine cincture goes to unlock the grating doors and lifts a call for battle. Fighting men then add their voices, and the brazen trumpets blown together blare their harsh assent. In that way, now, Latinus was enjoined to declare war on the people of Aeneas by setting wide the grim gates. But he would not, would not touch them, only turned away from the repellent work, and shut himself in the interior darkness. Heaven's queen at this dropped from the sky. She gave a push to stubborn yielding doors, then burst the iron-bound gates of war apart on turning hinges. All Asonian lands as yet unroused, unwakened, now took fire. Infantry mustered to cross the flatlands, mounted men tall on their horses in the dust whirled by, and all must take up arms. With heavy grease they rubbed shields clean and smooth, made javelins bright, and wetted axes on the grindstone, thrilled at standard bearing, at the trumpet call. Five sizable towns, in fact, with anvils cleared, now turned out weapons, these were tough Atina, haughty Tiber, Ardea, Crustumeri, towered Antimni. Workmen fashioned helmets, hollow and hard headgear, or for light shields bent wicker frames, while others molded breastplates out of bronze or trim greaves out of silver. Pride in plowshare and scythe had given way to this, and so had love of plowland labor. Swords of their fathers and the smithy fires they forged anew. The trumpet calls went out, the password, sign of war, went round, one fellow pulled down his helmet from the wall, another yoked his whinnying horses, took his shield, put on his mail shirt, triple linked with gold, and belted on his good sword. Muses, now throw wide the gates of Helicon, your mountain, now lift up your song, to tell what kings were stirred to war, what troops in each command filled all the lowlands, fighting men in whom even in those days bounteous Italy had come to flower, in whom her spirit blazed. For you remember, you can bring to life that time, immortal ones, while to ourselves faint wraiths of history barely transpire. First to equip a troop and take the field was harsh Mesentius of Tuscany, who held the gods in scorn. The son who rode beside him, Lossus, unexcelled in beauty except by Turnus of the Laurentines, horse tamer Lossus, conqueror of beasts, led from Aegilla's town a thousand men, his followers in vain, he that deserved more happiness and the father he obeyed, deserved indeed no father like Mesentius. Next after these came Aventinius, athlete son of the athlete, Hercules, he showed his palm crowned chariot and winning team and put them through their paces on the grassland, bearing his father's blazon on his shield, the hydra wreathed in snakes, a hundred snakes. In woodland on the Aventine the priestess, Rhea, in secret brought this child to birth in the world of daylight. She had mingled limbs with a strong god in love, in that far time when Turin's hero, with Gerion slain, reached the Laurentine land and bathed his kind in Tiber's Tuscan water. Soldiery that Aventinius led were armed with javelins and thrusting spears, with polished poles and points they fought, or hurling shafted Sabine spikes. Their captain went on foot, swirling about him a giant lion skin with stormy mane still terrible, and the great head for Cal with white fangs in the open maw. So cloaked in Hercules' shaggy accoutrement, he went up to the king's hall. Then twin brothers left Tiber's walls, that town and its townfolk named for Tibertus, elder than these two, Catillus and fierce Chorus, progeny of Argos, by descent from Amphureus. Ahead of the front line amid the spears they raced along, as from a mountain top two cloud borne centaurs on the run plunged down from Homol or from the snows of Othrus, making the mighty forest yield and thickets crash before their onset. Then the founder of the great town, Pranist, joined the rest, he, too, for war, that king whom every age believes a son of Vulcan, Seculus, born amid the pasturing herds but found, an infant, on the hearth. From far and wide his country levies came with him, rough hands of high Pranist and of Gabine Juno's pastures and cold Anio's riverside, and Hernican rock ledges, wet with streams, then those you nurtured, wealthy Anagnia, or you, Amasinus' father, by your waters. Armor and clanging shields and chariots were not for all, but most with slings let fly their bullets of blue lead, while others hefted pairs of darts. They wore close-fitting caps of wolf skin and gripped earth with left foot bare, the right foot roughly booted. Now Mesippus, horse-taming son of Neptune, 
not to be brought down by any man with fire or steel, called out as tribes, long settled in their peace, battalions long unused to war, and practiced swordsmanship again. Some of his troops held land on the Feskenine Heights and some on the Faliscan Lowlands, on Seracte's high points or Flavinium's pasture land, by Mount Simonius Lake, Capenna's Grove. All marched in equal ranks and him their king, like snowy swans when sometimes after feeding and taking flight into the lucent clouds, they cry a choral song from their long throats, making Asia's marsh, the stream below, re-echo their high sound. No one who heard would think the throng composed of ranks in bronze but rather that a cloud of clamorous birds beat landward from the open sea. Imagine one of the ancient line of Sabines, Clausus, leading a host, himself a host of men, from whom in our day throughout Latium, since Sabines had an early share in Rome, the Claudian tribe and family is diffused. With him came Amaternum's regiment, and old world quirates from Cures came, all troops from Aretum and fair Mutusca's olive bearing land, Nomentum town, the Roseon countryside around Valinus, the rugged cliffs of Tetrica, and Mount Severus, and Casperia and Forli, men from Hymella's brook, and men who drank the Tiber and Fabari's river water, levies from that cold upland, Nursia, from Ortina, and the people called Latini, and those whom Aelia, distressful name, divides by flowing between. There were as many as there are waves upon the sparkling sea off Libya, when cold Orion sets in winter, or as ears in fields of wheat when they are warmed by summer's early sun on Hermas Plain or yellowing Lycia. Clangor of shields and thud of marching feet made the earth tremble. Then a captain hostile to the very name of Troy, Agamemnon's son Halesus, yoked his chariot team and swept a thousand fighting clans to war for Turnus, men who hoed the fertile vineyard slopes of Massacus, and men sent by Oruncan fathers from the high hills, or, below, by citizen as flatland. Others came from Kales, or were neighbors of Volturnus' fordable waters, and in arms as well came harsh Saticulans and bands of Oscans. Polished clubs were what they used as missiles, leashed for recovery, as their practice was, light shields protected them on the left side, and for close combat they had sickle blades. It will not do for you to go unmentioned, Ebelus, in our poem, for the nymph Sabethes bore you, so the story goes, to Telone when he ruled the Teleboan Olive Capri in his age. The father's lands did not content the son, who now held sway over mainland Sarastians on plains the Sarnus watered, and the men of Rufri, Bachelum, Salemna's fields, with those on whom Abella's walls look down an orchard country, fighters trained to fling their boomerangs as the Teutons do. They wore headgear of bark stripped from the cork oak tree and flashed with brazen bucklers, blades of bronze. Then you, too, Euphans, were sent down to war from Highland Nersi, chieftain as you were in fame for combat luck among the rugged forest hunters, the Equiquili, who worked their stony soil in arms but took their joy in cattle raids, freebooter fare. Just as conspicuous, the priestly Umbro, sent from Meruvium by King Archippus, came with his helm and olive neatly bound, a man of power, who had a gift of soothing vipers and vile breathing water snakes by a sung rune or stroking into sleep, he calmed their rabidness and by his skill relieved men bitten by them. Yet his lore would not enable him to heal the blow he took from a Durdan spear, no sleepy charms or mild herbs gathered in the Marcian hills availed against his wounds. Umbro, the wood of Angisha mourned you, and Fusinus mirrors mourned you, the clear quiet lakes. Hippolytus' handsome son rode out to war, sent by Arachia, his mother. Verbius had grown up in Egeria's wood, around the moist bank where Diana's altar stands, a gracious shrine, and rich. The old tale goes that when Hippolytus went down to death by cunning of his stepmother, and paid the penalty his father claimed in blood, torn by stampeding horses, he returned to the upper air of heaven beneath the stars, called back to life by Asclepius' medicines and by Diana's love. Then the omnipotent father, taking it ill that any man should rise from undergloom to light and life, cast down by his own bolt Apollo's son, discoverer of that healing power, Asclepius, into the Stygian river. But the goddess Trivia, kind Diana, hid Hippolytus in a place apart, and sent him to the nymph Egeria in her retired wood. There he would live his obscure life alone in Italy's deep forest, and his name would now be Verbius. This is the reason horses with hooves are banned from Trivia's shrine and all her sacred groves, that on the shore in fright from sea beasts they had wrecked the chariot and killed the man Hippolytus. Even so, over the plain behind a fiery team his son rode in a chariot to war. Turnus himself came on, a mighty figure moving among the captain's blade in hand and by a head the tallest. His high helm with triple plume bore a chimera's head exhaling Etnian fires, raging the more with savage heat the more blood flowed, the wilder grew the battle. On his polished shield, in golden blazonry, Io appeared with lifted horns and hair grown coarse, that instant changed, in the huge blazon, into a cow. There stood her escort, Argus, and her father, Inachus, the river god, poured out a stream from a figured urn. 
and following Turnus marched the cloud of infantry, as all the plain filled up with troops in arms, Argive Ardea's men, Oruncan bands, Rutulians, old-time Sakani, Sacrani in ranks, Labasai carrying painted shields, all those who ploughed in time of peace your sacred shores, Numicius, or your woodland pastures, Tiber, or who turned clods on the Rutulian hills and Circe's ridge, those lands presided over by Jupiter of Angzer and Feronia, lady of wild beasts, blithe in her green grove. Satura's black marsh lies there, and the Chiliufin's river winds through bottomlands to find peace in the sea. Besides all these Camilla of the Votian people came, riding ahead of cavalry, her squadrons gallant and bronze. A warrior girl whose hands were never deft at distaff or wool basket, skills of Minerva, she was hard and trained to take the shock of war, or to outrace the winds in running. If she ran full speed over the tips of grain unharvested she would not ever have bruised an ear, or else she might have sprinted on the deep sea swell and never dipped her flying feet. To see her, men and women pouring from the fields, from houses, thronged her passageway and stared wide-eyed with admiration at the style of royal purple, robing her smooth shoulders, then at the brooch that bound her hair in gold, then at the lichen quiver that she bore in shepherd's myrtle staff, pointed with steel. Book 8. Arcadian Allies. That day when Turnus raised the flag of war over Laurentum Tower, and his trumpets blared horse-throated, when he laid the whip on fiery teams, making bright armor clang, then hearts were stirred by fear, then all of Latium joined in distracted tumult, and young men grew bloody-minded, wild. The high commanders, Mesippus and Euphans, and that one who held the gods in scorn, Mesentius, from every quarter drew repeated levies and laid the wide fields waste of their field hands. Dispatched to Diomedes distant city, Vinulus went to ask for aid, to state that Trojans had a foothold in Latium, that, landing there, Aeneas had brought in his conquered gods and claimed to be a king called for by destiny, that many tribes made league with the Dardanian, and his name reverberated far and wide through Latium, what he might build on this first enterprise, what he desired as outcome of the war should fortune favor him, that would be clearer to Diomedes than to either king, Turnus or Latinus. Thus affairs took shape in Latium. And Laomedon's heir, who saw the whole scene, weltered in his trouble, wave after wave of it. This way and that he let his mind run, passing quickly over all he might do, as when from basins full of unstilled water, struck by a ray of sun or the bright disk of moon, a flickering light plays over walls and corners and flies up to hit high roof beams and a coffered ceiling. Now it was night, and through the lands of earth deep slumber held all weary living things of bird and beast kind, when the Trojan prince, Aeneas, heartsick at the woe of war, lay down upon the riverside in the cold air, under the open sky, and gave his body at long last repose. Before him as he slept the very god of that place, Tiburnius of fair waters, lifting his hoary head through poplar leaves, appeared all veiled in cobweb cloak of grey and crowned with shady sedge. He seemed to speak in these words to relieve the burdened man, Sir, born of heaven, in whose care Troy city now comes back to us from its enemies, and in whose keeping high and everlasting Pergama stands, you whom Laurentine soil and Latin countryside have long awaited, here is your home, your hearth gods, fixed and sure. Now is no time to let go, or give way to fear at threats of war. Angers that rose among the gods have passed. And I can tell you, lest you suppose this nothing but a dream, under the shoreside oaks a giant so will be discovered, lying on the ground, with her new pharaoh, thirty young all told, a white so, with white sucklings at her teats. And by this portent, after thirty years Ascanius will found the famous town called Alba, or White City. I foretell no doubtful matter. But just now, as to what lies ahead and how you may win through it, listen, and I'll explain in a few words. In this country an Arcadian tribe, descended from a forebear called Pallas, colonists with King Evander, followers of his flag, marked out a spot and founded on the hills a town they named for Pallas, Palantium. Always at war with Latins, as they are, join forces with them, make them your allies. I myself between my banks will take you straight upstream, so you'll make way with oars against the current. Son of Venus, rise. Now, while the early stars of evening set, address your prayers in proper form to Juno, melt with your pleas her menaces and anger. You'll make return to me when you prevail. I am that river in full flood you see cutting through farmland, gliding past these banks, the sea-blue Tiber, heaven-delighting stream, my mansions here, my fountainhead far north amid the hilltop cities. Having spoken, he sank away into the watery depths at the river bottom. From Aeneas then night time and sleep departed, and he rose. Facing the light that fanned up in the east from the pure sun, he cupped his ritual hands to lift clear water from the stream, then spoke his heartfelt prayer to heaven. Nymphs of the springs, Laurentine nymphs, mothers of river kind, and Father Tiber with your sacred stream, take in Aeneas as your guest, at last shield him from peril. 
by whatever source the ponds lie that embrace you in your pity for our ill fortune, from whatever ground you well up in your loveliness, you'll be forever honored and adorned forever with gifts from me, O potent stream, great lord of waters in the west. Only be with me, and give me confirmation of your will. He finished, then selected from his squadron two biremes and had them manned and armed, but something suddenly caught his eye, a sign to marvel at, snow white in the green wood, snow white as her own litter, lay the sow upon the grassy bank, where all could see. And grave Aeneas dedicated her to thee, Juno the Great, to thee indeed, lifting both so and brood before the altar in sacrifice. Then all that night's long hours the Tiber quieted his swollen stream and countering his current with still water slack and so, that like a tranquil pool or placid marsh he smoothed his whole expanse and left no toil for oars. Once under way, therefore, cheered on, they made good speed upstream. Their tarry hulls with bubbling wakes behind slipped through the water, and the waves were awed, the virgin woods were awed at this new sight, the soldiers' shields that flashed in distant air, the painted ships afloat upon the river. Oarsmen out wearied night and day in rowing, past the long bends, shaded by differing trees, and cleft green forests in the mirroring water. At that hour when the fiery sun had climbed to heaven's midpoint, distant still they saw a wall, citadel, a few housetops, the town built heavenward by Roman power now but meagre then, and poorer, held by Evander. In toward the settlement they swung their prows. By chance that day the Arcadian king paid honor to Hercules, great son of Amphitryon, and to the other gods in festival outside the town, in a green grove. With him were his son Pallas and his leading men and homespun senate. They made offerings of incense while hot blood fumed on the altars. When they caught sight of the tall ships and saw the strangers gliding through the woodland shade, rowing in silence, they were caught by fear at the sudden apparition, and all sprang up, leaving the feast. But Pallas with high heart forbade them to disrupt the ritual. Taking a spear, he ran toward the newcomers and called out, while still distant, from a mound, soldiers, what brought you this strange way? We're bound. What is your nation? Where is your home? He said. Do you bring peace or war? Then Lord Aeneas from his high poop called back, as he held out a branch of olive signifying peace, you see before your eyes men born in Troy, enemy lances to the Latins, those who arrogantly attacked us in our exile. We come to find Evander. Take this message, say chosen captains of Dardania have come proposing partnership in war. Struck by that far away great name, young Pallas called, disembark, whoever you may be, and speak directly to my father, come, you'll be the guest of our hearth gods tonight. He took Aeneas' hand in a strong grip, and up the grove they went, leaving the river. Then, for the king, Aeneas had friendly words, most noble son of Greece, fortune would have me make my appeal to you with suppliant vows. I have not feared you as Arcadian or captain of Danians, or bloodkin of the Atridae. No, my own manhood and heaven's holy words, our ancestry in common, and your fame through all the world, have brought me here by destiny, and gladly, to join my strength with yours. The Greeks maintain Electra bore the founding father of Troy, old Dardanus, who sailed to the Teucrians. Electra was the child of that prodigious Atlas who upholds the heavenly sphere on a snowy shoulder. Father of your line was Mercury, whom Snow White Maya bore on the cold summit of Selene, Maya, fathered, if we can trust these tales, by that same Atlas, pillar of starry sky. So both our lines are branches of one blood. Putting my trust in this, I sent no legates, made no roundabout approaches to you, but have exposed myself, and my own life, in coming as a suppliant. The Donians, the race that harries you, now harries us in savage war. If they defeat and rout us, nothing, so they believe, stands in the way of their subduing all Hesperia, ruling the seas that bathe her, north and south. Trust us as we trust you. We have the stamina for warfare, and we have the spirit for it. In difficulties our men have proved themselves. Here Aeneas paused. For all this time, Evander's gaze had slowly swept the speaker, his eyes, his countenance, and his whole figure. Now he replied, Most gallant Teucrian, how happily I welcome you and know you, how you remind me of your father's speech, the voice of great Anchises, and his look. For I remember how Prince Priam, son of old Laomedon, Salamis bound to the kingdom of Hesione, his sister, visited the cold Arcadian land. The bloom of youth was on me. I admired the Trojan leaders, and admired Priam, but tallest in that company by far your father passed. With a boy's adoration I longed to speak to him, to shake his hand, so I approached. Then all aglow I led him into Phineas town. His parting gifts were a fine quiver full of Lycian arrows, a gold brocaded cloak, and two gold bits, those that my palace owns now. Well, then, here is what you ask, my right hand in a pact. 
and when first light returns to earth tomorrow I'll send you back with a fresh increment of troops to gladden you, and fresh supplies. Now, since you come as friends, be kind enough to join us at our feast, one held each year and not to be postponed. Become acquainted, even so soon, with how your allies fare. On this he called for dishes and wine cups already taken off to be brought back, as he himself gave the guests grassy seats and led Aeneas to the place of honor, a maple chair cushioned with lion skin. Then picked man and the priest who served the altar vied with one another to bring roast meat, to load bread baskets with the gifts of Ceres, milled and baked, and to pour out the wine. Aeneas with his Trojans feasted then on a beef chine and flesh of sacrifice. When they were fed, their appetites appeased, royally Vander spoke, no empty-headed superstition, blind to the age-old gods, imposed this ritual on us, and this feast, this altar to a divine force of will. No, Trojan guest, we carry out these rites, renewed each year, as men saved from barbaric dangers in the past. Look first of all at this high overhanging rocky cliff, see how rock masses have been scattered out, leaving a mountain dwelling bare, forsaken where the crags fell in avalanche. Here was once a cave with depths no ray of sun could reach, where Caucasus lived, a bestial form, half man, and the ground reeked forever with fresh blood, while nailed up in vile pride on his cave doors were men's pale faces ghastly in decay. Vulcan had fathered this unholy brute who as he moved about in mammoth bulk belched out the poisonous fires of the father. After long prayers, time brought even to us a god's advent and aid. The great avenger, Hercules, appeared, still flushed with pride and spoils he took when slaughtering Geryon, the triple-bodied giant, and as conqueror he drove the giant's bulls this way before him, while the mild herds grazed in our river valley. Caucus bloodthirsty mind, madly aroused to leave no crookedness untried, no crime unventured, turned four bulls out of their grounds, four heifers, two, all of the handsomest. But not to leave their hoof tracks going away, he held their tails and pulled the cattle backward, traces of passage thus reversed, and hid the stolen beasts in the cave's rocky darkness. Caveward, then, no sign would lead a searcher. Now when Amphitryon's heroic son had got his well-fed cattle on the move out of their pasture, ready to depart, the oxen bellowed at this leave-taking, filling the wood with protest, crying loud to the hills they left. One answer came, one heifer out of the cave depth load, out of her prison, foiling Caucasus hopes. For now indeed the affront of it set Hercules ablaze with black bile of anger. Taking arms, taking in hand his knotted massy club, he ran for the mountain top. Our people then saw for the first time fear in Caucasus' eyes as faster than the east wind he made off to reach his cave, and terror winged his feet. He shut himself inside, breaking the chain wrought there in iron by his father's hand to keep a boulder hanging. Down it crashed to block the entrance, none too soon. Imagine Hercules of Turin's in his fury facing that wall. This way and that he turned and stared to measure every access point, and ground his teeth, and in his rage three times went over all Mount Aventine, three times in vain pitted himself against the rock, and rested three times, wearied, in the valley. But from the ridge over the cave arose a flinty pinnacle, sheer on all sides, a towering home for nests of carrion birds. As to the left this leaned over the river the hero strained against it from the right and shook it, till the rock embedded roots were loosened then torn free, and all at once he heaved it over. At that fall great heaven thundered, river margins leapt apart, and the shock stream and flood surged backward. Then the cavern, Caucasus' huge domain, unroofed, lay open to its gloomy depth, as though earth, by some force cracked open to its depth, unlocked the underworld and brought to view the ghastly realm the gods hate, the abyss now visible from above, and ghosts a-tremble at the daylight let in. Caught by the light unlooked for, and closed in by stone, the giant bellowed as never in his life before, while from above with missiles Hercules let fly at him, calling on every mass at hand to make a weapon, raining down dry boughs and boulders like millstones. But then the monster, seeing no escape was left, wonderful to relate, belched from his gullet clouds of smoke, blanketing all the place in blinding haze that took sight from the eyes and thickened in the cave to smoky night, profound gloom laced with fire. Hercules' great heart could not abide this trick, but down he plunged headlong in one leap through the flames where the smoke billowed thickest, and the cavern seethed in that black cloud. Down there he caught and pinioned Caucasus as the monster belched his fires in vain, fastening on his throat he choked him till his eyes burst out, his gullet whitened and dried up with loss of blood. Soon the black den was cleared, the doors torn off, the stolen cattle, loot their tracks denied, revealed in the light of day, and the misshapen carcass dragged out by the heels. Our people could not be sated by the spectacle but gazed long at the dreadful eyes, the face, the shaggy bristling chest of the half-beast, his gorgeous fiery breath put out. Since then this feast is held, and younger men are glad to keep the memory of the day, in Chief Petitius, the founder, and the house of the Pinarii, custodians of rights to Hercules. 
here in the grove he placed this altar, ever to be called the greatest by ourselves, and be the greatest. Come then, soldiers, honor that great feat, garland your heads with leaves, hold out your cups, invoke the God we share, and tip your wine most heartily. At this with poplar leaves of shifting color, Herculean shade, he veiled his hair, and the leafy braided wreath hung down as the blessed wine cup filled his hand. Tipping their wine at once over the table the others made their prayer. Meanwhile Olympian heaven downward turned, evening came on, and soon the priests, led by Petitius, after their ancient mode, belted in furs, went round with torches. They renewed the feast, bridging a welcome second course, and heaped the altar tops with dishes. For a hymn at the lit altars came the Salii, all garlanded with poplar, files of dancers, here of the young, there of the elder men, who praised in song the feats of Hercules, his story, how he grappled monsters first, choking his stepmother's twin snakes, and how, again by might, he ruined tall towns in war, Troy town and then Echalia, and endured a thousand bitter toils under Eurystheus, doomed to these by Juno's enmity. O thou unconquered one, who slew the centaurs, Pholus and Hylius, born of cloud, and broke the terror of Crete by thy right hand and killed the lion under Nemea's crag. Before thee shook the Stygian lakes, the keeper of Orcus shook, sprawled in his gory cave on bones partly devoured. No monstrous form affrighted thee, even Typhaeus self though mountainous in arms. And Lerna's hydra coiling about thee with a swarm of heads attack no guileless warrior. Hail to thee, true son of Jove, new glory of the gods, with friendly stride come join us, join thy feast. So ran the hymns they sang, and crowning all a song of Cacus cave and breath of fire, voices that filled the leafy wood, and rang, and sprang back from the echoing hillsides. When they had carried out the ritual they turned back to the town. And, slowed by age, the king walked, keeping Aeneas and his son close by his side, with talk of various things to make the long path easy. Marveling, Aeneas gladly looked at all about him, delighted with the setting, asking questions, hearing of earlier men and what they left. Then King Evander, founder unaware of Rome's great citadel, said, These woodland places once were homes of local fauns and nymphs together with a race of men that came from tree trunks, from hard oak, they had no way of settled life, no arts of life, no skill at yoking oxen, gathering provisions, practicing husbandry, but got their food from oaken boughs and wild game hunted down. In that first time, out of Olympian heaven, Saturn came here in flight from Jove in arms, an exile from a kingdom lost, he brought these unschooled men together from the hills where they were scattered, gave them laws, and chose the name of Latium, from his latency or safe concealment in this countryside. In his reign were the golden centuries men tell of still, so peacefully he ruled, till gradually a meaner, tarnished age came on with fever of war and lust of gain. Then came Ausonians and Sicanians, and Saturn's land now often changed her name, and there were kings, one savage and gigantic, Thybris, from whom we afterborn Italians named the river Tiber. The old name, Albula, was lost. As for myself, in exile from my country, I set out for the sea's end, but fortune that prevails in everything, fate not to be thrown off, arrested me in this land, solemn warnings came from my mother, from the nymph Carmentis, backed by the god Apollo, to urge me here. Just after this, as he went on he showed the altar and the gate the Romans call Carmetal, honoring as of old the nymph and prophetess Carmentis, first to sing the glory of Palantium and Aeneas' great descendants. Then he showed the wood that Romulus would make a place of refuge, then the grotto called the Lupercal under the cold crag, named in Arcadian fashion after Lycian Pan. And then as well he showed the sacred wood of Argyletum, Argus' death, and took oath by it, telling of a guest, Argus, put to death. From there he led to our Tarpeian site and capital, all golden now, in those days tangled, wild with underbrush, but awesome even then. A strangeness there filled country hearts with dread and made them shiver at the wood and rock. Some god, he said, it is not sure what god, lives in this grove, this hilltop thick with leaves. Arcadians think they've seen great Jove himself sometimes with his right hand shaking the aegis to darken sky and make the storm clouds rise towering in turmoil. Here, too, in these walls long fallen down, you see what were two towns, monuments of the ancients. Father Janus founded one stronghold, sat in the other, named Janiculum and Saturnia. Conversing of such matters, going toward austere Evander's house, they saw his cattle lowing everywhere in what is now Rome's forum and her fashionable quarter, Carinae. As they came up to the door, Evander said, in victory Hercules bent for this lintel, and these royal rooms were grand enough for him. Friend, have the courage to care little for wealth, and shape yourself, you too, to merit Godhead. Do not come disdainfully into our needy home. Even as he spoke, 
He led under the gabled narrow roof Aeneas' mighty figure and made him rest where on strewn leaves he spread a Libyan bearskin. Swiftly night came on to fold her dusky wings about the earth. Now Venus, as a mother sorely frightened, and with good reason, moved by the menaces of the Laurentines and their hostile rising, turned to Vulcan. In her bridal chamber all of gold, putting divine desire in every word, she said, while Argive kings lay their due victim, Pergama, waste, her towers doomed to fall in fires her enemies set, never did I demand for the desperate any relief at all, no weapons forged by your skill, in your metal. Most dear husband, I never wish to tax you, make you toil in a lost cause, however much I owed to Priam's sons, however long I wept over Aeneas' ordeals. Now, however, by the command of Jove he has made good his landing on the Rutulian shore, and so I do come now, begging your sacred power for arms, a mother begging for her son. The daughter of Nereus moved you, and Tithonus' consort moved you by her tears to this. Look now, and see what masses throng together, see what cities lock their gates and wet the sword against me, to cut down my own. The goddess spoke and wrapped her snowy arms this way and that about him as he lingered, cherishing him in her swan's down embrace. And instantly he felt the flame of love invading him as ever, into his marrow ran the fire he knew, and through his bones, as when sometimes, ripped by a thunder peal, a fiery flash goes jagged through the clouds. His wife, contented with her blandishment, sure of her loveliness, perceived it all. Lord Vulcan, captive to immortal passion, answered her, Why do you go so far afield for reasons? Has your trust in me gone elsewhere, goddess? If concern like this had moved you in the old days, even then I might have armed the Trojans lawfully, for neither Jove Almighty nor the fates forbade Troy to endure, Priam to live, ten further years. If you are ready now to arm for war and have a mind to wage it, all the devoted craft that I can promise, all that is forgeable in steel and molten alloy by the strength of a blast fire, you need not beg me for these gifts. Have done with doubting your own powers, he said no more, but took her in his arms as she desired and gave himself, infused in her embrace, to peace and slumber. When his first repose came to an end in the mid-course of night now on the wane, and waked him, at that hour when a poor woman whose hard lot it is to make a living by her loom and spindle, pokes up the embers, wakes the sleeping fire, adding some night time to her morning's work, and by the firelight keeps her household maids employed at their long task, all to keep chaste her marriage bed and bring her children up, at that same hour, no more slothful than she, the lord of fire rose from his soft bed to labour at the smithy. Near the coast of Sicily and Aeolian Lipari a steep island rises, all of rock and smoking. Underneath, a mammoth cave and vaulted galleries of Etna, burned away by blast fire from the Cyclops' forge, rumble in thunder, mighty blows are heard re-echoing and booming from the anvils, Chalabi and bars of iron hiss in the caverns, Vulcan's workshop, named for him Vulcania. To this the Lord of Fire came down from heaven. Working with iron in the enormous cave were Cyclops' thunderclap and anvil fire and flash, stripped to the waist. They had a bolt in hand, such as from open sky the father often hurls to earth, this one part done, part still unfinished. First the smiths had added twisted hail, three rays, three rays of rain cloud, three of red fire and the flying south wind. Now they were mixing in terrifying lightning, fracas, and fear, and anger in pursuit with flares. Elsewhere they strove to finish a chariot of Mars, and flying wheels on which he might stir fighting men and cities. Then to an aegis, Coras bringing dread of Pallas when aroused, they gave a polish, vying to shine the golden serpent scales, the knot of vipers and the gorgon's head, for the goddess' very breast, with severed neck and rolling eyes. Put all these things away, commanded Vulcan. Cyclops under Etna, drop the work begun. Here is our task, armor is to be forged for a brave soldier. Now we can use your brawn, and your deft hands, your craft, your mastery. Shake off all reluctance, Vulcan said no more, but they for their part buckled down as one, allotting equal tasks to each. In streams the molten brass and gold flowed. Iron that kills turned liquid in the enormous furnace heat. They shaped a vast shield, one that might alone be proof against all missiles of the Latins, fastened it, layer on layer, sevenfold. Some smiths drew pulsing in and blasted out the air with bellows, others plunged the metal screeching in fresh water, and the cavern groaned under the anvils they set down. Now this, now that one, for a mighty stroke brought up his arms in rhythm, as they hammered, shifting the metal mass with gripping tongs. While in Aeolia Vulcan, Lord of Lemnos, pressed that fiery task, mild morning light with birdsong under eves awoke Evander, and the old man arose. He slipped his arms into his tunic and bound on his trim Tyrrhenian sandals, then by shoulder and flank slung his Arcadian blade. A mantling hide of panther, where it hung down on the left, he tossed back. Then his two awakened watchdogs preceded him out of the entranceway and kept close to their master. 
He went on to visit the secluded place's guest, Aeneas, occupied, and he remembered what had been said, what favors he had promised. Just as early, Aeneas had come outside, and one man had his son beside him, Pallas, the other had Achates. When they met they joined hands and sat down in the open court to enjoy the talk at last permitted them. The king began, saying, Greatest of Trojan captains, never while you live shall I consider Troy to be conquered and her kingdom gone, but, though our name is great, our power is slight to strengthen you in war. We are confined on this side by the river, and on that the Rutulians bring pressure on our wall with noisy forays. No, I plan for you a league with a great host, an army rich in many kingdoms. Here by unforeseen good fortune your salvation now appears. Fate called for your coming. No long way from here men live in the city of Agilla, built of ancient stone. The Lydians, renowned in war, in the old days settled there on the Etruscan ridges, and for years the city flourished, till an arrogant king, Mezentius, ruled it barbarously by force. How shall I tell of carnage beyond telling, beastly crimes this tyrant carried out? Requite them, gods, on his own head and on his children. He would even couple carcasses with living bodies as a form of torture. Hand to hand and face to face, he made them suffer corruption, oozing gore and slime in that wretched embrace, and a slow death. But at long last the townsman, sickening of his unholy ways, took arms and laid siege to the madman and his house. They killed his henchmen and threw fire on his roof, but in the midst of slaughter he escaped, took refuge in Rutulian territory, and got himself defended by the arms of Turnus, host and friend. On this account Etruria's people have risen as one man in righteous anger, threatening war at once, demanding the king back for punishment. Now I will make you leader of these thousands, Aeneas, for in fact while ships of theirs are crowded on the shore and fret for action, calling for ensigns to go forward, still a soothsayer of great age holds them all back, forewarning them, picked men of Meonia, flower and heart of an old heroic race, though justly moved by your past suffering against your enemy, and though Mezentius fires you with rightful anger, no Italian may have commanded this great people's cause. Choose leaders from abroad. Taking alarm at heaven's warning, the Etruscan ranks rest on their arms, here in this plain, and Tarkin sends me envoys with his crown and scepter, badges of regal power. He asks that I go up to camp and take the Tyrrhene throne. But slow and cold old age, weakened by years, forbids command, an old man's vigor falls behind in action. I should urge my son to accept, if he were not of mingled blood, through a Sabine mother heir to her fatherland. No, you are he whose age and foreign birth the fates approve, and whom the gods desire. Enter on your great duty now, great heart, commander of Trojans and Italians both. I shall, besides, commit to you my palace, all my comfort and my hope, to learn with you as master how to weather battle, Mars dead serious work. May he become familiar with your actions, look to you as his exemplar from his early years. I'll add two hundred horsemen, all Arcadians, picked for ruggedness. In his own name Pallas will give two hundred more. In silence after this speech, Anchises' son, Aeneas, and faithful at his side Achates sat with downcast eyes. They would have pondered long and grimly on the many trials to come, had not the Scytheran queen from open heaven given a sign, one utterly unforeseen, a quivering flash out of the upper air, a thunder crack, and in that instant all the sky seemed falling, as it seemed on high a tearing trumpet gave a rumbling blast. They all looked up. Again and yet again tremendous crashes came. Between the clouds in sunlit air they saw a red glare of armor clashing, thundering at the shock. The others sat still, mystified, but Troy's great captain recognized the sound, and knew the promise made by his goddess mother. Then he said, My friend, you need not, truly need not ask what new events portended. I am the man whom heaven calls. This sign my goddess mother prophesied she would send if war broke out, and said, too, she would bring out of the sky arms made by Vulcan to assist me. I. What carnage is at hand for poor Laurentines? What retribution you will make to me, Turnus? Many a shield, many a helm, and many brave men's bodies you'll take under, Father Tiber. Let them insist on war, let them break treaties. After saying this, he rose from his high seat and first revived the fires for Hercules on slumbering altars, gladly revisiting, as yesterday, the guardian Lar and humble household gods. Likewise Evander and the men of Troy made sacrifice of chosen ewes. Thereafter back to his ships and comrades went Aeneas, and chose among them soldiers known for bravery to follow him to war. The rest were carried effortlessly downstream on the current to bring Ascanius news of these affairs and of his father. Those Etruria bound were now supplied with horses. For Aeneas they led a special mount, all blanketed with a lion skin, gleaming with gilded claws. Then suddenly a rumor flew about the little town that horsemen were departing quickly for the Etrurian king's domain. 
Mothers in fright doubled their prayers, fear brought danger nearer, and the specter of war grew larger in their eyes. But Lord Evander clung to the hand of his departing son and could not have enough of tears. He said, If only Jupiter would give me back the past years and the man I was, when I cut down the front rank by promised wall and won the fight and burned the piles of shields. I had dispatched to hell with this right hand King Aerolus, to whom Feronia, his mother, gave three lives at birth, a thing to chill the blood, three sets of arms to fight with, so that he had to be brought down three times. Yet this hand took his lives that day, took all, and each time took his arms. I should not now be torn from you and from your dear embrace, my son, and neither would Mezentius have shown contempt for me, his bordering power, putting so many cruelly to the sword and widowing his town of citizens. But O oh, high masters, and thou, Jupiter, supreme ruler of gods, pity, I beg, the Arcadian king, and hear a father's prayer, if by thy will my son survives, and fate spares him, and if I live to see him still, to meet him yet again, I pray for life, there is no trouble I cannot endure. But, fortune, if you threaten some black day, now, now, let me break off my bitter life while all's in doubt, while hope of what's to come remains uncertain, while I hold you here, dear boy, my late delight, my only one, and may no graver message ever come to wound my ears. These were the father's words, poured out in final parting. He collapsed completely, and the servants helped him in. And now indeed through open gates the horsemen left the town, Aeneas at their head, Achates at his right hand, then the others, Trojan officers, and Pallas himself mid-column in short cloak with blazoned arms, a sight as brilliant as the morning star whom Venus loves above all stellar fires, when from the bath of ocean into heaven he lifts his holy visage, making night dissolve and wane. Mothers with quaking breasts were standing on the walls, watching the cloud of dust, the burnished gleams of cavalry, as the armed riders picked their way through scrub cross-country toward their goal. A shout went up, and, forming into column, they rode on, hoofbeat of horses shaking the dust of the plain. Near the cold stream of Car there's a grove immense and deep, awesome to our forebears. The hills encircle it with dark fir trees. The tale goes that the old Pelostians, who held this Latin country who knows when, made grove and feast day sacred to Sylvanus, god of the fields and herds. Not far from there Tarkin and his Tyrrhenians had encamped on favorable ground, and one could see from a high hill the tents of all the army on the wide plain. Now Lord Aeneas came to this place with his soldiers picked for battle. Here they refreshed their weariness and gave their horses pasture. Venus the gleaming goddess, bearing her gifts, came down amid high clouds and far away still, in a veil apart, sighted her son beside the ice-gold stream. Then making her appearance as she willed she said to him, Here are the gifts I promised, forged to perfection by my husband's craft, so that you need not hesitate to challenge arrogant Laurentines or savage Turnus, however soon, in battle. As she spoke Cytherea swept to her son's embrace and placed the shining arms before his eyes under an oak tree. Now the man in joy at a goddess gifts, at being so greatly honoured, could not be satisfied, but scanned each piece in wonder and turned over in his hands the helmet with its terrifying plumes and gushing flames, the sword blade edged with fate, the cuirass of hard bronze, blood-red and huge, like a dark cloud burning with sunset light that sends a glow for miles, the polished greaves of gold and silver alloy, the great spear, and finally the fabric of the shield beyond description. There the Lord of Fire, knowing the prophets, knowing the age to come, had wrought the future story of Italy, the triumphs of the Romans, there one found the generations of Ascanius heirs, the wars they fought, each one. Vulcan had made the mother wolf, lying in Mars' green grotto, made the twin boys at play about her teats, nursing the mother without fear, while she bent round her smooth neck fondling them in turn and shaped their bodies with her tongue. Nearby, Rome had been added by the artisan, and Sabine women roughly carried off out of the audience at the circus games, then suddenly a new war coming on to pit the sons of Romulus against old Tatius and his austere town of Cures. Later the same kings, warfare laid aside, in arms before Jove's altar stood and held libation dishes as they made a pact with offering of swine. Not far from this two four-horse war cars, whipped on, back to back, had torn Metis apart, still, man of Alba, you should have kept your word, and Roman Tullus dragged the liar's rags of flesh away through woods where brambles dripped a bloody dew. There, too, poor Anna stood, ordering Rome to take the exiled Tarquin back, then bringing the whole city under massive siege. There for their liberty Aeneas' sons threw themselves forward on the enemy spears. You might have seen poor Anna image there to the life, a menacing man, a man in anger at Roman daring, Codes who down the bridge, Clelia who broke her bonds and swam the river. On the shield's upper quarter Manlius, guard of the Tarpeian rock, stood fast before the temple and held the capital, where Romulus' house was newly thatched and rough. Here fluttering through gilded porticos at night, 
the silvery goose warned of the Gauls approaching. Under cover of the darkness Gauls amid the bushes had crept near and now lay hold upon the citadel. Golden locks they had and golden dress, glimmering with striped cloaks, their milky necks entwined with gold. They hefted alpine spears, two each, and had long body shields for cover. Vulcan had fashioned naked Lupersi and Salii leaping there with woolen caps and fallen from heaven shields, and put chaste ladies riding in cushioned carriages through Rome with sacred images. At a distance then he pictured the deep hell of Tartarus, Dis's high gate, crime's punishments, and, yes, you, Catiline, on a precarious cliff hanging and trembling at the fury's glare. Then, far away from this, were virtuous souls and Cato giving laws to them. Mid-shield, the pictured sea flowed surging, all of gold, as white caps foamed on the blue waves, and dolphins shining in silver round and round the scene propelled themselves with flukes and cut through billows. Vivid in the center were the bronze beaked ships and the fight at sea off Actium. Here you could see Lucata all alive with ships maneuvering, sea glowing gold, Augustus Caesar leading into battle Italians, with both senators and people, household gods and great gods, there he stood high on the stern, and from his blessed brow twin flames gushed upward, while his crest revealed his father's star. Apart from him, Agrippa, favored by winds and gods, led ships in column, a towering figure, wearing on his brows the coronet adorned with warships' beaks, highest distinction for command at sea. Then came Antonius with barbaric wealth and a diversity of arms, victorious from races of the Donlands and Red Sea, leading the power of the east, of Egypt, even of distant Bactra of the steppes. And in his wake the Egyptian consort came so shamefully. The ships all kept together racing ahead, the water torn by her strokes, torn by the triple beaks, in spume and foam. All made for the open sea. You might believe the Cyclades uprooted were afloat or mountains running against mountain heights when seamen in those hulks pressed the attack upon the other turreted ships. They hurled broadsides of burning flax on flying steel, and fresh blood reddened Neptune's fields. The queen amidst the battle called her flotilla on with a sistrum's beat, a frenzy out of Egypt, never turning her head as yet to see twin snakes of death behind, while monster forms of gods of every race, and the dog god Anubis barking, held their weapons up against our Neptune, Venus, and Minerva. Mars, engraved in steel, raged in the fight as from high air the dire furies came with discord, taking joy in a torn robe, and on her heels, with bloody scourge, Bologna. Overlooking it all, action Apollo began to pull his bow. Wild at this sight, all Egypt, Indians, Arabians, all Sabians put about in flight, and she, the queen, appeared crying for winds to shift just as she hauled up sail and slackened sheets. The Lord of Fire had portrayed her there, amid the slaughter, pallid with death to come then borne by waves and wind from the northwest, while the great length of morning Nile awaited her with open bays, calling the conquered home to his blue bosom and his hidden streams. But Caesar then in triple triumph rode within the walls of Rome, making immortal offerings to the gods of Italy, three hundred princely shrines throughout the city. There were the streets, humming with festal joy and games and cheers, an altar to every shrine, to every one a mother's choir, and bullocks knifed before the altar strewed the ground. The man himself, enthroned before the snow-white threshold of sunny Phoebus, viewed the gifts the nations of the earth made, and he fitted them to the tall portals. Conquered races passed in long procession, varied in languages as in their dress and arms. Here Mulciber, divine smith, had portrayed the nomad tribes and offrey with ungirdled flowing robes, here Lelages and Carians, and here Galonians with quivers. Here Euphrates, milder in his floods now, there Morini, northernmost of men, here bull-horned Rhine, and there the still unconquered Scythian Dai, here, vexed at being bridged, the rough Arashus. All these images on Vulcan's shield, his mother's gift, were wonders to Aeneas. Knowing nothing of the events themselves, he felt joy in their pictures, taking up upon his shoulder all the destined acts and fame of his descendants. Book 9. A Night Sortie, A Day Assault. While all these differing actions were afoot in the far distance, Juno from high air sent Iris down to Turnus. As it chanced, that day the rash prince rested in the grove of his forebear, Palumnus, in a valley blessed of old. There Iris, rose-lipped child of Thaumas, told him, Turnus, what no god would dare to promise you, your heart's desire, the course of time has of itself brought on. Leaving his town and ships and followers Aeneas journeyed to the Palatine court of Evander. Still unsatisfied, he's gone to distant hamlets of Carethus to rally and arm the Lydian countrymen. Why hesitate? Now is the time to sound the call for cavalry and war cars, now. Break off this lull, strike at their flurried camp, take it by storm. On even wings she rose into the sky, inscribing her great bow in flight upon the clouds. He knew her sign, and lifting both his hands to starry heaven sent these words after her, Glory of the sky, 
Who brought you down to me, cloud-born to earth? What makes the sudden brilliance of the air? I see the vault of heaven riven, and stars that drift across the night sky. I'll obey this great presage, no matter who you are who call me to attack. Then riverward he took his way and from the surface drew pure lustral water, then he heaped his vows plenteously on heaven. Soon his army at full strength moved out through open land, studded with riders, with dyed cloaks in gold, Mesopus commanding the forward units, Tyrus sons the rear, Turnus the center, as Ganges fed by seven tranquil streams flows high and quietly, or Nile goes full in a seaward channel when the enriching flood ebbs from the fields at last. A distant cloud in black dust mounting up, a darkness rising suddenly on the plain came to the eyes of Trojan lookouts. Then Caicus yelled from the rampart facing inland, Countrymen, what is the mass of men there on the plain in a dark cloud of dust? Take arms, be quick, hand missiles out, and spears, and man the walls. Here comes the enemy. On guard. In tumult back to the camp through all the gates retiring Trojans took position on the walls, for so on his departure their best soldier, Aeneas, had instructed them, if any emergency arose, not to do battle, not to entrust their fortunes to the field, but safe behind their walls to hold the camp. Therefore, though shame and anger tempted them to a pitched battle, even so they barred their gates as he commanded, and compact in towers, armed, awaited the enemy. Turnus, riding hard, had left the slow main column far behind. Now he turned up before the camp, with twenty chosen horsemen. A Thracian piebald was his mount, his helm all golden with a crimson plume. He shouted, Who will it be, men? Who will join with me to open the attack? Look here. He cast high in the air his spinning javelin, first in that fight. Then the tall horseman rode straight onward in the open field. His troop took up the cry and galloped after him with a wild din, yelling astonishment at Trojans' faint hearts. They won't risk themselves in the open in a fair fight, won't come down to stand up to us. How they hugged the camp. Now turn us furiously this way and that rode round the walls and looked for a way in where there was none. As a wolf on the prowl round a full sheepfold howls at crevices, enduring wind and rain at dead of night, while nestled safe under the ewes the lambs keep up their bleeding, he, beside himself, tormented by accumulated hunger, jaws a thirst for blood, in all his fury cannot reach them, rend them, so the Rutulian flared up with helpless rage at what he saw of walls and camp, a fever in his bones. How could he work an entrance? By what course dislodge the shut-in Trojans from their rampart, get them to issue on the plain? The fleet. Next to the camp it lay, shielded by earthworks on the land side and by the running stream. He rode for it, calling his cheering men to bring up fire, and he, himself inflamed, took up a blazing pine torch in his hand. Then as his presence urged them on, they all rode to and fro in earnest to arm themselves with evil torches, tearing campfires apart as fuming brands gave off a pitchy glare and Vulcan clouded heaven with smoke and ash. Now which of the immortals, muse, dispelled that cruel conflagration from the Trojans? Who turned those fires from the ships? Tell me the old belief in the eternal tale. In those days when Aeneas shaped his fleet on Phrygian Ida and prepared to sail the deep sea, then the mother of the gods, the Berecynthian, addressed great Jove, Son, now Olympus owns your mastery, grant your dear mother what she asks of you. There was a forest of pines I loved for years, a grove high on a mountain crest, where men brought offerings to me, a dusky place with dark pine trees and a tall stand of maple. These I gladly gave to the Dardan prince when he required a fleet. But now a pang of fear has made my heart contract. Relieve my anguish, let your mother's plea avail in this, that those ship's timbers not be breached or swamped on any course by any storm, but let their birth and growth here on our mountains prosper them all. But in reply her son who makes the firmament revolve demurred, what swerving, mother, do you ask of fate? What privilege for these, your ships? Shall hulls that mortal hands have made enjoy a right that only immortals have? And shall Aeneas go secure through insecurities and dangers? Which of the gods can wield that power? Rather, when they have done their work and moored in the Ausonian ports one day, those ships that have escaped the storm waves and brought home the Dardan hero to Laurentine lands, then I shall strip away their mortal shape and make them, at my bidding, goddesses of the great deep, like Dodo, near use child, and Galatea, in the midsy foam breasting their way. So ran the pledge of Jove, ratified when by Astygian brothers' rivers, boiling banks, and black whirlpool he took oath nodding, making all Olympus tremble at his nod. Now, then, the promised hour had come, the overshadowing fates had filled the appointed time. Now havoc planned by Turnus roused the mother to keep away his firebrands from her blessed hulls. Fresh light shone in men's eyes, a great cloud from the east appeared to storm across the sky with Ida's retinue of Sibel. Then a voice to chill the blood came falling through the air and reached all ranks, Rutulian and Trojan, 
No desperate rallying to defend my ships, you Trojans, no equipping men for that. Turnus may sooner fire the sea itself than hulls of holy pine. Ships, now go free, go as sea goddesses. Your mother sends you. Each broke her hawser instantly, their bows went under like a school of dolphins diving into the depths, then wondrously came up, so many virgin forms now seaward bound. The astounded troop drew back, as horses reared, Mesopus, even he, was terrified. The river halted with a raucous noise as Tiber turned back from the sea. But Turnus' fiery confidence held, in quick response he blazed at them to give them heart, these wonders are all aimed at the Trojans. Jove himself has robbed them of their usual ally, not waiting for our swords and fires to do it. The open sea is close to Trojans now, now they have no way out. That element is taken from them, and dry land is ours, where all the tribes of Italy, men in thousands, take up arms. Those fateful oracles, so called, on which the Phrygians plume themselves, terrify me not in the least, enough and more has now been granted fate in Venus, seeing the Trojans reached Ausonian lands. I have my fate as well, to combat theirs, to cut this criminal people down, my bride being stolen. Pain over such a loss is not for the Atridae only, nor may only Mycenae justly have recourse to arms. Enough that Trojans perished once? Their sin that once had been enough, were they not still given to hatred of all womankind. They get their courage from a wall between us, ditches to put us off, a paltry space for massacre for them. Did they not see the walls of Troy, built up by Neptune's hand, collapse in flames? Which one of you picked men is ready with his blade to breach their wall and rush their flustered camp with me? I need no arms from Vulcan, nor a thousand ships, to take these Trojans on. Let the Etruscans all be quick to join them as allies. They need not fear sneak thievery by night of their palladium, guards on the height cut down, nor will we hide in a horse's pitch dark belly. Openly by day I'll have their ramparts ringed with flame, by God, I'll see to it they won't suppose they're fighting with Danaeans, Pelasgian troops Hector held off ten years. Now, though, seeing the day's best hours are gone, be of good cheer, men, after the day's good action, rest and be fed. A fight's in preparation, you can be sure of that. In the interim Mesopus had the duty of placing men outside the gates, and watchfires round the ramparts. Fourteen officers were assigned to guard the perimeter, with a hundred men to each in crimson helmet plumes and glinting gold. Scattering to their posts, they manned the watch by turns, and settled on the grass at ease to drink their wine, tipping the brazen bowls. The campfires gave them light, and wakeful sentries passed the night in gaming. From their ramparts overlooking the scene, the Trojans watched. Anxiously they had tried and braced the gates, joined catwalks to their battlements and brought fresh missiles up. Mnestheus had charge of this with grim Serestus, for the lord Aeneas appointed them, if a crisis called for it, to keep order in troops and settlement. On the alert along the walls, the legion faced the danger, each his share of it, guarding in turn what each one had to guard. Nisus guarded a gate, a man at arms with a fighting heart, Herdicus' son. The huntress Ida had sent him to Aeneas' side, a quick hand with a javelin and arrows. Eurylus was his comrade, handsomer than any other soldier of Aeneas wearing the Trojan gear, a boy whose cheek bore though unshaven manhood's early down. One love united them, and side by side they entered combat, as that night they held the gate on the same watch. And Nisus said, This urge to action, do the gods instill it, or is each man's desire a god to him, Eurylus? For all these hours I've longed to engage in battle, or to try some great adventure. In this lull I cannot rest. You see how confident the Rutulians are. Their watchfire lights wink few and far between, they've all lain down in wine and drowsiness, and the whole place is quiet. Now attend to a thought I'm turning over in my mind, a plan that grows on me. Recall Aeneas, everyone, seniors, all our folk, demand, dispatch men to report to him. Will they now promise the reward I ask for you? The glory of the feat's enough for me. Below that rise of ground there I can find, I think, a way through to Fort Palantium. Taken aback, his love of glory stirred, Eurylus replied to his ardent friend, And me? Are you refusing me my place beside you in this great affair? Must I send you alone into such danger? Born for that, was I, and trained for that, amid the Argive terror, those hard hours of Troy, by a true fighter, one inured to battle, my father, Apheltes? Never till now have I behaved so at your side, and as a soldier pledged to see Aeneas' destiny through. Believe me, here's a spirit that disdains mere daylight. I hold life well spent to buy that glory you aspire to. Nisus answered, not for a minute had I any qualms about you on that score. Unthinkable. Witness great Jupiter, or whoever else may favor this attempt, by bringing me in triumph back to you. But if some god or accident defeats me, 
and one sees miscarriage of bold missions many a time, you must live on. Your age deserves more life. If I am dragged free from a fight or ransomed, let there be someone who can bury me. Or if, as often, bad luck rules that out, someone who can carry out the ritual for me, though I'm not there, and honor me with an empty tomb. Then too, I would not bring such grief on your poor mother, one who dared as many mothers did not, child, to come this far with you, taking no care for shelter behind Acestes' walls. But the boy said, your reasoning is all a waste of breath. Not by an inch has my position changed. Let us be off. With this he roused the watch, men who came up to stand guard in their turn, as he took his relief, matching his stride with Nisus, and they sought the prince of Troy. Earth's other creatures now had given over care and sleep, forgetful of their toil, but the high Trojan captains, chosen men, held counsel on the realm's pressing affairs, what action should they take? Or who should be their messenger to Aeneas? In the open midcourt of the camp, leaning on spears, gripping their shields, they stood. And Nisus came, Euryalus beside him, eager men who begged for a quick hearing, saying how grave the matter was, worth a commander's time. Iulus moved first to hear the excited pair, ordering Nisus to speak out. He did so, saying, Soldiers of Aeneas, listen with open minds, and let what we propose be looked on without reference to our years. The Rutulians have quieted down. Their wine has put them all to sleep. But we make out an opening for a sortie where the road divides there at the gate nearest the sea, a gap at that point in their line of fires with only black smoke rising. If you let us take advantage of this to find our way to Aeneas and Palantium, you'll see us back with plunder before long, and slaughter done. No fear the path will fool us, many times, hunting these valleys, we have come in view of the town's outposts, and we know the river, the whole course of it. Bowed by weight of years and ripe of mind, Alatus here exclaimed, Gods of our fathers, in whose shadow Troy forever lives, you are not after all intent on wiping out the Teucrians, seeing you've given our fighters daring souls and resolute hearts like these. And as he spoke he took each by the shoulder, took his hand, while tears ran down his cheeks. What fit rewards for this brave action, soldiers, shall I reckon we can make to you? The best of all the gods will give, and your own sense of duty. Then our devout Aeneas will recompense you in other ways, and soon, so will Ascanius, young as he is, never will he forget a feat of this distinction, here Ascanius broke in, never indeed, as my well-being wholly depends on fathers coming back. By our great household gods, by our hearth god, Lar of Asericus, by white-haired Vesta's holy chapel, Nisus, hear my vow, whatever fortune I may have, whatever hope, I now commit to both of you. Recall my father, bring him before my eyes. With him recovered, nothing can be grim. Then I shall give two cups well shaped in silver, rough with embossing, that my father took the day Arisba fell, twin tripods, two, two gold bars and an ancient wine bowl, gift of Dido the Sidonian. More than this, if it should happen that my father wins the land and throne of Italy, and divides by lot the captured booty, well, you've seen the mount that Turnus rode, the arms he bore, all golden, I exempt that mount, that shield and crimson crested helmet from allotment, even now, to be your trophies, Nisus. Father will reward you, too, with twelve deep-breasted beauties and twelve captive men, each with his armor, beyond these, whatever private lands the king, Latinus, owns. But as for you whose age my own approaches, young but so admirable, I embrace you with my whole heart, and say you'll be my friend in all future adventures. There shall be no labor for distinction in my life in wartime or in time of peace without you. Whether in speech or action, all my trust goes now to you. Euryalus answered him, The day will never come when I shall prove unequal to this kind of mission, hard and daring as it is, if only fortune turns to our benefit and not against us. One gift above all gifts I ask of you. My mother comes of the old stock of Priam, and she is here, poor lady, Ilium, her homeland, could not keep her, neither could Acestes city walls, from following me. I leave her ignorant of the risks I run, with no leave-taking. Let the present night in your sword arm be witness, I could not endure my mother's tears. Will you, I beg, console her in her deprivation, help her if she is left without me? Let me take this expectation of your care along, I shall face danger with a lighter heart. This moved the Dardan officers to tears, Iulus most of all. Thoughts of his own devotion to his father wrung his heart. When he had wept, he said, be sure of it. All here will be conducted worthily of the great thing you undertake. That mother will be mine, only the name Creuso wanting to her, and I shall not stint in gratitude for parenthood so noble. Whatever comes of your attempt, I swear, as once my father did, by my own life that all I promise on your safe return holds likewise for your mother and your kin. So he spoke out in tears, 
and from his shoulder lifted on its belt his gilded sword, a marvel of craft. It had been forged and fitted to an ivory sheath by the Nosian, Lycaon. Tenesis Mnistheus gave a lion's pelt and shaggy mane, and steadfast old Alidus made an exchange of helmets. Both now armed, they set out, followed to the gate by all the company of officers, with prayers from young and old, and in particular princely Iulus, thoughtful, responsible beyond his years, gave many messages to carry to his father. These the winds of heaven scattered, every one, unheard, and puffed them to the clouds. The messengers now issued from the gate, traversed the trench, and made their way through darkness toward the encampment deadly to them. Still, before the end, they were to bring a bloody death on many. Now everywhere they saw in drunken sleep lax bodies on the grass, up-tilted chariots along the river, forms of men at rest amid the reins and wheels, arms lying there where wine cups also lay. The first to speak was Nisus, and he said, Eurylus, here I must dare to use my sword, the case cries out for it, our path lies there. But you keep watch, keep well alert all round about for any stroke against us from behind. Ahead, I'll devastate them right and left and take you through. He broke off whispering to lunge at Ramnus, the proud man propped up on rugs and snoring loud, lungs full of sleep. A king himself and augured a king Turnus, now by no augury could he dispel his evil hour. Three of his bodyguards who lay nearby at random by their spears Nisus dispatched, then Remus armorer and then his charioteer, discovered prone under the very horse's feet, the swordsmen slashed their drooping necks. Then he beheaded Remus himself, their lord, and left the trunk to spout dark blood. By the warm blood the ground and bedding were all soaked. Next Lemiris and Lamus died, and so did Serenus, a handsome soldier who had played at dice that night for hours and now lay undone by abundant Bacchus. Lucky this man had been if he had made his gambling last the night into the dawn. Think of an unfed lion havocing crowded sheepfolds, being driven mad by hunger, how with his jaws he rends and mauls the soft flock dumb with fear, and growls and feeds with bloody maw. Eurylus carried out equal slaughter, all inflamed, as he too fell upon the nameless ranks of sleeping soldiery. Then he attacked Fatus, Herbesus, Rhodus, Abari, unconscious men, but Rhodus came awake and took in everything, struck dumb with fear, trying to hide behind a huge wine bowl. Full in the chest as he arose the Trojan plunged his blade up to the hilt and drew it backward streaming death. Dying, the man belched out his crimson life, wine mixed with blood, as the hot killer like a cat pressed on. He came then to Mesopus' company, their fires burning low, their tethered horses grazing the meadow. But now Nisus spoke in a curt whisper, for he saw his friend carried away by slaughter and lust for blood, let us have done, he said. The dawn's at hand and dangerous. We've made them pay enough, we've cut our way through. Turning now, they left a quantity of booty, solid silver armor, wine bowls, handsome rugs. Eurylus took medals and a golden studded belt from Ramnus, gifts the rich man, Cetacus, in the old days had sent to Remulus of Tiber as a distant guest friend's pledge, and Remulus at death had passed them on to his own grandson, at whose death in war the Rutulians had got them. These the boy tore off and fitted to his torso, tough and stalwart as it was, though all in vain, then Don Mesippus' helm with its high plume as the marauders put the camp behind them, making for safety. At that hour, horsemen sent ahead from the city of Latinus, other troops being halted on the plain, came bringing answers to the prince, to Turnus, horsemen three hundred strong, all bearing shields, with Vulcans in command. Nearing the camp and riding toward the rampart, they caught sight of the two Trojans over there who veered on the leftward path. Eurylus's helmet in the clear night's half-darkness had betrayed him, glimmering back, as he had not foreseen, dim rays of moonlight. And the horsemen took sharp notice of that sight. Troop leader Vulcans shouted, Soldiers, halt! What's this patrol? Who are you two in arms there, and were bound? They offered no reply to him, but made all speed into a wood, putting their trust in darkness there. Troopers rode left and right to place themselves at the familiar byways until they had the wood encircled, every exit under guard. The wood itself covered much ground, all bristling underbrush, dark ilex, and dense briars everywhere, the path a rare trace amid tracks grown over. Deep night under the boughs, and weight of booty, slowed your eyeless, and fear confused him as to the pathway. Nisus, unsuspecting, got free of the wood, escaped the foe, ran past the places later known as Alban, Latinus high-fenced cattle pastures then. But all at once he stopped and looked around in vain for his lost friend. Eurylus, poor fellow, where did I lose you? Where shall I hunt for you? Back all that winding way, that maze of woodland? Backward in his tracks, as he recalled them, now he went, and strayed through silent undergrowth. He heard the horses, heard the clamor and calls of the pursuit, and after no long interval a cry came to his ears, 
Euryalus now he saw set upon by the whole troop, first undone by darkness and the treacherous terrain, now overwhelmed by the sudden rush of men who dragged him off, though right and left he strove. Now what could Nisus do? What strength had he, what weapons could he dare a rescue with? Should he then launch himself straight at the foe, through many wounds hastening heroic death? His arm drawn back, hefting his javelin, he glanced at the high quiet moon and prayed, Thou, goddess, thou, be near, and help my effort, Latona's daughter, glory of the stars and guardian of the groves. If Herdicus, my father, ever brought gifts to thy altars, votive gifts for me, if I myself have honoured thee out of my hunting spoils with offerings, hung in thy dome or fixed outside upon thy sacred roof, now let me throw this troop into confusion, guide my weapon through the air. He made the cast, with all the force and spring of his whole body. And through the darkness of the night the javelin, whipping on, hit Solmo's back and snapped there, putting a splinter through his diaphragm. The man rolled on the ground and vomited a hot flood, even as he himself grew chill, with long convulsions. All the rest peered round this way, then that way. All the more savagely the assailant hefts a second javelin back to his ear. Now see commotion, hear the whizzing shaft. It splits the skull of Tagus side to side and sticks in the cleft hot brain. Now Vulcans in a wild rage nowhere saw the man who threw the missile, could not tell in what quarter to hurl himself. All right, he said, you, then, you'll pay with your hot blood for both my men. And with his sword unsheathed he went straight for Euryalus. Now truly mad with terror, Nisus cried aloud. He could not hide in darkness any longer, could not bear his anguish any longer, no, me. Me. Here I am. I did it. Take your swords to me, Rutulians. All the trickery was mine. He had not dared do anything, he could not. Heaven's my witness, and the stars that look down on us, all he did was care too much for a luckless friend. But while he clamoured, Vulcan's blade, thrust hard, passed through the ribs and breached the snow-white chest. Euryalus in death went reeling down, and blood streamed on his handsome length, his neck collapsing let his head fall on his shoulder, as a bright flower cut by a passing plough will droop and wither slowly, or a poppy bow its head upon its tired stalk when overborne by a passing rain. Now Nisus plunged ahead into the crowd of men and made for Vulcans only, of them all, concerned only with Vulcans. All around him enemies grouped to meet him, fend him off to left and right, but onward all the same he pressed his charge swirling his lightning blade until he sank it in the yelling visage straight before him. So he took that life even as he died himself. Pierced everywhere, he pitched down on the body of his friend and there at last and the peace of death grew still. Fortunate, both. If in the least my songs avail, no future day will ever take you out of the record of remembering time, while children of Aeneas make their home around the capital's unshaken rock, and still the Roman father governs all. The Rutulians, now victors, with their trophies bore the dead Vulcans into camp with tears, and tears flowed in the camp as well, at finding Ramnus bled to death, and many captains taken off at one stroke in that slaughter, even as Numa and Serenus were. A great crowd pressed around the dead and dying, pressed toward the ground still fresh with carnage, foaming rills of blood. The men could recognize the trophies there, and point them out, Mesippus' shining helm, and medals now regained that had cost toil and sweat in the attack. By this time early dawn, leaving Tithonus' yellow bed, scattered first rays of light over the lands of earth, down poured the sun, the world stood clear. And Turnus in full armour roused his men to arm. Each officer drew up his line of battle, all in bronze, and soldiers gave their anger a fighting edge with divers versions of the night attack. The attackers' heads, indeed, a ghastly sight, they fixed on spears, and lifted, and bore out in taunting parade, Euryalus and Nisus. Aeneas' men-at-arms on the left flank formed their defending line along the walls, the right enclosed by river. On high towers, having the ditch before them, broad and deep, they stood in sorrow, moved by those grim heads, impaled and dripping gore, heads too well known to their unhappy fellows. In the meantime, rumour on strong wings flying went about the settlement in dread, until it whispered close by Euryalus's mother's ears. Then all at once warm life drained from her body, shuttle and skein unwound dropped from her hands. She flew outdoors, all wretchedness, and wailed as women do, tearing her hair, and ran to reach the rampart, in mad haste, to reach the front line, paying soldiers there no heed, no heed to danger, none to missiles. Then she filled heaven's air with keening, must I see you even like this, Euryalus? You that were in these last days the comfort of my age could leave me, could you, cruel boy, alone? Sent into danger so, had you no time for your poor mother's last farewell? Ah, God! You lie now in a strange land, carrion for Latin dogs and birds, and I your mother never took you, your body, out for burial, 
nor closed your eyes nor washed your wounds nor dressed you in the fine robe I had been weaving for you night and day, in haste, before the loom, easing an old woman's pain. But where shall I go now? Where is the earth that holds your trunk dismembered, all your mangled body? This, is this all of yourself, my son, that you bring back to me? By sea and land did I keep this beside me? Put your spears into me, Rutulians, if you can be moved, let fly your javelins all at me, and let me be the first you kill. Or else take pity, father of the great gods, with your bolt dispatch this hateful soul to the abyss. I cannot else break off my tortured life. All hearts were shaken by her cries, and groans of mourning came from all, their strength for battle broken and benumbed. At the behest of Ilioneus and Iulus, weeping hard, the woman, as she fanned the flame of grief, was brought inside, supported on the arms of Actor and Idaeus, and given rest. But now a far-off trumpet sang in bronze heart-chilling clamor, and a battle shout re-echoed from the sky, as Votians charged under cover of shields evenly locked to fill the moat and tear the rampart down. Some tried to find a way over and in with scaling ladders at points lightly manned, where gaps showed in the high line of defenders, not so close-packed. But the Trojans, trained in their long war, knew how to hold a wall. They rained all kinds of missiles down, and used tough poles to push off climbers. Stones as well of deadly weight they rolled and tumbled over to crack the shield-roofed ranks. Nevertheless, beneath a tortoise shell so thick, those troops were glad to take their chances. Yet the time came when they could not. Where the massed attackers threatened, Trojans trundled a mass of stone and heaved it down to fell men in a swathe and smash their armored shell. Now Rutulians no longer cared to fight blind under shields but strove to clear the wall with archery. Mezentius in his quarter of the field, a sight to quail at, shook his Etruscan pine, his firebrand, and lobbed in smoking darts. Mesippus, Neptune's child, tamer of horses, breached a wall and called for scaling ladders. Calliope, I pray, and muses all, inspire me as I sing the bloody work, the deaths dealt out by Turnus on that day, and tell what men each fighter sent to Orcus, help me to spread the massive page of war. There was one tower of commanding height and served by catwalks, in a strategic place. Italian troops with might and main struggled to conquer this or bring it down with every trick of siege. And for their part the Trojans held it with a hail of stones and shafts they shot through loopholes. Turnus now became the first with his thrown torch to lodge a fire in the tower's side. Blazing up there with wind, it caught the planks and clung around the portals it consumed. The garrison, in panic at this horror, having no exit, herded to that side still free of deadly fire, but the tower under the sudden shift of weight went down, all heaven thundering with its crash. Men dropped half-dead with all that mass of ruin to earth, impaled on their own weapons, or run through by cruel splinters. Lycus and Helena barely escaped, the only ones, the young Helena, whom a slave, Lysimnia, had borne in secret to Meonia's king and sent to Troy, although forbidden arms, with naked sword and shield blank, bare of deeds. Now as he saw himself amid a thousand troops of Turnus, ranks of Latins waiting here and others there, as a wild beast pinned by a band of hunters in a ring will rage against their spears and hurl himself upon sure death, with one leap on the spear points, in the same way the young man facing death rushed at the enemy, and where he saw the spears were thickest, there he aimed his charge. But Lycus, being far quicker on his feet, made for and gained the wall amid the enemy, amid their missiles, trying to reach the top and outstretched hands of friends. But on his heels ran Turnus with his spear, and won the race, taunting him, Did you hope to get away, you madman, from our hands? And taking hold of the man hanging there he tore him down with a big chunk of wall, as when the bird who bears Jove's bolt takes wing, lugging a hare or snowy swan aloft in crooked talons, or when Mars wolf steals from the fold a lamb whose mother, bleeding, seeks it. Everywhere the shouting rose as Rutulians fought onward, filling the moat with piled up earth, while some tossed high upon the rooftops burning brands. Casting a stone, a piece of mountain crag, Ilioneus brought down Lucetius as he approached a gate carrying fire. Liger killed Amathion, and a Silas killed Coroneus, a javelin man won over a bowman's deafness from a distance. Kynaeus brought Ortigius down, and Kynaeus, even as he triumphed, fell to Turnus. Turnus then killed Ides and Clonius, Dioxippus and Promulus, then Sagoras and Ida's high on the battlement. But Capus killed Privernus. First, Themilla's point had grazed him so that he lost his head and threw his shield down, bringing his hand up to the wound, therefore the winging arrow sank in his left side and, deeply embedded, broke the inner vents of breath with a mortal wound. In great style fitted out, the son of Arson stood in his cloak with figured needlework all vivid Spanish blue, a brilliant sight. Brought up in Mars would by Samethus stream and where Pelicus altar stands, enriched by offerings, appeasable and mild, the young man had been sent to war by Arsons. 
Mazentius dropped his spears, then made a sling go whipping round his head three times as he put stress upon it, and he split the adversary's temples with a molten leaden slug, knocking him down as play on a bank of sand. At this point, it is said, Ascanius first aimed a shaft in war. In days before he had been used to scare wild game in flight. Now with one shot he brought a strong man down, New Manus, Remulus by added name, who late had married Turnus' younger sister. Now this captain strode ahead and shouted boasts that had or had not dignity, inflated as he was by his new status. He swashbuckled and cried, What, not ashamed to be besieged again, pinned by a rampart, walling yourselves away from death. You Phrygians twice conquered. Look, see those who claim our wives, prizes of war. What god, what madness brought you to Italy? Here are no Atridae, here is no artful talker like Ulysses. Tough pioneers are stock. Our newborn sons we take to the river first to harden them in wilderness waves, ice cold. Our boys are keen at hunting, and they wear the forests out, their pastimes are horse taming and archery. Hard labor, too, and a life of poverty our young men are inured too, they can crumble earth with hoes or shake walled towns in war. Our life is worn away with iron. A spear reversed will go to knocks. And slow old age enfeebles no man's bravery or vigor. No, we press down helms on our white hair, and all our days delight in bringing home fresh plunder, and in good freebooter fare. You people dress in yellow and glowing red, you live for sloth, and you go in for dancing, sleeves to your tunics, ribbons to your caps. Phrygian women, in truth, not Phrygian men. Climb Mount Dindima where the double pipes make song for the effete, where the small drums and the Idaean mother's bare and boxwood flute are always wheedling you. Leave war to fighting men, give up the sword. As he broadcast these insults and hard words, Ascanius could not abide the man. He turned and set a shaft on his bowstring, taut horse gut, and he drew his arms apart, then stood to make petition to high Jove, almighty Jupiter, only give consent to this attempt, this venture. I shall bring thy temple gifts in my own hands each year and place a snowy bullock at thy altar, gold leaf on his brow, grown up to hold his head high as his mother's, then to charge with lowered horns and paw the sand with hooves. This prayer the father heard. From a clear sky he thundered on the left, just as the bow sang out, freighted with doom. The springing shaft under high tension made a fearful whistle flying to pass clean through the head of Remulus, cleaving both temples with its shank of steel. Go on, please, mock our courage with windy talk. Twice conquered Phrygians return this answer to the Rutulians. Only this Ascanius called out. The Trojans cheered, echoing him in joy, lifting up their hearts. At that moment in the quarter of high air Apollo with flowing hair, from a throne of cloud, looked down upon Ausonian troops in town. He spoke to the victor, Iulus, blessed be your newfound manhood, child. By striving so men reach the stars, dear son of gods and sire of gods to come. All fated wars will quiet down, and justly, in the end under descendants of Asericus, for Troy no longer bounds you. As he spoke he put himself in motion out of heaven, parting the smoothly blowing winds to make his way down to Ascanius. And then he changed into an ancient man, beauties, the armor-bearer of Anchises and faithful doorkeeper in the old days, now an aid given Ascanius by his father. Apollo walked like beauties to the life, he had his voice, his coloring, his white hair, his grimly clinking arms. And now he said to Iulus in his ardor, let it suffice that Numenus met death by your good shot without retaliation, son of Aeneas. This feat of arms, your first, mighty Apollo grants you, and he feels no jealousy for the weapon matched with his. Only refrain from other acts of war, but even as he thus broke into words, midway in speech, Apollo quitted mortal vision, fading fast into thin air and distance. Durdan captains glimpsed the god and the god's bow and heard his quiver clanging as he went away. Therefore despite his eagerness for battle they kept Ascanius from it, by command and will of Phoebus, while they all, themselves, pushed forward once again to join the fight and put themselves in danger. Battle cries ran tower to tower along the entire wall as men bent springing bows, or twisted thongs on javelins to whip them out. The ground was littered with flung missiles. Shields and helms rang out as they were hit, and the fierce fight mounted as when a storm out of the west, when the young goats, the rainy stars, arise, lashes the earth, or as when clouds descend in thick hail on the deep, and Jupiter goes rough with south wind, making the downpour veer, and bursts the cloudy arches of the sky. Two brothers, sons of Alconor of Ida, Pandarus, and Bishes, whom I era, nymph of the woods, in Jove's wood, reared to manhood, tall as their native pines and hills, relying on their arms alone, unbarred and opened the gate their captain had assigned them, daring the enemy to come in. The two then took their stand inside, to right and left, before the gate towers. They were mailed in steel, 
their heads adorned with high and windy crests, as hard by rivers, on the banks of Po or near the lovely Adige, twin oaks go soaring high in air and lift their heads into the sky with foliage uncut and nod their utmost tops. The Rutulians now stormed the entrance when they saw it clear, and in a moment Kurtzens and Aquiculus, a handsome soldier, and foolhardy Tamaris, Heman as well, a son of the god Mars, with all their men were turned and put to flight or else lay down their lives at the very gate. Then anger grew in fighting hearts. The Trojans shoulder to shoulder closed in on that place for combat hand to hand, and dared to sortie. Elsewhere, as he raged and scattered foes, the commander, Turnus, heard from a messenger that, blooded with fresh kills, his adversaries were offering combat at an open gate. He dropped his action, in a towering rage, to rush the entry and the insolent brothers. First to be brought down by his javelin cast, the first to sortie, was Antiphides, bastard of tall Sarpedon by a Theban. Winging through the soft air the Italian cornell shaft sank in, deep in the chest, stuck there, and the black wound's open chasm yielded a foaming wave of blood, the steel grew warm in the transfixed lung. Then with his blade he brought down Meropes and Aramas and then Aphidness, finally Bishes, the fiery-eyed, all energy of heart, not with a javelin, for he would not give his life up to a javelin, no, a pike, a great beam given a spin, with a rushing noise that struck with impetus like a thunderbolt. His shield's two bull's hides were not proof against it, nor was his coat of trusty mail with lapping scales of gold. Giant-like he reeled and fell, earth groaned, and his great shield came thundering down. Just as at Bai, on the Euboean shore, a rocky pier, first built of massive blocks, goes over as men upended in the sea, creating surface havoc with its plunge to rest deep on the seafloor, as the water seethes around it and the black sands rise, and at the crashing sound that high-peaked isle, Prochita, shakes, and so does Ischia, Typhaeus flint bed, fixed by Jove's command. On this the god of warfare, Mars, instilled new heart and vigor in the Latin troops, goading them on, and sent among the Trojans rout and black dread. The attackers flowed from every quarter, now their chance had come, and he, the god of battle, swept their souls. Pandarus, seeing his brother in the dust, seeing where fortune lay, how the tide turned, pushed to shut the gate with his broad shoulders, turning it with a great heave on its hinge. He left outside a number of his own in desperate combat, but took others in as they turned back, pell-mell. Demented man, not to have seen the Rutulian prince burst in among them, close packed there. By his free act he shut the prince inside the town, a tiger mingling with cowed cattle. Turnus' eyes shone out with new light, as a deadly clang came from his armor. On his helmet crest the plume shook, red as blood, and from his shield he flashed out rays like lightning. Taken aback, Aeneas' soldiers knew that hated face and that gigantic figure. Pandarus flared up, hot with rage for his dead brother, calling, here is no bridegroom's royal house from Amata, no Andean inner court to comfort Turnus with his native walls. Your enemy's fortress camp is what you see, and not the faintest chance of getting away. But smiling calmly at him Turnus answered, step forward if you have the heart for it. Come within range. You will be telling Priam Achilles has been found again, and here. That was all. And the other man let fly his knotty spear shaft, bearing bark untrimmed, with his whole strength. But only the blowing air incurred its flight, for Juno warded off impact and wound. It stuck fast in the gate. Not from this blade, the stroke of my sword arm, will you escape. The man responsible for wound and weapon is no bungler. Turnus spoke and rose to full height, sword in air, then cleft the man's brow square between the temples cutting his head in two, a dreadful gash between the cheeks all beardless. Earth resounded quivering at the great shock of his weight as he went tumbling down in all his armor, drenched with blood and brains, in equal halves his head hung this and that way from his shoulders. Trojans, aghast, turned round in a stampede, and if the thought had come to the champion to break the gate bars, to admit his friends, that would have been the last day of the war, the last for Trojans. But high rage and mindless lust for slaughter drove the passionate man against his enemies. He caught Phalaris first, and Gygus, slashing from behind their leg tendons, then he took their spears to throw at the backs of men in flight, and Juno gave him heart and force. Next he dispatched Elise to join the rest, and Phagaeus, his shield run through, and men still on the walls, unwary there and urging on the fight, Alcandrus, Helius, Neumann, Pritinus. As Linsus came against him, shouting out to his companions, Turnus on the rampart whirled from the right a great sword stroke and struck him one blow, as he closed, taking off his head, which dropped still helmeted at a distance. Next he killed Amicus, nemesis of game, unmatched at poisoning lance and arrow points, and Clytius, a son of Aeolus, and Cretheus, familiar of the muses, ever in love with gittern harp and song and tuning notes on strings, forever chanting warhorses and wars and feats of arms. The Teucrian commanders, 
at long last, hearing of carnage wrought among their people, came on the scene, Mnistheus and grim Serestus, finding their troops distraught, the enemy at large inside. And Mnistheus shouted at them, Where do you think you'll run, then, after this? What walls, what fortress have you in reserve? Is a single man, hemmed in by your own ramparts on all sides, countrymen, going to cause a massacre like this throughout the town and not be stopped? Will he dispatch so many of our best men to Orcus? You poltroons, have you no shame, no pity for your own unhappy country, for the gods of old, for great Aeneas? Burning at these words, they stiffened and stood fast in close array. Now Turnus gradually edged away from combat, moving toward the riverside, where the stream closed the camp. Fiercer at this, the Trojans with a battle cry began to advance against him, massing ranks, as when a crowd with deadly lances at the ready corners a savage lion, in his fear still dangerous and glaring balefully, he backs away, as neither wrath nor courage allow him to turn tail, yet he's unable, yearn though he may, to charge the men and weapons. Likewise of two minds, Turnus kept stepping backward in no haste, seething with rage, and even twice he turned to charge his foes, put them to flight twice, broken, along the walls. But then the entire garrison on the run formed up in a solid mass, and Juno dared not give him power to match theirs. Jupiter sent out of heaven Iris, born on air, to tell his sister his unkind decree should Turnus not depart the Trojan ramparts. Therefore neither his shield nor his sword arm availed the man to hold out in the end, stormed it by missiles from all sides, his helm rang out around his head with constant blows, the bronze dented by stones, the horsehair crest knocked off, and neither could his shield boss take that battering. Now with redoubled force the Trojans cast their spears, Mnistheus himself, a lightning spearman, cast. Down Turnus' body streaming sweat made rivers black as pitch, he could not get his breath, his gasping shook his arms and shoulders, wearied out. At last, head first in all his armor, down he plunged into the river in one leap. Old Tiber welcomed the diver in his yellow depth, buoyed him up to the surface in mild water with carnage washed away, and floated him exultant to his fellow soldier's hands. Book 10. The Death of Princes. The Olympian Hall of Jove admitted mourning, and there the father of gods and king of men convoked a council, in that starry court from which he viewed the bright lands far below, the Dardan fortress camp, the Latin races. When all the gods had taken seats together in the great court, with gates to east and west, he said to them, Lords of the open sky, why this reversion to old thoughts and aims and bitter strife again? I had forbidden Italy to engage in war with Trojans. Under that ban, what does this conflict mean? What fear made those on this side and on that resort to arms, incite to arms? The time for war will come, you need not press for it, that day when through the Alps laid open wide the savagery of Carthage blights the towns and towers of Rome. Then men may strive and hate, then havoc one another. Now refrain. Be pleased to endorse the league I have decreed. Jupiter's words were few. Not so the words of golden Venus in reply, O Father, eternal Lord of men and their affairs, what other power may one call on now? Don't you see how Rutulians gloat, how Turnus rides in his car among them, all puffed up with his good luck in war? Closed walls no longer shield the Trojans, no, inside the gates they must do battle on their very ramparts, and moats run high with blood. All unaware, Aeneas is far away. Now will you never let that siege be raised? Once more an enemy looms at the walls of budding Troy, once more a host of soldiers. And once more the son of Tydeus, this time from Aetolian Arpi, rises against the Trojans. Yes, I think my wounds are yet in store for me, and I, your child, but keep the mortal spearmen waiting. If without your consent, your heavenly will, the Trojans cross to Italy, then let them pay for their sins, afford them no relief, but if they had those many oracles, heavens and the underworlds, behind them, why can the first who comes ignore your will and form new destinies? Must I recall the burning ships on Eric's shore, the king of tempests, and the gales unleashed out of Aeolia, or Iris born from cloudland? Even the powers of hell are stirred by Juno now, that third part of the world remained untried, Alecto has been ushered suddenly into the upper world and goes in frenzy through Italian towns. No thought of empire moves me now, one only hoped for that while fortune held. Let those you favor conquer. If there is no place on earth your pitiless consort will allow the Trojans, then by the smoking rubble of fallen Troy I beg you, father, let me send Ascanius unharmed out of the war, let him live on, my grandson. Granted Aeneas may be tossed on strange waters again and lay his course where fortune shows the way. But let my strength only protect this child and save him now from deadly combat. Amethyst is mine, and Paphos height, Cathera and Adalia. There let him put his arms away and spend his life ingloriously. Ordain that Carthage crush beneath her sway Osonia's power, no hindrance there to the city-states of Tyre. 
what use then to escape the plague of war, to take flight through the midst of Argive fires, to taste all bitter perils of the sea and the vast earth, looking for Latium, for Pergama reborn? And would it not have served them better to have made a home upon the ashes of their land, the soil where Troy once was? Just give them Xanthus back in Simois, I beg, let the poor Trojans live through Ilium's hard hours again. Then queenly Juno, stung to fury, said, Why force me to break silence, long and deep, and put abroad in words my hidden pain? Of men and gods, did any drive Aeneas to choose war, to march as an enemy against the Latin king? He sailed for Italy under the fate's direction. Let it be so, and spurred on by the mad fits of Cassandra. Did he leave camp, trust life to the wild winds, under my influence? Or give a boy authority in war, command of ramparts? Or trouble Etruscan loyalty, or the lives of peaceful folk? What god, what cruelty of mine impelled him to this harm? Where, now, is Juno to be found in this, or Iris down from the clouds? Intolerable that Italians ring your budding Troy with flames, that Turnus sets foot on the soil of his fatherland, whose grandfather was Polumnus and whose mother divine Vanilia. What, then, of the torch the Trojans carry smoking against Latins, what of their subjugating others' fields and driving off their herds? What shall we say of how they take their pick of fathers-in-law and drag the betrothed girl from her lover's arms? How with their hands outstretched they pray for peace and armor their beak ships? Oh, you, of course, can steal Aeneas from the hands of Greeks and spread in the man's place ground mist and air, and change a fleet into so many nymphs, that I, for my part, help the Rutulians somewhat, is this abominable? All unaware, Aeneas is far away all unaware and far away let him remain. Your homes are Paphos, Idolium, and Cathira's height, why go afield to a walled town rife with war and rugged fighting hearts? Am I the one who has attempted to bring Phrygia's frail kingdom down? Am I? Or is it not the man who pitted the poor Trojans once against Achaeans? What is the cause that made them, Europe and Asia, break the peace and rise in arms, through treachery? Guided by me did the adulterous Dardan make his conquest over Sparta, or did I supply the weapons, or foment the war with lust? You should have feared then for your people. Now late in the day you rise to make your moan, unfounded too, and bait me pointlessly. So ran the plea of Juno, and the lords of sky, each to his mind, murmured assent, as when the early gusts caught in a forest murmur, and the rustling unseen wind rolls on, the harbinger of gales to come for men at sea. The Almighty Father then, chief power of the world, began to speak, and as he spoke the great hall of the gods fell silent, and earth quaked, and silence reigned in highest air, the west winds went to rest, the deep sea stilled his waters into calm. Take heed then, and keep fast in memory these words of mine. Whereas Ausonians are not allowed to league themselves with Trojans, and it is not acceptable to you to end your discord, therefore I shall hold without distinction Rutulians and Trojans, whatever fortune each may have today, whatever hope may guide him. Whether the camp lies under siege as fated for Italians or through Troy's blunder, and through prophecies malign and dark. Neither do I exempt the Rutulians. The effort each man makes will bring him luck or trouble. To them all King Jupiter is the same king. And the fates will find their way. Then by his Stygian brother's rivers, boiling banks, and black whirlpool he took oath nodding, making all Olympus tremble at his nod. There was an end of speaking. Jupiter from his golden throne arose, and lords of heaven on either hand escorted him to the threshold of his hall. That day the Rutulians beset all gates, fighting to kill, to ring the walls with flame. The Aenean legion could but bear the siege, immured within, and had no hope of flight. Poor soldiers, helpless to break out, they stood on towers aloft and thinly manned the ramparts. There were Aesius, Imbrus's son, Thymetes, Hisitaean's son, and both Aserasi, with Castor and old Thymbri in the front line, Sarpetan's brothers, then, Clarus and Timon from high land of Lycia. Their Achman of Lyrnesus, great in bulk as Clytius, his father, or his brother, Menesthus, with all his might lifted a stone so huge it seemed the fragment of a mountain. Some with javelins fought the besiegers off, some with stones, or throwing firebrands and fitting arrows to the bowstring. See, enclosed by them, the Dardan prince himself, most fitting ward of Venus, his fair head uncovered, as a jewel shines out, inset in yellow gold, a jewel for throat or brow, or as pale ivory glows, inlaid by craft in boxwood or orishan terebinth, upon his milky nape the flowing hair, caught in a pliant golden band, came down. And, Ismarus, you too were seen by young high-hearted kinsmen as you aimed your shots and armed your shafts with poison, well-born son of a Meonian house, where plowmen turn rich earth, pactolous waters with its gold. And Mnistheus, too, was there, exalted still by yesterday's great feat, when he fought Turnus down from the rampart, Capus, too, 
whose name descends to us in the Campanian city. That day all these fought on in bitter war. But in the middle of that night Aeneas ploughed the coastal sea. When he had left Evander and reached the camp of the Etruscans, he sought the king, told him his name and race, what help he looked for and what help he brought, informed him of the levies that Mezentius won over, and the violent heart of Turnus, reminded him of how unsure the plans of men are and, so reasoning, made his plea. No time was lost, Tarkin joined forces with him, sealed a pact, and, freed from fate's delay, the Lydian host, pledged to a foreign captain, at the command of heaven, went to sea. Aeneas' ship sailed first in line, her beak showed Phrygian lions below a figurehead of Ida, welcome sight to exiled Trojans. Their great Aeneas sat and inwardly reflected on the fortunes of the war. And Pallas, at his left hand, questioned him, now of the stars, the course laid through the night, now of adventures met by land and sea. Muses, throw wide the gates of Helicon and lift your song of all that host that sailed beneath Aeneas' flag from Tuscan shores and man the ships and rode the sea. Massacus first, in the bronze-beaked tiger, cleft the waves, commander of a thousand men who left the walls of Clusium and Cosa City, arrows their weapons, quivers lightly slung and deadly bows. Along with him sailed Abbas, grizzled and grim, his whole ship's company in richest armor, and his ship agleam with gilt Apollo for a figurehead. His Populonian motherland had sent six hundred practiced fighters, and three hundred came from the Isle of Elba, rich in ore, in inexhaustible mines of the Chalybes. Third came the interpreter of gods to men, a Silas, who commanded all presage of entrails at the altar, stars in heaven, flight of birds, prophetic lightning fires. He hurried aboard ship a thousand men in close formation, rugged ranks of spears, placed under him by the Tuscan town of Pisa, settled from Greece, from Alpheus Riverside. Esther came next, the handsomest of captains, confident horsemen, bearing motley arms. Three hundred soldiers more had been dispatched, like-minded in their zeal, by those at home in Car and the plains of Minio, in ancient Pyrgi, fever-prone Gravisque. Cunerus, never could I pass you by, bravest in war of the Ligurian captains, nor you with your scant following, Cupavo, plumage of swan upon your crest, a sign reproaching Amor and his goddess mother with your own father's change of form. Sickness, they say, when morning Phaethon and Phaethon's young sister's poplar shade among the new leaves, quieting with song his woe for love lost, dressed himself in softest plumage as in snowy age and left the earth and chanting sought the stars. With crewmen young as he, the sun, Cupavo, drove ahead with oars the giant centaur, figurehead that towered, threatening the waves with a great boulder, the tall ship, with long keel driven, furrowed the open sea. Then Ochnus came, who roused his company from the paternal waterways, a son of Sibylline Monto and the Tuscan River. Mantua, it was he who gave you walls and named you for his mother, Mantua, rich in forebears, not of a single stock, but three distinct tribes, each with four communes, the chief one Mantua, whose vigor came from Tuscan blood. Mezentius' cruelty had there aroused five hundred sturdy men to take up arms against him. These were led by a pine-timbered fighting ship whose prow showed Mincius River flowing out of Garda, Father Garda, in grey veil of sedge. Then heavy in the waves Alestes came surging ahead, as a hundred tree-trunk oars lashed at the sea and turned it up in foam. Huge Triton bore him, and the blue sea quailed before the figure's conch, the dipping torso down to the flanks a shaggy man, his belly merging with a monster of the sea. Beneath the semi-human breast the foaming groundswell murmured. All these many captains in thirty ships had sailed for Troy's relief and sheared the expanse of brine with brazen prows. Now daylight left the sky, and the mild moon, in mid-heaven, rode her night-wandering car, but duty would not give Aeneas rest, he held the tiller still, still shifted sail. Then look, halfway upon his course, a band of old companions hove in sight, the nymphs whom kind Sibel had, by her command, transformed from ships to nymphs and given power over the sea. Swimming abreast they came, parting the waves, as many as one time had prows of bronze and moored ashore. Far off they knew their king, and, like a dancing chorus, veered around his ship. One most adept at speaking, Simodosia, in his wake took hold of the ship aft with her right hand and pulled herself up, as her left hand kept her stroke in quiet water. Then she spoke to the still unwitting captain, still awake, Aeneas, kin to gods? Be wakeful, then, and slacken off your sheet. We are those pines from Ida's holy crest, and once your fleet, now become sea nymphs. When the base Rutulian bore down on us with sword and fire, headlong we broke our cables, though against our will. All through the sea we looked for you. This form the mother of gods in pity fashioned for us, allowing us as goddesses to spend our lives under the waves. Now learn from us, the boy, Ascanius, is pinned down behind his wall and moat, amid attacking spears of Latins, rough in onslaught. Even now Arcadian horse, 
mingled with brave Etruscans, hold their appointed place, but Turnus plans to throw his squadrons in between, to keep the Arcadians from your camp. Now up with you, as dawn comes order a call to arms for all your troops, and take the shield the Lord of Fire himself supplied you, made unconquerable, and rimmed with gold. If you'll trust what I say, the new day sees heaps of Rutulian slain. When she had said this, as she slipped away with her right hand she sped the tall ship onward, having the skill of it, the ship more swift than javelin or arrow down the wind took flight over the waves. The ships behind lifted the pace. Anchises' Trojan son, amazed and baffled, even so took heart and comfort from the omen. Raising his eyes to heaven's vault, briefly he prayed, Benignant Lady of Ida, Mother of Gods, to whom Mount Dindymus is dear, and towered cities, and lions yoked in tandem under harness, be my first patroness in combat, bring fulfillment of the augury, come near thy Phrygian soldiers, goddess, and advance with friendly stride. He prayed thus, as the day came swiftly round again with ripened light and routed darkness. First he gave his people orders to act on signals, to devote their minds to war and fit themselves for action. By now, as he stood high upon the stern, he had the Trojans and the camp in view. On his left arm holding the shield ablaze, he raised it up now. From the walls the Trojans shouted to heaven. Hope reawakened wrath, and they hurled missiles, clamoring as when the cranes that home on Strymon through the clouds call back and forth as they traverse the heavens, leaving the south behind with cheerful cries. Rutulian prince and captains of Osonia marveled first at all this, till they turned and saw the sterns already nearing shore, the whole sea moving landward with the ships. Aeneas' helmet blazed, flames from the crest gushed upward, the gold boss of his great shield shot out vast firelight, even as when blood-red, ill-omened, through transparent night a comet glows, or Sirius comes up, that burning star that brings drought and disease to ill mankind, and makes all heaven drear with baleful shining. Not for that did Turnus fail in audacity, in his confident hope to occupy the shore first and drive back the invaders from the beach. Here is the chance you've prayed for, now to hack them up with swords. The battle is in your hands, men. Let each soldier think of his wife, his home, let each recall heroic actions, great feats of our fathers. Down to the surf we go, while they're in trouble, disembarking, losing their footing. Fortune favors men who dare. Now he took thought for what troops he should lead in the assault, and those to leave, pressing the siege. Meanwhile Aeneas put men off on landing ramps from the high sterns. They waited, many of them, for the slack water in a breaker's ebb and leapt into the shallows. Some held on to oars for steadiness. Now Tarkin sighted shoreline without a sandbar or long breakers, only the sea swell mounting, going in unhindered to a line of surf and smother. He swung his prows at once and begged his men, picked oarsmen, now give way with your good oars, and lift the bow with every stroke, then split this enemy land wide open with your beaks. Let each keel plough the shingle. It's all one with me if we break up, beaching her here, once the dry land is under us. At this, the crew surged at the oars and drove the ships in spume against the mainland, till the prows crunched in, and keels in safety came to rest. But not yours, Tarkin. Grounded in shoal water, she hung tipped over on a sloping reef, a long time, balancing, tiring the swell, until she came apart and spilled her crew into the waves. Or halfs and floating thwarts impeded seamen, undertow pulled back their feet from under them. At the same time no sluggishness held Turnus. On the double he brought his line of battle down upon the Trojans and disposed it on the shore. Now trumpets gave their signal. In the lead Aeneas broke through troops from the countryside, a first good omen for the fight to come, and mowed the Latins down. He killed the giant Theron, who left ranks to encounter him, bent on meeting the enemy champion. A sword blade driven through his bronze chainmail and tunic stiff with gold drank from his side slashed open. Next Aeneas struck Lycus down, a man excised from his dead mother's womb and held then consecrate to thee, Apollo, as one who had been granted immunity in infancy from the perilous knife. Nearby, Aeneas hurled to death tough Sisius and gives the gigantic, these with clubs had bludgeoned ranks of men. But Hercules' old weapon in their powerful hands could not help them win through, nor could their sire, Melampus, comrade of Hercules in those days when earth afforded him hard labors. Then, as Ferris babbled oaths, Aeneas sent his javelin spinning, look, into his yelling mouth. You, too, unlucky Sidon, at the side of Clytius, your latest joy, whose cheeks were goldening with down might have succumbed to the Dardan's blow and lane, pitiful sight, free of the loves you ever bore young men, had not your band of brothers in a mass come forward, Forcus sons, all seven of them, hurling seven javelins. A number glanced ineffectual from helm and shield, and others kindly Venus turned aside so they should only graze him. Aeneas spoke to loyal Achates, hand me still more spears. 
of those lodged in the Greeks at Ilium my throwing arm will not send one astray. He took a heavy spear and cast it hard, winged in the air, so that it crashed clean through the brazen shield of Mian, then stove in his breastplate and his breast. Alconer, who had run to help, held up his falling brother, but passing onward on its bloody way the spear went through his arm, and the arm hung lifeless on its tendons from his shoulder. Numitor, then, pulling the spear away out of his brother Mian's body, threw it back at Aeneas, but had not the luck to hit him, only grazed Achates' thigh. Now up came one from Cures, Clausus, bold in the first flush of youth, putting his back into a long shot with his rigid spear he hit Dryops just under the chin, the point passed through his throat and took his life and voice upon the instant as he gave a cry. His forehead smote the ground and he spewed gore. By various strokes Clausus brought down as well three Thracians, men of Boreas' high house, and three whom father Idas and their country, Ismarus, had sent. Then came Halesus, then the Oruncan troops, Mesippus then, the cavalry leader, Neptune's son. First these then those fought hard to push the landing parties back, and on Ausonia's very threshold the pitched battle raged. As in wide heaven contrary winds do battle, matched in force and impetus, and neither will give way to the other, nor will clouds nor sea give way, the fight hangs in the balance, power to power locked in stalemate, even so the ranks of Troy with ranks of Latins met in combat, foot to foot, unbudging, man to man. At another point a stream in flood had rolled a scattering of stones and trees uprooted. Here where the rough watercourse had made them leave their mounts and fight on foot against their custom, Pallas saw Arcadians turn their backs on Latins in pursuit. In that crisis he had but one recourse, to sting them by appeals and bitter chiding, Friends, where are you bound? I beg you now by all the brave things you have done, the wars fought through, your leader, great Evander, with my own hopes of emulating him, put no faith in retreat. The way ahead has to be cleared by cold steel through the enemy. There where the mass of them is heaviest your proud land calls you forward and calls me, Pallas, your captain. No unearthly powers stand in our way, we are hemmed in by soldiers mortal as we are mortal. Just as many lives, as many hands, belong to us. Look, how the deep sea's barrier behind us cuts us off, no land there for retreat. Is it the camp we head for, or the water? With this he charged the clump of enemy center. First to meet him, led by cruel fate, was Logus, as this man tore from the ground a heavy boulder. Pallas put a javelin through him where the spine divides the ribs, then pulled it from the cage of bone it clung to. There, as he bent over, his bow failed to hit him, though he hoped to, running up in reckless rage at a comrade's cruel death, Pallas received him with a sword thrust, deep in his expanded lung. Next he went after Sthenius and the scion of Rhodus' line, Ancamelus, who dared his stepmother's incestuous bed. And you twin brothers, two, Larides, Thymber, fell on the Rotulian field, identical sons of Daucus, so alike their parents, happily bemused, could never tell the two apart. Now Pallas made a grim distinction, now Evander's blade cut Thymber's head off, while for you, Larides, dying fingers of your right hand, severed, fluttered as they groped for the sword hilt. Made hot by his reproach, and seeing him fight with such distinction, the Arcadians were armed by rage and shame against the foe. Then Pallas put a spear through Redius as he sped past him in his car, escaping you, noble Teuthras, and your brother, Tyres. That gave a breathing space to Illus, target of Pallas' spear, which Redius intercepted. Down from his car he rolled and kicked the earth of Italy as he died. When the winds rise, long for in summer, a shepherd kindles fires in woods at scattered points, then in a rush the spaces in between blaze up, and Vulcan's line of battle spreads without a break in ragged flame across the countryside, and seeing he has brought it off, the man looks down on the triumphant fires, just so brave acts of comrades came together, Pallas, in one tableau of bravery for your sake. But now against them came Halesus, keen in warfare, braced in armor. First he killed Laden, then Ferris, then Demodocus. With a sword flash he lopped off the right hand Strimonius had raised, aimed at his throat. Then with a stone he smashed the face of Toas, shattering the skull bones, mixed with brains and blood. His father had foretold Halesus' fate and hidden him in woodland, but the day the old man closed his glazing eyes in death the Parsi took the son in hand, to be cut down, blood sacrifice, by Evander's spear. Thus it was that Pallas prayed before he threw against him, Grant, O Father Tiber, luck to the steel of this shaft I let fly, a passage through the hard chest of Halesus. Then these arms that I shall strip from him shall be your oaks to hold. This the god heard, for while Halesus held his shield for a maon, he left his chest bare to the Arcadian spear. Now Lossus, a great figure in the battle, would let no troops of his be terrified by all the carnage heroic Pallas wrought. His first exploit was bringing Abbas down, Abbas who faced him, naughty bastion of Trojans in the fight. 
Arcadians fell, Etruscans fell, and you, too, Trojan soldiers, bodies the Greeks had left unscathed. The lines of troops met, matched in strength and officers, crowded by rear ranks till the congested front allowed no elbow room for weaponry. Here Pallas strove and pressed, against him, Lossus, not much disparate in age, and both splendid in height and build, but fortune gave neither a homecoming to his native land. Now, though, the mighty ruler of Olympus would not let them encounter one another. Their fates awaited them, each at the hands of a still greater foe. The nymph Juturna, Turnus loving and immortal sister, counseled him to go to Lossus aid. From his command post to the battle's heart in a flying chariot he cut his way and seeing his own men cried, the time has come to interrupt this battle. I take Pallas, Pallas falls to me. I wish his father stood here to watch. At his command the troops drew off, clearing the ground. As they gave way, the Arcadian, struck by the arrogant command, stood amazed at Turnus. Casting his eyes upon the giant form he took his measure, all at a distance still, with a grim stare, then countered thus the tyrant's brutal words, either I win the honour of taking spoils from the enemy commander, or I die a noble death. My father will bear alike one destiny or the other. No more threats. He strode into the open, and the blood turned cold in hearts of the Arcadians. Down from his chariot Turnus leapt and lunged on foot to closer quarters, as a lion after he sights from some high place a bull far off, spoiling for combat on the plain, goes bounding forward, such was the look of Turnus as he came on. When he seemed near enough for a spear cast, Pallas opened the engagement, hoping his daring would bring luck to him, outmatched in power as he was. He cried to the open air above him, By my father's welcome and the feast to which you came a stranger, Hercules, now lend your help to my great effort here, I pray. Let Turnus, dying, see me take his blood-stained arms, and bear the sight of me, his conqueror. Hercules heard him. Deep in his heart he quelled a mighty groan, and let the vain tears flow. At this the Olympian father addressed his son in kindness, every man's last day is fixed. Lifetimes are brief, and not to be regained, for all mankind. But by their deeds to make their fame last, that is labor for the brave. Below the walls of Troy so many sons of gods went down, among them, yes, my child, Sarpedon. Turnus, too, is called by fate. He stands at the given limit of his years. So saying, Jupiter turned his eyes away from the land of the Rutulians. On the field with all his might, Pallas let fly his spear, then drew his flashing blade out of the sheath. Onward the shaft flew till it punched its way through layers of the shield rim, then struck home there where the cuirass lapped the ridge of shoulder, grazing Turnus' great torso in the end. But after balancing for a long time his oaken shaft with wetted head of steel, pointed at Pallas, Turnus hurled it, saying, Watch this, and see if my spearhead has not more penetrating power. With quivering shock his point ripped through the center of the shield, through all the skins of steel and bronze and bull's hide outer integuments, and then punched through the cuirass armor and the stalwart chest. Pallas pulled from the wound the warm spearhead in vain, for blood and life came out as well by the same passage. Forward on his torn breast he plunged, his armor clanging over him, and bit the hostile earth with bloody mouth as he gave up his life. Looming above him, Turnus called, Arcadians, note well and take back to Evander what I say, in that state which his father merited I send back Pallas. And I grant in full what honor tombs confer, what consolation comes a burial. No small price he'll pay for welcoming Aeneas. As he spoke he pressed with his left foot upon the dead and pulled away the massive weight of sword belt graven with pictured crime, that company, Egyptus sons, killed by Danius daughters, young men murdered on one wedding night, their nuptial beds bloodstained. Eurydice's son, Clonus, had chased the images in gold. Now Turnus gloried in it, in his winning. The minds of men are ignorant of fate and of their future lot, unskilled to keep due measure when some triumph sets them high. For Turnus there will come a time when he would give the world to see again an untouched palace, and will hate this day, hate that belt taken. Now on the battleground palaces troops in tears with many groans throng to bear off the prince, laid on his shield. O oh grief, O oh glory, destined for your father. This, your first day, gave you to the war and took you from it, even though you leave Windrows of Rutulian dead. No rumor only of this great loss, but a sure messenger ran to Aeneas, telling how his men were now within an ace of being destroyed, how he must lose no time stemming the rout. Near enemies he cut down with his blade, then made a swathe before him in the ranks, driving on Turnus where the man stood, proud of his new kill. Pallas, Evander, all their history rose before Aeneas' eyes, the first feast he had come to as a stranger, the right hands joined in friendship. Now he took four sons of Sulmo, four more Euphans reared, took them alive to offer to the shades in sacrifice, wetting with captive blood the flames of Pallas' pyre. Magus, 
at whom he made a spear cast, cleverly dodged ahead so all a quiver the shaft passed over him. Embracing then the spearman's knees he pled, I pray you by your father's ghost and by your hope of Iulus rising power, preserve a life here, for a father and a son. I have a great house. Hidden deep within are bars of inches silver, weights of gold both finished and unfinished. Victory for Trojans cannot hinge on this one case, this one life cannot weigh so much. Aeneas retorted in this way, those bars of gold and silver that you tell of, spare for your sons. Turnus has already done away with all such war trade, Pallas being lost. My father Anchises' ghost feels as I say, and so does Iulus. And with this he took the man's helm in his left hand, bent the neck backward, still begging, and drove home the sword up to the hilt. Next, not far off, he met him in Ides, a sacred minister of Phoebus and Diana of the Crossroads, wearing the holy headband, all in white and shining priestly robes. Over the field Aeneas drove him till the man went down, then stood, his mighty shadow covering him, and took his life in sacrifice. Serestus bent for his arms and shouldered them to be your trophy, Mars Gratibus, battle king. The Italians rallied, led by Siculus of Vulcan's line, and Umbro from the Marcian mountains, as the Dardan still raged on against them. With his blade he cut away Angzer's left arm with all his round of shield. This man had made some loud threat, thinking words would summon prowess, carried away, perhaps, and sure long years would bring him hoary age. Then to confront Aeneas' fiery course Tarquitus came, elate with flashing arms, a son the nymph Dryope bore to Faunus, god of woodland. Spear drawn back and thrust, Aeneas pinned his big shield to his cuirass, putting him out of action. As Tarquitus vainly pled, and would have pled again, the Trojan struck his head off to the ground, then with his foot made the warm trunk roll over, speaking above him from his pitiless heart, lie there now, fearsome as you are. No gentle mother will ever hide you in the earth or weight your body with a family tomb. Either you stay here for the carrion birds or the sea takes you under, hungry fishes nibble your wounds. Aeneas then ran onward after Antaeus and Lucas, front rank men of Turnus, Numa the brave and tawny cammers, son of great-hearted Vulcans, wealthiest landowner in Ausonia once, who ruled the silent town, Amicli. As men say the Titan Aegean had a hundred arms, a hundred hands, and sent out burning breath from fifty mouths and breasts when he opposed Jove's thunderbolt, clanging his fifty shields and drawing fifty swords, just so Aeneas multiplied savagery over the whole field once his sword point warmed. Now see him rushing Nypheus' four-horse team, their breasts against him, when they catch sight of him with his long strides and murderous moaning, they will round in fear, careering backward, spilling out their driver, whirling the chariot along the shore. At the same time Lucagus and his brother Liger drove their white team into action, Liger at the reins, while grim Lucagus made play with his sword. Far from inclined to await their fiery onset, Aeneas rushed them, looming with his spear aimed. Liger called, this is not Diomedes' team you see and not Achilles' war car, not the field of Phrygia. Here and now on Latin ground you'll have an end of war, an end of life. So in his madness he proclaimed. The Trojan warrior called out nothing in reply but sent his javelin spinning. Hanging on and bending to the stroke, using his blade to go the team, left foot ahead, Lucagus settled himself to fight, just as the spear broke through his gleaming shield's rim at the bottom, penetrating his left groin. Pitched from the car, he rolled out dying on the field. Aeneas, that grave captain, mocked him bitterly, no panic of your team lost you your footing, no mere shadows of enemy ahead made them shy backward. No, you've tumbled out and left them of your own accord. With this, he took hold of the horses' heads. Lucagus' luckless brother slid from the chariot and held his hands out helplessly. He said, I beg you in your own name, in the name of those who gave you life, great as you are, soldier of Troy, let this life be, in mercy hear my prayer. He prayed on, but Aeneas said, your speech was not like this just now. Die and be brotherly, stay with your brother. He slashed open the breast where life is hid. And deaths like these all over the battlefield the Dardan captain brought about, in fury wild as a torrent or a dark tornado. Finally Ascanius and the troops, besieged in vain, broke out and left the camp. At this point Jupiter slyly said to Juno, sister and wife, too, most delightful wife, as you were thinking, not amiss, that thought, it must be Venus who sustains the Trojans, not their good right arms in war, their keen combativeness and fortitude in danger. In low tones Juno answered, Darling husband, why provoke me, heartsick as I am, and fearing as I do your grim decrees? If my love mattered to you as it did and should, you would not, O oh omnipotent, deny me this, the power to spirit turn us out of the battle and to keep him safe for his father, Donus. Well then, let him perish, give Trojans quittance with his gentle blood. And yet he took his name from our own stock, his sire Palumnus, 
four generations gone, and generously has he often heaped your shrine with offerings. The king of high Olympus briefly answered, If a reprieve is asked from imminent death, more time for the young man before he falls, if you so understand me, take Turnus off in flight, rest him away from fate that stands before him. There is room for that much lenience. If some greater favor lies hid in your mind beneath your prayer, if you imagine the whole war affected, changed by this, you cherish a vain hope. Then Juno said in tears, Oh, if at heart you meant to grant what you begrudge in words, and life were still ahead, assured for Turnus. Now heavy dooms ahead for him, the innocent. Else I'm adrift from truth. Oh, let me be deluded, let my fear be baseless, change your purpose for the better, as you can. With this, from heaven straightway she launched herself in a tucked up robe of cloud, driving a storm before her through the air. She made her way to the Ilian lines and the Laurentine camp, then made a bottleless shade of spectral mist in likeness of Aeneas, weird and strange, adorned the image with Dardanian arms and matched the godlike hero's shield and plume, gave unreal words, a voice without a mind, a way of walking, modeled after his. This form was like the ghosts that after death are said to hover and haunt, or shapes of dream deluding sight and touch and sleep. Now, then, before the front line sprang the happy phantom, angering Turnus with a threat of arms and shouted challenges. Turnus attacked, at the extreme range hurling a whizzing spear. The phantom wheeled, turning its back, and ran. At this, thinking in truth his enemy had given ground, Turnus in his confusion drank deep of an empty hope. He called, Where bound, Aeneas? Come, don't leave behind your wedding vows. That earth you sailed to find you'll get from my sword arm. And shouting this he pressed on after, making his drawn sword flash, not seeing that his jubilation now was at the mercy of the wind. One ship, it happened, stood there moored to a high rock ledge, ladders and gangway out, King Osinius had sailed in it from Clusium. The distraught phantom of Aeneas in flight ran here to fling itself aboard and under cover. Hard on its heels, past every obstacle, Turnus bounded over the steep gangway. He had scarce reached the prow when Juno broke the mooring line and wrenched the ship away adrift on the ebb of surf. Ashore, Aeneas called for the absent man to stand and fight, while he sent down to earth many a soldier met on the field. But now the weightest phantom looked for a lair no longer. Soaring up, it mingled with a black cloud, as high wind bore Turnus out to sea. And he gazed back, bewildered at this business, giving no thanks for safety. Then he spread his hands to heaven and cried out, Father Almighty, have you found me so to be deplored, and so chastised? Where am I seaborn? And from where? And why this flight, or what am I, to be so taken? Shall I see my encampment, or Laurentum's walls again? What of that company of men who rode with me, followed my flag? Monstrous that I have left them all to face a death unspeakable. Now must I see them leaderless, and hear the wounded groaning? What shall I do? What chasm on earth is deep enough to hide me? Better, winds be merciful, drive this ship on a rocky coast, a reef, with all my heart I beg you, put her aground in savage sandbanks where no Rutulians or news of my disgrace can come. He prayed, and in his spirit swayed this way and that, whether for madness at so great a shame to fit his breast upon his blade and drive it bloody through his ribs, or else to plunge amid the waves and swim for shore, that curving shore where he could meet again the Teucrians in arms. Three times he moved to try each way, three times Almighty Juno held him back, pitying him in her heart, and curbed the young man's passion. Smoothly onward cutting a wake in the deep sea he sailed, with favoring swell and current, carried home to the ancient city of his father, Donus. Meanwhile, hot-hearted Mezentius joined the fight, being by Jove alerted, and he drove against the cheering Trojans. But the Etruscan lines converged on him with all their hatred, on him alone, on him alone with all their javelins cast in a continual shower. He weathered at the way a rocky headland, jutting into the waste sea, bare to gales, bare to the sea surge, taking all the blows and fury of sky and sea, remains unshaken, buffeting back. So he brought Hebrus down, Dolichaon's son, then Latagus, with Pomus on the run, one smashed in mouth and face by a huge stone, a bit of mountain crag, the other hamstrung, left to his slow writhing, even while Mezentius handed loss a shoulder armor and a plume to wear upon his crest. He killed Evanthes then, the Phrygian, and Mimas, peer and friend of Paris. Theno bore him to Amicus on the same night that Sisius' royal daughter, Hecuba, pregnant with a firebrand, bore Paris. Paris lies in Priam's town. The Italian beach holds Mimas the forgotten. Think of a wild boar, one Mount Vesulus kept safe in his pine forest many years before the nipping hounds harried him out, or one the Laurentine marsh for long has fed on reedy undergrowth, now ringed by hunters ready with nets, he stands at bay and snorts, ferocious with his bristling hump, 
and no one's blood is up enough to go in closer, they keep safely away as they attack with darts and shouts, while he turns on them all, undaunted, waiting for the time to charge, gnashing his tusks and shrugging off the darts. So men who justly hated Mazentius had not the gall to meet him, blade to blade, but harried him with darts and wild shouts at a safe distance. There was a man named Akron, come from Carithus old country, a Greek exile who left his marriage unfulfilled. As he drove Rutulians into disarray, in crimson plumes, in rose red of his bride, Mazentius caught sight of him apart. An unfed lion prowling in the bush and ravenous, catches sight of a wild goat or a tall antlered stag, then he exults, and gaping terribly ruffles up his mane before he kills and cleaves to a feast of flesh, while blood bathes and befouls his cruel jaws. With such a spring Mazentius fell upon the dense ranked enemy. Unlucky Akron crumpled first and kicked the black earth, dying, splashing with blood the spear shaft broken off. But when Orodes turned to run, the killer scorned to hit him from behind, to cast unseen and wound him. No, he caught and turned him, facing him man to man, proving the better by force of arms, not by an unfair shot. With foot pressed on the dying where he lay he pulled his spear out, calling, here's no mean partaker in this battle, men. Here lies Orodes, once so high. The Italian troops shouted together, echoing in ovation. Then, however, as he expired, Orodes whispered, whoever you are, you'll not take joy in this death long, for it will be avenged. An equal destiny awaits you here. The same field will be yours to lie in soon. Mazentius answered smiling in hard anger, die now. But as for my fate, let the father of gods and king of men attend to it. He pulled the spearhead from Orod's body. Harsh repose oppressed his eyes, a sleep of iron, and an eternal night they closed. Now Cetacus cut Alcathous down, Secretor killed Hydaspes, Repo killed Parthenius and Orses, Man of Brawn, Mesippus finished Clonius and Erisetes, Lycaon's son, one fallen from his unbridled mount and lying prone, the other on foot. On foot the Lycian, Agis, too, came forward only to be hurled in the dust by one who had his grandfather's bravery, Valerus. Next Thronius fell to Salius, Salius fell before Nialsus, dead shot with a javelin and a sly arrow striking at long range. In the battle now Mars evenly dealt out to both sides heavy grief and mutual death, both killing, both going down in equal numbers, winners and losers, neither any longer knowing the meaning of retreat. The gods in Jove's long haul pitied the empty rage of these two armies, and the painful toil mankind must bear. For here Venus looked on, there her opponent, Juno, while death pale to Siphony and savagery roamed the field amid the soldiers in their thousands. Yes, and Mazentius shook a giant spear and he stormed over the field, tall as Orion when he wades through expanses of the sea with shoulders unsubmerged, or when he brings his aged ash tree staff from mountain heights and treads the earth, head hidden in the clouds. So giant-like Mazentius came on in his enormous armor. Sighting him in the long battle line, Aeneas made his way toward him. Mazentius stood fast, utterly fearless, biding his gallant foe, immobile, massive, measuring with his eye the distance needed for his throw. He said, my right arm, only God I have, and shaft I now let fly, be on my side. I pledge you, Lossus, armed in what I strip from him, from this free hooter's body, you shall be my trophy of Aeneas. After his speech, he made a long cast, and the whistling spear winged on, clanged on the shield, but sprang away to fix itself between the flank and groin of Antares, a distinguished soldier there, Hercules' old companion. Sent from Argos, he stayed close to Evander and made his home in an Italian town. Killed by a stroke that missed another, now he lay and skyward turned his eyes in death, remembering the sweet land, Argos. Then the god-fearing captain Aeneas made his throw. Through the round shield, convex with triple bronze, layers of linen worked with triple bull's hide, the spear passed and stuck low in the groin. Yet at the end it lost force. Cheered at seeing Etruscan blood, Aeneas in a flash drew sword from hip and closed with his shocked enemy. Now Lossus groaned at the sight for love of his dear father, and down his cheeks the tears rolled. Here indeed I shall not fail to tell of that hard death you came upon, and of your heroism, if ancientness for a great act wins belief, and of your memorable self, young soldier. Mazentius had begun to back away, disabled, hampered, dragging on his shield the enemy spear, when in a lightning move the young man threw himself into the fight, just as Aeneas rose for a downward cut he beat aside the blade, and for a space put the man off. Italian troops came up with shouts, while under cover of Lossus shield the father limped away. The soldiers' javelins harassed Aeneas and kept him back, so he took shelter behind a shield in a black rage. As when the storm clouds pour down hail in showers, every farmer and plowman leaves his field, and every traveller takes cover, snug in some good shelter, overhanging bank or rock vault, while the rain falls, 
they defer the day's work till the sun comes out again. So, swamped by missiles left and right, Aeneas suffered the war cloud till its thunder passed and meanwhile had harsh words and threats for losses. Why this rush deathward, daring beyond your power? Filial piety makes you lose your head. But losses all the same leapt to the clash, beside himself. Now in the Dardan captain anger boiled up higher. The Parsi wound the threat of losses to the end. Aeneas drove his tough sword through the young man's body up to the hilt, for it pierced the half-shield, light defense for one so menacing, and the shirt his mother had woven him, soft cloth of gold, so blood filled up the folds of it. His life now left his body for the air and went in sorrow to the shades. But seeing the look on the young man's face in death, a face so pale as to be awesome, then Anchises' son groaned in profound pity. He held out his hand as filial piety, mirrored here, wrung his own heart, and said, O oh, poor young soldier, how will Aeneas reward your splendid fight? How honor you, in keeping with your nature? Keep the arms you love to use, for I return you to your forebears, ash and shades, if this concerns you now. Unlucky boy, one consolation for sad death is this, you die by the sword thrust of great Aeneas. Then giving Loss's troops a sharp rebuke for hanging back, he lifted from the ground the dead man as he lay, his well-combed hair soaking with blood. By rippling Tiber now his father slowed the bleeding of his wound with river water and eased himself, his back against a tree trunk. His bronze helm nearby hung from the boughs, and on the grass in pieces heavy armor lay. Men of his choosing stood in a circle, he himself, in pain, his flowing beard combed forward on his chest, panted and tried to rest, to ease his neck. Repeatedly he asked for news of Lossus, repeatedly sent messengers to recall him bearing his gloomy father's word. But weeping troops bore Lossus lifeless on his armor, a mighty prince brought down by a mighty wound. Mazentius heart knew well for whom they wept when still far off. Gouging up dust he soiled his white hair, spread his hands to heaven, and when the body came, he clung to it. Did such pleasure in being alive enthrall me, son, that I allowed you whom I sired to take my place before the enemy sword? Am I, your father, saved by your wounds, by your death do I live? I. Now at the end exile is misery to me, now the wound of it goes deep. There's more my son, I stained your name with wickedness, driven out as I was, under a cloud, from throne and scepter of my ancestors. Long since I owed my land, my hating folk, punishment for my sins. I should have given my guilty life up, suffering every death. I live still. Not yet have I taken leave of men and daylight. But I will. At this he stood up on his anguished thigh, and though strength ebbing in the deep wound made him slow, undaunted he commanded that they bring his mount, his pride and stay, on which he rode from all his wars victorious. Then he said to the mournful animal, Rebus, we too have had a long life now, if lives are ever long for mortals. Either you win today and bring that armor yonder back, blood smeared, Aeneas head, too, and avenge with me what losses had to bear, or if no force can clear that way, you'll die as I must die. Brave heart, I know you will not bend the neck to strangers' orders or to Trojan masters. He eased himself on the warm back of the horse, astride him as before, and took a sheaf of javelins in each hand, his bronze helm shining, horsehair plume bristle, and off he galloped into the battle lines. In that one heart shame seethed amain, and madness mixed with grief. Three times with a great voice he called Aeneas, who knew the voice and prayed in joy, so be it. So may the Father of Gods and High Apollo bring it on. Begin the fight. At this he moved on up to meet him with his spear. Mezentius in his rum said, Heart enemy, how can you think to terrify me, now my son is lost that was the only way you could destroy me. Neither do I quail at death nor act in deference to any god. So drop your talk, I come resolved to die. But first there are these gifts I bring for you. At once he hurled a javelin at his enemy, then sent another and another still straight to the mark, as he rode wide around in a great circle. But the golden boss held intact. Leftward the assailant rode three times around. Aeneas faced the shots and three times turned a thicket of javelins on the bronze shield. The contest, long drawn out, the toil of plucking steel points from his shield, the disadvantages of fighting on foot, grew wearisome. Racking his brains, at last he burst from his position to hurl a spear squarely between the temples of the warhorse. The beast reared back and high, pawing the air with his forefeet, then on his rider thrown the horse came down, entangling the man, and with his shoulder out of joint, headlong he plunged and pinned him. Trojan and Latin shouts flared to heaven. Aeneas on the run came up, pulling his sword out of the sheath, stood over him and said, Where is the fierce Mezentius now, and his bloodthirsty soul? The Etruscan with his eyes cast up regained his senses, drinking in the air of heaven, answering, Bitter as gall, my enemy, why pillory me and hold up death before me? 
taking my life you do no wrong, I had no other expectation, coming to battle. Lossus, my son, made no compact with you that you should spare me. One request I'll make if conquered enemies may ask a favor, let my body be hid in earth. I know on every hand the hatred of my people. Fend off their fury and allow me room in the same grave with my son, this said, he faced with open eyes the sword's edge at his throat and poured his life out on his armored breast in waves of blood. Book 11. Debaters and a Warrior Girl. When dawn came up from ocean in the east, though palace death had left Aeneas shaken, and duty pressed him to give time for burial of the dead, he first in early light discharged his ritual vows as victor to the gods. A big oak trunk lopped of its boughs, he planted on a mound and dressed it with mesentious bright gear to make a trophy, god of war, to thee. He fitted it with a crest still oozing blood, with javelins of the warrior, and his cuirass, twelve times cut and breached. On the left side he tied the bronze shield, and he slung the ivory scabbard and sword around the figure's neck. Then he addressed the officers who thronged about him in elation. One great mission stands accomplished, men. For what remains let all our fears depart from us. I strip these arms from a proud king, my offering now, first trophy in the war, Mezentius, become this figure at my hands. The road before us leads to the Latin town and king. Look to your gear, and courage. Think ahead with good cheer of the war to come, and when by will of the high gods our flag is raised, our troops led from the camp, nothing amiss or unforeseen will cumber or delay us, no heavy-heartedness will slow us down. Meanwhile let us give over to the earth our friends' unburied bodies, the one honor possible for them now in Acheron. Go, he continued, and make beautiful the funeral rites for those heroic souls who won this land for us. Let Pallas first be sent to Evander's grieving town. He lacked no valor when the black day took him off and sank him in death's bitterness. He wept as he said this, then made his way again to his own threshold, where the corpse of Pallas lay in care of old Ascides, once Arcadian Evander's armor-bearer, chosen under less happy auspices to be companion of a cherished ward. Their household stood around, with men of Troy, and Trojan women, hair unbound in mourning. Then as Aeneas entered the tall doorway everyone there groaned mightily to heaven, beating their breasts. The prince's lodge rang out with sobs and lamentation. When he saw the head at rest, the snow-white face of Pallas, the smooth chest and the open wound the Ausonian spearhead made, his tears welled up with grim words, Was it you, poor boy, that fortune would not let me keep when she came smiling? You who were not to see our kingdom won, or ride in victory to your father's house? This was not the pledge I made Evander on your behalf, on leaving him, when he embraced me and gave Godspeed to my quest for countrywide command. Anxiously, too, he warned of battle with a rugged race, with savage fighting men. Even at this hour prey to false hope, he may be making vows and heaping altars with his gifts, while here we gather with a soldier, young and dead, who owes no vows to heaven any longer, here is our helpless ritual and our sorrow. Father ill-fated, you will see his funeral. Can this be our return, our long-for triumph, this my great pledge carried out? Enough. Evander, you will see no shameful wound of one who ran, hit from behind you'll pray for no hard death because a son lives on disgraced. What a defense Ausonia lost and you, too, Iulus. Having wept his fill, he had the forlorn body taken up for journeying, and from the army chose a thousand men to march as retinue at palace funeral. These would take part in mourning with his father, for great pain small consolation, but the poor kings do. Deft hands now made a pliant beer of wicker, arbutus shoots and oak twigs interwoven, shading the piled-up couch with screens of leaves. Here on his rustic bed they lay the prince, most like a flower a girl's fingers plucked, soft petaled violet or hyacinth with languid head, as yet not discomposed or faded, though its mother earth no longer nourishes it and makes it stand in bloom. Aeneas brought two robes all stiff with gold embroidery and purple. Dido of Sidon herself had loved the toil of making these with her own hands one day for him, in weaving golden thread into the fabric. One of these the sorrowing man wrapped round the prince in final honor, and he spread the other, mantling the hair soon to be set aflame. He heaped the many prizes Pallas won in the Laurentine battle, to be borne in a long file, and added mounts and weapons taken in his own fights from the enemy. Then came, hands bound behind their backs, the prisoners he sent as offerings to the shades below, intending that when slain they should bedew the pyre's flames with blood. And he commanded officers themselves to carry trophies, tree trunks and femen's gear, with names attached. Ascides had to be led, far gone in age and misery, his breast stung by his blows, his cheeks torn by his nails, at times he fell, full length, flinging himself to earth. War cars they also led, a glisten with Rutulian blood. The warhorse Athon, bear of insignia, came behind, with big tears rolling down to wet his cheeks, then men who bore the spear and helm of Pallas, 
for his belt and sword were held by Turnus the Victorious. And now the whole sad column marched, the Trojans, all the Etruscans, the Arcadians, with arms reversed. When the long file had gone a distance on its way, Aeneas halted, sighed from the heart, and spoke a final word, more of the same drear destiny of battle calls me back to further tears. Forever hail to you, my noble friend, my palace, hail and farewell forever. That was all. Then he turned backward toward the parapets and made his way to camp. From the Latin city spokesmen wearing chaplets of olive boughs had now arrived with a petition for him. Let him give back their dead, felled by the sword, who lay upon the field, let him permit interment of them under an earthen mound. There was no combat with defeated men who breathed the air no longer. Let him spare them, hosts, he called them once, and fathers-in-law. This request the good heart of Aeneas could not spurn but granted, and he added, What unmerited misfortune, Latins, could have embroiled you in so sad a war that now you turn your backs on us, your friends. Do you ask peace from me for those whose lives were taken by the cast of Mars? Believe me, I should have wished to grant it to the living. Never should I have come here had not fate allotted me this land for settlement, nor do I war upon your people. No, your king dropped our alliance, lent himself instead to Turnus fighting. In all fairness, Turnus should have faced death on this field. If he would end the war by force, and drive the Trojans out, he should have fought me, fought my weapons, then the one for whom great Mars, Par or his own sword, revealed would have lived on. Go now, light fires beneath your wretched dead. He finished, and they stood stricken and still, turning their eyes to look at one another. Drance, an aging man, forever hostile to the young Turnus, whom he blamed and hated, spoke in reply, great man by fame, and proven greater in warfare, Prince of Troy, how can I match your godly nobleness with praise? Shall I admire the just man first, or first his deeds of war? Surely in gratitude will take your generous words back to our city, then, fortune willing, we shall see that you and King Latinus reunite. Let Turnus look for his own ally. Our happiness will be to raise your destined bulk of wall and bear the stones of Troy upon our shoulders. To this the rest as one man spoke assent, and so they made a twelve-day truce, while peace should hold between them, two Creans and Latins mingling without harm as they traversed the wooded ridges. Lofty ash trees rang with strokes of double-bladed axes, pines that towered starward toppled and came down, and men with wedges all day long split oak and fragrant cedar logs, or hauled the trunks of mountain ash on groaning wains. Rumor already flown ahead inland had heralded the mournful news, it filled Evander's ears, his house, his city walls, par rumor that only lately had reported Pallas victorious in Latium. Arcadians crowding to the gates by night took up the funeral torches custom called for, flames whose glare in a long line moved out along the road, between the fields. The Phrygian column came to meet and join that line of men lamenting. When the women saw them near the walls, they made the darkened town blaze up with wailing cries. As for Evander, nothing could hold him, but he took his way amid them all to where they set the bier, then threw himself on Pallas. Clinging there with tears and sobs, he barely spoke at last when pain abated. This you had not promised, Pallas, telling your father with what care you would go into action, facing Mars. I knew how heady it could be to draw first blood, to taste the wine of victory in your first combat, and Hood's bitter gain, war's hard initiation, close at hand, my vows, my prayers unheard by any god. O oh, blessed wife, so lucky in your death, not kept alive to suffer this. For my part, I have outlived my time to linger on, survivor of my son. Would God Rutulians had found me side by side with Trojan troops and pinned me to the earth with spears. I should myself have given up my life. Would God this Corti brought me and not Pallas home. Not that I blame you or decry our compact, Trojans, N.D. our handgrip, guest and host. This lot awaited me in my old age. But if my son had early death before him I can rejoice that first he took the lives of countless Votians, that he met his end leading the Trojans into Latium. Besides, I could not wish a funeral more noble for you, Pallas, than this one Aeneas in his piety performs, with Phrygian leaders and Etruscan captains, all the Etruscan army. Men to whom your sword arm dealt out death are here as trophies, great ones, you, too, Turnus, would stand here, a huge trunk hung with arms, had age and strength and seasoning of years matched him with you. But in my misery why do I hold back the Trojans from the war? March on, remember this, my message to your king. If I live out my hateful life now, Pallas gone, your sword arm keeps me, earnest life the debt you see it owes to father as to son. In this alone your greatness and your fortune now have scope. I ask no joy in life, par I may not, ought to take word to my son far down amid the shades. Dawn at that hour brought on her kindly light for ill mankind, arousing men to labor and distress. By now Aeneas and Tarkin had built up their pyres along the curving shore. 
On them in the old time ritual each bore and placed the bodies of his men. The smoky fires caught underneath and hid the face of heaven in a tall gloom. Round pyres as they blazed troops harnessed in bright armor marched three times in parade formation, and the cavalry swept about the sad cremation flame three times, while calling out their desolate cries. Tears fell upon the ground, fell upon armor. High in air rose the wild yells of men, the metal knell of trumpets. There were some who hurled gear taken from the Latin slain into the fire, helmets and ornate swords, and reins and chariot wheels. Others tossed in gifts more familiar to the dead, their spears and shields which luck had not attended. On all sides death received burnt offerings of oxen, throats of swine were bled into the flames with cattle commandeered from all the fields. Then over the whole shore they stood to see their fellow soldiers burning, and kept watch on pyres as they flared. Men could not be torn from the scene till dew-drenched night came on and a night sky studded with fiery stars. The wretched Latins, also, in their quarter, built countless pyres, and of their many dead they buried some, took some inland, or home into the city. All the rest they burned, heaped up in mammoth carnage, bodies jumbled, numberless and nameless. Everywhere field strove with field in brightness of thick fires. A third day lightened heaven of cold and gloom before the mourners raked from the deep ash scattered bones and piled warm earth upon them. That day, in the city, within the walls of rich Latinus, high-pitched wailing rose, the climax of long mourning. Mothers, brides bereft, and tender hearts of sisters grieving, orphan boys, LL cursed the war, the marriage hope of Turnus. Let him fight alone, they called, and fight it out to a decision, he who demands kingship in Italy and highest honours for himself. Then Drance gave his weight to this, fiercely avowing Turnus alone was called to single combat. At the same time, many declared themselves in one way or another on Turnus' side, the queen's great name protected him, renown and trophies fairly won stood in his favour. Amid these hot exchanges, as the tumult reached its height, who should arrive in gloom, par one more misfortune, up the emissaries back from Diomedes' city, bearing his reply, and nothing had been gained by all their effort and expense, their gifts, their gold, their long entreaties had not moved him, Latins must look elsewhere for reinforcement or ask for peace terms from the Trojan prince. Now King Latinus at this grievous blow lost heart, he too, for the gods' anger shone in burial mounds before his eyes had told him Aeneas came as one ordained, brought by palpable will of the unseen. Therefore he called together his high council, principal men of Latium, in his court, and in all haste they came to the royal house, through the full streets. Eldest among them, first in power of the scepter, grim in aspect, King Latinus took his chair, commanding those returned from the Aetolian town to tell their tale, their answers, point by point. Silence being enjoined on all the rest, obediently Venulus began, We have seen Diomedes, fellow townsmen, seen the Argive camp. We made the journey, won through all the dangers, gripped the hand that brought the realm of Ilium down. We saw him laying the foundations of his city, named Argyripa for his father's race, in Yapix country, hard by Mount Garganus. When we were in the camp, with leave to speak before him, tendering our gifts, we told what name was ours, what fatherland, what enemy made war upon us, and what urgent cause drew us to Arpi. First he heard us out, then answered peaceably, fortunate race and realm of Saturn, men of old Ausonia, what happened to disturb your quiet life and make you rouse the unknown that is war? We who did violence to the Ilian land with cold steel, nd I now pass over pain endured in warfare under those high walls and soldiers the Simoi their holds under par all of us have paid throughout the world beyond belief in suffering for our crimes. Priam himself might pity the lot of us. Witness Minerva's deadly star and storm, you be in crags, vengeful decoying lights, then too, after our conquest, driven far to strange landfalls, Menelaus Atreides tastes exile near the pillars of Proteus, Ulysses has beheld Etnian Cyclops. Neoptolemus' realm, hall I tell of that, and hearth gods of Idomeneus destroyed? Of Locrians, now displaced in Libya? Even that marshal of the great Achaeans, the Mycenaean, entering his home met death at his unspeakable consort's hands. The adulterer lay in wait at Asia's fall. And must I at all that the gods denied me, return to the altars of my fatherland, my long-for wife, Caledon's loveliness? At this hour still, portents I dread to see pursue me, lost companions, turned to birds, have taken to the air and roamed the streams, par what torture for my soldiers, s they fill the sea cliffs with their cries, their mewing cries. These punishments were all to be expected from that day when I so far lost my mind as to attack a being formed in heaven, wounding, defiling, Venus' hand. No, no. Invite me to no warfare such as this. Troy fallen, I have had no quarrel with Trojans, no delight in calling up evil days. The gifts you bring me from your country, take instead to Aeneas. I have stood my ground against his wedded spear, 
fought him with swords. Trust one who knows the surging mass of him behind his shield, the whirlwind of his cast. Had Ida's land borne two more men like him, Troy would have marched upon the towers of Argos, Greece would be mourning a contrary fate. As to our stalemate before stubborn Troy, the sword arm of Aeneas, with Hector's, halted dominance of the Greeks for ten long years, both known for courage, both for skill in arms, Aeneas first in reverence for the gods. Your right hands and your forces should be joined and well may be. Take care they do not clash in combat. Now your majesty has heard both Diomedes' responses and his views of our great war. Barely had the legates finished their story when a hubbub rose, and turbulence among the listening faces, as when rock beds that stem a rushing stream make the roiled current roar, and banks re-echo foam lash of the waves. But soon the council's mood grew calm, excited tongues were stilled, and calling on the gods from his high throne the king spoke out, much earlier than this I should have wished, nd wiser it would have been, par to meet and take decisions in this crisis, not with the enemy at our walls, as now. My countrymen, we make ill omen war with men of heavenly birth, unconquerable, untired by battle, and even in defeat unable to put up the sword. What hope you had of brothers in arms, Aetolians, you must dismiss. Each man may have his hope, but this how narrow now you see. Then too all that we had, now visited with ruin, lies before your eyes and in your hands. But I accuse no one. What bravery could do was done. The whole strength of our kingdom fought the battle. It is over. Now let me disclose the plan formed in my mind still tentatively. Give me your attention. I shall be brief. There is an old domain of mine along the Tuscan stream, extending far toward sundown, well beyond Sicanian boundaries. Oruncans and Rotulians sow crops there, plough the stony hills, or graze the wildest of them. Let this region all be seated now in friendship to the Trojans, with a pine-forested zone of mountain heights. Let us make equitable treaty terms and in the realm call them co-citizens. Here let them settle and here build their walls if such desire is in them. If their hearts are set on other lands and other races, and they are able to leave our soil, why then twice ten good ships of stout Italian oak will build them, if they muster crews for more, the timber lies at the sea's edge. They may prescribe the number and rig, and we shall give the bronze, the labor, and the launching ways. It will content me, further, that one hundred emissaries chosen from our best shall bring our terms and sign the pact and offer olive boughs of peace, carrying gifts, par gold bars and ivory, and throne and robe, insignia of our kingship all take counsel here and now. Shore up our tired strength. Then Drance rose, belligerent as before. The fame of Turnus galled him, made him smart with envy unconfessed, this wealthy man, a lavish spender and an order but a cold hand in battle, held to be no empty counsellor, a strong party man. His mother's nobility made him arrogant, though he had no certain father. Now he spoke to add to and to aggravate their anger, Excellency, it is all clear as day, the situation you address, no need for us to enlarge on it all here concede they know what these events mean for our people, yet they keep silent. Let the man we know allow us liberty to speak, and let him hold his bluster. His unlucky star, his baleful influence, nd I shall say it, threaten as he may to run me through, par his whim put out so many shining lights among our captains that we see our city founder in grief, hile at the Trojan camp he skirmishes, being sure to get away, frightening the air with javelins. One more gift, your gracious majesty, include with all you'd have us send or offer to the Trojans, one gift more, and let no violence from any man prevail on you to yield a father's right, betrothal of your daughter fittingly to an exceptional son, by that eternal bond to accomplish peace. But if our minds and hearts are so oppressed by terror, let us plead with Turnus here himself to do this kindness to us all, resign his marital rights to king and country. Why must you, sir, send into open peril time and again your suffering countrymen, you, chief of woes to Latium, cause of all. In war there's no salvation. We require peace of you, Turnus, and along with it the one pledge that makes peace inviolable. Look, I whom you pretend to be your rival, par I will not linger on that, first of all come to beg you, pity your own people. Cool your hot head, being beaten, leave the field. In our defeat we have seen enough of death and made a landscape desolate. If glory is on your mind still, iron self-conceit, or a royal house for dowry charms you so, then take the risk and brave the enemy. Must I suppose that for the sake of Turnus' royal marriage we poor common souls should strew the field, unburied and unwept? Come, sir, if any fighting blood is in you, any native legacy from Mars, go face the man who calls you out to combat. Under this taunting Turnus' fiery temper flared up, but he gave a groan of scorn, then broke out in his deep voice, plenty of talk you always have when contests call for action. Summon a senate, you are the first one there. No need to fill this hall with words, big words you can let fly in safety 
keeping walls between you and the enemy, no moats as yet running with blood. Hammer away with all your rhetoric. Say I'm afraid when your own sword has left the dead in heaps, the field brilliant with trophies everywhere. What bravery in action can achieve you are still free to experience, no need to hunt for enemies, they ring the walls. Go out to meet them, shall we? Why hang back? Will all your skill for battle rest forever in a windbag's breath and in those flying feet? Beaten, am I? Can anyone have cause to utter that word, beaten, you foul wretch, seeing the Tiber risen with Ilian blood and all Evander's house, his line, brought low, Arcadians killed and stripped? I should not say I seemed a beaten man to Bishes and Pandarus, that giant, or the throngs I sent to hell on one victorious day, shut between walls, at that, with enemy earthworks to right and left of me. In war there's no salvation? Sing that to your Trojan chief and your own prospects, you mad fool. Go on confusing everything with fear, exalt a race twice conquered in their strength, cry down Latina's power. Nowadays the Myrmidons tremble at Phrygian spears, Diomedes and Achilles tremble, par yes, and Ophidus' torrent flows uphill in flight from the Adriatic. Take him now pretending to be frightened when I blast him, the artful devil, just to add that touch, par intimidation, oh his case against me. You'll never lose that life, such as it is, to this right hand, don't worry, let it stay long resident in that tame breast of yours. Now, father, I revert to you, to your large-scale proposal. If you put no further hope in our fighting power, if we are left so unsupported, if our army corps by one reversal has gone all to pieces, our fortune reached the point of no return, then let us beg for peace with beggar's hands. Yet, oh, had we a spark of our old spirit. The luckiest of men in this hard time, the finest man, to my mind, would be he who bit the dust, once and for all, and died to avoid a sight like this. But if in fact we have resources, fresh reserves of men, Italian states and peoples with us still, and if the Trojans won at a great cost in blood, hey have their burials as well, the storm struck all alike, hi then give up like cowards on the threshold? Why allow our knees to shake before a trumpet blows? Days passing and the changing work of time have often righted things. Fortune returns to put on solid ground those she derided. Say the Aetolian will not help, nor Arpi, Mesippus will, so will that lucky seer, Ptolemyus, so will chiefs whom many nations sent to us, nd no small fame will come to the picked men of Latium and Laurentum, par yes, and Camilla of the noble Voshi, leading her cavalry, splendid in bronze. But if the Trojans call on me alone for combat, and if you approve, and I am blocking something for the good of all, then victory has not so bitterly hated these hands and so eluded them that I should not, in such a hopeful cause, make my attempt. And cheerfully I'll go against him, though he overshadow Achilles, and were gear made, like his, by Vulcan's hands. This life of mine I, Turnus, not outdone in valour by the men of old, have sworn in service to my father-in-law and you. Aeneas calls on him alone. Call on, I pray. If this brings anger of the gods, may Drance not appease it with his death, nor if it brings honour and feats of arms may he bear off the palm for these. The two debated the obscure future in this way, in bitter strife. Meanwhile Aeneas left camp and took the field. Now see a messenger hastening through the palace with hue and cry to alarm the town. He brought word that the Trojan battle line, and the Tuscan complement had left the Tiber to move down the plain. Their minds in tumult, shaken by the news, the common people felt their anger roused as by a goat. With oaths their hands went out for arms, and then the young men yelled to arms. Even as their despondent fathers wept. Everywhere now clamour and discord rose into the air above the town as when bird flocks come down in a tall grove, or swans where the Pedusan channel teams with fish give their hoarse-throated cries on echoing pools. But Turnus caught the moment and made it his. He said, Just so, my townsmen. Hold your counsel. Sit and praise the name of peace. And they? Their army sweeps to attack our capital. That was all. He leapt up and away, quitting the council hall with rapid stride, then gave commands, Volusius, it's for you to make the Votian squadrons arm. You lead the Rutulians. Mesippus, arm your horsemen. Chorus, you and your twin brother see our cavalry deployed across the plain. One foot battalion reinforce the approaches to the city and man the towers. All the rest, prepare with me for action, as and where I order. Running crowds made for the city walls, and King Latinus, prey to the dark hour, left the council chamber and postponed all he had set afoot. Bitterly now he blamed himself for having failed to welcome Aeneas the Dardanian to his realm as son in law. Before the city gates deep pits were dug, big stones and pikes brought up, a vibrant trumpet sang bloodshed and war. In long uneven lines mothers and boys appeared atop the ring of walls, the final effort drew them all. 
The queen is well rode in her carriage with a company of mothers to the shrine of Pallas, high above the town, with gifts, and close beside her the young princess, Lavinia, rode, he cause of so much suffering, lovely eyes downcast. The women, entering, beclouded all that shrine with smoke of incense, and sad voices rose from the portal in a tide of prayer, O power over battle, our protectress, virgin, Tritonia, shatter in thy hand the spearhaft of the Phrygian corsair. Throw him headlong to earth, let him lie dead below our high gates. Turnus, furiously on edge for battle, pulled his armor on, first his cuirass, glowing red, with scales a quiver, then he encased his legs in gold, his head still bare, then belted on his sword and ran down from the citadel, his figure glittering, golden, while his heart beat high, at grips with Femen even now in thought, par as a stallion breaks his tether and goes free at last out of the stall, and down the meadow, gaining the open land, there he may turn to a grazing herd of mares, or canter on to a stream he knows well for a cooling plunge, neighing and frisking, tossing back his head, his mane at play over his neck and shoulders. Square in his path, her votion squads behind her, Camilla came, hard-riding warrior queen. Before the gates she leapt down from her mount, and her whole troop, taking the cue, dismounted at the same instant slipping to the earth. She spoke then, saying, Turnus, as confidence goes hand in hand with bravery that earned it, now I dare and undertake to meet Aeneas' horsemen, charging the Tuscan cavalry alone. Let me first risk the combat at close quarters, you with your infantry stand by the walls meanwhile, and guard the city. His eyes intent upon the awesome virgin, Turnus answered, Virgin, glory of Italy, how tell my gratitude, or how repay my debt? Courageous spirit, towering above all here, now share the toil with me. Rumor, confirmed by scouts I send, informs me that that dog Aeneas dispatched his light-armed horse ahead to scour the plain, while on the mountain track through the wild land, crossing the ridge, he makes his own descent upon the town. I'll set an ambush where the path is arched by forest, soldiers to close both ends of the defile. You take the field, engage the Tuscan horse, Mesippus and the Latin cavalry will be there with you, and Tiburtus' troop. Plan your battle as my co-commander. With corresponding orders he dispatched Mesippus, with his Latins, to that fight, while he himself marched on his enemy. The mountain road curves in a pass, designed by nature for entrapment and surprise, heavily wooded, dark on either hand. The road thins out here, and the narrowing gorge begrudges a way through. But on high ground amid the lookout posts along the crest there's a concealed plateau, a safe retreat, whether you plan a rush from right or left or stand fast on the ridge and roll down boulders. Here by familiar shortcuts Turnus came, preempted the high ground, and lay in wait in woods made dangerous. In heaven meanwhile Diana spoke to Opis, the fleet huntress, one of the divine virgins in her train. Her lips opened in sadness, and she said, Sister, now Camilla goes her way to the cruel war, equipped with bow and quiver, weapons of ours, but all in vain, cherish her as I may beyond the rest. No new love, this, come just now to Diana, moving my heart with pleasure. Years ago when haters of his insolent power drove him out of Privernum, ancient realm and town, Metabuz took along his infant child in flight amid the struggles of that war to share his exile. By her mother's name, Casmilla, changed a bit, he called the child Camilla. Now he carried her before him close to his breast, and toiled for refuge on long ridges in the wilderness, though spears of grim pursuit were everywhere behind, and Votion patrols cast a wide net. Lo and behold, square in his path, in flood, the torn Amasinus, foaming high, ran over banks and brim, filled by so wild a cloudburst. As the man prepared to swim it, love for his infant stayed him, and he feared for his dear burden. Weighing all the choices possible, he settled suddenly and desperately on this, in his tough hand he chanced to carry a battle spear of oak, knotted and seasoned, now to this he tied his child, encased in cork tree bark, and bound her trimly in the middle of the shaft. He balanced it in his big hand and prayed to the heir of heaven, daughter of Latona, Diana, kindly virgin of the groves, I, her father, swear this child shall be thy servant, he first weapon she embraces thine, as by thy mercy through the air she escapes the enemy. I beg thee, goddess, take her as thine own, this girl committed now to the veering wind. Then he drew back his arm and let the spun shaft fly. The waters din below, and over the rushing stream small and forlorn Camilla soared across upon the whistling spear shaft. Well aware of troops in force approaching from behind, Metabuz took to the river. Spear and child in triumph he recovered from the turf, his offering to the virgin of the crossroads. Now not a city gave him sanctuary, public or private, or would he himself, because of his fierce nature, yield to any, par so he lived out his life upon the shepherd's lonely mountains. Here in undergrowth amid rough haunts of beasts he nursed his daughter, 
putting her to the breast of a wild mare whose teats he milked into her tender mouth. When the small child took her first steps, he armed her hands with a sharp javelin, and hung a bow and quiver from her infant shoulder. No gold headband, no flowing outer garment covered her, but a tiger skin hung down her back from head to foot, and as a child she flung play darts with her soft hand and whirled a slingstone on a strap around her head to fell a crane of strymon or a swan. Then many mothers in the Tuscan towns desired her in vain to be their daughter. All her contentment being with Diana, the girl remained untouched and ever cherished passion for arms and for virginity. I wish that she had not been swept away in this campaign, or tried to challenge Trojans, she would be still my dear, one of my sisters. Come, though, granted harsh fate is at hand, go gliding out of heaven, nymph, and visit Latin lands where, with unlucky omen, battle is begun. Here are my weapons. Take one vengeful shaft out of the quiver. By this let any Trojan or Italian, one or the other, who may violate her sacred body with a wound, pay back in blood an equal penalty to me. Then I shall carry, pillowed in a cloud, the body of the pitiable one, par her war gear intact, owe her final rest in her own land and tomb. When she had finished, Opis dropped from heaven through light airs with a rushing sound, wrapped in a dark whirlwind. The Trojan column now approached the town, with Tuscan chiefs and all their cavalry in numbered squadrons. Over the level ground with thudding hoofs the warhorse trots and snorts and rears up, tugging at the check of rain, and curvets here and there. The wide, steel-glinting field bristles with lances, the long vista teams with upright arms. Against them soon Mesippus and the headlong Latin horse, Chorus, his brother, and Camilla's wing came into view, defenders in the field, with lances drawn back, then in forward thrusts, and with a brandishing of javelins. The onward rush of men and horses neighing blazed in the sunlight. When they came within spear throw of one another, Trojan and Latin pulled up in a halt, then, all at once, with shouts they spurred their furious mounts and flung their javelins in showers from both sides as thick as snowflakes, making a daytime dusk. Now shaft to shaft, Tyrrhenus and the savage Latin horsemen, Acantius, met head-on with a mighty crash that caused the first downfall from shock of horses, breast to bursting breast, Acantius, pitched off like a thunderbolt or stone out of a catapult, came down far off, his life dispersed into the air. At this, their lines disordered, Latin troopers turned and, tossing shields behind their shoulders, rode off toward the town. Asilus led the Trojan squadrons in pursuit. But then when near the walls, again the Latins shouted, yanked the horses yielding necks about and wheeled to fight. Now Trojans fled in turn at a full gallop, as in full retreat, par just as the sea with alternating rush now runs ashore in foam above the ledges and lapping soaks the sand high on the beach, now in a rapid seething ebb recedes and glides from land and pulls the rolling pebbles, par twice the Tuscans drove the Rutulians headlong to the walls, but thrown back twice they fled, glancing behind, their shoulders covered. Now, when they came together a third time the two formations mingled, man to man, and then indeed groans of the dying rose, then arms and bodies in a mire of blood went down, and dying horses, with their riders butchered, as the bitter fight surged on. Orsilacus, in dread of meeting Remulus, hurled his javelin at the other's mount and left the steel point under its ear, at this the warhorse reared in fury, four legs high, to shake the wound away, with towering chest, and Remulus was thrown to earth. Catillus brought down Iolus, then Herminius, great-souled, great-bodied warrior, his bare head flowing with tawny locks, his shoulders bare. Wounds held no terrors for him, great as he was, fighting uncovered, up the driven lance a quiver passed clean through his shoulder's breadth and made him double up in agony. Dark blood spilt everywhere. Men dealt out death by cold steel as they fought and strove by wounds to win the beauty of courageous death. Amid the carnage, like an Amazon, Camilla rode exultant, one breast bared for fighting ease, her quiver at her back. At times she flung slim javelins thick and fast, at times, tireless, caught up her two-edged axe. The golden bow, Diana's weapon, rang upon her shoulders, yes, when she gave ground, forced to retreat, with bow unslung in flight she turned and aimed her arrows. At her side rode chosen comrades, virgins all, Larina, Tulla, Tarpia shaking her bronze axe. These were the girls of Italy that she, divine Camilla, picked to be her pride, her staunch handmaidens, both in peace and war. So ride the hardened Amazons of Thrace with drumming hooves on frozen Thermoden, warring in winter, in their painted gear, sometimes around Hippolyta, the chieftain, or when the daughter of Mars, Penthesile, drives her chariot back victorious and women warriors bearing crescent shields exult, riding in tumult with wild cries. Savage girl, whom did your lance on horse, what victims, first and last, how many thrown down on the battlefield, torn bodies dying? Eunaeus, Clytia's son, came first, he faced her with unarmored breast, 
and with her shaft of pine she ran him through. He tumbled, coughing streams of blood, took bites of bloody earth, and dying writhed on his wound. Then she brought Lyris down, and then Pagasus. Lyris, his mount stabbed under him, spun off and tried to gather up the reins, Pagasus, coming to help, put out his hand, unarmed, and both alike went down. She sent to join them Hippotas' son, Amastris. At a distance, pressing on with couched lance, she rode after Terius, Harpalicus, Dimafu, and Chromis. And for every javelin she twirled and cast a Phrygian trooper fell. Still out of range, Ornitus, a hunter, rode a Iapygian horse, in strange war gear, his broad shoulders covered by bullock's hide, his head by a huge wolf's muzzle gaping wide with gleaming fangs. In his right hand he held a forester's bladed hunting spear. This man now wheeled about, the tallest by a head amid his company, but soon Camilla caught him from behind, O oh effort there, since all were in retreat, ND ran him through. Then from above, heart full of hate, she said, in forests, were you, Tuscan, flushing game? The day has come when boasts of all your kind are proven wrong, by women under arms. You'll take no light fame to your father's shades, to have been killed by the lancehead of Camilla. She killed next two of the very tallest Trojans, Orsilacus, and Bute. Bute head being turned, she put her lance head in the gap between his helm and cuirass, where the neck showed white, above the shield on the left arm. Then running as Orsilacus gave chase in a wide circuit, tricking him, she closed a narrowing ring till she became pursuer, then to her full height risen drove her axe repeatedly through helmet and through bone as the man begged and begged her to show mercy. Warm brains from his head wound wetted his face. One who came upon her at that moment reined in, taken aback at the sudden sight, par the son of Onus, a Pennine mountaineer. Not the least guileful of Ligurians this man was, while fate allowed him guile. Seeing he could not spur away from combat, could not deflect the queen from her attack, resorting to a cunning ruse, he said, what's so remarkable if, to a girl's taste, your mainstay is your horse. No running away. Take me on, hand to hand, on level ground, get ready for a fight on foot, and learn whose blown up vanity will have a fall. Now bitter anger made her burn at this. She gave a friend her mount and faced the man fearlessly, on foot with equal arms, a naked blade, a shield without device. But he, who thought his ruse had worked, rode off without a pause, reining his mount around, goading him into a run with iron spurs. Ligurian fool, too cocksure, much too soon, your slippery native trickery has failed. No chance it will return you and your skin to Onus, the old deceiver. So the girl called out as in a sprint with lightning pace she came abreast and passed the running horse, then whirled and yanked the reins and met the shock of the Ligurian's onset, making him pay her penalty in hated blood. So easily a falcon, sacred bird, from his rock tower will strike a soaring dove high in a cloud and grip her as he tears her viscera with crooked talons, blood and plucked out feathers fall from the sky. But on that scene the father of gods and men kept no indifferent watch from his aerial seat high on Olympus. He roused the Tuscan, Tarkin, to the me, instilling anger in him, far from mild, so that amid the carnage, where the companies of horse were giving way, Tarkin rode out, with one shout or another rallying the left and right wings, calling men by name, putting new fight in routed cavalry. Incapable of shame, poltroons forever. Tuscans, what is this fright, what cowardice has entered into you? Shall a single woman drive you out of line, break your formations? What do we carry swords for? Why hold on to useless lances? None of you is tame when it comes to making love, bed wars at night, or when a flute preludes the dance of Bacchus. Look for a feast, and cups on laden tables, all you care for, all you're keen for, yes, when some dependable reader of the entrails heralds an offering, and a fatted lamb is calling you into the sacred wood. With this he gave rein to his mount, prepared to face death, he as well, in the battle's heart, and straight for Venulus went storming on. With his right arm he swept him from the saddle, hugged him to his chest, and spurring hard with a great effort lugged the man away. A yell went up to heaven as all the Latins turned to watch. And like a streak of lightning Tarkin with his load of man and weapons flew over open ground. Then he broke off the steel point of the enemy lance and groped for an opening where he could wound and kill him. But fighting back the other warded off the hand aimed at his throat, met force with force. As when a golden eagle flapping skyward bears a snake as prey, her feet entwined but holding fast with talons, while the victim, wounded as it is, coils and uncoils and lifts cold grisly scales and towers up with hissing maw, but all the same the eagle strikes the wrestler snake with crooked beak while beating with her wings the air of heaven. Just so, out of the Latin squadron, Tarkin triumphing bore off his prey. And Tuscans heeding the example their captain gave, his daring that came off, at once attacked. Wanna runs, a man marked by fate, 
rode wide around Camilla, javelin at the ready, waiting his chance, ahead of her in cunning. Wherever in the me the girl rode in her wild forays, a runs kept behind, silently stalking her, when she turned back blooded from the enemy, he drew rein in stealth and swung his nimble mount away. Now this way, looking for an opening, now that, he shadowed her, going about a circuit on all sides, the dangerous man, a dead shot, hefting clear his pointed shaft. By chance Clorius, Mount Cybele's votary, once a priest, came shining from far off in Phrygian gear. He spurred a foaming mount in a saddle cloth of hide with scales of bronze as thick as plumage, interlinked with gold. The man himself, splendid in rust and purple out of the strange east, drew a Lycian bow to shoot Gorton and arrows, at his shoulder golden was the bow and golden too the helmet of the seer, and tawny gold the brooch that pinned his cloak as it belled out and snapped in wind, a clamus, crocus yellow. Tunic and trousers, too, both eastern style, were brilliant with embroidery. Camilla began to track this man, her heart's desire either to fit luxurious Trojan gear on a temple door, or else herself to flaunt that golden plunder. Blindly, as a huntress, following him, and him alone, of all who took part in the battle, she rode on through a whole scattered squadron, recklessly, in a girl's love of finery. Now at length from where he lurked, seeing the time had come, Aruns went into action, let his javelin come alive, and prayed aloud to heaven, Supreme God, Holy Seracte's guardian, above all others we are blessed in thee, for whom the pine chip's glowing pile is fed. Assured by our devotion, in thy cult we step through beds of embers without harm. Mighty Apollo, grant that we wipe out with arms this ignominy. I want no spoils, no trophy of a beaten girl. My actions elsewhere will bring me honor. May this dire scourge of battle perish, when hit by me. Then to the cities of my ancestors with no pretense of glory I'll return. Phoebus heard, and felt disposed to grant his prayer in part, the rest he gave the winds to blow away. Granted, Arun should fell Camilla in the shock of death, denied that Arun's land should see the man return, that plea the gale winds wafted to the south. So when the javelin whistled from his hand the votions to a man, fiercely intent, looked toward their queen. Oblivious of the air around her, of the whistling shaft, the weapon gliding from high heaven, she remained until the javelin swooped and thudded home beneath her naked breast. There, driven deep, the shaft drank the girl's blood. In consternation fellow troopers gathered on the run to catch and hold their captain as she dropped. But a runs on the instant galloped off in a daze, in fearful joy, he put no further trust in his lance nor in himself to meet the warrior girl in arms. Just as a wolf who killed a shepherd or a full-grown steer makes off cross-country for the hills, to hide before the arrows chase him, knowing well his kill was reckless, tail curved down between his legs to his quaking belly, off he goes, just so, a runs in panic made himself scarce, well out of it amid a crowd of horsemen. Dying, Camilla tugged at the javelin, but the steel point between the ribs held fast in the deep wound. She drooped from loss of blood, her eyelids drooped, chill with approaching death, and the fresh glow of youth drained from her cheeks. With halting breath she whispered now to Akka, one of her company, equally young, her confidant, most faithful of them all, and said, Until now, sister, I was able. Now this wound galls me and finishes me. Everything around is growing dark. Make your escape and take my last command to Turnus, that he join the battle here to keep the Trojans from the town. Farewell. Even while speaking she let slip the reins and slid feigning to earth. Little by little, growing cold, the girl detached herself from her whole body and put down her head, death's captive now, upon her strengthless neck, and let her weapons fall. Then with a groan for that indignity, her spirit fled into the gloom below. Now, spreading measureless, a shout went up to strike the golden stars. Camilla gone, the fight became more savage. Massed for battle, Trojans and all their force pressed on, with Tuscan captains and the Arcadians of Evander. As for the sentinel of Diana, Opis, resting all this time on a mountain top, she had been watching without fear. But now she sighted, far off in the furious din of cavalries, Camilla beaten down and pitifully dead. Then from her heart the nymph said, groaning, it is too cruel, girl, your punishment, too cruel for having tried to challenge Trojans in the war. Devotion paid to Diana in your solitude, in the wild wood, our arrows on your shoulder, did not avail you. Yet your queen has left you not without honor at the hour of death, nor will your end be unrenowned among earth's peoples, nor will it be known as unavenged. Whoever dared to pierce your body, impiously, pays with his life unjustly. On a mound in a mountain shade the ancient king, Gersonness of Laurentum, had an ilex dark and massive tomb. Here with an easy spring, most beautiful, the goddess mounted and looked down on her runs. Seeing him bright in arms and puffed with pride, why turn aside? She said. Step this way, 
Come and perish here, enjoy the fit reward Camilla brings. You wretch, will even you die by Diana's arrows? Then she picked a feathered shaft out of the gilded quiver and, taking deadly aim, drew the bow back full circle, till the tips could almost meet. Her hands aligned, the left hand felt the point, the right hand, and taut bowstring, touched her breast. All in one instant a runs heard the arrow whistle in the ripped air and the arrowhead thud in his body. As he moaned and died his fellow troopers rode off, unaware, and left him in the dust, a spot unknown on the wide terrain. Opis, taking wing, went soaring to the high Olympian air. Now first to leave the field, their mistress lost, were Camilla's light-armed cavalry. Then routed Rutulians made off, and fierce Atenas. Captains torn from squadrons, troops astray wheeled toward the town and looked for safety there. No one at all could hold or make a stand with javelins against the Trojan onset. Bows were unstrung on slumping shoulders, galloping hooves shook up the loose dry mire of the field. A dusky cloud of churned up dust rolled onto the city walls, where mothers on the towers with beaten breasts lifted their women's cry to the stars of heaven. Hard on the heels of men first breaking through the open gates, a crowd of enemy pressed, or men of both sides mingled, so there was no escape from piteous death, but in the very entry, amid the walls of their own city, their protecting houses, lanced from behind, they gave up life and breath. Then after some had shut the gates, they dared not open a way in for their friends, or take them into the town, beg as they would. Now came a wretched slaughter, as the gate's defenders shot at the crowd that rushed upon their shots. Kept out before the eyes of weeping parents, some of those born onward in the route plunged headlong in the moat, and others rode in blind panic to batter at the gates, unyielding, barred against them. On the walls even older women, mothers, as true love of homeland taught them, and as they had seen Camilla fight, outdid each other now at hurling missiles with unsteady hands, in place of steel, hard oaken box and pikes with fire-hardened points. For their town wall they dared, they burned, to be the first to die. In the mountain wood, meanwhile, the cruel news filled Turnus' thoughts, as Aka brought him word of the great tumult, Votian troops destroyed, Camilla fallen, foes in Mars good graces carrying all before them, riding on, panic already at the city walls. Raging, as Jove's hard will required, Turnus left the heights that he had manned and left the rough wood. Hardly was he out of sight and holding level ground, when Lord Aeneas entered the pass, unguarded now, and crossed the ridge and issued from the woodland shade. Then both, with no time lost, marched on the city, two whole hosts, not many miles apart. Aeneas viewed the plain smoking with dust far off, and saw the army of Laurentum. Turnus at the same time recognized Aeneas, pitiless captain in the field, and heard the tramp of feet, the neigh of horses coming behind. In moments they would skirmish, go to the test of battle, had not Redden Phoebus already dipped his weary team in the Spanish sea and, as the bright day ebbed, brought on the night. One army strengthened walls, the other encamped in quiet before the town. Book 12. The Fortunes of War. Turnus now saw how Latin strength had failed, how the day's fight was lost and they were broken, saw that they held him to his promise now all eyes upon him. But before they spoke his passion rose, hot and unquenchable. As in the African hinterland a lion, hid in the chest by hunters, badly hurt, gives battle then at last and revels in it, tossing his bunch of mane back from his nape, all fighting heart, he snaps the shaft the tracker put into him, and roars with bloody maw. So Turnus in the extremity flared up and stormed at the old king, no one waits while Turnus shirks a battle. No pretext allows Aeneas riffraff to renege or take their challenge back. By God, I'll fight him. Father, bring sacred offerings and state the terms of combat. Either by this right arm I send to hell the Dardan prince who left his Asia in the lurch, and let the Latins rest and look on. While I alone disprove with my sword point the charge against us all, or else let him take over a beaten people, let Lavinia be the winner's bride. To this Latinus answered steadily, soldier without a peer, as you surpass the rest in heroism, all the more must I labor to think, and weigh my fears, taking account of all that may occur. You have your father Donus' realm, you have your many conquered towns. Gold and the heart to spend it are not lacking to Latinus. Here in Latium, in the Laurentine land, are other girls of noble blood unmarried. Allow me these reflections, painful, yes, but open and above board. Take to heart this fact, it was not right that I should pledge my daughter to a suitor of other days, gods, and prophecies of men, forbade. Affection for you, our Rutulian kinsman, won me over, and my wife in tears. I broke my bonds of duty, stole the girl, though promised, from her husband and took arms against the will of heaven. You see what followed, Turnus, the bloody wars and the defeats, the bitter days you, most of all, endure. Beaten in two great battles, barely alive we keep Italian hopes within our town, the Tiber's currents warm still with our blood, 
the open land white with our bones. And why, again and yet again, am I pulled back from action? What mad dream blurs my resolve? Granted with Turnus dead I am prepared to make them partners in the realm, why not stop fighting, rather, while he lives unharmed? What will Rutulians of your family say, what will all Italy say, if I betray you, heaven forbid, to death while you contend for marriage to my daughter? Only give thought to the veering ways of war, take pity on your aged father whom Ardea keeps at home, secluded from us and forlorn. All that he said affected Turnus' fury not in the least, it mounted, all the more fevered at words of healing. When the man could speak at last, he said, My lord, I beg you, put this reckoning for my sake aside for my sake, let me bid my death for honour. Father, I too can make a rapid cast of javelins, not puny when they strike. Blood flows from wounds I, too, can give. This time his goddess mother, she who, when he runs, hides him in womanish cloud, who hides herself in empty phantoms, she'll be far away. But now the queen, Amata, terrified by the new hazard of the single combat, wept and pale as death clung to her ardent son-in-law, Turnus, I beg you by these tears, by all you hold at heart for me, Amata, you are one hope, our stay in grim old age, Latinus honour and authority rest in your hands, all our declining house now leans upon you, this one thing I beg, refrain from single combat with the Trojans. Any mischance that may await you there awaits me, too, for with you I'll forsake this hostile daylight. Never as a captive shall I look on Aeneas as my son. Lavinia, listening to her mother, streamed with tears on burning cheeks, a deepening blush brought out a fiery glow on her hot face. As when one puts a stain of crimson dye on ivory of India, or when white lilies blush, infused with crimson roses, so rich the contrast in her colouring seemed. Desire stung the young man as he gazed, rapt, at the girl. He burned yet more for battle, briefly answering Amata, Please, mother, no tears for me, no parting omen so unpromising, as I go out to combat ruled by Iron Mars. No longer is Turnus free to put off risk of death. Idmon, come, be my messenger, say this to the Phrygian tyrant, words not to his liking. When dawn tomorrow, born from the ocean stream on crimson chariot wheels, reddens the sky, he need not lead the Trojans in attack on the Rutulians. Let all Trojan weapons rest, Rutulians rest. With our own blood let us two put an end to war, and there on that field, let Lavinia be the prize. With this he whirled away into his quarters, called for his team, and smiled with joy at horses whinnying before him. These were the two that Erythia, consort of the north wind, gave as a glory to Polumnus, horses rivaling snow in whiteness, wind in speed, and, flanking them, the nimble charioteers clapped hollow palms to chests and combed their manes. Then round his shoulders Turnus donned his cuirass glinting with golden and pale copper scales, made ready sword and shield, and helm with horns to bear his crimson plume. The sword was one the fire god himself had forged for Donus, dipping it white hot in the wave of sticks. And finally, from where it leaned against a pillar of the hall, he picked a spear, his powerful hand gripping that hardy shaft he took in battle from Orunkan actor. Shaking it, making it vibrate, he cried out, Spear, that never failed me once when called on, now the time has come. A champion once carried you, Turnus bears you now. See to it that I smash down that body and tear away with my strong hand the breastplate of the Phrygian eunuch, and be foul and dust those lovelocks curled with hot iron, drenched with liquid myrrh. To this length driven by passion, he gave off a sparkling glow from his whole face, and fire flashed from his eyes, as a wild bull at bay will give a fearsome bellow and wet his horns to fury on a tree trunk, striking blows against the wind, kicking up spurts of sand in prelude to the fight. Likewise, meanwhile, Aeneas, fierce in his maternal armor, wetted his edge for war, and roused himself to anger, full of joy that, by the terms he offered, war should cease. He comforted his officers, allayed pale Iulus' fear, recalling fate's design, then ordered men to take Latinus an assured reply and set conditions for the coming peace. The next day's dawn had barely cast its glow on mountain tops, at that hour when the sun's heaven climbing team strives from the deep, exhaling light from flaring nostrils, when Rutulian troops and Trojans, under the city walls, laid out a field for combat. Some built hearths and grassy altars for their common gods, while fire and fresh spring water were brought out by priests in cloaks, rosemary round their brows. The compact legion of Ausonians debouched now from the crowded city gates, the Trojan Tuscan army from the plain streamed up in various accoutrement, ranks glinting steel, as though rough work of Mars had called them, and amid their numbers captains wheeled about in pride of gold and crimson, Mnestheus of Asericus's line, valiant Asilus, and the master of horse, Mesippus, Neptune's son. At a trumpet note each side retired to its appointed zone with lances fixed in earth and shields at rest. Then matrons and townspeople, 
pouring out with old men and infirm, thronged towers and roofs, while others clustered at the tall gateways. But gazing from the height we now call Alban, nameless then, it had no fame or glory, Juno surveyed the plain, the facing lines, Troys and Laurentums, and Latinus town. Promptly she turned, immortal to immortal, and spoke to Turnus' sister, nymph of ponds and purling streams. Heaven's king Jupiter for the maidenhead that he had ravished, gave this divine dignity, rule over limpid things. Nymph, she said, and loveliness of rivers, cherished by me, you know I honor you above all Latin girls who ever entered great-hearted Jove's unwelcome bed, I've kept most happily for you a place in heaven. Now let me tell you of your grief to be, lest you think me the cause. While fortune seemed compliant, and the fates let power rest with Latium, your brother in your city had my protection. Now I see the soldier meeting a destiny beyond his strength, his doomsday, mortal shock of the enemy, are now at hand. I cannot bear to watch this duel, this pact. If you dare help your brother more at close quarters, do it, and well done. A better time may follow present pain. The words were barely out before Jaterna's eyes brimmed over tears, with her clenched hand she thrice or four times beat her comely breast. This is no time for tears, the goddess said, be quick, go snatch your brother back from death if there's a way. Or else renew the war, cast out the pact which they drew up. I'll be sponsor to your audacity. With this last urgent word she left her wondering, torn, in turmoil from the pang her heart had suffered. Meanwhile the kingly men appeared, Latinus mighty in aspect in a four-horse car, his shining brow crowned with twelve golden rays in token of the sun, his ancestor, while Turnus rode behind his snowy team, handling a pair of spears, broad in the blade. Then from his quarters Lord Aeneas came, the father of the Roman race, aglow with starry shield and armor forged by heaven, close at his side the second hope of Rome, Ascanius. A priest in a clean robe brought out a boar's young and a sheep unshorn to place before the altar fires. These men with eyes turned to the rising sun, bestowed their handfuls of salt meal, took knives to mark the foreheads of the beasts, and poured from shallow ritual cups libations on the altars. Aeneas, the God-fearing, with drawn sword spoke out his vows, Son be my witness now in this land for whose sake I could endure hard days and many, then the Almighty Father also, and his lady, thou, Saturnia, more kindly to us, goddess, now, I pray, and thou, too, famous Mars, whose hand hurls down on men all wars according to thy will, I call on springs and streams, and all the powers both of high heaven and the deep blue sea, should victory fall to the Ausonian, Turnus, it is agreed that in defeat we shall retire upon Evander's town, that Iulus quit this region, and Aeneas people never afterward return in war or send this kingdom challenges to arms. If on the other hand the day is ours, conferred by divine victory, as I think, and may the gods confirm it by their will, I shall not make Italians underlings to Trojans. For myself I ask no kingdom. Let both nations, both unconquered, both subject to equal laws, commit themselves to an eternal union. I shall give rituals and gods to both. My father-in-law Latinus, let him keep his arms, and keep his royal authority. My share will be a town with walls, laid out and built by Trojans. Lavinia will give that town her name. In these terms first Aeneas declared himself. Latinus followed, with a skyward look, his right hand lifted to the stars. Aeneas, I swear by the same powers, by earth and sea and stars, by the twin children of Latona, Janus two faces, and the nether powers, shrines of pitiless dis, let this be heard by the sky father who with lightning bolts conceal and violate the packs of men. Here as I touch the altars I appeal to ritual fires, and mediating gods, never shall that day dawn that sees our peace, our treaty, ruptured by my countrymen, however things fall out. No force on earth can make me swerve from my intent, no force, though it embroil the earth and water in flood to pour land into sea, heaven into hell. Just as this scepter here in my right hand will never put out foliage or shade, once cut from the live tree bowl in the forest, torn from that mother, and laid bare by steel of branching arms and leaves. This one time bow the artificer's hand has fitted well in a bronze sheath and given to our Latin lords to carry. By these spoken vows they sealed the pact between them and the sight of captains on both sides, then cut the throats of duly hallowed beasts over the flames and tore the living entrails out, to heap in freshly loaded platters on the altars. On the Rutulian side the coming match seemed more unfair, however, as time went on. Fears came and went, troubling them all the more when, seeing the contenders close at hand, they saw their strength unequal. This disquiet multiplied now as Turnus walked in silence reverently and humbly to the altars, eyes downcast, his cheeks drawn, his flesh pale. Now when Juturna saw troops in commotion, whispering ever louder, and losing heart, she moved into the ranks, disguised as cameras, an officer whose ancestry was noble, 
his father's valor a matter of renown and he himself assiduous in arms, taking this form, amid the ranks she went, aware of their condition, putting out one rumor and another, asking them, dox no one blush, Rutulians, to expose one life, one soldier, for so large a force? In numbers of good men, in fighting power, are we no match for them? Look, all are here, Trojans, Arcadians, fate-driven Tuscans, foes to Turnus. If we take them on with merely every other man, we barely find a foe for each. Turnus will rise in fame to those high gods upon whose altars he makes the offering of his life, he'll be alive upon the lips of men. Not so with all the rest. Losing our fatherland, proud masters on our backs, we'll be enslaved for never stirring on this field today. This fueled the fire of what the soldiers thought, and louder murmuring crept through the ranks, Laurentine, too, and Latin. Their mood changed, and men who lately hoped for rest from combat, safety for their way of life, now felt a hankering for weapons, wished the pact could be unmade, and pitied Turnus' lot as underdog. To add to all this, then, Juturna gave a more insidious stroke, for high in heaven she produced a sign most potent to confuse Italian minds, a strange, deceitful tableau. Winging down through rosy dawnlit air, Jove's golden bird came chasing offshore seafowl, noisy flocks, and with a swoop upon the waves caught up in crooked talons a surpassing swan. The Italians gazed, enthralled. Then all the birds in flight wheeled round with screams, wondrous to see, their wings darkening heaven, and in a cloud harried the enemy through the air until their pressure and the swan's weight broke his grip, his talons dropped the prey into the river, then gaining depth of cloud he soared away. Cheers at this omen broke from Rutulian ranks, and hands were freed for arms. Ptolemyus, the augur, gave a cry, here was the sign. The sign I often looked for in my prayers. I welcome it, I see the gods behind it. Arm with me. Follow my lead. Poor countrymen on whom that vulture from abroad has come to scare like light winged turns or gulls in war and to lay waste your seaboard. He'll be gone, his canvas wide winged toward horizon cloud. It is for you to take heart, all together, close your formations, and fight on to save the prince this raiding stranger took for prey. He finished, then ran forward with a spear to launch it at the facing enemy. The whistling shaft of Cornell sang ahead unwavering through the air. At the same time a great shout sounded from all companies, their hearts grown hot with turmoil, as the spear flew on toward where nine handsome brothers stood, all of them born to the Arcadian Gelippus by his faithful Tuscan wife. The spear hit one of them just at the waist where the sewn belt rubbed on his upper belly, and a brooch clamped the strap from either side. The spear that passed from rib to rib brought down this well-built soldier, all a gleam in armor, pitching him on the tawny sand. His brothers, brave men, now as one, in shock and grief, some with swords out, some with steel to throw, came in a blind rush forward. But Laurentine squads moved out to meet them, double quick. Then from the other side again came Trojans, Tuscans from Agilina, Arcadians in painted gear, now charging side by side. One passion took possession of them all, to make the sword their arbiter. They ripped the altars to get firebrands, missiles flew in darkening squalls over the whole sky, a rain of steel, while sacrificial bowls and hearth fires of the peace were snatched away. His treaty void, Latinus took to flight with images of his defeated gods. Others caught up their chariot reins or vaulted into the saddle, drawing blades, advancing. Avid to break the pact, Mesippus rode against Olestes, the Etruscan prince who wore a prince's blazon. This poor captain flinched aside, then stumbled as he whirled amid the obstructing altars and went down on head and shoulders. In a flash Mesippus rode up with his spear, high on his horse, and even as the prone man begged for mercy thrust hard downward with his beam-like shaft. Then he called out. That does for him. A richer carcass for the great gods. And Italians running up despoiled the still warm body. Out of one altar Coroneus pulled a half-burnt firebrand, facing Abysus as he came lunging for a stroke, he hit him between the eyes with flames, his bush of beard flared up and gave a smell of burning flesh. Coroneus closed, and caught in his left hand his staggered enemy's hair, then struck a knee into his groin and bent him to the ground to be dispatched with a sword thrust in the side. With naked blade Podalirius rose behind the shepherd Alsus, as he ran along the front through spears, but Alsus whirled his axe backward and split the skull of his enemy from brow to chin. Gore splattered on his armor, harsh repose oppressed his eyes, a sleep of iron, and an eternal night they closed. Meanwhile the man of honor, Aeneas, stood bareheaded with his right hand out, unarmed, and called his troops, were bound. Are you a mob? Why this outbreak of brawling all at once? Cool your hot heads. A pact has been agreed to, terms have been laid down. I am the one to fight them. Let me do so. Never fear, with this right hand I'll carry out the treaty. 
Turnus is mine, our sacrifice obliged it. But even as he called out, as he spoke, a winging shaft, look, whizzed and struck the man, sped by who knows what hand, what spinning gust, what stroke of luck, what god won this distinction for the Rutulians. Glory for the shot when afterwards suppressed, no claims were made by anyone of having hit Aeneas. When Turnus saw Aeneas in retreat, leaving his troops, and saw the Trojan captains thrown into disarray, he seethed again with sudden hope and called for team and weapons. Flashing aboard his car in one proud leap, he pulled hard at the reins and went careering, handing over to death dozens of men and bringing others down half dead. Whole files he smashed under his wheels. He wrested spears from men who fled and killed them on the run. Like bloodstained Mars himself he rode, when Mars goes headlong by the frozen Hebrus river, beating out claps of thunder on his shield and lashing on his furious team for war, that team that on the open ground outruns the south and west winds, while the farthest land of Thrace re-echoes to their drumming hooves, and riding with him go black visages of fright, ambush, and anger, Mars' companions. That was the way of Turnus, lashing on a team that smoked with sweat amid the battle, trampling foes in wretchedness brought down. His running hooves kicked up a bloody spray and pocked the mire of sand and gore. The rider cut down Sthenilus with a long throw, Thamyris and then Pholus at close quarters, with a long throw, again, Imbrus's sons Glaucus and Lades, whom their father reared in Lycia and richly fitted out to fight on foot or to outride the wind. Elsewhere on the field Eumides charged into the melee, a man famed in war, son of the fabled Dolon, having his name from his old grandfather, his recklessness and deft hand from his father, who had dared to ask Achilles' team as his reward for spying on the Danon camp at Troy. For that audacity Diomedes gave a different reward, all hope expired for horses of Achilles. Now when Turnus caught sight of Eumides at a distance across the plain, he had a shot at him with a light javelin over the open space, drove after it, reined in, and vaulted down to where the man had fallen and lay dying. With one foot on his neck he wrenched away the sword from his right hand, then sank the blade shining but soon encrimsoned in his throat. Then from above he said, Here's good land, Trojan, the western land you thought to take in war. Lie there and measure it. See what is gained by daring to face up to me in arms. See how far you go in founding cities. To bear him company he brought Aspites down with a spear cast, then killed Chlorius, Sybaris, Dares, and Thersilicus, Thymetes too, thrown when his horse shied. As Thracian north wind, Boreas, in a gale roars on Aegean deeps and shoreward surf where squalls roll down the dark and the scud flies, just so, wherever Turnus cut his way, formations yielded to him, ranks turned tail and ran before him. His own impetus carried him on, the wind his chariot made whipped back and forth his flying crest. One man, Phagaeus, hated the sight of Turnus tall before him thundering on. Square in the chariot's path he flung himself and yanked aside the galloping horse's jaws that foamed upon the bits. While he hung on to the yoke, borne onward, Turnus' broad spearhead, now thrust at his unshielded flank, broke through his mail of double mesh and grazed his body. Nonetheless, turning his shield around, resorting to his blade, he made a lunge, only to go down headlong as the wheel and axle spinning struck and laid him low. Then by a stroke between the helmet rim and breastplate, Turnus cut his head away, leaving his trunk mired in sand. While all these deaths were being brought about by Turnus, Mnestheus, and Achates, ever faithful, accompanied by Ascanius, helped Aeneas into the camp, bleeding, putting his weight with every other step on his long spear. He strove in rage to extract the arrowhead with snapped-off shaft, and asked for the quickest way, a sword cut, making a deeper and open wound to expose the embedded point, then sent him back into the battle. But now Iapix came, son of Iasus, and most dear to Phoebus. Captured one time by sharp desire, Apollo made him gifts of skills that were the gods, augury and the lyre and speeding arrows. Iapix, however, to postpone the death of a father desperately ill, preferred to learn the powers of herbs, a healer's ways, and practice without glory silent arts. Aeneas, bitterly impatient, stood and leaned on his great spear, unmoved by tears of soldiers gathering in a crowd and Iulus grieving. In Paeonian style the old man rolled his cloak back carefully and worked with his physician's hand, with herbs of potency from Phoebus, all in vain, in vain trying to worry out the barb or grip and tug the embedded steel with tongs. No luck guided his probes, and no help came from Phoebus, the arch-healer. More and more savage the terror of the field grew, nearer came the calamitous end. By now they saw a wall of dust that stood against the sky, horsemen approaching, arrows falling thick into the middle of the camp, and skyward rose the shouts of men who fought, the cries of men who fell, cut down by pitiless Mars. Now, shaken by the pain unmerited her son bore, Mother Venus picked a stalk of Dittany from Cretan Ida, Dittany with downy leaves and scarlet flower, a plant that wild goats know about when stuck with arrows. 
Venus now brought this down, veiling her face in a dark cloud, and for a secret poultice dipped the leaves to imbue a shining bowl of Tiber water, sprinkling in Ambrosia's health-giving juices and the fragrant hill all. Quite unaware of her, old Yapix used the medicated fluid to lave the wound. Then, sure enough, all anguish instantly left Aeneas' body, all his bleeding stopped, deep in the wound. The arrowhead came out, unforced and ready to his hand. New strength renewed his old-time fighting spirit. Here, be quick, and give the man his armor, Yapix exclaimed. Why stand there? First to speak. He fired their hearts against the enemy. No mortal agency brought this about, no art however skilled, not my own hand preserves you, but a greater power, Aeneas. A god is here at work. He sends you back to greater actions. Avid for battle now, the captain sheathed his left leg and his right in golden greaves, hating the minutes lost, and hefted his long spear. Once he had fitted shield to flank, harness to back, he hugged Ascanius, embracing him with steel, then through his visor brushed his lips and said, Learn fortitude and toil from me, my son, ache of true toil. Good fortune learn from others. My sword arm now will be your shield in battle and introduce you to the boons of war. When, before long, you come to man's estate, be sure that you recall this. Harking back for models in your family, let your father, Aeneas, and uncle, Hector, stir your heart, this said, his powerful figure past the gates, his long spear flashing in his hand. With him Antheus and Mnestheus and a dense battalion sortied en masse, and all reserves inside flowed outward from the abandoned camp. The field went dark with blinding dust, the marching feet awakened crumbled earth and made it tremble. Turnus from the rampart opposite saw them coming, so did the Ausonians, and felt a chill of dread run through their bones. First of them all to hear and know the sound, Juturna trembled and turned back. Aeneas with flying feet led through the open field his dark battalion at high speed, as when a storm cloud out at sea moves toward the land and cuts the sunlight off, then farmers know, alas, what's coming, shivering in their hearts, for it will bring down trees, devastate crops, and flatten all things far and wide. The winds fly in ahead and bring the tempest roar. Just so the captain from the trode led his troops in close formation, swarming on, against the enemy. With his long blade Thymbraeus cut massive Osiris down, Mnestheus killed Arcetius, Apulo fell to Achates, Euphens fell to Gis, Ptolemyus, the augur, too, succumbed, he who had made the first spear cast against them. Skyward the shouting rose as in their turn Rutulians turned their dusty backs and fled across the fields. Aeneas held aloof from fugitives and would not chase or kill those met on foot or mounted men with lances. In the dense murk he tracked Turnus alone, called on Turnus alone to stand and fight him. Stricken with dread of this, Juturna, now nerved as a man for combat, made Metiscus, Turnus' charioteer, tumble head first along the reins and fall from the chariot pole. Then she left him far behind as she drove onward, swerving, reins in hand, and took the entire guise, voice, armor of Metiscus. About a rich landowner's farm a black-winged swallow flits through lofty rooms and picks a meal of scraps and crumbs for her loud nestlings, now she is heard in empty colonnades, now skimming over ponds. Just so, Juturna, borne by that team amid her enemies, in her swift car traversed the field, now here, now there she showed her brother glorying and would not let him fight but flew far onward. Aeneas all the same kept after him, following his twists and turns, and calling out in a loud voice among the scattered troops. But each time that he glimpsed his enemy and tried to match on foot the speed and flight of the racing team, Juturna whirled away. He groaned. What could he do? As in a cross rip weltering without headway, in his heart he felt desires clash. But now against him Mesippus came, light on his feet, with two steel pointed and tough spears in his left hand. He twirled and threw one, aimed for a direct hit, and, halting, falling to one knee, Aeneas crouched behind his shield. The driven spear still carried off the apex of his helm and knocked away his plume. At this attack, a tide of battle fury swept the Trojan, overcome by Rutulian bad faith. The team and car of his great adversary being out of range, he called on Jove and called on altars of the broken peace to witness, many times, then into the melee he raced, most terrible to see, with Mars behind him, rousing blind and savage slaughter, all restraints on wrath cast to the winds. What god can help me tell so dread a story? Who could describe that carnage in a song, the captains driven over the plain and killed by Turnus or in turn by Troy's great hero? Was it thy pleasure, Jupiter, that peoples afterward to live in lasting peace should rend each other in so black a storm? One duel briefly stayed the Trojan charge, when Sucro, the Rutulian, held Aeneas, then on that side where fate is quickest, Aeneas drove his raw steel through the man's ribcage. Turnus and horsed Amicus and his brother, Diorus, and dismounted then to strike them 
killing with his spear the one who came against him, and the other with his sword. He cut their heads away and bore them off, dripping blood, hung to his chariot rail. Aeneas consigned Talos and Tanais to bloody death, and brave Sethegus, three in one fight, then Oneats as he mourned them, a son of Peridia from fabled Thebes. Turnus killed certain brothers sent from Lycia, Apollos's highlands, and went on to kill Maneats, hater of war, his hatred vain. A fisherman in his Arcadian youth, he had his poor hut near the brooks of Lerna, crowded with perch, and knew no seats of power, his father tilled a plot of rented land. The two assailants were like fires begun on two sides of a dry wood, making laurel thickets crackle, or like snow-fed streams that foam and roar seaward down mountainsides and leave, each one, a watercourse laid waste. With no less devastating power these two, Aeneas and Turnus, cut their way through battle. Now with fury rising, now again with bursting hearts and reckless of defeat, they spent their whole strength running upon danger. Here came Muranus, and he boasted loud of grandfathers, and grandfathers of theirs, of old names, and one family entire that came down through the Latin kings. Aeneas tumbled him headlong with a whirlwind cast of a big stone and bashed him to the ground. Under the yoke and reins, his own wheels knocked him rolling where with beating hooves his team, oblivious of their master, trampled him. Then Hillas charged ahead in boundless rage, but Turnus met him with a javelin flung against his gilded brow, and through his helm the shaft stuck in his brain. Bravest of Greeks, Cretheus, neither could you, by your sword arm, be saved from Turnus. Nor when Aeneas came did gods protect their minister, Cuppincus. Facing the blade thrust at his breast, he could not fend it with his brazen shield, poor soldier. Then the Laurentine fields witnessed your death, Aeolus, yours too, sprawled on the earth, whom once the Argive columns and Achilles, bane of Priam's realm, could not bring down. Here was your finish. Though your manor stood in Ida's shade, your manor at Lyrnesus, Laurentine earth would be your sepulchre. Each army's total strength was now engaged, all Latins and all Trojans, every man, Mnestheus and brave Serestus, too, Mesippus, master of horse, valiant Asilus, ranks of Tuscans, and Arcadians of Evander, each putting all he had into the struggle, never a let-up, never a breathing spell, in the vast combat every man fought on. Here, though, Aeneas' lovely mother sent the captain a new thought, to approach the walls, to bring his troops to bear upon the city quickly, and take the Latins by surprise, threatening sudden ruinous assault. Following Turnus down the long front, he viewed the city from one vantage or another and saw how quiet it lay, immune, untouched by the wild battle. Now in his mind's eye, a fire, he saw a greater fight to come. He called his officers, Mnestheus, Sergestus, brave Serestus, and climbed a rise of ground round which the Trojan legion came together, crowding, shields and spears held at the ready. Standing amid them on the mound, he said, there will be no time lost in carrying out what I shall say now. Jupiter stands with us. Granted this change of action unforeseen, on that account let no man lag behind. Unless our enemies accept our yoke and promise to obey us, on this day I shall destroy their town, root of this war, soul of Latina's kingdom. I shall bring their smoking rooftops level with the ground. Must I go on, awaiting Turnus' whim to face and fight me once again in battle, beaten already as he is? I think not. Countrymen, this town is head and heart of an unholy war. Bring out your firebrands. Make terms, this time, with the town in flames. On this he ended. Vying with one another high-hearted troops formed up in echelon, a compact mass, and headed for the walls. Now scaling ladders all at once appeared, now spurting fires. One company rushed the gates and cut down the first guards they met, another launched their missiles, darkening the sky. Aeneas himself, among the foremost, held his right hand up in shadow of the walls with shouted accusations of Latinus, calling the gods to witness that once more the fight was forced upon him that Italians twice had turned his foes, that a second pact had now been broken. Amid the townspeople panic and discord grew, some said the town should be unbarred, gates open to the Dardans, these would hail to the walls the king himself. The rest ran to fetch arms and man the ramparts. As when a shepherd, tracking bees, has found their hive in Tufa, he fills up the cleft with acrid smoke, inside, roused in alarm, the bees clamber about their waxen quarters, buzzing loud and growing hot with rage as black and reeking puffs invade their home, and deep in rocky dark their hum resounds while smoke goes up in the clear air. More trouble came now to weary Latins, a new grief that shocked the whole town to its heart. When Queen Amata from her window saw the enemy at hand, the walls besieged, flames flying to the roofs, she saw no soldiers drawn up against them, no Rutulians under Turnus' command, and thought, poor woman, her prince had been destroyed in the melee. Her mind riven by this thunderclap, she cried that she had been the cause, the source of evil, 
and many such laments in her sad frenzy. Maddened now, wishing to die, she rent her crimson gown and knotted round a beam the noose that strangled her in hideous death. When Latin women heard of this disaster, doubling their sorrow, Princess Lavinia first tore her flower-like hair and scored her cheeks, then all the rest crowded about her, mad with horror and grief. The palace rang with wailing. Everywhere in the town the black news ran and hearts grew sick. Ripping his robe, Latinus fouled his snowy hair with dust and filth, stunned by his wife's death and the city's fall. Fighting his war meanwhile, and far away at the edge of the battlefield, Turnus pursued a straggling few, but now more sluggishly, less and less joyous in his winning team. Faint outcries, with dark overtones of terror, came to him on the breeze, he cupped his ears and heard the sound of turmoil in the city, a joyless uproar. Sink, heart. What great loss is brought on this commotion, this wild cry born from the distant city on the wind. With this, distraught, he took the reins and halted. Then his sister, who seemed his charioteer, Matiscus, driver of his team and car, bent toward him and protested, Turnus, this way for our pursuit of Trojans. Victory opened the way here first. And there are others able over there to defend their homes. Aeneas is attacking the Italians in pitched battle, let us play our part by massacring Teucrians. Your death toll and feats of war will be no less than his. But Turnus answered, Sister, yes, I knew you long since, when you spoiled the pact by guile and gave yourself to this war. Now again you need not try to hide your divinity but who has wished you sent down from Olympus to take this rough work on? That you should see the painful end of your unhappy brother? What am I to do? What stroke of luck can guarantee my safety now? I saw before my eyes, and calling on my name, Murenus downed, great soul by a great wound, and none survives more dear to me. Poor Euphans died as though to avoid seeing my shame, the Trojans have his body and his gear. But now destruction of our homes, the one thing lacking to my desperate case, can I face that? Should I not give the lie to Drinces? Shall I turn tail? Will this land know the sight of Turnus on the run? To die, is that so miserable? Heaven has grown cold, shades of the underworld, be friendly to me. As a pure spirit guiltless of that shame I shall go down among you, never unfit to join my great forefathers. Just as he finished, here came Sachis riding at a dead run amid the enemy, his mount foaming, his face torn by a wound, crying out Turnus. As he rode, and then, Turnus, our last chance rests with you, be moved for your own people. Like a thunderbolt Aeneas falls on us. He means to topple the citadels of Italy in ruin. Firebrands even now fly to the roofs. The Latins turn their faces toward you, turn their eyes to you, the king himself, Latinus, mutters in doubt, unsure whom to call sons, what alliance to turn to. Worst of all, the queen who put such trust in you is gone, dead by her own hand, fleeing daylight in fear. Only Mesippus and Atina still maintain a fighting line before the gates. In close formation on both flanks the enemy bristles with spearheads like a crop of steel. And yet you keep your chariot in play on this deserted meadow. Stunned and confused by one and another image of disaster, Turnus held stock still with a silent stare. In that one heart great shame boiled up, and madness mixed with grief, and love goaded by fury, courage inwardly known. When by and by the darkness shadowing him broke and light came to his mind again, wildly he turned his burning eyes townward and from his car gazed at the city. Look now, billowing flames went up from floor to floor and twined about a defensive tower that he himself had built and braced, fitted with wheels and ramps. Ah, sister, see, fate overpowers us. No holding back now. We must follow where the god calls, or implacable fortune calls. My mind's made up on what remains to do, to meet Aeneas hand to hand, to bear all that may be of bitterness and death. You'll find no more unseemliness in me. Let me be mad enough for this mad act, I pray, before I die. He left his car in one swift leap upon the field and coursed away from his sad sister. Then, amid the spear casts of the enemy, on the run, he broke through the attacking Trojan line. As when a crag dislodged by wind rolls down from a mountaintop, for either a storm of rain washed earth from under it or time and age had undermined it, and it goes headlong, a mass ungovernable, bounding on in huge descent, sweeping along with it trees, herds, and men, so through the broken ranks to the city walls went Turnus in his rush. With blood spilled there the ground was drenched, the air a swish with javelins cast. His hand held up to arrest the fighting, with a great shout he called, Rutulians, hold! Put up your weapons, Latins! The outcome here, for good or ill, is mine. Better that single-handed in your stead I pay for a broken truce and fight it out to a decision. When Aeneas heard the name of Turnus, he forsook the walls, forsook the high point of the citadel, 
threw off all hindrance, cut all action short, in joy, clanging in arms of fearsome thunder, grand as Mount Athos or Mount Eryx or old father Apennine himself, when high oak forests flash and roar, and into heaven he rears his crown of snow. Now, sure enough, Rutulians and Trojans and Italians all outdid each other, dropping combat, craning to see, now those men on the ramparts, those at the battering ram low on the walls, put down their shields. Even Latinus marveled, seeing two giant men of action, born in countries so far distant, come together, vowed to a decision by the sword. Once a space on the open ground was cleared, the combatants ran forward, hurling spears at a distance first, then closing hand to hand. Their brazen shields and harness rang, the earth groaned under them, redoubling stroke on stroke, they fought with swords, and prowess merged with luck in the fighting power of each. On Sela's flank of mighty mountain, or Tabernus height, when two bulls lower heads and horns and charge in deadly combat, herdsmen blanch and scatter. Then cattle all stand mute as heifers muse on a new forest lord whom all the herds will follow. The contenders, compact of shocking force, with lowered horns gore one another, bathing necks and humps in sheets of blood, and the whole woodland bellows. Just so Trojan Aeneas and the hero son of Donus, battering shield on shield, fought with a din that filled the air of heaven. Jupiter held the two pans of a scale in balance and placed in each a destiny, doomed for him whose weight would bring death down. Turnus, thinking himself secure, flashed out to his full height, blade lifted overhead, and struck. The Trojans and the anxious Latins raised a cry, both ranks of men on edge, but then the treacherous blade on impact broke and left the man undone, enraged, his one recourse in flight. Swifter than wind he fled and stared at the strange sword hilt in his hand, disarmed now. Legend tells that when he first stepped up behind his team for headlong combat, haste made him leave his father's blade behind and snatch that of his charioteer, Matiscus. This for a long time had sufficed, while he rode down the Trojan stragglers from behind, but now, encountering the armor forged by the god Vulcan, the mere mortal blade snapped into fragments like an icicle, and shattered bits shone on the yellow sand. Crazed by the loss, in search of open ground, Turnus ran, weaving circles at a loss this way and that, for the dense crowd of Trojans ringed and shut him in, and on one side a broad marsh, on the other high stone walls made limits to his flight. As for Aeneas, slowed though his knees were by the arrow wound that hampered him at times, cutting his speed, he pressed on hotly, matching stride for stride, behind a shaken foe. As when a staghound corners a stag, blocked by a stream, or by alarm at a barrier of crimson feathers strung by beaters, then the dog assails him with darting, barking runs, the stag in fear of nets and the high riverbank attempts to flee and flee again a thousand ways, but, packed with power, the Umbrian hound hangs on, muzzle agape, now, now he has him, now, as though he had him, snaps eluded jaws and bites on empty air. Then he gives tongue in furious barking, river banks and pools echo the din, reverberant to the sky. As Turnus ran he raged, raged at Rutulians, calling their names, demanding his own sword. Aeneas countered, threatening instant death for any who came near, he terrified them, promising demolition of their city, and pressed the chase, despite his wound. Five times they ran the circular track and five again re-ran it backward, this way and now that. They raced for no light garland of the games but strove to win the life and blood of Turnus. Now on this field there happened to have stood an old wild olive, bitter-leaved, a tree sacred to Faunus, with a trunk revered by seamen long ago, those who survived shipwreck or storm fixed votive offerings there and hung their garments to Laurentum's god. The Trojans, treating it like any other, had left a stump but lopped away the tree, so they could fight on a clear field. The spear thrown by Aeneas had stuck in that tough stump where winging force had carried it and held it. The Dardan bent to extract the weapon now and cast it at the man he could not catch. At this, Turnus grew mad with fear. He said, Faunus, have pity, I entreat you. Gracious earth, hold fast the steel, if I have honored you all my life, whereas Aeneas men ward on you and profaned you. So he prayed and asked divine assistance, not in vain, for pausing at the stump, and struggling long, Aeneas, using all his power, could not pry apart the bite of stubborn oak. As bitterly he braced and strove, Juturna ran up, once again changed to Metiscus, giving her brother back his sword. At this, indignant that the nymph had made so free, Venus came forward, and she tore away Aeneas' weapon from the deep oak root, so both men were rearmed. They towered up, one confident of his own blade, the other tall and savage, with a spear to throw, and both now, panting, faced the duel of Mars. Omnipotent Olympus king meanwhile had words for Juno, as she watched the combat out of a golden cloud. He said, My consort, what will the end be? What is left for you? You yourself know, and say you know, Aeneas born for heaven, tutelary of this land, 
by fate to be translated to the stars. What do you plan? What are you hoping for, keeping your seat apart in the cold clouds? Fitting, was it, that a mortal archer wound an immortal? That a blade let slip should be restored to Turnus, and new force accrue to a beaten man? Without your help what could Juturna do? Come now, at last have done, and heed our pleading, and give way. Let yourself no longer be consumed without relief by all that inward burning, let care and trouble not forever come to me from your sweet lips. The finish is at hand. You had the power to harry men of Troy by land and sea, to light the fires of war beyond belief, to scar a family with mourning before marriage. I forbid your going further. So spoke Jupiter, and with a downcast look Juno replied, Because I know that is your will indeed, great Jupiter, I left the earth below, though sore at heart, and left the side of Turnus. Were it not so, you would not see me here suffering all that passes, here alone, resting on air. I should be armed in flames at the very battle line, dragging the Trojans into a deadly action. I persuaded Juturna, I confess, to help her brother in his hard lot, and I approved her daring greater difficulties to save his life, but not that she should fight with bow and arrow. This I swear by Styx's great fountainhead inexorable, which high gods hold in awe. I yield now and for all my hatred leave this battlefield. But one thing not retained by fate I beg for Latium, for the future greatness of your kin, when presently they crown peace with a happy wedding day, so let it be, and merge their laws and treaties, never command the land's own Latin folk to change their old name, to become new Trojans, known as Teucrians, never make them alter dialect or dress. Let Latium be. Let there be Alban kings for generations, and let Italian valor be the strength of Rome in after times. Once and for all Troy fell, and with her name let her lie fallen. The author of Man and of the World replied with a half-smile, Sister of Jupiter indeed you are, and Saturn's other child, to feel such anger, stormy in your breast. But come, no need, put down this fit of rage. I grant your wish. I yield, I am won over willingly. Ausonian folk will keep their father's language and their way of life, and, that being so, their name. The Teucrians will mingle and be submerged, incorporated. Rituals and observances of theirs I'll add, but make them Latin, one in speech. The race to come, mixed with Ausonian blood, will outdo men and gods in its devotion, you shall see, and no nation on earth will honor and worship you so faithfully. To all this Juno nodded in assent and, gladdened by his promise, changed her mind. Then she withdrew from sky and cloud. That done, the father set about a second plan, to take Juturna from her warring brother. Stories are told of twin fiends, called the Duray, whom, with Hell's Majira, deep night bore in one birth. She entwined their heads with coils of snakes and gave them wings to race the wind. Before Jove's throne, a step from the cruel king, these twins attend him and give piercing fear to ill mankind, when he who rules the gods deals out appalling death and pestilence, or war to terrify our wicked cities. Jove now dispatched one of these, swift from heaven, bidding her be an omen to Juturna. Down she flew, in a whirlwind born to earth, just like an arrow driven through a cloud from a taut string, an arrow armed with gall of deadly poison, shot by a Parthian, a Parthian or a Cretan, for a wound immedicable, whizzing unforeseen it goes through racing shadows, so the spawn of night went diving downward to the earth. On seeing Trojan troops drawn up in face of Turnus' army, she took on at once the shape of that small bird that perches late at night on tombs or desolate rooftops and troubles darkness with a gruesome song. Shrunk to that form, the fiend in Turnus' face went screeching, flitting, flitting to and fro and beating with her wings against his shield. Unstrung by numbness, faint and strange, he felt his hackles rise, his voice choke in his throat. As for Juturna, when she knew the wings, the shriek to be the fiend's, she tore her hair, despairing, then she fell upon her cheeks with nails, upon her breast with clenched hands. Turnus, how can your sister help you now? What action is still open to me, soldierly though I have been? Can I by any skill hold daylight for you? Can I meet and turn this deathliness away? Now I withdraw, now leave this war. Indecent birds, I fear you, spare me your terror. Whiplash of your wings I recognize, that ghastly sound, and guess great-hearted Jupiter's high cruel commands. Returns for my virginity, are they? He gave me life eternal, to what end? Why has mortality been taken from me? Now beyond question I could put a term to all my pain, and go with my poor brother into the darkness, his companion there. Never to die? Will any brook of mine without you, brother, still be sweet to me? If only earth's abyss were wide enough to take me downward, goddess though I am, to join the shades below. So she lamented, then with a long sigh, covering up her head in her grey mantle, sank to the river's depth. Aeneas moved against his enemy and shook his heavy pine tree spear. 
He called from his hot heart, rearmed now, why so slow? Why, even now, fall back? The contest here is not a race, but fighting to the death with spear and sword. Take on all shapes there are, summon up all your nerve and skill, choose any footing, fly among the stars, or hide in caverned earth, the other shook his head, saying, I do not fear your taunting fury, arrogant prince. It is the gods I fear and Jove my enemy, he said no more, but looked around him. Then he saw a stone, enormous, ancient, set up there to prevent landowners' quarrels. Even a dozen picked men such as the earth produces in our day could barely lift and shoulder it. He swooped and wrenched it free, in one hand, then rose up to his heroic height, ran a few steps, and tried to hurl the stone against his foe, but as he bent and as he ran and as he hefted and propelled the weight he did not know himself. His knees gave way, his blood ran cold and froze. The stone itself, tumbling through space, fell short and had no impact. Just as in dreams when the night swoon of sleep weighs on our eyes, it seems we try in vain to keep on running, try with all our might, but in the midst of effort faint and fail, our tongue is powerless, familiar strength will not hold up our body, not a sound or word will come, just so with Turnus now, however bravely he made shift to fight the immortal fiend blocked and frustrated him. Flurrying images passed through his mind. He gazed at the Rutulians, and beyond them, gazed at the city, hesitant, in dread. He trembled now before the poised spear shaft and saw no way to escape, he had no force with which to close, or reach his foe, no chariot and no sign of the charioteer, his sister. At a dead loss he stood. Aeneas made his deadly spear flash in the sun and aimed it, narrowing his eyes for a lucky hit. Then, distant still, he put his body's might into the cast. Never a stone that soared from a wall-battering catapult went humming loud as this, nor with so great a crack burst ever a bolt of lightning. It flew on like a black whirlwind bringing devastation, pierced with a crash the rim of sevenfold shield, cleared the cuirass edge, and passed clean through the middle of Turnus thigh. Force of the blow brought the huge man to earth, his knees buckling, and a groan swept the Rutulians as they rose, a groan heard echoing on all sides from all the mountain range, and echoed by the forests. The man brought down, brought low, lifted his eyes and held his right hand out to make his plea, clearly I earned this, and I ask no quarter. Make the most of your good fortune here. If you can feel a father's grief, and you, too, had such a father in Anchises, then let me bespeak your mercy for old age and Donus, and return me, or my body, stripped, if you will, of life, to my own kin. You have defeated me. The Osonians have seen me in defeat, spreading my hands. Lavinia is your bride. But go no further out of hatred. Fierce under arms, Aeneas looked to and fro, and towered, and stayed his hand upon the sword hilt. Moment by moment now what Turnus said began to bring him round from indecision. Then to his glance appeared the accursed sword belt surmounting Turnus' shoulder, shining with its familiar studs, the strap young Pallas wore when Turnus wounded him and left him dead upon the field, now Turnus bore that enemy token on his shoulder, enemy still. For when the sight came home to him, Aeneas raged at the relic of his anguish worn by this man as trophy. Blazing up and terrible in his anger, he called out, You and your plunder, torn from one of mine, shall I be robbed of you? This wound will come from Pallas, Pallas makes this offering and from your criminal blood exacts his due. He sank his blade in fury in Turnus' chest. Then all the body slackened in death's chill, and with a groan for that indignity his spirit fled into the gloom below.